Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica present... Mr. District Attorney, Champion of the People, Defender of Truth, Guardian of our Fundamental Rights to Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. And it shall be my duty as district attorney, not only to prosecute to the letter of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. In our experience, in our war against crime, ladies and gentlemen, nothing in the popular conception of crime is so widespread and so erroneous as the idea that honor exists among thieves. In tonight's case of the deadly snowflake, we see this so-called criminal code for what it is, a cold, stubborn, selfish fear based on a colossal contempt for decency. We begin in a bedroom darkened by shades drawn tight to the sill. Agnes. Agnes, is that you? Go back to sleep, Larry. The doc says you should rest. I hit my doc. They threw him out years ago. Did you talk to him, Agnes? They told me not to. Don't you think you'd better? What's the matter? Get the bandages off your head, huh? I'm lucky I'm alive, he said, Agnes. That cop's bullet went right across my skull. I know. You're lucky you got home. I still got my fingers, too. That's real talent, Agnes. One in a million. What do you mean you still got your fingers? I'll, uh... I'll get to that. First, I... I just want to say I'm sorry about... Well, about the way I've been treating you. You what? Uh, I don't mean to... Well, knock you around, Agnes. I, I just get nervous when I'm going out on a job. What's come over you, Larry? You know how it is. Feeling those tumblers fall with your fingers. It's tough work, Agnes. Oh, uh, that reminds me. What? I want you to get hold of a guy. You remember him? Rudy Bowie? Oh. Uh, What's the matter? Nothing. I just haven't heard you mention Rudy in so long. What do you need him for? To help me. I got to get back to work, Agnes. We'll be needing dough. We could sell that crazy boat. The snowflake? No, I mean big dough. More jobs, Agnes. Like that transfer office I had cased out. I don't see what you need Rudy for. He's no safe man. I don't need a Peterman, Agnes. Just a helper. Someone to to take me around. Take you around? Fred, what do you mean? Agnes, I... There's something the matter. Now, what is it, Larry? I'm blind. There's a few more, Chief. Squad D report the total arrest on the arson case. Oh, yes, I know, Miss Miller. Send a copy of the findings over to the commissioner, if you will. It's on the way. Good. Well, what about you, Harrington? Anything on that warehouse robbery? Chief, I've been over that job with a fine-tooth comb. I pulled McHenry out of his prowl car all day yesterday just to get his story again. Uh, McHenry is the officer who shot at the men as they escaped, Chief. Yeah, shot and missed, I'm sorry to say, Chief. Missed completely? I thought the officer's report a week ago indicated that he might have hit one of the men. Yeah, that's right, Chief, he might, but nobody's been showing up dead in any of the alleys, though. Mm, That adds up to what? You've no idea at all? Well, uh, just one, Chief. Yeah, and I'll say this before I start, Miss Miller. It ain't scientific. Harrington, I haven't said a word. I know, but you will, you will. The point is, Chief, I want to... Well, I want to play this one on a hunch. Oh. Well, we've played your hunches before, haven't we? Yeah. Yes, and we've got results, too. What's your thought? 
Okay, let's go back to this warehouse job for a minute, okay? I don't have to. The warehouse people have been on the phone about it all week. So what was it? A Peterman job. Am I right? No powder, no dynamite, no blasting. Just a straight Peterman. A what? A Peterman, Miss Miller. A man who opens safes. Oh. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Chief, I went over that warehouse safe 20 times. The guy opened it with his fingers. Yes, yes, you put that in your original report. Right. Now think about this thing. Feeling for those tumblers ain't easy, you know. That's very delicate work. You gotta be trained to it. Yes, go on. Okay, so it comes down to this, Chief. There's three guys I know who could have fingered a safe the way that warehouse job came off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of them's in the happy house. Yes, and the other two? One's in California, Chief. At least I think he is. I'm checking on it. Yeah. And the other? Uh-huh. The other. The boy named Morton. Laird Morton. Laird. I got his file out of the master, Miss Muller. Is that M-O-R-T-O-N? That's right. He's been quiet for a couple of years, Chief. Might take me time to find him. Now, let me get this straight. You really think you can narrow down that warehouse robbery to certain individuals just on... On, on technique, Chief. And like I said, on a hunch, too. So... Well, can I go on? You've nothing else? Mm -hmm. No witnesses? Fingerprints? Nothing? No, not so far, Chief. I see. All right. I'll hold it over on the disposition report, Harrington. We'll say, how about three days? Starting now, Chief? Starting now. Let's see what this hunch of yours will do. Agnes. I'm right in front of you, Laird. Don't oh. get to jump. I'm sorry. I... It bothers me when you move around, that's all. You here, Rudy? Yeah, just waiting for what you say, Laird. Go on, Laird. Say what you got to say. All right, we won't waste any more time. You can lead me into the transfer office, Rudy. The way I time it, it should be three minutes from the card of the safe. Yeah, if we have luck with the watchman, Laird. Never mind him. Now, you both got this picture? You lead me. Give me, oh, say, six minutes with the tumblers, and then we beat it. Back our car? That's right, Agnes. From there, we go directly to the snowflake. To the what? Laird's boat. I don't get it. Can you think of a better place to hide out, Rudy? We get aboard, shove off, we can cruise around for weeks. She sleeps, Six. She? His boat. He bought it off some jerk during the war. Yeah. Oh, that's... well, you see her, Rudy. I bought it complete. Right down to the gear and galley. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, Laird, uh, we make the getaway on a boat? I told you, it's the safest place in the world. She's all set, too. Agnes saw everything, didn't you? I checked all the papers in your billfold, Laird. Swell. Well, now I guess I'll get a little sleep. Big day tomorrow, huh, Rudy? Yeah, whatever you say, Laird. You want some help? No, I can make it. I've been practicing, haven't I, Agnes? Go ahead, show him. Uh, Laird, watch it. I'll be all right, Rudy. You sit with Agnes. Three steps to the left. Turn and... Yeah, shut up. Season. Forward. Forward. Yeah. Hey, you all right? Yeah. Sit still, Rudy. I... I misjudged, I guess. I'll be fine. Good night, now. Want a drink? What's the idea, Agnes? You let him walk right into that chair. I know. I forgot to tell him I moved it. Oh, yeah? Hmm. Never mind the drink. Hold still. Rudy, listen. Still, I said. What was that for? Just wanted to be sure of something. Are you? Yeah, I'm sure. Your idea, Laird sending for me when he was blind. I just said it was a good idea. He didn't know then? But, uh. Before? Him? Yeah. Don't be funny. I'm not. I'm just getting organized, Agnes. Yeah, you know, watching things around here the last few days, it strikes me you're, uh. A uh, what? Well, you've changed. Laird used to push you around like a lawnmower. That was before he lost his papers. Yeah, yeah. So now you let him walk into chairs. That ain't all he's walking into. 
I got it all planned. The transfer office job, the boat, everything. What is he walking into, Agnes? Rudy. Yeah? Now it's your turn to hold still. Baby, I... Still want to know what he's walking into? Guess. Okay, Chief, so it boils down to this. Yes. Either that warehouse job was a complete outsider, or it's my boy. Laird Morton, you mean, Hank. Right, and I'm taking bets it was no outside rip and tear job. What makes you say that, Harrington? Because, Miss Miller, when a bunch of the boys plan a job the size of that warehouse deal, they line it up, see? And if they're from out of town, well, they get permission. Permission to break open a safe? From whom? From the boys in this town that know about things like safes. Yes, and they're pretty well cleaned out, aren't they? Aren't they, they are, Chief. And that's why, again, I think Laird's my boy. You know how to find him? Well, he's been off my books now for nearly three years, Chief, but I can find him. At least here's where I try. <laughs> No, oh, I'll shoot your game some other time, Harry. Yeah, and with no chalk on my cue, too. Oh, hey, hey, before I forget it, uh, you ever hear from Morton? Yeah, Morton, you know, he used to play snooker in here. Laird Morton. Give me three, will you, Rusty? No, 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 the Panatella is that the only good cigar you got. Hey, oh, Rusty. Uh, Harry over at the billiard joint says, maybe that you heard from Laird. Yeah, Morton. Come on, Rusty, you know him. Laird Morton. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry to get you out of rehearsal, Maisie. Trying a new number, huh? <laughs> Pretty good, too. Oh, oh, I know now what I meant to ask you, Maisie. You used to go around with Laird Morton, didn't you? I mean, back before he got married? <laughs> uh, well, tell me something, kid. Does he owe you any dough? Pretty talk clear, lad. I look both ways. What about the watchman, Rudy? Is he in the office? What office? I told you a dozen times, Agnes. It should be straight ahead of us, up the steps and to the right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it, lad. No light on. Okay. That's it, then. Let's go in. You got him, Rudy. Yeah, I am. That's it. Keep hold of my coat, Laird. It won't fall. Remember now, both of you, we come right back to the car and drive directly to the boat. We know that. Go on, Rudy. Door's open. I told you it would be. The watchman leaves it unlatched till 2 a.m. What's the matter? What's that around your neck, Laird? What? These, these, these. I got hold of them. Go on in, will you? Somebody will walk by in a minute. They're binoculars, Rudy. You'll need a good pair on the boat. He's still there. Rudy's opening the door. Okay. So far. Now we take the first door to the right, huh? It'll be open, too. Go on. Try it. Like a barn. Look for the safe, Rudy. Is it there? Should be over in the corner. I see it. All right. Lead me to it. Come on, make it fast. That snooper gets back here every 20 minutes. It's right here, Laird. You feel it? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Shut that door, Agnes. What? Well, we come in. I didn't hear it shut. I got it. I... Can you open it, Laird? In a breeze. Just let me warm up my fingers. What's the door, Agnes? Don't worry about me. Anybody comes through it, I'm ready for him. Can you imagine a big transfer company owning a safe like this? The tumblers fall like bowling pins. Two more minutes and I'll have it. Agnes. Shut up, I hear it. Laird, somebody's at the door. What? Can't be. We come in at one five, didn't we? I must have got it mixed up, Laird. Rudy, stand back. Be careful with that one. Agnes. She got a light? No, he hasn't. Come on in, Grandpa. Welcome home. I told you I had this planned. Come on, give me your hand, Agnes. We've got to get out of here. Fast. Yeah, go on. Yeah, I'm going. 
take it down to the car fast. Agnes, take my hand. Sorry, lad, ain't got the time. Agnes, you're not leaving me here. Agnes, no, you can't. Can I? Watch me, just watch me. Oh, I forgot you're blind. Hey, hey, Agnes! Hey, hey, Agnes, come back! I can't see! Agnes, no! No! <laughs> Laird Morton, blinded safe cracker, deserted at the scene of a murder. We'll hear the next exciting development of this unusual case in just a moment. But first, let's bend an ear to one of those early morning sounds. One that says, rise and shine. Now, of course, sometimes you may not feel like rising and shining. Like most all of us, you may wake up feeling dull and headachey because you need a laxative. In that case, better tune in on this sound. And that's the sparkling sound of sal hepatica in a glass of water. And remember, unlike slow-acting laxatives, a sparkling glass of sal hepatica, when you get up, brings quick, gentle relief, usually within an hour. And that means you don't have to feel dull and headachey all day, waiting until night to take the laxative you needed in the morning. And if at the same time you're troubled with excess gastric acidity... Let Sal Hepatica help sweeten your stomach. So keep a bottle of Sal Hepatica handy. Then any time you need a laxative... Morning, noon, or night... See how much faster you feel better thanks to gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. Now back to Mr. District Attorney... The reporters are going to wait, Harrington. I'll say they are, Chief. Somebody tipped them to the angle in this thing. The angle, Harrington? Well, wouldn't you call it one, Miss Miller? A watchman gets killed. The prowl car boys come looking for him. And they find a blind man yelling his head off. Yes, as I put it together, the watchman must have been shot about one or one ten. Well, by that, Chief, he was supposed to punch his clock at one fifteen, and he didn't. Yes, I know. Then when he didn't report at one thirty, our men came in to investigate. <laughs> Some investigation. A dead watchman and Laird Morton blind. Oh, Chief, he's being booked downtown. They'll hold him in your office until we get there. Yes, thank you, Miss Miller. Yes. Well, Harrington, where do we start? No gun, huh, Chief? None so far. Did you tell the men to search the yard outside? Yeah, Brophy's out there, Chief. If Morton tossed the gun out the window, we'll find it. Well, how could he if he's blind? Eh, that, Miss Miller, is the the break-the-bank question. Brother, what a lot of talking he's going to do. I hope so. There's one thing in particular I'm curious about. Yeah, which one, Chief? If Morton is blind, what was he doing with a pair of binoculars around his neck? Rudy, cold. Oh, this one? There's only one. Shut it. How should I know? I ain't never been on a boat. Well, you are now. Like it? You uh, steer it with that? Sure. It isn't hard. Laird taught me. Okay, so we're moving. Now, where does it go? Any place. I figured we'd just keep cruising around for a while. You know, let things cool down. And what happens when this crate runs out of gas? We buy some more. It's easy. they got gas pumps all along the shore. Well, I still don't like it, Agnes. None of it. It's set up, I tell you. I got all the dough from Laird's warehouse job before. Well, I wondered why we didn't wait and grab the loot at the transfer office. What for? We got plenty. Besides, that it only stick the insurance sticks on us. They can get nasty, too, you know. This way we're clear. And, uh, what about Laird? He won't talk, if that's what you mean. Well, why won't he? You killed that watchman, Agnes, not him. What's he got to lose by talk? You think I didn't figure? Listen, so they found him with a dead duck, all right. He's blind. No court in the world would convict yeah, him. Yeah, but... knows that. So do the cops. I still say it would have been... I ain't finished. Finally, they got to find the gun, don't they? 
Well, that much from the movie. Hey, you still got it, haven't you? Certainly I got it. Right here. Come on, Rudy, relax. What is it Laird was always saying? Oh, yeah, get a load of that air. <laughs> Now listen to reason, Morton. That watchman was killed with a thirty-two caliber slug. He was. Look at the district attorney when you're talking, Morton. I'm tired of looking at him. We've been at this four hours. You're tired of looking, huh? With what? Are you really blind, Morton? You know, we'll be certain when the doctor gets here. Am I? What do you think, D.A.? I think you are. And so do I, Morton. Yeah, and I'll tell you how you got that way, too. From a cop's bullet right across your head where that scar is. That so? Well, we'll know after you're examined, Morton. I can't see your point in delaying things any longer. Anything you say, D.A.? Huh? What do you want to know? I'll read the last question, will you please, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. Um, listen to reason, Morton. That watchman was killed with a thirty-two caliber slug. All right, we'll start from there. Now, where's the gun, Morton? Who was with you, Morton? Now, come on, use your head, man. We've got you. Why shield the others? In a pig's eye, you got me. You were there, Sonny. Right there waiting for me. All right, smart guy. Go ahead on that. Go on, D.A. Tell a jury I did it. Tell them. And you can also tell them I'm blind. <laughs> For Pete's sake, Agnes, let's turn this thing towards land. Not till we need gas. Well, I'm going nuts, I tell you. Nothing but water. That's a nice crack. Huh? I'm here. Gee, I'll say you are. Just what do you mean by that? Oh, look, Agnes, we can't just spend the rest of our lives going nowhere. we got to get back to town. What for? Well, we're layered for one thing. Oh, now, look, I could call one of the boys, Agnes. They'll know if he's singing, maybe. He ain't, I told you. But we don't know, Agnes. Oh, it's driving me off my rock or not. I told you before, relax. I'm telling you, head this tub toward the show. No, thank you. Listen, you sleep brain little idiot. Go on, me. Get us back to hear me now. Go. Oh, Agnes, please. You look at my arm. I'll be black and blue. Will you listen to me, Agnes? Yes, it, Buster. I planned this show and I'm running it. You try any more rough stuff to help me, I'll toss you over the side. What time is it, Miss Miller? It's uh, 7.10, Chief. The day shift will be coming on at 7.30. Well, you ought to go on home. We can send for a stenographer downstairs. No, I'm all right, Chief, really. Is there any more coffee, Harrington? Yeah, plenty, Miss Miller, in that Oh, thanks. How about you, Morton? Feel like talking some more? Hey, Morton. The Chief's talking to you. Aren't you guys tired yet? <laughs> Oh, boy, we got lots of time left, Morton. All day today, tonight, tomorrow, the next night. Who shot the watchman, Morton? Where's the gun, Morton? I'll get it, Chief. How'd you lose your sight, Morton? Yes. Pulling away from that oh, warehouse yes, job? I thought you should give up, yes, Harrington. Me. Yes. That's the Harbor Patrol. Oh, hmm? let me have that. Yes, sir, right here. What's that, Miss Morton? Yes. The Harbor Hello. Patrol, Harrington. The chief right. phoned them about an hour ago from outside. You sure yes. now? Yeah. You sure? The number is 20Y205. Yes, I'll repeat it. 20Y205. What's the matter, Laird? No. You look excited. No, I have a boat stand by, will you please? We'll be right out. Harrington, we've got it. Come on, let's go. No, Agnes, put away the gun, will you? I, I didn't mean to get rough. Shut up, Emily. Huh? It's a boat. See it coming up from the port side. Where? There. See it? What the... Rudy, that's a patrol boat. I don't get it. What patrol? What are you talking about? 20, by 205. Stand by to be boarded. Stand by my foot. Get out of my way, Rudy. Cut your motors and stand by. You're under arrest. Agnes, it's cops. Listen to them, Agnes. Don't you think I can hear? Get back, Rudy. They're coming alongside. Uh, stand by. We're coming aboard. Watch it, Chief. Get back. Get back or I start shooting. Agnes, don't be a fool. The boat's loaded with police. Cover me, Harrington. I'm right with you, Chief. Easy, Billy. Keep her alongside. The Chief's going over. You rats, I told you to... 
Don't reach for that gun. Leave it on the deck. Okay, Chief. Here, wait till I cut these engines. Did I get her? Yeah, just her arm, I think, Harrington. Stand still, both of you. Now, listen, I didn't do anything. Shut up, was... Bertie. What, you, can't you see I'm bleeding? Yeah, we'll have you taken care of as soon as we get ashore. Take the man, Harrington. Right, Chief. No, you don't cut her. Bring her up a little, Billy. All set? Now, let's take this pair back to town. Your district attorney will return in just a moment with an explanation of his capture of Agnes and Rudy. But first... Tell me, who should know best the difference between toothpaste? Who should know best the difference between toothpastes? Why, your dentist, of course. Your dentist is the skilled guardian of your dental health, the authority on care of your teeth and gums. So ask your dentist about Ipana toothpaste and gentle gum massage. Many dentists recommend gum massage. What's more, a nationwide survey reveals that more dentists recommend Ipana toothpaste than any other dentifrice. And wait a moment. More dentists personally use Ipana than any other toothpaste. There's a difference between toothpastes, all right. And dentists know that difference. Ipana cleans teeth clean, safely too, without gritty abrasives. And followed by gentle massage, aids the health of your gums. Help your dentist help your smile. Begin now getting your new Ipana smile. Get Ipana toothpaste. Taste the freshness. Feel the cleanness. See the sparkle. See how you look with an Ipana smile. Ipana toothpaste. Now, here is your district attorney. I should like to report, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, that all three of this unusual trio, Laird Morton, his wife, and Rudy Bowie, will pay the full penalty demanded for the murder of the watchman in the transfer company office. I'll say they will, Chief, and that's the end of all those safe-cracking jobs on the list. Yes, Harrington, it is. Oh, Chief, I think you'd better explain just how you knew Agnes and Rudy were on a boat and which boat to go after. Well, we have Laird to thank for that, Miss Miller. As you know, when we found him, he had a pair of very good binoculars around his neck. Sure, Chief. A blind man with spyglasses. Exactly, Harrington. He intended to bring them to the boat for his wife and Rudy. Fortunately, this particular pair of binoculars was of a foreign make. I don't understand, Chief. Well, during the war and before, Miss Miller, all such foreign binoculars had to be registered with the proper authorities. Oh. And when we examined the pair on Laird, I checked the registration and found them assigned to his boat. With the Coast Guard number 20Y-205. Right, Chief? Right, Harrington. And then when the harbor police reported sight of the vessel, we went right out. You certainly did, Chief. Well, it just goes to show what you've said so often, Chief. The crooks don't have a chance of winning, ever. Oh, indeed. For no criminal or criminal gang has the resources of the forces of law and order. And now what about next week? Well, our story for next week, ladies and gentlemen, is another colorful and exciting dramatization. It's the case of the House of Death, and I invite you to join us for it. And so until then, thank you, and good night. Right dress! Yes, ma'am, the right dress for well-groomed hair. For your hair is Sentry. S-E-N-T-R-Y, Sentry Hair Cream. New liquid cream grooms hair without that unsightly, greasy look. What makes Sentry so different? Well, most hair creams are made with mineral oil, but not Sentry. Sentry's the only leading liquid hair cream made without mineral oil. No wonder Sentry grooms without an objectionable, greasy look. Guard your grooming with Sentry. S-E-N-T-R-Y. Sentry. Sentry hair cream. Your right dress. of all characters in tonight's dramatization are fictitious and in a resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington and Vicky Vola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden. The program is produced and directed by Edward A. Byron and written by Robert Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Remember, I pan a toothpaste for the smile of beauty. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Bristol Myers invites you to tune in again next week for Duffy's Tavern and Mr. District Attorney. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
by Pana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica present... Mr. District Attorney, Champion of the People, Defender of Truth, Guardian of our Fundamental Rights to Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. And it shall be my duty as District Attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Tonight's case of the unknown source is particularly vital, ladies and gentlemen, because it concerns a lawyer, or at least a man who was once entitled to practice law. Here, indeed, is an infuriating and sorry spectacle. A criminal whose mind was keen enough to attain the privilege of the bar, but warped to the point of degrading himself and his profession. We begin in the lobby of the Revere House, an inexpensive hotel catering to young career girls here in our city. Honey! What? Honey Bartlett, wait up! I just saw you get out of the elevator. Gee, have I got news. Oh, uh, it's you. Look, I, uh... Don't you remember, honey? We were talking last night with Soda Fountain downstairs. I'm Alice Stratton. Oh, well, sure, I remember, kid. I'm just in a hurry, that's all. Oh. That gentleman sitting over there is waiting for me. Oh, you got a date, huh? Gee, lucky you. Huh? Oh, well, yeah, you could say that, I guess. Well, I'll see you around, Alice. Oh, but I haven't told you. Remember I said I worked in the district attorney's office? Oh, you remember, honey? I told you when I came from Sheboygan, I got a job typing there. Yeah, yeah, well, that's just great, kid, but really, I've got to go. Oh, well, this won't take a minute, honey. Well, anyway, guess what? Yeah, what? Miss Miller, that's the district attorney's private secretary, she's gone on a vacation. And what do you think? I'm going to substitute for her. Isn't it thrilling? I'm going to be the district attorney's secretary. Oh, uh, wait a minute. You know what? Can you imagine? <laughs> I've never even seen him. And I'm going to be right there in his own private office while Miss Miller's on vacation. The DA himself? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I start tomorrow morning. Miss Miller came down to the bullpen where all the typists work and shows me herself. Mm -hmm, I see. What's the matter? You don't seem excited about it, honey. Gee, a wonderful break like that and everything. I'm just so thrilled. You've, uh, you've never seen the DA, hmm? Huh? And he's never seen you? He will tomorrow. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah, come on, um, Alice. Uh, come on with me. Well, come where, honey? I don't understand. Oh, it's just an idea. Oh, uh, Jimmy. Good evening, honey. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Jimmy, this is a girlfriend of mine here in the hotel. This is Alice, um... Alice Stratton. Alice Stratton. Meet Jimmy. I'm very pleased to meet you. Yes, thank you. Now then, honey, shall we be going? I uh, just wanted you to hear Miss Stratton's good news, Jimmy. Starting tomorrow morning, she's going to be private secretary to the district attorney. What? I'm so thrilled. His regular private secretary is on vacation, and I'm going to substitute for her. Are you really? Uh huh. I uh, knew you'd be interested, Jimmy. The D.A. has never seen Alice, and she's never seen him. You don't say. I just had to tell Honey about it. Honestly, I'm so excited. Why, it might lead to just anything. You're looking for something, Chief? Uh, yes, Harrington. Have you any idea where Miss Miller keeps my sunglasses? Your sunglasses, Chief? Yes. Usually puts them right here on my desk. <laughs> yeah, and... Don't ask me. Ain't they sending up some girl from the bullpen? Uh, no, to take Miss Miller's place while she's away. Yeah. Yes, I think she did say something about it. She said she was coaching the girl during lunch hour. Yeah, Miss uh, Stratton or something, wasn't it? Uh, something like that, oh. I believe. Oh. Yes, yes. Excuse me. May I come in? Well, yes, of course. What is it? Uh. Oh, you're the district attorney. Yes, I am. Is there something you wanted? And uh, you'd be Mr. Harrington. 
<laughs> oh, oh, I've heard about you. Oh, you have? Oh, I certainly have. <laughs> um, I'm Alice Stratton. Yeah, who? From the bullpen. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have been late my first morning, Mr. District Attorney, but honestly, this office is so upside down. I see. <clears throat> uh, you would work up here while Miss Miller's on vacation? Yes, it... sir. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Although, really, I don't see how Miss Miller got anything accomplished at all. Mm. Why, the files. Now, honestly... Miss Miller does okay. Oh, I'm sure she does, <laughs> Mr. Harrington, in her way. Huh? Uh, was there anything you wanted, Mr. District Attorney? Why, uh, <clears throat> yes, yes. If you'll take notes, please. Mm-hmm. I want to discuss the Nick Venice trial with Mr. Harrington. Uh, Nick Venice? Yeah, there's a folder on him over on that table, Mr. Stratton. Oh, thank you. You are nice. <laughs> I am? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, no. uh, let me see. Where were we? Uh, pretty boy Venice, Chief. Oh, yeah. You're going to trial on him this week. Yes, I hope to. I've got just about all I need. Well, it ought to be first degree, Chief. He sure put the bee on that girlfriend of his. I uh, found the folder. Oh, yes, thank you, Miss Stratton. And now, if you'll just take notes as we talk, please. Yes, sir, I will. Yeah, uh, who's defending him, Chief? Venice? Uh, Jimmy Appleton. Uh, he got Nick out on bail on a technicality. You mean this Appleton ain't disbarred yet? There's always hope. And as for Venice, I think we'll have clear sailing. Well, I'll be glad to check him off my list, Chief. He gives me the creeps. Yes, he ought to. Well, the material I've collected on him is absolutely astounding. The fellow's ignorant, rude, arrogant... Definitely below normal and intelligent. You're telling me I was downstairs the night they booked him, Chief. Why, that guy even wears perfume. Yes, I know. That's part of the picture. Big, uncouth, ignorant killer, dressed in a loud suit, a fifty-dollar necktie, and reeking of cheap violet perfume. <laughs> this is going to be some trial. Well, let's not underestimate it, however, Harrington. Well, Jimmy Appleton's a tricky defender, and that's a mild word for it. Appleton is that? That's right. Uh, you'll find the name in the folder. Oh, thank you. But I promise you this, Harrington. Appleton can pull all the tricks he knows in that courtroom, and I'm still going to nail Nick Venice cold. <laughs> Put the food on that table, Nick. No, no, no. That table over by the girl. I know, Jimmy. Here, huh? That's right. Now untie her, will you? Listen, what am I around here? You're my client, Nick, remember? In my hands, in that courtroom tomorrow, lies the answer to whether you live or die. You're getting paid for it, Shyster. Mm-hmm. You amuse me, Nick. Untie Miss Stratton, please. Yes. I yes. am. Excellent. Now the gag from her mouth, if you please. Hold still, baby. Yes. Get away from me. I'm oh, just untying you, baby. Hey. You're okay, you know. Ain't you, Jimmy? Okay. Get away from me. Help! Help! Oh, come now, Alice. I should think after 24 hours you'd be calmed down. There's food on that table. I demand to know the meaning of this. You can't keep me here like a prisoner. Oh, yes, he can, baby. Hey. You like violet perfume? Smell. Don't touch me. That will do, Nick. We leave Alice alone in here to enjoy her dinner. You can't do this, I tell you. Let me out of here. In due time, Alice. Until then, do try to relax, won't you? Come, Nick, this way. She's okay, you know. Honey smooth. Come back here. I demand you. What's she fussing about now? Oh, honey, my dear. I didn't realize you'd come home. Hiya, honey. Hi, Nick. Hey, your girlfriend. She's okay. How is she, Jimmy? Alice? Confused, I'd say. I hardly think she realizes what we've done. Neither does the D.A. Oh, it's a tough racket being a secretary again. I've been at it since nine o'clock this morning. He assumes you're Alice Stratton, of course. He does. Good. Now then, about our client here. Me? You needn't bother trying to follow this, Nick. Rest assured, I have your interests at heart. A chicken there, you know, she's... All... Later, Nick. Well, honey? We worked on Nick's case all day. With you? Sure, with me. There's the envelope. It contains what I want? Yeah, the works. His brief, copies of his notes, copies of his plan for trial, description of all his evidence, everything. And I made an extra copy of everything I typed for him. Splendid, honey, splendid. I, um, uh, I've been a busy girl, Jimmy. Do I get a reward? My dear child. Can I go in and talk to her, No. Jimmy? Maybe she's lonesome. I or said something. no, Nick. As for your question, honey, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, keep on being Alice Stratton, my love, and you'll get... Everything your heart desires. Oh, you 
be surprised, Mr. Harrington. Yes. Why, I've saved every clipping about you from the newspapers. You have, Miss Grant? Mm-hmm. I certainly have. Oh, you'll laugh, but I've even got a picture of you pasted on my dresser at my hotel. No kidding. Mm-hmm. A picture of me. <laughs> Why, I told you you'd laugh. <laughs> Incidentally, my name's Alice. Yeah. Well, oh, oh. <clears throat> oh, you're here, Hank. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, had some calls, Mr. District Attorney. Yeah, how did it go, sir? In just a minute, Harrington. Oh, Miss Stratton. Yes, sir? Will you tell whoever's waiting I'll be delayed, please? I want to talk to Mr. Harrington. You'll be delayed. That's yes, right. sir, I'll tell them right away. Hey. You look worried, Chief. Nothing went wrong over at that courthouse, did it? Harrington, I simply can't understand it. I had to ask the court to recess until tomorrow morning. Under Nick Venner's trial? Yes. Why, I thought that was all set up, Chief. Yes, it was. And that's just the point. But so help me, Jimmy Appleton was prepared for every move I made. What? I tell you, it was uncanny. Almost as if the man had read my mind. Why, he even knew I intended to put the cab driver on the stand first. What? Oh, Chief, he couldn't have. Why, he only decided that yesterday. Well, he knew it. Yes, and he had prepared notes on his objections. I tell you, Harrington, it was beyond understanding. Hey, you got a delay, you said. Huh? Well, just until tomorrow morning. But I don't get it, Harrington. No, I just don't understand it at all. He burned up, Jimmy. <laughs> His face was a sight. Oh, that's delightful, honey. <laughs> then how did he spend the afternoon? Oh, he made a whole new set of plans for when court opens in the morning. Do you have a copy? Yes, I put it on your desk. Wonderful. Simply wonderful. <laughs> oh, and this Harrington character. He was telling the DA about some raid he's going to pull tonight. Oh? Yeah. He's going to knock over the Green Hat Club at 9 o'clock. That's interesting. Remind me to call Lou Woodruff. Mm-hmm. I'm almost sure I can sell him that information. Hi, honey. Hi, Scheister. Well, if it isn't our boy, hi, Nick. Thought I told you to stay off the street, Nick. Been gone an hour. I was getting the papers. Hey, my picture's all over. I've seen the papers. Now, will you leave us alone, please? Honey and I want to work. Not in there. I was just going to see if she's thirsty or something. Oh, Jimmy, how's the kid, by the way? Somewhat difficult, I'm afraid. Oh. Can I, Jimmy? I won't bother her or nothing. What? Oh, yes, go on, go on. She's some dish, you know. Got a red dress, too. I like red. Now then, honey, I think first we'll go over the eminent district attorney's plan for tomorrow. Hey. Hey, little girl, you, you sleep or something? What do you want? No need to get on your high horse, sister. Just came in to talk to you. What do you want? What in the world is happening to me? Come on, come on. Sit down and be comfortable. Oh, please. Sit down, why don't you? Hey. Hey, you like perfume? Smell. Y your name is Nick, isn't it? You mean you ain't never heard of me? I'm Nick Venice. Oh, listen, Nick, you can help me. Please help me, Nick. I'm scared. Ah, that's no way to be. Little girl like you. You're okay, you know, kid? You will help me. You'll tell me what they're going to do to me? You got nice arms, kid. You're nice and tan. Oh, please. I'll move I don't... away. I said don't I... pull away from me like that. You're hurting my wrist. Go on, go on, pull. Oh. <laughs> I could break your wrist just by squeezing my fingers together. I said, help! Help! Hey, shut up. You want to get Jimmy Sorpin? Help! You lousy little cat, shut up. I won't shut up. I won't. Help! Why, you... No, will you leave me alone? Why, you think they slap me in the kitchen. Will you come back here? Get out of here. Get out. Nobody slaps Nicky Venice, little girl, but nobody. Come here. I didn't mean it. Oh, please. Please, won't you leave me alone? You rotten little cat. You ain't going to hit nobody again. Oh! Dumb dame, smack me, will you? What in the world's going on in here? I... Nick! Honey, come in here. Listen, Jimmy, this crazy mink, Nick, she's why... slapping... Honey! What's the matter, Jimmy? Did you what? Hey, what's the idea? What happened to her? I've been trying to tell you. Guess got mad or something, Jimmy. Will it... Will it be okay? Okay. You blundering boob, this girl is dead. Stratton, innocent victim in a monstrous plot, dead. 
We'll hear what happens next in this unusual case in just a moment. But first, here's an important question. Tell me, who should know best the difference between toothpaste? Who should know best the difference between toothpastes? Why, just one man. Your family dentist. For through study and experience, your dentist has become your authority on the care of your teeth, the health of your gums. So don't depend on just anyone. Ask your dentist about Ipana toothpaste and gentle gum massage. So many dentists recommend massage. And very important to you. A nationwide survey also shows more dentists recommend Ipana toothpaste than any other dentifrice. And more dentists personally use Ipana than any other toothpaste. Yes, Ipana wins wholehearted approval from those who know best the difference between toothpastes. The nation's dentists. Ipana's unique formula actually stimulates gum circulation. And with gentle gum massage, aids the health of your gums, the brilliance of your smile. Help your dentist help your smile. Begin now getting your new Ipana smile. Taste the fresh flavor. Feel the cleanness. See the sparkle. See how you look with an Ipana smile. Remember, for healthier gums, for brighter teeth, for a cleaner breath, Ipana toothpaste and massage. And now back to Mr. District Attorney. Well, there she is, Chief. Nobody's touched the body since I threw a blanket over it. You've been here how long, Harrington? About 20 minutes, Chief. I tried to get in touch with you right away, but... Strange. A girl dressed like that in a district like this? Yeah. She's no waterfront character, Chief. About uh, 23 or so, wouldn't you say? Yes, yeah, something like that. Have you checked the neighborhood, Harrington? I was doing that when you drove up, Chief. We can't get much on tire marks. All the trucks in the south end of town dump here into the river. Yes, I know. Of course, the dame's little, whoever she is, and somebody could have carried her from that alleyway, got scared, and didn't even drop her into the water. Yes. What about the cause of death? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine, Chief. Look, she's got a terrific bump here on the back of her head, mm. and it looks like a broken jaw. I bet either one of them could have done it. Yes, well, we'll get the examiner's opinion when he gets here. What about identification? Not a thing, Chief. No purse, no gloves, nothing. Hmm. They even tore the label out of her jacket. Oh? And that's another reason I thought you ought to have a look. This is strictly a professional job. Yes, yes, it seems to be. Well, let's get to work on it, Harrington. <laughs> I tell you, I just tapped her a little, Jimmy. I didn't mean no harm. Harm? The girl's dead, Nick. Don't you understand that? You're on trial for murdering one girl and you kill another. Nobody knows it, Jimmy. We got rid of the body, didn't we? I know it, my friend, and don't forget that. Yeah? So what do I pay you for? I am an attorney, Nick, not your personal bodyguard. I resent a thing like this happening in my apartment. So go ahead and resent. I got to... That is beside the point. I've got to come up against the district attorney in court in the morning. This kind of thing unnerves me. You'll take care of the DA. Honey got you all the dope, didn't she? You live a simple life, Nick. How you've managed to survive is remarkable. <laughs> I got a smart lawyer. My dear boy, I hope and pray you're right. <laughs> Yes, Doctor. And if I'm not here, Harrington will be. Yes. Yes, call as soon as you can, will you please? Oh, and one thing more. Will you send up that report you did on the victim in the Nick Venice murder? Yes. Yes, that's right. The waitress. Yes, thank you, Doctor. Chief. Oh, come in, Harrington. I was just going to phone for you. Chief, I got something that's... Yeah, well, I haven't much time, here. No, Chief, listen to this. That yes. kid we found down by the river last night? Yes, yes. Skippy took a set of fingerprints off the body, so I checked him against the master file. And? Get this, Chief. That girl is Alice Stratton. Alice Stratton? Yeah. 
Harrington, what are you talking about? Sir, help me, Chief. It's true. The kid we found dead last night is supposed to be your secretary while Miss Miller's on vacation. Yes, but that's impossible. Miss Stratton is right outside. I was just going to send for her. Chief, it's a positive identification. You know yourself, all the employees around here have their prints in the master. Yeah, you checked carefully? Carefully? I checked four times. I couldn't believe it myself. Well, then this girl outside is... Hey, wait a minute. Chief, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Mm -hmm. About how Jimmy Appleton knows so much about what goes on in this office lately? Yes, find out if Appleton is connected with that raid that backfired last night. I did, Chief. Yes? He's a personal friend of Woodruff, the guy that owns the joint. Well, this is beginning to come clean, isn't it, Harrington? (laughs) Appleton's success in court and the empty gambling club when you staged the raid? Clean? I'm going to pin that little girl to the wall. Get her in here, Chief. Let's find out what this is. No, no, let's wait, Harrington. Let's wait. Wait? Yes. With that dame out there spying on you, Chief? Why, there's no telling who she is. We can tell, all right. I think we'll play this young lady right into our hands. I can't believe it, honey. Are you sure you copied this accurately? Jimmy, I tell you, he said it himself. He dictated the memo and then went out to the courthouse. Leaving Harrington in the office? He's still there, I guess. I said I had a sick headache and had to come home. What's it all about, Jimmy? I didn't get it. It seems, Nick, we're about to have a visit from the district attorney. Yeah? At your place? So he informed Honey when he dictated a memo this morning. Are you sure, Honey? I tell you, he said he was coming here at 8 o'clock tonight with new evidence against Nicky. Me? What's the bum up with me? Your life, Nicky. I don't like this. I don't like it at all. You think I do? It's after eight now. You'd better slip out the back way. Certainly be confused to find you here. Confused? Are you kidding? Hey, somebody's at the door. Oh, Jimmy. All right, be calm, honey. No, don't go. You might have someone posted downstairs. But I can't stay here. Get into the other room and keep the door shut. Go on, dear. Hurry. For Pete's sake, watch it, Jimmy. This isn't good. What do you want me to do? Just sit still, Nick, and don't say a word. Yes? Why, it's my esteemed colleague, Mr. District Attorney. May I come in, Mr. Appleton? It's late, I know. Late? Nonsense. Oh, you know my client, of course. Vividly. As a matter of fact, Nick, it's about you that I've come. What's that mean, Jimmy? This is a business call, then. I'm disappointed. Oh, you won't be, Appleton. I have here a rather interesting document. A completely new kind of evidence against Nick. In this envelope. May I see it? At this time, no. Sorry. Let Jimmy see it. What's that, Venice? You heard me. Hand it over to him. Nick, put down that gun. Yes, Venice. Isn't it unwise to draw a gun in your circumstances? I said hand it over. I'll show you why I got this gun, wise guy. I'm getting sick of this, see? Now we're going to play this game my way. With a gun. That's right, Doc. They sure have been waiting here ever since the chief left. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I got that right. No, no, that's all he wants to know. Huh? <laughs> do I know what to do now? Doc, we got this one timed to the second. I put down my hands, Nick. I assure you, I'm not armed. Keep him in the sky. I need hardly tell you, D.A., I'm not responsible for my client's actions. I wash my hands of him. You pipe down too, Shyster. What do you intend to do now, Nick? Or may I offer a suggestion? Huh? Ask the young lady to come out of that bedroom. Oh, there's no need to look surprised, Appleton. I mean, Miss, uh, Miss... Well, there's a question about her name. Honey, Nick, shut up. I'm sick of this. I'm pulling out of here, but good. Hey! Well, don't tell me you got rid of it. The... Oh. Well, Miss Stratton, you do seem to get around. Jimmy, what's the idea? Nick's making a fool of himself, D.A. I give you my word, I know nothing of all this. Nothing. You pipe down. I gotta take a powder. You got any dough? Dough? For what? And Nick is in the act of escaping, I think you might say, young lady. Oh? Oh, I have a suggestion, Nick, if you're interested. Yeah, what? There's a rather interesting memo in that envelope I brought with me. Why not read it? Nuts to it. I look shy through. I want to tell you. You know I ain't got any cash around here. Did you say memo? 
What memo? One you couldn't have copied for Mr. Appleton here, Miss Stratton. I had it prepared after you left. Open it, honey. Uh, this? Yes, this will interest all of you, I know. You too, Appleton. Oh, Jimmy. What's in it, honey? Some more about me? Jimmy, listen. Yes, dear. What is it? Memo to James Appleton, Nick Venice, and to my secretary. Yes, that would be you, Miss Stratton. If you'll open the door, Mr. Harrington is waiting for you. You are all under arrest for murder. Flash now to hear it. You're going to put away the gun, Nick? Oh, Harrington, you outside? Right here in the hall, Chief. The joint's surrounded. Well, Nick? Oh, that's better. It's much better. All right, Harrington. Oh, and uh, will you open the door, please, honey? You know, a competent secretary always does. And closes it behind her. Your district attorney will return in just a moment with an explanation of the clues in tonight's case. But first, do you know what this... (laughs) Now, lots of people, that sound says it's morning again with a good day ahead. But of course, that doesn't mean every morning. For now and then, most all of us wake up feeling dull and logy because we need a laxative. And that's when another sound is so welcome. Yes, that's the sparkling sound of sal hepatica in a glass of water. Sal hepatica. Unlike slow-acting laxatives, a sparkling glass of sal hepatica, when you get up, brings quick, gentle relief, usually within an hour. That means you don't have to feel dull and logy all day, waiting until night to take the laxative you needed in the morning. And if at the same time you're troubled with excess gastric acidity... Sal Hepatica helps sweeten your stomach. So keep a bottle of Sal Hepatica handy. Then any time you need a laxative... Morning, noon, or night. See how much faster you feel better thanks to gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. And now, here is your district attorney... I'm happy to report, ladies and gentlemen, that all three members of this unusual trio, Honey, Appleton, and Nick Venice, will pay the full penalty demanded for the murder of Alice Stratton. Yeah, and I'm happy to say that Miss Miller will be back at her job next week, Chief. (laughs) Boy, what a dame that Honey was. Fortunately, Harrington, we've seen the last of her. Hey, Chief, why don't you explain just how you put all the pieces in this puzzle together? Well, actually, we didn't connect the murder of Alice Stratton to Nick Venice until the examiner reported traces of strong perfume on her body. And not a scent she was wearing, but... One that had apparently clung to her arms for, uh, from contact with another person. Violet perfume, aren't you? Yes, exactly, Harrington. The same cheap scent Venice reeked of. The same, I might add, that we found on the waitress he'd murdered some weeks before. Sure, and on top of that, there was a nice, clean set of Nicky's prints dug into Alice's wrist, aren't you? Yes, Harrington, and that just about closed the case. I'll say it did. Oh, hey, Chief, what about next week? Well, our story for next week, ladies and gentlemen, is the case... Of the athletic louse. Timely and dramatic. It's one I'm sure you'll enjoy, and I invite you to join us for. And so until then, thank you, and good night. Tell me, when you think about shaving, do you worry about your whiskers or your face? Better just forget your whiskers and think about your face. How your face feels and looks is what matters. To get a more comfortable feeling, a smoother shave, try Ingram Shaving Cream. That rich Ingram lather on your brush helps condition your face for the razor. You get cool, comfortable, soothing shaves. Remember, comfort means coolness. Coolness means Ingram. I-N-G-R-A-M. Ingram, the cooler shaving cream. And a pair of clever crooks in the case of murder a la carte. I invite you to hear Mr. District Attorney, which follows immediately on NBC. WMAQ NBC in Chicago. The big story tonight at nine is about the missing chemist who was found by reporter Ike McAnally. His newspaper big story was the winner of the $500 big story award. Then stay tuned at 9.30 for Curtain Time. 
and at 10 o'clock for Supper Club. I Pano Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica present Mr. District Attorney, Champion of the People, Defender of Truth, Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Sal Hepatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. And it shall be my duty as District Attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Mr. District Attorney, and tonight, the case of murder a la carte. Hey, Stanley, will you cut it out? Stanley, you boob! Yeah, Hannah? For the love of Pete, stop that hammering. I'm trying to concentrate on the racing form. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. I was just finishing this here little ran house. Yeah, yeah, you and your bill. Finishing a what? This ran house, Hannah, you see? I, I put a number five hinge in the bottom so you could clean it out. You're nuts. You know what, Stanley? A ran house. What for? Well, we won't always live in this small apartment, dear. I want to have so many things ready when we get a home in the country. I swear I married an idiot, hammering, sawing his kisser full of nails. Sit still, I'll get it. It might be a wren. Oh, I'll, I'll use the sandpaper, dear. It won't disturb you. Hello? Hannah? Nikki. Oh, hi, Nikki. I gotta talk fast, Hannah. I have to get back to my table. Yeah, I'm listening. Mr. and Mrs. Mallory are here for dinner again. You got the name? Mallory. I just brought them a bottle of Cordon Rouge on the house. Understand? How long will it take him to drink it? An hour at least. Probably more. All right, what's the address? Jefferson Towers, apartment 16. You got that? Right. Look for a mink, silver fox cape, and a platinum dyed stove. Oh, yes, and a ruby necklace. She is not wearing it tonight. Not bad, Nicky. Send them another bottle. They'll need it when they get home. That's my girl. Good luck now. Bye, Nicky. Hey, useless. Stanley. Hey, look, Hannah, you see how it would hang in a tree? Like a dead duck, darling. Now get shaved and dressed, will you? We're going out on a job. You got nothing on the street, Harrington? No, not a thing, Chief. I even covered some of the boys on the retired list. Well, it doesn't help, does it? <laughs> I'd counted on picking up a lead. Well, in the first place, there's no pattern in these robberies. Take the fur coat boys now. They wouldn't be seen dead heisting jewelry. I know. Still, that's what's happening. Yeah. I had Mr. and Mrs. Mallory in here an hour ago. Oh, the ones that got robbed last night? Yes, that's right. They had dinner at some nightclub, and when they got back to the Jefferson Towers, it was all over. Mm. What's the loot? I ain't seen the list. A mink coat, silver fox cape, the first stole, and ruby necklace, mm. same as the others. Oh, oh, boy, the papers ain't going to be fun. Mm. This is five in a row in all riches. Yes. Oh, golly, Chief, I... Sorry, I took so long. Oh, it's quite all right, Miss Miller. How did the meeting go? Well, the meet, after... meet, What meeting, Miss Miller? Your poker club again? I'm out for spring baseball practice, Harrington. <laughs> didn't you know? <laughs> no, I went to the Girl Scouts luncheon. Oh. Oh, they're a wonderful organization. This is their 37th anniversary, you know. Yes, yes. Yes, it is a fine group, Miss Miller. After we finish, I'd like to hear about their plans. All right. I'll get my notebook. Here. Yeah, I wish there was something to take notes about. Well, our best bet now is to find that pattern, Harrington. Mm. Five robberies, all of them prominent or wealthy residents. Yeah, all of them good addresses, too, Chief. Yes, and in all five cases, expensive loot. Mm. Uh, let's have the five folders, will you please, Miss Miller? I was just getting them. Here you are. Thank you. Well, all right, Harrington. Five in a row is plenty, so let's get to work. <laughs> Right, that's 700 apiece on the platinum and an ace each on the necklace. All right? 
Well, you should have argued with the fence, Nicky. When my dad was alive, he did better. It's tough, Hannah. The papers are full of it. Well, you still should have argued. One night, I saw my old man reach over and put the Jap choke on a fence. He huh? raised the price over. What, dear? The Jap choke. I'll show you sometime, Stanley. Remind me. Got a new deal coming up, Nicky? That's what I wanted to discuss, Hannah. I think now we quit. We what? I told you in the beginning it couldn't be for long. Even now, the district attorney might suspect the Regency Club. In a pig's eye, he might. Why should he? He can't think it is just coincidence all five times we get a haul, they are having dinner at the club. Yes, and at one of my tables. Why not? It is the ritziest joint in town. Yeah, and you're the most popular head waiter. Uh, Hannah, look, could I say something? Not I now. Wait. It's too good to give up, Nicky. You know that. But, now, no. I haven't finished. Look how simple it is. You watch your regular customers, make a list of the furs and hey, stuff. Look, Hannah, what Will you be quiet? They even make it easy, Nicky. They sign their dinner checks. We get their address. I know all that. Well, what could be sweeter? The night Mrs. Richwich leaves something big at home, you call us. We get dressed up, go over with the passkey, and get it. I'm trying to tell you the DA has asked to see all the Regency Club employees tomorrow for questioning. Well, let him question. Turn on the head waiter act for him, baby. He won't understand a word you're saying. Hey, look, In a I minute, was... Stanley. As long as we look good to the doorman, yeah, and can work the locks while we're in, Nicky. Now, what are you yapping about? Well, uh, uh, I think Nicky is right, Hannah. We could quit now and get a nice house in the country. What? Oh, you should see the plans I got, Nicky. I'm going to do the whole kitchen myself in pine. Stanley. With built-in sink and cupboards, Nicky. You know... Yeah, dear? Get lost. But I was Beat it, will you? Go down to your workbench and whip up a birdhouse. All right. As a matter of fact, I will. <sighs> Excuse me, Nicky. Uh, sure. Go ahead, Stanley. You know, one of these days, Hannah, you'll go too far. <sighs> you don't treat Stanley very nice, Hannah. Oh, why should I? He's happy with a chisel and a bucket of nails. It's good for a man to have a hobby. I suppose. Maybe. What's yours, Nicky? Mine? Sit still. I'll light us a cigarette. Stanley is, um, in the basement? Here. Yeah, he makes things. You're not smoking? One's enough. I'll take drags off yours. Good Lord. What is that? So help me someday, I'll hit him with his own hammer. Stanley, turn that thing off, you big-headed jerk! Stanley! What was that, dear? I said turn that thing off! Well, it was just my power saw, Hannah, I'm sorry. I don't care what it was, you make that racket again, I'll wrap it around your skull. Heaven is wrens. Now... Let's see, where were we? And uh, about pulling any more oh, jobs. Oh, we'll pull more jobs, Nicky. You know we will. We got lots to do, you and me. Come on, honey. Sit down, make yourself at home. You know, it can happen to anyone, even to you. Tonight or tomorrow, you may get one of those dull headaches that leaves you feeling miserable and out of sorts. And all just because you need a laxative. So remember, like millions of others, you too can get gentle relief with Sal Hepatica. A glass of sparkling Sal Hepatica gives you gentle relief. Welcome relief day or night. Sal Hepatica, taken when you get up, brings gentle, speedy relief. Usually within an hour. And at the same time, if you're troubled with excess gastric acidity, Sal Hepatica sweetens your stomach. So get a bottle of Sal Hepatica, America's most famous saline laxative, at any drug counter and keep it handy. Then, day or night, get feeling right with gentle, sparkling Sal Hepatica, the laxative that suits your convenience. Sal Hepatica. <laughs> Now, as I understand it, Mr. Sylvania, there are several head waiters at the Regency Club. Is that right? Antonio, Frank, Luigi, and that is myself, Nicky. Nicky, I see. Uh, you know Mr. and Mrs. Mallory, do you, Nicky? Pardon? 
I don't need to tell you that we're working on a series of robberies, do I? Mr. and Mrs. Mallory were at the Regency Club in the night their apartment was entered. So? Oh, that is too bad. You do remember them? I remember all of my good customers and never forget. I see. And the Fultons? Fulton? Yeah, let's try some of these other names. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Fulton, Mr. and Mrs. Owen Conroy, Mr. and Mrs. Abington, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Nathan Sims. You know these people, do you? But I have told you, I know all of my customers. Please, I work very hard. I have done nothing. nothing. Well, there's no reason to think you have. I'm merely interested in your cooperation. Pardon? I say, if you can help me, I'll appreciate it. Oh, any time at all, sir. A yes. pleasure. Huh? You come to the club for dinner. I will Let... arrange it personally, sir. Let... Yes, we start with bouillabaisse, a chicory salad with romaine, a crown, a roast, a lamb. Yes, yes, that'll be very nice, I'm sure. Oh. Pardon? You, um, you may go now, Mr. Sylvania. If I need any more help, I'll call. Oh, you are most kind, of Mr. District Attorney. Merci, merci beaucoup. All right, don't mention it. Uh, Dorothy, if Miss Miller and Harrington are finished in the other room, ask them to come in here, would you please? Oh, they are. Oh, fine. Thank you. Come in. I just called Dorothy to see if you were free. Oh, yeah, sure, I'm free and losing my mind, Chief. Those waiters talk everything but English. Harrington isn't kidding, Chief. I don't know whether I was taking notes or ordering dinner. Yes, yes, I had a little difficulty myself. (laughs) I got this much, though, Harrington. Yeah? In every single case, the people who were robbed dined at the Regency Club the night it happened. Yeah, I got that too, Chief. I have the notes on it. Well, all right. There's our pattern, then. So let's see what the pattern makes. The name is Phillips, Hannah. Mr. and Mrs. Austin Phillips. They've been customers of mine for years. How big a score? I haven't got it set yet, but it looks fine. Every time she comes in, she's wearing a different coat. Rocks? There must be dozens. Diamond bracelets, rings, solid gold cigarette cases. It's uh, very nice. (laughs) And you wanted to quit. Aren't you glad I talked you out of it? I'm glad about a lot of things, Hannah. The only worry is... I know, Stanley. He would care, would he? If he knew about us? What if he does? I hope you know how to handle him. Oh, don't worry. I do. Like a baby... (laughs) Hey, uh, Hannah, did you see my cross-cut saw? I had it just as... Ah, Nicky, I'm glad you're here. It's uh, good to see you, Stanley. Uh, You're looking for a saw? Oh, no, that can wait. I haven't even told Hannah, but I've been waiting to talk to you. Both of you. So, but it is so late, Stanley. Some other time. No, I I really must be gone. Hold it, Nicky, and drop the accent. You want to talk about what? Sandpaper? Oh, no. No, I've I've been thinking, Hannah. With what? Now, look, I warn you, don't treat this lightly. Oh, I, I let you have your way, I know, but this time I'm serious. Hey, Stan, old man. Let him Maybe say it, Nicky. Well, I mean, all this in the papers, the employees of the club being questioned and all, I've come to a decision. I'll be a monkey's uncle. About what? We're quitting, Hannah, not after the next one, not tomorrow or the next day, but now. You kill me, Stanley. Go back to your birdhouse. No, no, no. I, I, I mean it. We got, we got money now. Well over three thousand dollars. Well over thirty cents is more like it. Look, and I happen to know. What's more, with the money, we, we could buy a nice trailer. A nice what? Second hand, I think. If it needs attention, I could fix it up. Hey, did you ever see the inside side of a trailer, Nick? Me? All you can do wonders with a hammer and a nail, snug as a bug in a rug. Are you through now? No, no, Hannah, I'm not. Of course, it won't be like a house in the country, but that will come in time. Now, listen to me. In a me. moment, in a moment. It has, uh, it has advantages, you know. Travel about, meet people. You know, I've always wanted to see Yellowstone National Park. Just see it? And come for the course. You can have that in a trailer, Hannah. You can. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I thought a heavy gingham of some kind at the windows, you know, gives all the privacy in the world. On wheels. Oh, now, look, Hannah, you needn't be flipping. After all, half of what we've taken in is mine. All right, brace yourself, Buster. I've got news for you. Uh, perhaps I should go. Just stay put, Nicky. He just don't know the time of day. 
I think I do, Anna. Yeah, well, Mr. Trailer, we ain't got any three grand. At this exact minute, we ain't got a lousy 200 bucks. What did you say? What do you think I've been playing the races with? Shavings? You're lying. Am I? That's Nicky. I'm sorry you lost so much, Hannah. Well, I'm not. Easy come, easy go. My old man taught me that. Oh, you thieving little swine! Hey, no. Hannah, are you hurt? Hannah! Oh, look, Hannah, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to do that. I, I just lost my temper. Get out of my way, Nicky. Hannah, I said I didn't mean to slap you. Hannah, be... Be careful, you... Come here. Let me go, Anna. Anna. Stay out of this. Anna, please, you're hurting me. Yellowstone Anna. National Anna. Park. Anna, let go of my throat. How do you like this, Gingham? How, how do you like this? Anna, let go of his neck. You don't know what you're doing. Don't I? He... He's dead? He should be. The Jap choke works every time. The one your father taught you. Pop taught me a lot. Like, like easy come, easy go, Nicky. Remember that, will you? Now that you're going to hang around. <laughs> Harrington, I've seen enough. Hmm? Have one of the men throw a blanket over the body. Yeah, all right, Chief. You agree with me? Yes, yes, there's no question about it. Death due to strangulation, I'd say. Uh, the medical examiner's on his way. Good, Mr. Spillian. How would you say the body got down here in the railroad yards, Harrington? Ah, it was brought here. There's no sign of a struggle underground. Yes, yes, that's my idea, too. And in a car, I think. Sure. If he'd been hurled from a train, he'd never have landed over here. Oh, excuse me, is there any preliminary identity? I have to make out the card. No, not a thing so far, Miss Miller. I see. Harrington? Well, it don't look like there's going to be much either. Mm. Nothing in the pockets, labels torn out of his suit and clothes. Yes, yes, I noticed that. Sure, they even tore the laundry marks off his shirt, looks like. Yes, and took his ring. Yeah. As you can see, the line on his finger where he wore one. Ah. Well, I still don't buy it as a plain mugging. I doubt that, too. Especially when identification's been so carefully destroyed. Yeah. You know, the neck is what gets me. Hmm? How do you die like that? Oh, excuse me. The examiner's arriving up on the ramp. Oh, thank you, Miss Miller. Well, let's let him get to work, shall we? This one may be more of a puzzle than we know. Hello? Anna? Nikki? Any news? Ah, oh, forget it. I've been waiting for the call about the job. Mr. and Mrs. Phillips are here in the club now. Oh, wonderful. They just ordered dinner, and they want to make an 840 curtain at the theater. Oh, what a break, Nikki. She isn't wearing the chinchilla, is she? She's wearing the mink. The chinchilla must be at home. I'll have it in one hour. Be careful, baby. They have a butler, you know. He may be home. Just so that coat's at home, honey. That's all I need to know. door open. Mr. and Mrs. Phillips are not at home this evening. If you... You got any more questions, bud, or can't you talk? No, thank you. Tell Mr. and Mrs. Phillips I'll be out at three. Yes, thank you. Chief, can't we do something with those reporters? They're tearing their hair outside. Well, not for the moment, I'm afraid, Harrington. Any reports from the morgue, Miss Miller? Yes, sir, just now. Yes? Dr. Colgan finished his examination of the Phillips butler. And? 
The same as the man in the railroad yards. Death due to strangulation. The same discoloration in the neck? Oh, he didn't say. He's sending up his report. Well, tell him not to bother. I'm going down for more. All right. You want me, Chief? Well, I want to set up something else first, Harrington. I got all I needed from Mr. Phillips. Yeah? Not only have all the victims in these robberies had dinner at the Regency Club, but it seems they all had the same waiter captain. Which one, Chief? Well, fortunately, Miss Miller, one you and Harrington didn't see. Oh, as for the two whom you did question, I'm arranging to have them take a vacation. I don't get it, Chief. What's the plan? Well, one that might work, Harrington. However, it's going to take a long time. Dentists say the Ipana way works. Yes, dentists say the Ipana way works. In thousands of reports from all over the country, eight out of ten dentists say the Ipana way promotes healthier gums and brighter teeth. Listen, here's the professionally approved Ipana dental care, the Ipana way. First of all... Between regular visits to your dentist, brush all tooth surfaces with Ipana toothpaste at least twice a day. And then... Massage gums the way your dentist advises. Remember, Ipana's special formula actually helps stimulate gum circulation. Yes, for healthier gums and brighter teeth, the Ipana way. Dentists say the Ipana way works. Ipana toothpaste with a sparkling flavor that leaves your mouth fresher, your breath cleaner. Ipana, the toothpaste more dentists personally use and recommend than any other. So ask your dentist about Ipana and massage. A good dentifrice, like a good dentist, is never a luxury. Make the Ipana way your way to healthier gums, brighter teeth, and Ipana smile. Get Ipana toothpaste. All right, so I had to take care of the butler. We got the coat, didn't we? It won't be easy to get rid of Hannah. The fences all say chinchilla is too rare. It takes time to dispose of it. All right, so we do another. Now? But we... All right, all right, hold it. Sure, it's getting hot, Nicky. I know that. Very hot. And I agree, we should quit. Go somewhere, like you said. But that is just what I'm saying, But Anna. we can't go without dough, can we? You just said it'll take weeks to get the cut on the Phillips coat. But I... So we do just one more, Nicky. One big one, and we go. Now get somebody lined up, baby, and we're free. Good evening, sir. It is a pleasure to see you again this evening. Well, what do you know about that, Edith? He remembers us from last week. Oh, how nice. It is a pleasure, Mrs. Johnson. And if I may say so, sir. Yes, uh, a Nicky, wasn't it? A Nicky, sir. Good. And the management has suggested that if you wish to sign your dinner checks, it will be a pleasure. Well, well, now isn't that nice? Just sure. Send the bills to the apartment, Nicky. Apartment 20, the Westport Arm. A pleasure, sir. Good. May I suggest oysters for Madame to start? The peconic salts are excellent. No, I think a hot consomme, please. It's been so cold. Oh, Harry, would you mind? I'll just put my mink over my shoulder. Oh, allow me, madame. Oh, thank you. And a hot consomme. Yes, please. It will be a pleasure. Was the venison all right, Mr. Johnson? Oh, oh, oh my favorite meat, Nicky. Even better than last week. Uh, well, my dear, are uh, you ready to go? Yes, Harry, we ought to get home. Oh, will you ask Nicky to get my coat, please? It's the sable there on that chair. For tonight, Mr. Johnson, may I suggest the rack of lamb? Well, it sounds good, Nicky. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Did we have lamb here the other night, dear? Well, Harry, anything that won't take too long. We haven't much time, you know. May I inquire if you are attending the theater again this evening? <laughs> oh, gracious, no. Not dressed like this, Nicky. Mr. Johnson insists on going to the boxing matches. Well, you're going to like them, dear. It's a great card tonight. Probably last until midnight, but it's worth it. <laughs> well, thank goodness I am dressed for it. If anyone mauls this old thing, I just don't care. <laughs> It's all set, Hannah. They've gone to the fights, and she's left all the furs at home. Remember now, the Westport Arms, apartment 20. I'll be in the car in front when you're through.
I've been waiting for what? you. Why, you... <laughs> all right, all right. Now, just stand perfectly still. Oh, my wrist. You've broken my wrist. I don't doubt that. It's the only way I've learned to break that choke. Yes, in here, Harrington. All right, Ricky. Oh. Come on, this is in our place. How dare you? Anna. I can't stand the pain. Get a doctor, Miss Miller, will you please? Right away, Chief. Well, a clean sweep, eh, Harrington? It's looked like this time they've ordered the full meal. Here's a faster, better way to relieve pain. A new product that acts twice as fast as aspirin. The name is Bufferin. Remember that name, Bufferin. It acts twice as fast as aspirin. Now you can get faster relief from your headaches, pains due to colds, neuralgia, and minor muscular aches with Bufferin. Remember that name, Bufferin. It acts twice as fast as aspirin. You see, Bufferin is absorbed twice as fast into your bloodstream. So it goes to work faster to relieve pain, and gently too. And because Bufferin tablets are antacid, they will not upset your stomach. Remember that name, Bufferin, at drug counters everywhere. Bufferin acts twice as fast as aspirin. And now, with the explanation of tonight's case, here is your district attorney. It's a pleasure to report, ladies and gentlemen, that with the arrest of Hannah Price and Nick Sylvania, we brought to an end the unusual wave of robberies. Both Hannah and Nicky will pay the full penalty demanded by law for the murders of the Phillips butler, as well as Hannah's husband, Stanley. Golly, that was one assignment I liked, Chief. Uh, I've never eaten such good food in my life. <laughs> yeah, and oh boy, did you look swell in all those furs that you rented, Miss Muller. <laughs> Why, thank you, Harrington. But of course, I look good in just uh, anything. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> well, it was certainly good work, Miss Muller. You and Harrington sent Hannah right to the apartment where I was waiting, simply by displaying those furs. Yeah, and when we got there, we picked up Nicky and front of the joint chief. Yes, actually, it was Hannah's peculiar method of choking her victims that helped, Harrington. Yeah, that's the Japanese choke. Brother, that one's the works. Yes, it nearly always kills, and without as much effort as is sometimes needed. Fortunately, it leaves a characteristic discoloration of the neck, as well as abrasions on the lower jaw. And uh, you saw those in the morgue, chief? Yes, I did, Miss Miller, on both Stanley and the butler. And that's why I was ready for Hannah when she tried the Japanese choke on me. Yeah, and you can thank the Army Service for that, huh, Chief? Right. Bring your arms down hard and you can break it, sir. And break the case, I'm glad to say. I'll say so. Oh, Chief, what about next week? Well, our case for next week is one of the most vital in our files, ladies and gentlemen. One which lays bare a vicious crime now being committed against all of us. It's the case of Send the Homeless. And I invite you to join us for it. Until then, thank you. And good night. The names of all characters in a night's dramatization are fictitious, and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, and Vicki Vola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden. The program is produced and directed by Edward A. Byron and written by Robert Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Remember, I pan a toothpaste for the smile of beauty, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Bristol Myers invites you to tune in again next week for Duffy's Tavern and Mr. District Attorney... District Attorney, Champion of the People, Defender of Truth, Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as District Attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. The case of free play. Well, I must say the kindergarten looks wonderful, Aunt Martha. Isn't it delightful, Deborah? Flight me, Ted. What? Oh, yes, of course. Yes, we. You've neglected your old Aunt Ted. I haven't seen you in ages. Well, we, we've we been busy, Aunt Martha. You and Miss uh, Hawkins, is it? Hawkins. I, uh, I have thought of you, Aunt Martha. Haven't I, Deborah? Mm. 
Every time someone mentions Miss Mulberry's nursery school, I feel a little glow of pride. Uh, being a Mulberry, too, I mean. What time are the kids out of here? I beg pardon, Miss Hawkins? This building, what time do the kids get out of it? Why, school closes at three, Miss Hawkins. We only take little tots, you know. Uh, oh, my, I think the water is boiling for tea. Uh, Will you excuse me? Oh, uh, can I help? No, no, help? you sit still. I won't be for a minute. Bird brain, will you get to the point with the old fool? Now, Deborah, you promised I could handle it. After all, she is my aunt. I know how. Why don't you just give it to her straight? Tell her we've been peddling the stuff and it got hot. Oh, in heaven's name, Deborah, have you lost your mind? And Martha wouldn't know what marijuana is. Say nothing of narcotic. Okay, okay, have it your way. I mean, this chap is perfect. You said the last one was. So it got hot. Now, will you please tell her we're moving in here? Oh, I don't know. I I really don't know. Look, it's a nursery school or whatever you call it, right? One of the best private ones in the city. Great. The brats pull out at three. We can run the joint wide open all night long. Yes, it, um... <laughs> it does seem advantageous, I'll admit. Advantageous? It's beautiful. There's plenty of room. We can even take on more customers. Of course, Aunt Martha will be hard to handle, that one. Very hard. Well, that's your department. All I know is we're moving in. Who'd look for hopheads in a nursery? Oh, all I can say, Chief. When I pull a boner, it's a beaut. Why, Harrington? Something go wrong? Uh, You mean last night? I mean last night, Miss Miller. You know, I've been working on that marijuana thing, Chief. Yes, yes, I know. For weeks now, I've been working along with the federal boys. Mm -hmm. The heavier stuff, heroin, cocaine, all that, that's their department. Yes, and what about the marijuana? Well, sure, we've got jurisdiction there. It's a local offense. I know. I mean, weren't you about ready to go ahead? Well, last night, wasn't it, Harrington? That's right, last night. There's a dame named Hawkins, Chief. Mm -hmm. Guess I told you, Deborah Hawkins. Yes, yes, you mentioned the name. Okay, for weeks now, we've been casing her place. Mm -hmm. An apartment over on West Avenue. And that's where she operated? Oh, in a big way. She not only peddled the stuff, she let the customer stay right there and use it. Mm -hmm. Oh, talk about a fun house. And what happened? Yeah, nothing happened. We got all set to raid the joint. I got four extra crews on duty. I got the whole building roped off. And? We go in. Yeah. Boom. The joint's as clean as a whistle. You mean you couldn't get any evidence? Evidence? The place was empty, Miss Miller. Mm. Deborah and her chum pulled out in the morning. Her chum? Oh, yeah, some punk that works for us. Oh, I see. Any idea where the tip came from? No, I haven't, Chief. It was kind of a big operation, you know. When they're like that, there could be a lot of leaks. Yes, unfortunately, you're right. But I have a stack of complaints a foot high about this marijuana situation. Yeah, don't I know it? The tea boys too. Mm. They're absolutely sure narcotics are coming into this town. Yeah, even better. They're coming to Deborah Hawkins. And she's gone. She sure was last night. Well, there's only one answer. She'll open up again some other place. Oh, that you can bet on. Well, let's find her then, and this time, let's bring her in. Ah, here you are, Deborah, in here, huh? Well... Did you see who's in the nursery tonight? Mm-hmm. Martin Dale, light me, Tim. Well, you might at least have let me tell it. How much did he spend? Oh, here. Thanks. Fifty. I'm not sure I like him as a customer, though. He's got a bad reputation. I think he's fascinating. I do believe he's the first gangster I've ever met. You're somewhat naive, darling. Where were you all afternoon? I was with Aunt Martha in the nursery. In the afternoon? I was helping with the children. You know, it's amazing, Deborah, watching their little minds. Yeah, well, you keep your little mind on our children, dear. We made a good start here for a week. I want to make it even better. Ted? Oh, good. You're both here. Why, Aunt Martha, I thought you were upstairs in bed long ago. Oh, I can sleep with people coming and going. I'll never know. Good evening, Miss Hawkins. I was just going. I'd rather you stayed. As a matter of fact, there's something I want to say to both of you. Can I get you a cup of tea, Aunt Martha? Stop fussing, Ted. Fact is, I'm extremely upset. One of the kids fall out of the swing. Deborah, please. What is it, Aunt Martha? 
I told you a week ago you were welcome to stay here for a while, Ted. You too, Miss Hawkins. Thanks. With your tea room burnt to the ground and all, goodness knows you had no place to go. With our what? I, uh, told Aunt Martha about our tea room, Deborah, in Chicago. Oh, and you're welcome here. I'm sure it isn't that. So it's what? My dear Miss Hawkins, it seems to me you've had company every night since you came. Company? Even now, there are people in the nursery coming and going until all hours. I've heard the... Oh, but my dear, right? Let they we... finish and stop dancing about. Sit down, Ted. Well, I'm only trying to explain. I realize you're young, you have friends, and you like to have a good time. You bet. On the other hand, this is my nursery school and my home. You mustn't abuse it. Oh, now, we don't mean to, Aunt Martha, really. Well, nevertheless, I don't like it. Smelling up the place with their Turkish cigarettes. How's that again? My dear Miss Hawkins, the nursery is just thick with their smoke. It's getting so I can't air the place out. Aunt Martha, Oh, you needn't you... explain, my boy. I'm tired now, and I'm going to try to sleep. Oh, let me help you. Oh, do leave me alone. Sorry I had to speak, but I just can't have this. Now, uh... You'll excuse me. Good night. She ought to take a drag or two herself and prove her disposition. It's not funny, Deborah. I think it is. The first time I ever heard marijuana described as a Turkish cigarette. She doesn't know. Really? You amaze me. Better go see if Martin Dale wants anything. He usually takes a deck home. Is it just, but what about Aunt Martha? We'd have to find a new place if she makes us move. Now, you're being funny. But you heard her, Deborah. She... Will you come to... This is the neatest setup I ever had. But I don't intend to give it up. Aunt Martha or no Aunt Martha, we're here to stay. And please assure the committee we are doing everything we can. Sincerely, etc., etc. Mm hmm. I'll have this tap right away, Chief. Uh -huh. Hey, Chief! Oh, yes, come in, Harrington. Well, you look happy. <laughs> oh, boy, why shouldn't I? Hey, Chief, we finally got a break. Oh, on the marijuana problem? Right on the head. Yes? I was prowling around town last night. Pretty late, too, come to think of it, and I see my old pal, Martin Dale. Who? A two-bit bum around town, Miss Miller, mixed up in a dozen different rackets. Uh, well, there's no charge pending against him, is there? No, no, nothing special, Chief, but I spoke to him just the same. A bum like that on parole, well, I do it just for exercise. Well, I don't blame you. <laughs> Dale's in prison oftener than he's out. Well, he's on his way in again, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. When I stopped him, Chief, he was glassy-eyed. First, I thought he was drunk. Yes, and? He was all hopped up, Chief. I could smell marijuana all over him. What? Sure, and to make it even better, he was carrying two dozen cigarettes. No. Sure. I got him down in the bullpen right now. Have you made out the charge? No, not yet, Chief. I thought I'd see you first. Good. Say, this may be an opening wedge, Harrington. Is he able to talk? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. The jag's worn off. He's he's just depressed now. He's what? Oh, those hopheads get off a low when you take away the candy, Miss Miller. Oh. Well, what time did you make the arrest? 2 a.m. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, all right, let's do this. We'll hold him the full 24 hours without making a formal charge. Right. Oh, and nothing to the papers, Miss Miller. Okay. Notify the desk, will you? Right away. And we'll give him a couple of hours and then bring him up here, Harrington. Right. And by that time, he ought to be real unhappy. Yes, we won't make a deal, you understand, but maybe he'll talk anyway. They usually do. Oh, brother, I sure hope so, because if Martin Dale got his supply from little Deborah Hawkins, Chief, we're in. <laughs> I've got to go to bed, Ted. There won't be any more customers tonight, anyway. Yes, I, I, I will, Deborah. Simply trying to calm myself by reading. Reading what? Hmm? Oh, one of Aunt Martha's books. The Life of Madame Montessori. Oh, she. Lightning, will you? Oh, nuisance. Madame Montessori founded a method of educating small children, the theory of free play. That ought to calm anybody. Here. Yeah. Thanks. What's the matter? You run out of comic books? <laughs> Those sense of humor has warped, Deborah. If I want to improve myself, I should at least be encouraged. You like telling stories to the little monsters? I happen to find it stimulating, yes. As a matter of fact, Deborah, oh, I... Hmm? Somebody's coming. But you said everyone's gone. Heaven is after three. Yes? Well... Aunt Martha. I thought I'd find you here. Now, don't speak to your door. We won't mince words. You're up pretty late, aren't you? I'll hear no more from you, Miss Hawkins. Now, both of you pack your bags and get out. 
What did you say? Don't pretend you don't understand me. I said get out of my nursery school. Now? Now. Is that clear? Just what's wrong, Aunt Martha? Well, I'm sure you could answer that better than I, Miss Hawkins. I saw some of your friends tonight. Of uh, friends? Downstairs in the nursery? I did. I don't know what was going on, but it's going to stop. Why, they acted like drunkards. Oh, Martha, no. Don't argue with me. I said pack up and get out. Nobody was drunk, Aunt Martha. Well, worse then. I don't even want to hear about it. Well, didn't you hear me? She's your aunt, Ted. Take over. Aunt Martha, now, now be calm a minute. Oh, you're a spineless, weak jellyfish, Ted Mulberry. Yes, and no telling what else. I said get out. Aunt Martha, don't... Don't talk like that. I might get mad. Mad? You? Oh. Oh, I can get mad, can't I, Deborah? Tell her. Take it easy, Aunt Martha. Now, listen, you two. The officer in this neighborhood is a friend of mine. If you are not started in two minutes, I'm going to call him. And get your poor nephew arrested? I don't care what happens to him. He's a sneak, a lying little sneak. I always thought you were a lady. Get out. Deborah? You calm enough, Ted? Completely. You realize now I was right? Perfectly. He talks to that policeman at 15 to 25 years for the both of us. Naturally. I should have acted before. Oh, stop this chattering and get out of I'll here. I'll get the gun, Ted. I have it my first. Let me have it, Deborah. Quickly. Have you gone mad? What are you talking about? What gun? This one. Here, Ted. Thank you. Ted, what's come over you? Theodore. You don't know your nephew in a crisis, Aunt Martha. He's a riot. There's no need to explain to her, Deborah. I see it quite clearly. And Martha? Ted, uh, No, no, Theodore. Oh. Oh. You shot me. You didn't have to. I... I shall have a reaction quite so, Deborah. I'll need a small brandy. I know. It's the only thing to do, of course, you... Agree about that? Completely. There's just one thing. Yes? Are you still thinking clearly? We need the nursery for the cover-up, you know. I was aware of that when I shot. Who's going to teach the kids? I am. You? I shall use the Montessori method, I think. The accent on free play. And now my brandy, Deborah. Oh, I, I really do feel quite faint. All right, Jerry. Put him back in the cooler. Let's go back to the office, Harrington. All right. How long were we talking to him? Working deal? Mm -hmm. Good three hours, Chief. Yes, and not very profitably, I'd say. Well, let's take the back stairs. Oh, that guy sure is stubborn. Yeah. Well, there isn't a doubt in my mind that he knows where Deborah Hawkins is. Oh, sure. Every time you mentioned her name, we got a reaction out of him. Yes, a reaction, but no information. Hmm. Well, we can't hold him, Harrington. We'll make out a charge upstairs. All right. Possession of marijuana? Well, that's about all we can do, I'm afraid. We'll have to release the stories to the papers, too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Brother, wherever Deborah's operating, it sure is terrific. We've got to find it, Harrington. I want to put a stop to her for good. Ted. Huh? Oh, Deborah, I asked you not to disturb me when I'm in the nursery. Where are the kids? In Humpty Dumpty Land. What? In the next room, it's nap time. After that, they get their milk. Fortified, of course. Listen, teacher, will you wake up? Did you see the afternoon papers? But hardly. I've been busy here at the blackboard since noon. <laughs> you like it? Like what? Well, good heavens, Deborah, don't tell me you don't recognize it. All this colored chalk. It's a turkey. You drew that? Well, I traced part of it, I must admit. It's good, though, don't you think? I'm trying to tell the you... The tail feathers just delight the children. <laughs> tell me what? Martin Dale is in stir. Martin Dale? 
Our Martindale? Our Martindale. And get this, the DA charged him with possession of marijuana. Oh. Our marijuana, in case you don't get it. That could be very serious. Could be. Suppose he tells where he got it. That's what I meant. That and your Aunt Martha lying out in that ditch, my friend. That don't add up so good. Oh, don't mention her, Deborah. I've told so many mothers she went to Florida, I almost believe it. I don't care about the mothers. Just believe this, Montessori. If Martin Dale starts talking, this whole act may turn into a turkey. This woman's body was found in a ditch, you said? Yeah, this morning, Chief. She's up ahead on slab nine. Yeah, I, uh, I heard about Martin Dale. About uh, getting released on bail? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess we kind of expected it. Well, there wasn't any way to hold him pending trial. All I'm banking on now, when we do try him, he'll talk. Well, maybe. Yeah, here's the woman. He'll have to slab. There's been no autopsy? No, yet. nobody's even touched her, Chief. There's no identification. Nice-looking woman. Yeah. One shot here. In a ditch, you said? Right, Chief. What? Nothing. I'm, I was just looking at these smudges on her dress here. Some sort of chalk, isn't it? Chalk? Yes. It wasn't any in the ditch. Well, we'll have a test taken. It seems like... Hmm. What's the matter, Chief? Oh, it's strange. There's an odor on these clothes. Still quite strong. Hmm? Let me smell. That familiar? Huh. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle, Chief. That smells like marijuana. Yes, that was my impression, too. Yeah. Now, there's the phone. Yeah, that may be for me, Chief. I told Brophy we were coming down to the morgue. Yes? Chief, Miss Miller. Yes? Can you come back to the office? Well, I'd rather not right now, Miss Miller. Harrington and I have just stumbled onto something important. I'll say we have. Well, this is important, too, Chief. Yes? The report just came in. Martin Dale's been killed. The way we tie our shoe, tie our shoe, tie our... Ah. No, no. This is the way we brush our hair, brush our hair, Will you please keep still? I'm trying to concentrate. Well, my dear Deborah, you told me yourself the nursery is important. If I'm to run it, I want it run right. Will you please... The children learn through these songs, Deborah. I must say, I've learned quite a bit myself. Great. Now, will you listen to me? Later. You're really feeling your muscle lately, you know it, little man? Why not? Things are going extremely well. The children adored my turkey. Oh, dear. All right, we'll talk quietly. Lightning wind. Why don't you carry matches, Deborah? I'm busy. Listen, Egghead, I spent all afternoon trying to find Martin Dale, and I couldn't. Suppose he's talking. He isn't. What do you mean, he isn't? Stop smirking at me. I killed him. You did what? He was here while you were out. It seems he needed a supply. Give me this slow. It was quite simple. I offered to drive him home, and when we got there, I shot him. I, I borrowed your gun. You shot Martindale? It's just like that? My dear Deborah, you said yourself if he talked, we'd have to move again. Yes, but and I And it did... was the only thing to do. I'd simply hate giving up the nursery. Oh, good Lord. So you see, there's nothing to worry about at all. Now, heavens. It's the way we tie our shoe, tie our shoe. God. In heaven's name, how do you tie a shoe? Come on, come on, clear out, will you, fellas? The DA will see you in a minute. That's it, that's the boys. Well, I'll give us a chance to work, huh? That's it, outside. The examiner's on his way for the body. Oh, good. You may start on the apartment, Miss Murray, and just right. list everything you see. Sure thing. And this Martin Dale sure wasn't neat, Chief. Look at this dump. Well, at the moment, Harrington, I'm more interested in his body. You notice anything? He shot once. On the coat sleeve here. Huh? See. Hey, that's funny. Looks like chalk. Exactly. And that was chalk on that woman in the morgue. Hey, Chief. 
This begins to make sense. Yes, a lot of sense. A woman and Martin Dale, both shot once, chalk on both bodies, and the odor of marijuana on both. Well, Marty's got more than odor. His pockets are full of cigarettes. Oh, gee. Yes, Miss Miller. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I found this engagement calendar. This one? Yeah. On Martin Dale's desk, Harrington. The page for today is still here. Yes, what about it, Miss Miller? Well, the name seems so strange. Huh? Martin Dale didn't have any children, did he? <laughs> My dear Deborah, I must ask you once more to remain calm. Calm? Now? You're simply putting a series of circumstances together, my dear. It's what we call a basic association. What? Basic association. For example, take one of the children. I say dog. He answers bow wow. I say snow. And he says Santa Claus. <laughs> it's really most interesting. Yeah, well, I say murder, Bob. First Aunt Martha, now Martin Dale. Still association. There's no reason in the world to connect us to any of it. Now, would you like to help me? I'm doing the nursery in crepe paper. Ted. Yes, Deborah? What's the matter with you? You used to be so easy, so gentle. Why, I'm the soul of gentleness, Deborah. Then will you think... We gotta get out of here, Ted, now, before things get any hotter. I say no. Oh, you fat headed. No, so help me, Mother Goose, I'll make you see it. Ted. Yes, dear? Please, can we go? You're really very selfish, Deborah. I enjoy the nursery immensely. I see. Okay, that does it. You won't listen to me. Maybe you'll listen to this. Just happen to have here in my purse. I'd put away the gun if I were you. They make me extremely nervous. I only wish they did. Now, will you get started? We're checking out. Put it down, Deborah. You know my temper. Who's that? One of the mothers, I'd imagine. She'd hardly expect firearms, Deborah. Put it away. Get rid of her, you hear me? But I enjoy the problems. I really do. Enter. This is the Mulberry Nursery School? Yes, I'm Mr. Mulberry. Can I can I help you? Yeah, in here, Chief. Oh, yes, yes, I see. Yeah, I just got... Hey, wait a minute. Well, I'll be darned if it ain't Debbie Hawkins. What? I'm more interested in this one, Harrington. Uh, that's interesting chalk on your suit. I beg your pardon? Ted, you fool. They're cops. Deborah, quickly, the gun. There you go. Let them be old kid. I'll take that. Pull him. Keep that gun, Harrington. We'll need it. All right, both of you. This school is out for good. Let's go. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it 
shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. The case of deadly devotion. You have no idea how these old phonograph records take me back, Mr. St. Charles. Look, here's Dardanella, remember? You select whatever you want to hear, Mrs. Post. The other club members will enjoy it, I know. Well, honestly, I don't know when I've enjoyed myself so. Oh, here's the two black crows, my, my. You do like it here, then? I mean, at the Devotion Club? Like it? Why, Mr. St. Charles... Harry, please. What? Oh, thank you. Do I enjoy it? For I think what you're doing here is simply wonderful. I hope so. People our age, people in the flush of life, you might say, have a difficult time making new friends. We don't hear, I'll say that. I'm glad you feel that way. You especially, Laura. The moment you came into my office, I... Is something wrong? Well, oh, I'm sorry, but that man seems to be beckoning to you. There, that one near the door. Near the door? Oh. Oh, yes, I... I see. Do you know him? He doesn't look like one of the members. What? Will you excuse me, my dear? I'll see what he wants. Oh, don't worry about me, Harry. I'll pick out the records before the members start around. You don't look glad to see me, Harry. Nick. Nick, my boy, I... Well, don't we shake hands, Harry? Back when we were cellmates, I thought we got to be pretty good friends. Nick, you can't stay here. Look, my boy, What I... do you mean, can't? I had quite a time looking you up, pal. Yeah, you get quite a layout here. What's the gimmick? Look, I'll uh, I'll give you my address. I have a house. No kidding. We can talk later on. Please, Nick. The Devotion Club, huh? What do you do? Get a lot of old dames in here and take them? Don't say that. Really, you must go, Nick. It... Go. Come off it, pal. We're buddies, remember? Coop in the same hatch back in stir. Yes, I know, my boy, but... Go. Why, you're flubstruck, Harry. I'm going to stay. Oh, I picked that information request out of the file, Chief The one from St. Louis Oh, which one was that, Harrington? A young punk named uh, Oliver oh. Nick Oliver Oh, I saw that when it came through uh, He was released from prison out there, wasn't he? That's right, Miss Miller and from looking at his record, he's on his way back. St. Louis thinks he's here in town. That's the tip they got, Chief. Mm -hmm. For the bum like him, even when he's released, it pays to keep an eye on him. Well, what is his record? I didn't read all the report. Well, <clears throat> little Nick is quite a boy, it seems like. He's got an arrest record as long as your arm. And there's a charge against him now? Well, they want to talk to him about a little accident, Chief. Seems the day he got out, a pal of his turned up with a hole in his head. What? That's right. Then it turns out the dead guy ratted on Nick in the first place. It was his testimony that sent him up. And they didn't pick him up? No, it happened in a little town outside of St. Louis, Chief. Mm. By the time the local boys notified the city, Nick was on his way. And they think he's here? Yeah, it looks that way. I've been doing a little checking up on him this morning. Oh, any luck? No, it's a little early, Chief. They're sending us his prison record, personnel report, all that. Mm -hmm. If he's got some pals in town, chances are he'll look him up. Well, let's hope so. The St. Louis authorities have helped us a great deal in the past. I'd like to return the favor. Oh, I'll find him, Chief. <laughs> Bums like that always go in a pattern. Well, how do you mean? Well, that's one way you find a guy, Miss Miller. You study his habits. Find out what kind of bars he hung around in. What kind of people. Uh-huh. Get a line on him. You know, what kind of dames he goes for. Whether he likes sports... Drives a car, his clothes, anything. Yes, the personnel report should contain most of that. Sure, then as soon as we know what kind of a guy he is, we pass the word along to places where he might show up. And then wait for a tip. Tips help. Isn't it strange criminals are so willing to turn each other in? Well, it really isn't strange, Miss Miller. It's part of the criminal nature. Fear. That's right. And when he turns a pal in... He feels safer for a little while. You'd think they'd realize that someday they all get caught. Yes, they do. That's the basis of the fear. Take this man Harrington's trying to find. Nick Oliver? Yes. Wherever he is right now, he's afraid. And why? Because he knows that sooner or later we'll get him. And we will. <laughs> I 
didn't realize you were here in my office. I thought it better to wait in here, Harry. I'm delighted. Have you been waiting long? There isn't much here to amuse you, I'm afraid. It's quite all right. I was reading an article in this week's Colliers. Oh? It's most entertaining about Mr. District Attorney. You know, the radio program. I'll have to read it. Sit down, my dear. No, thank you. You seem so, so formal, Laura. Is anything wrong? Yes, Harry. A great deal. I don't understand. I, I thought the dance last night was most enjoyable. Who is that man, Harry? A uh, man? I think you're evading me. I mean Mr. Oliver. Nick? Why, he, he's an old friend, Lord. I, I, I told you that. He's been here a week, Harry. Have you any idea how much the club has changed in that short time? Changed? In what way? Good heavens, are you blind? Do you realize that man encouraged the members to gamble? Yes, and to drink. Now, Laura... Oh, you needn't put your arm around me, Harry. I'm disgusted. I wrote my sister about it last night. Now, Laura, listen to me. Perhaps you're right. Perhaps. When that nice Mrs. Webster lost $43 playing dice... As I say, Nick is impetuous. I shouldn't have permitted him to stay. Oh, he's a very bad young man, in spite of that smile of his... I tell you, Harry, this has changed my opinion of everything. Including us? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't made up my mind. There's something wrong here, Harry. Uh, uh, Laura, my dear, wait. No, I'm going home now. I've had my say. Home before the dance tonight? I won't be at the dance, Harry. I, I'm not sure I shall return here at all. But the money... Uh, Harry... I mean, you decided to do so much. I have my doubts about that, too. Goodbye, Harry. Harry, you think... Oh, sorry. It's quite all right, Mr. Oliver. I was just leaving. Laura, wait. Thank you, no. Goodbye. <laughs> What's eating the old bag? You fool, you blundering idiotic. Oh, no, I'm wrong. I'm the fool, not you. It's a trouble, pal. She looked pretty steamed up. I was crazy to let you stay crazy. I'll wait back on that again. I told you, Harry, you ain't got much choice. I was getting along so well. Huh? Yeah, well, now you're doing even better. And you can stop yakking about getting rid of me, Harry. Or do I tell these old crows where you and me met? Dice tables, liquor in the punch, shakedowns. In heaven's name, Nick, what are you trying to pull? No, oh, I need plenty, pal. This is as good as any joint to get it from. But I don't operate that way. I told you I play it slow. Well, that's too bad. I play it fast. What was her name? What? The dame in the uproar just now. It was Mrs. Post. Laura Post. Yeah, well, she can take the... Wait a minute. Is that the one? The one what? The dame he were building up for the big one. Sure it was. I remember the name. She has $20,000 in convertible bonds. She's got what? I've worked on her for three months personally. And now it's all for nothing. She was going to kick in twenty grand. She was, even if I had to marry her. Where'd she go, huh? I imagine so. She's washed up, though. You and your quick scheme scared her off. Where does she live, Harry? I never mind. I get it from my membership. You stay away from her. You think you could change her mind, you? Change it? You're oh. why she pulled out. It's a washup, I tell you. <laughs> you know, you con boys give me a pain. Twenty grand and you quit like a spoiled kid. I know when a score is cold, Nick. Yeah, well, I know when it's hot. Twenty G's, Harry, my boy. That's plenty hot. Now, where are you going? Calling. What? You heard me. I'm calling on Mrs. Post. <laughs> Oh, come in, Harrington. Yeah. I, I didn't want to bust in, Chief. Oh, it's quite all right. I just thought I'd bring you up to date on Nick Oliver. Oh, uh, the one they want in St. Louis? That's my boy. Oh, I got a pile of dope on him. Brother, he's something. Yes? Yeah, he started out when he was 13 years old. He stuck up a gas station, and when the attendant was slow with the money, little Nick hit him with a hammer. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's only the beginning, Miss Miller. The bum's record runs six full pages. Uh, any idea where he is now? No, not yet, Chief, but I got a good lead. Yes, what is it? Well, a punk that looks like him hit town about a week ago. Mm -hmm. Come in by bus from over the state line. Do you think it's Nick? Well, maybe, but I know this, Miss Miller. When a rip and tear man like that arrives, a lot of guys know about it. Yeah, and fast. Yes, remarkably fast, usually. That's the grapevine, Chief. Mm -hmm. And today they're saying there's a baby-faced guy like Nick in town. Just a minute. I'm coming. 
coming. Yes, uh, just a moment. I'll turn on the porch light. No need for that. I could see okay. Now, see here, just what the... Oh, it's you. I got to talk to you, Mrs. Post. It's about uh, something that happened at the club. The devotion club? Uh-huh. I don't want to hear about uh, it. Let's sit down. I'd, uh, how about in here? Now, see here, I've said I don't want to discuss anything. Why, I was getting ready for bed. Now, this is important, Mrs. Post. It's for your own good. For my own good? Whatever do you mean? You and Harry? I beg your pardon? I told you it was important. Go on. Sit right down and relax. Come to the point, please. Ah, that's fair enough. Uh, Harry tells me you've got 20,000 bucks laying around. What, what do you want, Mr. Uh, Oliver, isn't it? Uh, Nick's enough. And I want to tip you off, Mrs. Post. It's just a friendly gesture. I think perhaps you'd better leave. I'm playing straight with you. You take the dough and put it in a big, strong bank. You understand? I'm sorry. I think all this is, uh, well, to say the least, Mr. Oliver, none of your concern. You're sure hard to convince. Look, will you promise me one thing? Hardly. Yeah, well, first thing in the morning, take the dough and put it in a bank. I never heard of anything like this in my life. Is that too much to ask? Put it in a bank? Very well. Suppose I promise you. Now, will you go? Uh, be more definite. You'll... Put it in tomorrow? Yes, yes. Now, will you please leave my house? <laughs> That's funny. And Harry said I wasn't smooth. That's a laugh. Well, what do you mean? Kid, you just told me the one thing I wanted to know. What? I had to be sure that those here, didn't I? I'll get it up. Get it up? Come on, come on. Let's not waste time. Where do you keep it? You get after it here. Well, you listen to reason. I'm a busy man, baby. Get the dough. I... I don't believe it. I just don't. Look, I got no time to fool around. If I have to, I'll kick this joint upside down. But... Yeah, I may have to take a few belts at you. I get smart. Will you just hand it over nice and easy? I... I'll do nothing of the kind. Don't look so greedy at the phone, kid. You reach for that and I'll break your little arm. But do you realize what you're doing, do you? Yeah, I do. But you don't. I'm getting sore, sister, and that ain't good, you know. I... But I haven't got the money here. You lie in your teeth. You just said so. Now, get it up fast. Uh, Mr. Oliver, listen Never to me. mind the routine. I got one of my own. You what? How many rooms are this dump? Eight? Nine? I can go through them in an hour. You wouldn't dare. If I have to look for the scratch, that is. And you know something, baby? I just can't do a good job with you around bothering me. I, I don't understand. Oh, it's simple. Either you hand over the dough like a good kid, or I'll kid you. Kill me, you. I'd have to. If I have to search for it, at least. <laughs> you see? You've got a gun. Oh, that's the flesh of the weak. Okay. Make up your mind. Oh, please. Where's I... the dough? I... I don't know. Oh, I'll be. You shot me. Help me, please. Oh, you sure make it tough on yourself, sister. Yeah, and on me, too. Now I gotta tear this joint apart. Boy, there's enough reporters out in that yard to cover a World Series. Well, I don't wonder, Harrington. Mrs. Post is very prominent in this city. Yes, we're about ready to add up, Harrington. Yeah. Has Dr. Colgan finished? Uh, yes, just about, Chief. He fixes the time of death as between 9 and 11 last night. That's mm -hmm. right. Shot once at about two feet away. Uh, what about the doors and windows? Did Brophy check? Just finished, Chief. Every one of them closed and locked from the inside. How about inventory, Miss Miller? Well, I've been trying to get somewhere on that. Her nearest relative is a sister, but she lives in Chicago. Yes, well, perhaps one of the neighbors can estimate what's missing for us. All you know, right. Chief, there's one thing I don't like about this. Yes, what's that? Well, when the grocery kid discovered something was wrong this morning and called the patrolman... Yes? It looked like a nice, neat case of robbery. And? I mean, everything's just like we've seen it many times before. The house all ransacked and the dame dead. Yes, yes, that's the impression, at least. She probably resisted, and the burglar got panicky and shot. Except for one thing. Well, what's that? Well, just look around, Miss Miller. There's her purse with ten bucks still in it. There's a gold lighter on the table. 
Upstairs is a hunk of jewelry on her dresser. Yes, yes, I saw that too. Say, uh, take a look at that purse, Miss Miller. All right. This was a burglary. The guy sure passed up a lot of nice items. Yes, it is strange. Still, if he were frightened after he shot, he might have run out. Say, yeah. Chief. Yes. Here's something odd. In her purse? Yes. Mm. Mrs. Post belonged to the Devotion Club Limited. Mm. Whatever that is. Uh, here's her membership card. The Devotion Club? Uh-huh. Are you kidding? Why? Do you know anything about it, Harrington? Well, sure I do. Well, maybe not that particular outfit, but I've heard that name. Mm-hmm. It's one of those agencies that helps people meet other people. Really? Yeah, most of them are on the up and up, but sometimes they're not. Yes, it's strange that a woman like Mrs. Post should belong to one. Uh, put the card in your pocket, Harrington. Right. We may have to check that club. Mm, I can drop around and ask a few questions. Yes, do that. Uh, no need to arouse suspicion, however. Uh, uh, put a little gray on your temples and you can drop around as a prospective member. It's a cinch, Chief. Well, let's hope the whole case is a cinch. Now, if you'll call Dr. Colgan, Miss Miller, we'll get to work. I hope I've made everything clear, Mr... Harrison, was it? Yeah, that's right, Mr. St. Charles. You see, we don't take just anyone into our membership here. Only those we know to be sincere. Oh, I'm I'm sincere, all right. I've been wanting to meet people for a long time. I see. You dance, do you? (laughs) Just a little. Ah, Back home, I never had much time for it. And that was where, did you say? Oh, I had a cattle ranch out west. Did you indeed? Yeah, I had 7,000 head at one time. Then when I made my pile, well, I just quit. Well, that was sensible, Mr. Harrison. We all work too hard in this life. Wear ourselves out. (laughs) You can say that again. (laughs) From now on, Mr. St. Charles, I'm just going to spend my money and enjoy myself. I don't blame you. (laughs) Yeah, well, could I uh, get into your little club here, do you think? Well, ordinarily, Mr. Harrison, I interview a candidate a number of times before we accept it. Oh, yeah, sure. Then, as I explained, we make every effort to see that you meet people of your own age and interests. Suits me. And you know, sir, you suit us. I do. You do. We'll dispense with the interviews, Mr. Harrison. You can meet the members tonight. <laughs> Listed everything the neighbors mentioned, Chief. Mm-hmm. You know, not one thing's been taken from this house. Well, it's difficult to understand, Miss Miller. Unless, of course, Mrs. Post kept a great deal of money someplace here on the premises. Yes. The neighbors would hardly know if it were missing or not. Well, her sister might. I've got Dorothy back at the office trying to get through to her in Chicago. Yes, that'll help. And perhaps Harrington will have some luck, too. Is he still out? I guess so. He hasn't called back. Mm-hmm. He was going over to that club to see what he could find. That's the door. Uh, yes, it's the mailman, I think. Uh, do you want me to see? Yes, will you? Okay. Oh, thank you. I was right, Chief. Here's a magazine and one letter. Oh? Uh-huh. It's a uh, postmark, uh, let's see, Chicago. Hmm. It's a woman's handwriting, too, Chief, probably from her sister. Here, may I look at it? Of course. Hmm. Well, I think I'll open it, Miss Miller. Under the circumstances, I can take the responsibility. Oh, sure, Chief. Anything to help. Mm. I'll keep going on this inventory. Right. Mm. Well, I'll be... Say, Miss Miller. Yes? Uh, this letter is remarkable. It may be just what we need. Well, Chief, the guy's a phony from a way back. I could smell it all over him. Uh, this Mr. St. Charles, you mean? Yeah, yeah, Miss Miller. Slick as a whistle. Even if he's got nothing to do with Mrs. Post, we better break up that joint of his on general principles. Yes, we have more reason than that to break it up, Harrington. Yeah? Miss Miller and I had quite a day, too. Oh, yeah, anything look good? Oh, yes, plenty. Uh, you're attending this dance at the club tonight, you said? That's right. Starts at nine. Well, all right, you be there, then. And if you can, get St. Charles into his office. And here's what we're going to do. I'm sorry, I'm busy. Nick, I thought I told you to stay away from here. Can an old pal drop in to say goodbye, Harry? I don't want anything to do with you. You know, you con boys operate funny. We don't get mixed up in a murder. Oh, 
You heard about that, huh? I read the papers. It's funny. I was even thinking of giving you part of the stash. You know, just for old times' sake. You mean you got the money? All of it? I'm leaving, ain't I? That's the answer to that. But the paper said nothing was taken. You read too much, Harry. Just like back in a cell block. I had no idea. Why, sit down, Nick. No need to rush. <laughs> oh, you kill me, you know. Now you're interested all of a sudden. No, no, I'm not, Nick. I give you my word. No kidding. Look, I took in a new member today. He's loaded, Nick. Big cattle man from out west. Huh? Take him, why don't you? I intend to. Only you can help me, my boy. Think of it. We'll take him together. Huh. You'll take the old dame's dough, you mean? No, thanks, Harry. I'm shoving off. Do hey, you mind if I come in, Mr. St. Charles? What? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Harrison. I'm busy just now. If you'll... Mr. Harrison... Uh, this won't take long. Come right in, Laura. I told you I'm very Thank busy. You. Good Lord. Hello, Harry. Love... For the love of... Oh, what's the matter? You fellas look like you've seen a ghost. I think they're surprised to see me. You don't say. What? Hey, I, I gotta get out of here. No, no, no. Stick around, Sonny. You interest me. You know, I could swear I've seen your face before. Like on the St. Louis police posters. Hey, well... Well, what's going on here? Don't you remember? You came to my house last night. No. No, I didn't. Laura, I, I can't believe it. The paper said you you were dead. Perhaps. Do you think so, Nick? Look at me. No. Don't come near me. Please, don't. Nick, listen to me. She's dead, I tell you. Really, Nick? Look again. Closer. No, I tell you. No. Harry, don't let her come near me. Mr. Harrison, please. Please take her out of here. Do you remember now, Nick? Last night? Yeah. You're dead, I tell you. I was there. I, I saw you die. That's what I'm waiting to hear, pal. All right, back up, both of you. This is a very touchy gun. Mr. Harrison. The name is Harrington, pal. Just stand still. Okay, Chief. Better stand back, oh, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. I do feel a little faint. Are we all set in here, Harrington? Perfect, Chief. Nick just spilled the whole story. Nick? Yeah, and a little added touch, Chief. This is our St. Louis boy. Oh. Looks kind of pale right now. Oh, Chief, the members are all waiting downstairs. Yes, we'll go down and explain things to them in just a moment, Smitter. Right. Are you all right, Mrs. Rogers? Yes, thank Mrs. you. Mrs. Rogers? What, what do you mean? Hey, look, uh, I don't get it. We were very fortunate, gentlemen. I think you knew Mrs. Post had a sister in Chicago. Sure, she said... Well, she... this is Mrs. Post's sister, what you didn't know, however, is that she happens to be a twin, an identical twin. Mr. District Attorney comes to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.
Sal Hepetica and Vitalis present Mr. District Attorney, Champion of the People, Defender of Truth, Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as District Attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you in the public interest as part of the constant fight for a better America by Bristol Myers, the makers of Sal Hepatica for the smile of health and Vitalis for well-groomed hair. Sal Hepatica, Vitalis. And tonight, the case of the money machine. Who is it? Let me in, Joyce. I got him with me. It's... Is he all right? He won't... He won't get violent or anything. Well, of course he's all right. Uh, sit down, Frank. Take off your coat. Can he understand, Emil? Take off your coat. You hear me, Frank? I understand. I was worried sick. I still am. Worried? Now you just sit there, Frank. You don't have to talk. Oh, did it go all right? Yeah, yeah, there was nothing to it. I slipped in the back door of the asylum, got him out of his room, and here we are. Didn't take an hour. Be sure they won't miss him before morning. Oh, look, Joyce, I told you I used to work in the joint three years ago. I took care of cases like him. Oh, I know, but won't he's, they He's just like to... a lump of, of putty or something. You set him down and he stays there. <laughs> He doesn't look crazy, I'll say that for him. No, he, he lives in a state, something like that. They got a lot of them like him. Always seem to be, seem to be thinking about something a million miles away. Frank? Frank. Now leave him alone. He's all right. Give him a pan of water after a while. We'll keep him in the back room until we hook up with the carny. A pan of water? Like a dog? I don't want him cutting himself on any glass, kid. He's a little money machine. I still wonder if it'll work. No carnival wants a guy working who ought to be in a hatchery. Well, who's going to know? He'd be a sensation, I tell you. We used to turn him on all the time when I worked the hospital. Turn him on? Yeah, sure. The, the doc explained it one day. He, he's got a mind for figures, see? That's why I thought we'd build the act as the lightning calculator. You like it? Ask him something, Amy. You know, just like you were a square in the crowd. Oh, sure. Well, he likes it. Uh, all right, Frankie. Uh, here's one for you. You ready? <laughs> Look at the way his eyes light up. Go on, ask him. Ask oh, yeah, sure. Uh, multiply, Frank. Three, six, nine, two, one, eight. Got that? Three, six, nine, two, one, eight. Times four, oh, three. Got it? Times four, oh, three. All right, boy. What's the answer? The answer is one hundred and forty-eight million seven hundred and ninety-four thousand eight hundred and fifty-four. Gresham is here, Chief. Oh. Well, go right in, please, sir. Well, thank you, Miss Miller. Oh, Mr. Gresham, sit down. Sit down. Yeah, this is Mr. Harrington. Hi, ah, Mr. Gresham. Mr. Harrington. Oh, do you want me, Chief? Uh, yes, stay if you will, please, Miss Miller. Right. Uh, you're with the State Hospital, Mr. Gresham. That's right. Mm -hmm. I know you're familiar with the institution. Yeah, right. that's for the chronic insane, isn't it? We have the heavier load of the state's incurables, yes, Mr. Harrington. Mm -hmm. I've been in charge of protection out there for the last year. Oh, yes, yes, we know. I know you're busy, so I'll make this brief. When the attendants checked roll this morning, we found one of the patients missing. Uh-oh. That's uh, gone, Mr. Gresham. Well, naturally, finding him again is part of my job. Mm -hmm. However, I wanted you to have a full report, too. Yes, yes, we'd like to have. Uh, take this down, would you, Mr. Miller? Right, Chief. A man or a woman, Mr. Gresham? A man. His name is Kent. Frank Kent. I'm not a doctor, Mr. D.A., but I, I do know his history. Yeah, which is what? Well, without using technical terms, Kent is... Uh, well, 
Uh, off in another world is one way to describe it. Mm-hmm. Go on. He's seldom violent. <laughs> in fact, you're seldom aware of him at all. Yes, well, could he become violent, Mr. Gresham? My answer would be yes. Most of them could, if the right things happened. Yeah. However, you can get more exact dope from the doctors. Mm. You got a description of him? Oh, I know Frank quite well. <laughs> he has a unique ability, actually... Something I've never run up against before. A unique ability, did you say, Mr. Gresham? That's right. He has a head for figures, mathematics. Hmm? <laughs> He's amazing, Mr. Harrington. He can add, subtract, and multiply all in his head. And all in a matter of seconds. No matter how complicated the numbers? Well, I've never seen him stumped yet. Yes, there are cases on record like that. Some of them phenomenal. Yeah, how did he uh, escape, Mr. Gresham? Sometime last night, his door was open from the outside. Uh, maybe some other patient. No, Mr. Harrington, that's literally impossible. There are too many doors to get through. And you have no idea where he might be now? I know Frank's habits, Mr. D.A. I think perhaps I can trace him. Uh, where I need your help, though, yes. we want to know who opened that door. Is the lightning calculator ready? Quite ready, Mr. Hudson. All right, folks, give me a number. Any number, just shout it out. You, sir. Beg pardon? All right, now. Five, nine, six. Thank you, sir. Five, nine, six. And you, sir, will you supply the second number? Anything at all, sir? Beg pardon? All right. Times three, eight, four. Got that? We're ready, Mr. Hudson. Times three, eight, four. The answer, please. The answer is 228,864. Thank you, lightning calculator. All right, folks, the show on the inside will begin immediately. Don't miss this amazing demonstration. There's plenty of room on the inside. Follow the metal master into the tent. Thank you, friends. The show is about to begin. Come on, let's go, Harry. Emil, who's taking tickets? Oh, where do I get this flap shut? Gee, the tent's filling up. I told you he'd be a sensation, didn't I? Now we can make real plans. Where is he? Oh, he's all right. He's just changing into his costume. He's been doing it all week. Well, get him out and on the platform. If we turn this crowd over fast, we can talk plans before dinner. What do you mean, plans? Well, you think I'm going to waste my time on a carny lot all spring? But you just said... They would play class dates, Joyce. Maybe even a first-rate nightclub. What? Metal acts are big. You know that. I might even teach him some routines. Come on, help me get him going. Well, I still say we ought to stay right... Well, what? Who are you? My name is Gresham. I'm just sitting here in the trailer talking to Frank. Yeah? Well, uh, look, buddy, we don't allow nobody to... Wait a minute. How'd you know his name? Frank, who is this man? I'll handle this, Joyce. Mr. Gresham is my friend. Be quiet, Frank. All right, let's have it. I'm from State Hospital. I've come to take Frank home. In the morning when you awaken with a dull, headachey feeling because you need a laxative, you want relief, fast relief. And you get fast relief when you take gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. Sal Hepatica, taken before breakfast, brings gentle, speedy relief Usually within an hour. But if it's not until much later in the day that you feel miserable and logy because you need a laxative, well then, too, you want fast relief. And for fast relief, take sparkling sal hepatica one half hour before dinner. Get gentle, speedy relief before bedtime. Yes, for really fast relief, anytime, morning or evening, take sal hepatica and avoid laxative lag. That feeling of discomfort that continues for hours until the ordinary slow-acting laxative brings relief. What's more, because sal hepatica is antacid, it will also sweeten a sour stomach. Anytime you need a laxative, take sal hepatica. 
and get gentle, speedy relief. Morning or night, get feeling right with gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. We'll just use this desk here in the hospital boardroom, Harrington. Uh, did you bring that diagram, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. Right here, Chief. I marked the location of Frank Kent's room uh, right mm, there. Yeah, here we are. Here's the corner right here. Mm-hmm. Now, if you ask me, he went out through here and right in this door here. Yes, and directly to the kitchen. Mm. Yes, from here, it would be easy to get out into the yard. Sure, if you have help. Yes. Yes, I want to go over that with Gresham. Uh, what did his office say, Harrington? Well, I told the guard that we're over here in this wing, Chief. Mm-hmm. He said he'd tell Gresham as soon as he comes in. But he's not here now? No, and he hasn't been since last night. Well, it's my fault, actually. I should have made sure he kept in touch with us. Ah, uh, he'll be back, Chief. In the meantime, we can try to figure out what happened. Yes. Well, it narrows down to this. Kent's been gone over a week. He's ten days now. Mm-hmm. Gresham can't find a trace of him. And there's nothing turned up at missing persons, either. I checked again just before we left to come out here. Mm. Well, all right, let's assume this. If a fellow patient couldn't have released Kent... And that holds because they were all locked up, too. Yes, exactly. Then the next guess is an employee. Chief, you mean one of the nurses or doctors? No, no, not necessarily. It might have been a guard. At least someone who knows these passageways very well. Yeah, and knows where Frank's room was. Yes, that's right. And finally, someone who wanted him out. Well, it couldn't have been a relative. His record doesn't list any. Well, nevertheless, somebody helped him, Miss Miller. Our job is to find out who and why. worry about Frank Gresham. Joyce will bring him right back here to the trailer. As soon as the show is over? I promised you, didn't I? You don't want that audience to riot, do you? Well, all right. Can't be much longer. Well, it sure was a surprise to me, I'll tell you that. Do you care for a drink? No, no, thanks. Uh, what was a surprise? Finding out Frank was in a nut house. I hope you know I wouldn't have had anything to do with him if I'd known. You'll still have to answer some questions. As I explained, there's some doubt about how Frank got out. Well, you got me. He turned up here in the carney, and I hired him. That's all I know. Mm-hmm. You've always been with the carnival? Yeah, for years. What makes you ask that? When I was standing in the crowd outside, I asked some of the other performers about you. None of them seemed to know much. Oh? You ask at the front office? Not yet. I imagine the district attorney will see to that. The D.A.? I told you his disappearance could have become very serious. Oh, sure. Well, tell me, how did the uh, how did the D.A. find him here? He didn't. I did. Oh. Then he don't know you found him yet? Not yet. My job is to see that he gets back. Sure. Well, you can count on me, Gresham. Like I said, he turned up and I hired him. That's about all I know. He looks thinner than when he was at the hospital. Has he been well? You got me. He seemed to want to be alone, so I didn't bother him much. I see. They're taking a long time. The crowds are crazy about him. He'll quit in a minute. Joyce handles the questions for him. <laughs> Amazing. I-, I-, I had a hunch I'd find him in a place like this. That's why I looked in that magazine. Billboard? <laughs> yeah, you tell me. Hey, you know, it's hard for me to believe. What is? Oh, that he could... Well, have a couple of screws missing. He's such a simple guy. His mind isn't. He's sure nuts about figures. You, uh, sure you won't have a drink? No, not now. It's just cheap whiskey. I don't usually go for drinking myself. Take a bottle like this. (laughs) Simple-minded jerk. How do you like it now, huh? Come on, you lousing up the chair. Come on, Frank. we got to change him. Hey, don't just stand there. Help me do something with him. That's my friend. You keep out of this, Frank. Joyce, lock the door. What did you do to him? I hit him with the bottle. Now, will you lock the door? Mr. Gresham is my friend. I think if I'm Shut hungry, up. You... I don't want to hear another word out of you. Joyce. I'm locking it. All right, all right. Now put Frank in his closet. What? 
You heard me. Put him in and lock it. Go on. Not now. I want to stay with my friend. Go with Joyce, Frank. Go on. Come on, Frank. In here. Please? Emil, I can't... Frank, Frank, get in there. You want a belt in the teeth? No. In here, Frank. That's good. And don't make any noise. Any more orders, mastermind? Now, don't get smart. Smart? When you just hit him over the head? You think I'm going to let him take Frank back after all my work? He'll only find you again, Emil. I told you this was no good. Oh, look, this creep was on his own. All I got to do is change my name. And Frank's, too. What happens when he comes to? You going to keep hitting him the rest of his life? I don't have to. Why not? Do you think he'll ever come a... What do you mean? The rest of his life is over, kid. He's dead. I'm sorry, Harrington. I... I was so shocked when you told me it was Roy Gresham, I... I didn't get all the facts. You know how you feel, Chief? I couldn't believe it either. Uh, Harrington, you said he died from a blow on the head? Yeah, yeah. Doc Hogan's got him downstairs in the morgue now. Uh-huh. Where was his body discovered? In a boxcar. What? Yeah, in a boxcar on the railroad side, Miss Miller. Switch out about ten miles out of town. His death occurred there? No, I doubt it, Chief. There weren't any signs of fight or anything. It's... It's more like somebody killed him and then threw him in the empty car. Yes, well, we'll know more when Dr. Colgan's through. Uh, how about his effects? Everything was on him. Keys, identification, billfold. Uh, how much money? About $40. Stuff's all coming up in an envelope. Jewelry? Yeah, watch, ring, the usual. I see. Well, robbery is pretty well ruled out then. I think so. Yes. Get the state hospital on the phone, William Smith. Oh, sure, right away, Chief. I asked Gresham if Frank Kemp could turn violent. And he said if the right things happened. Yes. I wonder if they did. She even got him into his tuxedo yet? He goes on in another hour. Hey, Mo, I'm scared. You what? All right, shut the door. The door. Never mind, Frank. I wasn't talking to you. I said shut the door. Yes, sir. Now, there's nothing to be scared about, Joyce. You saw the papers this morning. They barely mentioned that bum from the hospital. I mean here. This isn't a carny anymore, Emil. This is a nightclub. Hey, you're telling me. Forty bucks a night. The police will be looking for Frank. Don't you see that? More than ever now. So what? So what? When they find Frank, they'll know about that... that man. Ah, you think I'm a dope? You think they ain't got that squared away? Joyce, shut up. Look, kid. Who was looking for Frank? Gresham, wasn't it? Mr. Gresham. Shut up or I'll throw you in the closet. What if they do find him? But who... Who will they they... think killed him? Me? Or a nut who escaped you mean you're going to tell them Frank killed him? Mr. Gresham... I'm telling nobody nothing. Chances are it'll be a long time before they find us. But if they do, what then? They'll assume Frank conked them. It's natural. Mr. Gresham is dead. We know that, Frank. You're my money machine, kid. And I'm keeping you turned on full. <laughs> Listen now to some good grooming advice. Every Jane and Judy and Alice goes for guys who use Vitalis. They have handsome, healthy-looking hair when they give it live action care. So be one of those well-groomed guys. Well-groomed and Vitalis-wise for live action care of your scalp and your hair. Get Vitalis. Do more than just keep your hair well-groomed. Keep it neater in a natural, healthy-looking way with live-action Vitalis Care. Vitalis and the 60-second workout wakes up your scalp. You actually feel the tingling difference, and she'll see the difference in your hair. 
Yes, be one of those well-groomed guys. Well-groomed and vitalis wise. For live action care of your scalp and your hair. Get vitalis. Yes, get vitalis. <laughs> When the doctor out of the hospital calls, let me know, Miss Miller. All right, I will, Chief. I've asked for a full report on Kent's condition. Uh Uh-huh. At least if we understand his illness, we'll know what to expect. And where to find him. Yes, I'll get that. Oh, all right. Maybe the doctor. Yes. Chief? Harrington. I got news. Where are you? About two miles from that railroad site. Oh, where Gresham's body was found? That's right. I found a carnival playing a field out there. A carnival? Yeah, yeah, Chief. This falls right into our lap. Remember that half a ticket stub we found on Gresham? Yes, yes. Did you trace it? Yeah, sure, through the printer. Gresham got it when he paid admission to this carny last night. A carnival. Of course, of course. Well, for sure, you can just about guess the rest. Yeah. Frank Kent was in the sideshow here until this morning. Yes, who with? Oh, a guy named Emil Hudson. Oh, and a dame. Emil Hudson. Yes, yes, it means plenty, Harrington. His name is on the personnel records at the hospital. Huh? Yes, he used to work there. Oh, brother, this is really narrowing down. Well, all right, let's finish it then. Uh, can you get a lead on where they are now? Uh, well, well, see, we're, we're stymied there. Yes? Looks to me like the three of them pulled out for good. <laughs> Joyce. Sit still, Frank. Now fix your tie. Mr. Gresham... Don't keep mentioning him, Frank. He's my friend. Yeah, yeah, I know. Mother, I want to introduce my friend. What? He wants me to walk to school with him, Mother. May I? What are you talking about? If I walk with my friend, they can't laugh at me. Not if I'm with him. Sure. <laughs> sure. Now, hold still. You go on in half an hour. Don't laugh at my friend, Mother. Please don't. There. Now you look okay. Mother? Look. Now snap out of it, will you? You're laughing, Mother. Don't. What? Stop, I said. Frank, let go of me. Frank, Stop no. Stop it. Stop Frank, it. Help. 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 Don't laugh. Get him all excited for. Are you nuts? They tried to kill me. Relax, I said. Relax. Don't hurt me, Mother. Don't. Wait a minute. Slam the door, Joyce. You want the manager to come in here? I want to get out of here. You stay where you are. Now listen to me, Frank. We go on in a minute. And you're going to do a show. Mother. Now think, Frank. Think? Numbers. Nothing but numbers. Eight times eight. I... uh, Tell me. Eight times eight. Tell me. The answer is 64. All right. Eight, nine, six, five times four, six, nine... Yes, thank you. Yes, that's right. Yes, I have that. Yes. That's right. Yes, thank you. No, that's all we need. Right? Chief, nothing so far. Me neither. That's all right. We're finished. Finished? Yes, almost finished, Harrington. Get your things, Miss Miller. You too, Harrington. You got what we want, Chief? Oh, I'm sure of it. Now let's go. Quite a change for me, Harrington. I don't get to nightclubs very often. No, me neither, Chief. Not even on a visit like this. Oh, Chief, he's coming out on the floor. Oh, yes, I see. All right, Harrington. You better take your station over by the wall. Right. See you in a minute. Does someone over there have a problem? This gentleman has a problem. May I have the numbers, please? Are you ready, calculator? Ready? Six, seven, nine, six, 
Repeat that, please. Six, seven, nine, six. Multiply by seven, eight, nine. Times seven, eight, nine. The answer, please. Mm-hmm. The answer is five million three hundred and sixty-two thousand and forty-four. Oh. 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 I thank you. May we have another question, please? You, sir? Yes, yes, I have a question. Go right ahead, sir. The human calculator never fails. Uh, may we have it quiet, please? No. Go ahead, sir. My question is, who killed Roy Gresham? What's the question? Frank Frank. Wait a minute. Who killed him, Frank? Tell me quickly. Amos, stop him. Stop they put sister on right behind Frank? Him. Amo killed him. Amo hit him. Shut up. All right, boy. Just stand where you are. All right, just stay at your tables, ladies and gentlemen. This is all part of the show. Uh, Brophy's at the door, Miss Miller. See that he takes charge of Frank. He's all right, Chief. He isn't moving Um, out of his chair. Let go of me, you clown. What are you trying to do? Hey, Mo Mason, stop. All right, take them out the side, Harrington. Come on, both of you. This show is over. There's one good thing, Chief. Yes. Frank is back in the hospital. He certainly is, and under good care once again, Miss Miller. Yeah, so are Joyce and Emil. Under our care. Real special. Yes. Joyce didn't stand up very well under questioning, did she, Harrington? No, I'll say she didn't. She even handed us the bottle Emil used to kill Gresham. Complete with fingerprints. Well, Chief, actually, you didn't need Frank's statement at all, did you? No, Miss Miller, but it helped to unnerve both. Joyce and Emil. That, and it gave them no chance to get together on their stories. And that's why she broke down so readily. Oh, it was a cinch. After that ticket stub led us to the Carney, all we had to do was phone nightclubs until we found one that had just booked a mental act. Yes, Emil boasted that he'd put Frank into a nightclub, Harrington. And some of the carnival people were only too glad to give us that suggestion. Yes, some suggestion. We find them waiting for us. Well... Frank sure got a mind, all right. I'm glad he's got a good care now and in a place where he belongs. Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy tonight to join the San Francisco Junior Chamber of Commerce and station KNBC in naming our first honorary Mr. District Attorney. He is 15-year-old Alvin Julian of Sequoia High School in Redwood City, California. Alvin, at great personal risk, lowered himself into a narrow drain pipe to rescue a 13-month-old baby that had fallen 10 feet into the pit. Our first honorary Mr. District Attorney, Alvin Julian. Information on how you can become an honorary Mr. District Attorney can be supplied by the station... To which you are listening. You know, ladies and gentlemen, in each of us somewhere there exists fear. A clever criminal realizes this, and often he can twist that fear into tragedy. We encounter such a man in next week's highly dramatic case of Scared to Death, and I urge you to join us for it. Until then, thank you. And good night. The next time you have a headache, take bufferin because bufferin acts twice as fast as aspirin. Here's why. You see, no tablet, no powder can relieve pain until the pain-relieving ingredient enters your bloodstream. Bufferin, with its exclusive formula, gets into your bloodstream twice as fast as aspirin. That's why it acts twice as fast as aspirin to relieve pain. So for fast pain relief from headaches, neuritis, neuralgia, get Bufferin at drug counters everywhere. B-U-F-F-E-R-I-N. Bufferin. The names of all characters in the ninth dramatization are fictitious and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role... Len Doyle as Harrington and Vicki Vola as Miss Miller, with music by Charles Paul. The program was produced and directed by Edward A. Byron and written by Robert J. Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. And remember, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health 
Vitalis for well-groomed hair. Sal Hepatica, Vitalis. Fred Utell speaking for Bristol Myers, who invites you to tune in again next week for Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. One of the real headaches of my job is the unwary person who walks into the trap of a confidence game. If these people are lucky, they lose only their money. All too often, as you will hear in the case that follows, they also lose their lives. This heat... I never saw such country. Yeah, it's a desert. What'd you expect? I'll be glad to get out of it, I can tell you that. You'll be glad to get the money, too, won't you? I quit belly aching so much. You sure she's got the money? She said she's got it. That's good enough for me. She's still behind us? I can't see in all that dust. Yeah, she's still behind us. Dad, you still think it's a good idea? Suppose somebody comes along and finds her. Out here. This road hasn't been used for ten years. What are you stopping for? This is where we're going to do it. Uh, she's coming up and stopping behind us. Trouble, Miss Morrow. We can all take my car if we have to. Get out of your car, Miss Smith. But what for? This certainly isn't the place, is it? Are you going to get out or do I have to yank you out? Am I? Mr. Morrow, what kind of an attitude is Come that? on, get out! Well, I... Well, it's my car. I guess I can stay in it if I want to. You'll stay out of it. I never heard of such a thing. If I want to... Well, better take it easy, Dan. You don't want to leave any marks. I know what I'm doing. Now, shut up. Oh, she's coming too, Dan. Better hurry. get the money? Right here. Gosh, what a wad. Uh-oh, she's on her feet. Mr. Morrow, will you... Will you please tell me why you stalled my car in sand? Keep you from driving it, Miss Smith. You'd like it back to town. And tell them about this. How are you going to make it back to town? Well, I guess I can... Wait a minute. You... You wouldn't leave me out here. There'd be no one to help me. A person would die out here alone. In this heat. Oh, please let me in the car. Get away from that. No. Don't leave me. I'll die. I'll die, Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Morning, Miss Miller. Oh, good morning, Mr. Garrett. Hello, Harrington. Hi, Miss Miller. Anything stirring? It certainly is. Phone was ringing as I came in the door. Did you read that thing on the front page this morning? About the woman being found dead on the desert? Yes, I read it. I got the paper right here. Died of thirst. Well, this call came from the manager of her bank. He says she drew $10,000 from her account last week in small bills. Thinks it must have been the day before she went to the desert. Well, that's interesting. The bank manager thought so, too. He felt you should know about it. Did he leave his name, Miss Miller? Yes, I've got it here. Um, Mr. Payton. Remind me later to drop him a letter expressing our appreciation for his alertness. 
Did he give you any information about the woman? Uh, says here in the paper she was a Miss Emily Smith, 48 years old. Mr. Payton says she lived alone, had no relatives that he knows about. Where did they find her, Harrington? Near a highway, wasn't it? Yeah, not far from the general store at Buffalo Springs. What else does it say there? Uh, a woman's car was found on an abandoned mine road five miles from where her body was discovered. The car had been driven off the road and was stuck in the sand. Only spinster with 10000 in cash. What would she be doing out in the desert? Might be worth looking into. I think so. Well, Miss Miller, call the sheriff's station at Buffalo Springs. Tell them we'll be there inside the next couple of hours. Come on, Harrington. Captain Kane in. Right here, Mr. Guy. I've been expecting you. Oh, hello, Harrington. Hiya, Pete. Hey, you guys really get it hot up here, don't you? Oh, dry heat. It's good for you. Yeah, it wasn't so good for that woman you found yesterday. No, it sure wasn't. That why you came up? No, that's right, Kane. What do you have on the case? Not too much. Think there's something funny about it? Well, did she have any money on her? Some silver in her purse, a couple of bucks. Anyone see her alive? Yeah, she went into the store... Bought some bottles of pop to take along with her. Storekeeper says she told him she was heading for some kind of an outer space shrine. He said she seemed pretty sensible, though. Shrine? Do you have anything out here like that? Mm, not that I know about. Sounds like one of those phony religious setups, Chief. Yeah. Coroner's wagon hasn't come up for the body yet, Mr. Garrett. Uh, would you like to take a look at her? I might as well, I guess. Our morgue is right across the hall here. Is there any evidence of anyone being with a captain? Storekeeper says no one he knows about. Oh, this is it. Second table here. Wow. I never saw anything like that before. Uh, dehydration. 48? She looks like 148. As soon as we get back to town, I'd like you to do a checkup on this woman, Harrington. Her habits, friends, everything. Okay, Captain. Cover her up. Hey, it's it's cold in here. <laughs> it's got to be. Darn it. What's the matter? Line's busy. Who are you calling? Newspaper. Tell them to cancel our ad. I ordered the phone taken out this morning and the electricity turned off. What are you talking about? Well, we don't want to keep paying for them if we're going to take a trip, do we? You just can't wait to start living up that money, can you? I'm sick of waiting. Well, you're going to wait. Then you get on that phone and cancel those stop orders. I won't do it. You promised me that trip, and I'm going to have it. Here, give me that phone. No. Give me that. You try it, Dan. You try calling those people, and I'll scratch your baggy eyes Don't out. Don't start anything, Connie. I'm warning you. And keep your claws off me. Put that phone down, then. Get away from me, Connie. I'll show Get you. Get away from me. I'll... Why, you... I hope I broke your jaw. Hello, Miss Miller. Chief in yet? Well, yes, he is, Harrington. He... Find out anything, Harrington? Yeah, I did, Chief. A couple of things. Number one, Miss Emily Smith has been known as a fanatic for years, hopping from one phony religion to another. Number two, she was also nuts about flying saucers. And this neighbor I talked to, well, she said she just recently joined up with some outer space cult. And this ties in with that shrine the storekeeper mentioned. How about the name of the cult? He, uh... Well, neighbor didn't know. But she said she thought Miss Smith got next to it through a through an ad in the personal column. Well, let's see if we can get anything out of that. 
Do you still have the paper you had with you this morning? It's here, Mr. Garrett. See if you want ad section. Oh, thanks, Miss Miller. Personal column. Now, here it is. And here's one that sounds like what we're looking for. Are you aware of the realm of outer space? Are flying saucers the means to our salvation? If you would learn the great truths of our day, join the disciples of the entire universe. Call Elmwood 64245 for an appointment. Hmm. That sounds like a pip. Miss Miller, do you think you'd be interested in joining this group? Sounds like fun. Good. Pick up the phone and see if they'll give you an appointment for this afternoon. <laughs> I can't wait. This is our present meeting place, Miss Miller. But of course, it's nothing to what Mrs. Morrow and I have in mind for the future. You see, Miss Miller... We expect to build a temple of our own. One of the most unique edifices the world has ever seen. A shrine, Miss Miller. A shrine to which the superior beings of outer space will be drawn. Summoned by the vibrations of welcome which we will project into the ether. And where will the shrine be located, Mr. Morrow? In the vast open reaches of the desert. But not too far from here. Well within commuting distance. I'm fascinated. But won't this take a lot of money? Yes, it will. Our greatest problem. And we have no one to turn to but the people who associate themselves with us. Perhaps Miss Miller might be interested in furthering the development of the shrine. (coughs) Well, I'm sure Miss Miller would want to know a lot more about it before she has any thoughts like that. And, of course, you'll only be too glad to take the time to tell her. Frankly, yes, I, I would. There are several things she needs to know particularly the ritual of our initiation. I'll be happy to learn the ritual, but right now I'd better be running along. I have someone waiting for me outside. You'll be back tomorrow? Will that be all right? It'll be fine. Goodbye, Mrs. Morrow. Goodbye, Miss Miller. Goodbye, Mr. Morrow. Goodbye, my dear. have any luck? I'm expected to come back tomorrow. Were you well received? Very well received. I'm to be told all about a shrine in the desert, a place for flying saucers to land and bring us the superior wisdom about a space. Did they mention money? Oh, yes. They need money to build the shrine. Apparently, Miss Smith's $10,000 was only the beginning. Who are these people, Miss Miller? Well, Mr. and Mrs. Morrow. He's Dan and she's Connie, and I know I'm going to be asked for funds. Well, go along with it. Let them think you're an eager prospect, but watch yourself. You're dealing with a pair of ruthless killers. Now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A woman had been found dead of thirst in the desert, five miles from a stalled car. Apparently an accidental death. But word had come to my office that she had withdrawn $10,000 in cash from a bank account the day before her disappearance. Further investigation disclosed that the dead woman had belonged to a pseudo-religious cult featuring flying saucers in its formula. A cult supposed to be building a shrine in the desert. Miss Miller had joined the group. And as you'll see, this gave us the break we were waiting for. Well, what are you doing here at this time of the day? I'm waiting to meet Miss Miller. And why can't you meet her at the apartment like you did the others? Is it because she's young and good-looking and you can't bear the thought of having me around when you're with her? Oh, let's not start that again, Connie. You've been seeing her for three days now, Dan. Is she ready to buy in yet? I don't know. All right, keep quiet. Here she comes. Good. Since you're so reluctant to ask for the money, I'll do it for you. I'll give her the same spiel you gave Emily Smith. Listen to me, Dan. I'm pretty good at it. Shut up. Good morning, Miss Miller. Oh, good morning, Mr. Morrow. Hello, Mrs. Morrow. Good morning. You've come in at a rather sad moment in our lives. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there anything I can do to help? Well, it's rather involved. 
You see, we have this option to buy the land for our desert shrine, but it runs out tomorrow at midnight. And unless we can put up $10,000, we're going to lose it. Oh, but you can't lose it. That's what we've been telling each other. But there it is. There must be something. Well, the other day you said you might be willing to accept a financial interest in the shrine. Oh, yes. Stop worrying about it, Mrs. Morrow. I'll put up the money. Wonderful. Could you meet us out there with the money uh, tomorrow afternoon? In the desert? Yes. It's a little place called Buffalo Springs. We could meet in front of the general store. Consider it settled. Miss Miller, you're an angel. Isn't she, Dan? Yes. Yes, she certainly is. Oh, you're too kind, both of you. Now I'd better go and make arrangements about the money. I'll see you both tomorrow. It's me, Mr. Garrett. I couldn't wait to come into the office to tell you. They just made the proposition. A trip to the desert? I'm to meet them at Buffalo Springs tomorrow afternoon with $10,000. Okay. We'll fix up the money for you. Better come on in now and we'll work out a plan. You did all right, Miss Miller. Thanks, Chief. Bye for now. There's Miss Miller's car, Chief. Better go behind the store, Harrington, so the Morrows won't see us. Yeah. That's a good spot. Right. And we can see from here, and they won't notice us. Wow. Boy, this is hot country. Look at that thermometer. 110 degrees. 108, Harrington. You'll never notice the difference. Be philosophical. Remember what Captain Kane said? It's dry heat. Good for you. Whatever it's good for, I probably don't have. Why? There are the Morrows. Yeah, we aren't going to be able to follow them too closely. They'd see our dust. We know where they're going, and that's the main thing. There they go. We let them get a start and then follow them. Okay. Let's not wait too long. I guess that's far enough ahead now. Let's go. Hold it, Harrington. We might as well face it. We've lost them. This was the right road, wasn't it? No doubt about that. They crossed us up. Went somewhere else. Yeah, that's bad. I guess we let them get too far ahead. Well, we've got to move fast. No use chasing them all over this desert. There's an airport at Silver Wells. Head for it. Hey, mister! Hey, mister! Hold it, will you? Something wrong? We want to talk to you. Can't hear what you're saying. We want to talk to you, please. What did you say? He's going to kill the engine, Harrington. I hope so. I'm yelling at the top of my foot. No, oh, fine. Okay. Now, what are you fellas all excited about? My, my name's Harrington. I'm an investigator. This is the district attorney. Oh, well, I'm Tom Mason. Uh, am I in trouble about something? Or nothing like that. We need your help. There's a girl lost up here, and we have to have a plane to find her. Well, I'm your man. Climb in. Now, watch where you step. Too bad you have to turn off the engine. No trouble to get it going again. All set? Let her go. Let her go! All right, Dan. Get out and do your stuff. Let, let's call it off, Connie. Let's tell her we've changed our minds. I thought you'd come up with something like that. So I brought this gun along. Oh. You won't take care of her? I will. All right, sister. Where's that money? 
I see you have a gun. Where's the money? Right here. Thanks. Now back your car off the road. But it'll get stuck. The next one will come a lot closer if you don't do what I tell you. Move the car. Yes, Mrs. Morrow. Now what am I supposed to do? Why don't you try walking? See if it'll do you any good. All right, Dan, let's get going. Are you going to leave me here? Consider yourself left. Get moving, Dan. This trip might not be so simple, Connie. We got troubles of our own. What? Car is heating up badly. Can we make it to that motel near the store? I guess we could do that. Then do it. We can stay there till it cools off tonight and head back to the city. I guess so. See anything down there, Harrington? Oh, not a thing. I'm beginning to get worried. How far from the store will she be? Could be miles. Well, we've still got lots of time before dark and we... Hey, wait a second. What is it? Well, I saw a car down there off to the left. I'll bank around. Hey, he's right, Chief. Look. There's a car in the sand off the road. She's standing alongside of it, waving at us. Good girl. She was smart enough to stay with the car. Can you land there, Mason? We're practically down. Not to do it on that road. Here we go. Happy to see you. Climb in. Yeah, pretty smart. Staying by the car. Well, I figured I could always drink the water from the radiator if I had to. <laughs> You're all right, Miss Miller. We all set? All set, Mason. Here we go, then. This motel is all right. Air conditioning and everything. Yeah. Uh, how do you think that girl feels by now? Who cares? Who's that? How do I know? Open the door. Mrs. Morrow? That's right. I'm Paul Garrett, district attorney for this county. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Well, I can't imagine why... Any objection to my coming in? I think it's kind of nosy, but come on. Thank you. I assume this is Mr. Morrow. Yes, I'm Morrow. What's all this question stuff? You mind telling me what you're doing out this way, Mr. Morrow? Why should I? What are you doing out this way? Well, I came here to investigate the death of a Miss Emily Smith. Huh? So what? Do you happen to know a Miss Smith? No, we didn't. Are you sure about that, Mrs. Morrow? I have information that Miss Smith was a member of a cult or a society run by you people. Well, yeah, I knew her slightly. I'm sure you knew her more than slightly, Mr. Morrow. I have information that you knew her well enough to talk her into coming up here with more than $10,000 in cash. You have all kinds of information, haven't you? Yes, I do. I also happen to know that you arranged to meet another person up here. A young woman by the name of Miss Miller. Isn't that true, Mr. Morrow? I don't know what you're talking about. She came up here today. You and Mrs. Morrow took her out to an abandoned road and forced her to turn over the money she had with her. And then you left her there with a car stuck in the sand. You're crazy, mister. Let's see you produce this, Miss Miller. I can do that, all right. She's outside. You see, we landed an aeroplane on that road about a half hour ago and picked her up. And the money you took from her happens to be marked. You think you're going to be able to explain that? Dan, what are we going to do? I told you this was a bad one. You got me into this, you little... <laughs> now you, mister. Get out of my way. You're pretty good at slugging women. Let's see you try with me. I'm going to do just that. <clears throat> hey, 
I thought I heard a commotion in here. You did. Come on in, Hankin. They're all yours. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. No doubt you remember the facts of this case. The couple we call the Morrows were tried and found guilty of murder in the first degree. Also of conspiracy to commit murder and highway robbery. Both are now serving life sentences. Now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. The district attorney knows that the world of crime has many windows, and that only by looking through all of them may the truth be seen, because nothing is more dangerous than half-truth or half-knowledge. This case we're about to hear had its start three years before it came to my attention. Harry, I beg you, please don't go. Please get out of here and let me pack, Doris. How can you do this? You're my husband. We're going to have a baby. The kind of dough I make... I'll go back to my job later, Harry. We'll make out. I'm making out right now. Out of here. I'll watch out for me. You watch out for you. You're in love with somebody else, aren't you? I'm not in love with you. I'll never give you a divorce, Harry. Yeah, you've been saying that for months. What else is new? Harry, I, I can't go through this alone. I need you. I love you. Please. Please don't do this to me. You're going to be a father. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Yeah, it means I'm going. Stay. Stay until morning, please, Harry. Harry, I'm frightened when I'm alone at night. This house is so isolated. Stop blabbing. Here. Here, I'll leave you my gun. Do me a favor. Blow your brains out. Harry. Get out of my way. Harry. Doris, put that down. Stay, Harry. No. Harry. 
What have I done? Harry! Harry! Get out of here. Get out of here before... Before the police find out. I'll call the doctor. No, no, that's no good. It's my fault, Doris. Go, go on. Far away. Change your name. Harry. I was no good. Go for the... For the baby's sake. Uh, uh. Harry. Harry. I just, I just got in from a movie. I've been trying to reach you for a couple of hours. Oh. I can't find the Sanderson papers in the files. Why, well, I, I put them on your desk. Thought you might work on them tonight. Well, just a second. <laughs> oh, yes. Here they are, all right. Right under my nose. Oh. I'm sorry I disturbed you. Oh, it's, it's all right. I'm, I'm glad you called. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Uh-huh. Business as usual. Oh, well. Who's in there? Don't be frightened, Edith. I waited for a couple of hours. Then your landlady let me in. You seem to know me. Do I know you? Doris Griffin. Uh, I mean, Doris Lloyd, before I was married. (gasps) We went to high school together. Yes. Last I heard of you, you were modeling. Yes. And then I married Harry, Harry Griffin. Here. Here, you'd better sit down. Now, what's the matter? Why did you come to see me? You work for Mr. Garrett, the district attorney. Yes. Well, I have to go to him. I'm afraid to go alone. Have you done something? I killed my husband. Oh, I see. When did this happen? Three years ago. Our baby was coming. He was going to leave me. Where's the baby now? I gave him out for adoption in Baltimore last week. That's where I ran to after I shot Harry. I want to face it and get it over with. I want you to take me to Mr. Garrett. He's at the office working tonight. I'll go in and talk to him, but you're in no condition to go any place tonight. You try to sleep and I'll be back. There's nothing in that file either, Miss Miller. I know. Perhaps the old files in the storeroom? Three years and then solved? No, it should be right here. I should remember it for that matter, and I don't. You sure it happened in this county? She said right here in the city. Well, Hank will be up from the record bureau in a minute. They'll be certain to have it there. I may have misfiled it. Oh, you don't usually. It looks like I did this time. Chief? Well, you just saved us a job, Harrington. What have you got? Sore eyes from looking. No record? Chief, there hasn't been anybody named Griffin murdered in this county since 1892. There's no report of any such murder in the files, and we have no wanted sheet out on any Doris Griffin. But that's impossible, Harrington. (laughs) Nothing is impossible, Miss Miller. You've been here long enough to know that. We get a dozen confessions a month to crimes that never happened, or from people who didn't commit crimes that did happen. He's right, Miss Miller. Your old schoolmate seems to have all the symptoms of a psychopath. She wasn't lying to me, Mr. Garrett. People who are mentally sick sometimes believe that they've done something they haven't. Miss Miller, I'd like to arrest a murderer. It's my job. But we can't arrest anybody for a murder that hasn't happened. Unless, of course, your friend's story isn't complete. She probably never had a husband or a baby. Or if she did have a husband and shot him, as she says, it wasn't a case of hysteria or temporary insanity. What makes you say that? The simple fact that no body was found, which would indicate she didn't just run. She hid the body or stripped it of its identity first. 
Oh, yes. It would have to be that way, wouldn't it? You better get on this again, Harrington. Yeah, what do you want this time, Chief? Marriage license bureau. Make sure there's a record of a Doris Lloyd marrying a Harry Griffin. Mm-hmm. Then if you're sure there was a Harry Griffin, check our records and the records of the surrounding counties for all unidentified bodies found during the probable period of the murder. Uh, you gonna wait here for it? No, dig up what you can and bring it to Miss Miller's apartment. We'll be there. Come along, Miss Miller. Yes, sir. She's in the bedroom. In the state you say she was in, if she's asleep, we'd better let her rest for a while. I'll look. Yeah, she's asleep all right. No, no, she isn't. Where's the light switch? I'll get it. Her eyes are wide open. She looks so strange. Doris. Doris, are you all right? Get some water, Miss Miller, right away. What is it? She's in a state of emotional shock. Get the water. I'll open some windows. Mrs. Griffin. Mrs. Griffin, try to talk. Hurry, Miss Miller. I'm coming. Get the water. Smelling salts, too. Good. Here, open your mouth, Mrs. Griffin. Try to drink some of this. She won't touch it. Try the salts. <laughs> She's in bad shape. We'd better have her taken to the hospital. Where's your phone? On the dressing table. Smell this, Doris. Come on, breathe, breathe, please. Operator, get me to the general hospital. No, don't push it away. It'll help you. Hello. This is Paul Garrett, the district attorney. Ambulance emergency. I don't 49 Hooper. Out. Apartment 4D. Hurry. Hurry. Is he... Is he calling an ambulance for Harry? Yes. Yes, now, now just lie back and rest until it comes. Everything's going to be all right. Is that her purse on the chair or yours? It's hers. We'd better take the liberty of looking into it. The papers are probably in the billfold. Driver's license. Baltimore, Maryland. That's where she went when she ran away. Name on it is Doris Lloyd, though. Same on her social security card. That was her maiden name. Might be her only name. She might have resumed it after the murder. What are those? Newspaper clippings. The one ads. Help wanted and rooms to rent. Apparently she didn't come to you as soon as she arrived in town. How do you know? Papers dated last week. A couple of ads circled in pencil. Help wanted. Dress manufacturers. She used to be a model. Well, that whole section is circled. How about the rentals? And just one. Single room. Fourteen dollars a week. 6611 West Homedale Avenue. She might have been living there. We'll have to check it. And that'll be Harrington. You stay with her. I'll get it. Hi, Chief. How did you make out? Mavis License Bureau was another blank. I guess we were right the first time, then. I don't know. They might have been married in another state. Well, that's a possibility, of course. But what makes you think so? Well, I did find a record on a Harry Griffin. What? Yeah, this. Magistrate court. Five years ago, charge was wife beating. Wife's name was Doris. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dismissed when she refused to press charges. Yep. It could be other people with the same name. No. This is occupation as dress designer. Hers is a model. She and her husband, all right. This kind... <laughs> Hold on, Miss Miller. Grab a Harrington. I have to. Go ahead. I. Well, I didn't want to hit her. That was the only way. Carry her into the living room. Okay. You all right, Miss Miller? You scratched me a little, that's all. Thought I had her calm down. She was staring at the window, jumped up suddenly, and tried to throw herself out. She's a very sick girl. Sounds like an ambulance coming, Chief. Yes, I sent for it. Did Harrington find out anything about her husband? Yes, yeah, she was married, all right. Maybe she still is. I don't get you, Chief. We know there was a living Harry Griffin. The court record you found proved that. Yeah. 
We still haven't found any trace of a dead Harry Griffin. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the missing corpse, here's an important message I'd like you to hear. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A woman had confessed to the three-year-old murder of her husband, but the body had never been discovered. Our police files showed no record of such a murder. I went to talk to the landlady in an address circled in a newspaper advertisement we found in the woman's purse, an address where Doris Griffin might have rented a room. Stop your knocking. I'm sorry. Your doorbell seems to be out of order. Rooms are $14 a week and no cooking. Well, I'm not looking for a room. I'm looking for information. Do you have a tenant named Doris Griffin? No. How about Doris Lloyd? No. That one. Who are you? My name's Paul Garrett. I'm the district attorney. Oh. And she's in trouble, is she? Well, I can't say it gives me any surprise. None whatsoever. Why do you say that? Oh, them sweet young things. They're all the same. I only lived here a week, but the men, oh, the men, how they telephoned her. Do you mean men or a man? Well, I don't know for sure. I didn't think you did. The phone is right there in the hall. You must have answered it. Well, I did mostly. Maybe it was one man. Had a funny voice, kind of hoarse it was, like I had a cold. Did he ever leave his name? No, never said. Just ask for Doris Lloyd. Did she ever tell you who the man was? She did not. I see. Did the man ever come here? No, nope, she never had a visitor in the week she was here. Did the phone call start the day she came? No, no, she went job hunting that day. Started the day after. Oh, that'd be last Thursday. After they started, she didn't go looking for work. She just stayed in her room and cried. I see. Thank you. You'll see her, her rent's due again. I'll be holding her back. I'm sure you will. Miss Miller? Oh, Mr. Garrett. Is Harrington back yet? Just came in a minute ago. He's waiting in your office. Well, what are you working on? Monthly report to the mayor. Now let it go. Go over to the general hospital and see how Doris Griffith is making out. Yes, sir. Tell the doctor I'd like to know as soon as she's in condition for me to talk to her. Yes, sir. Hello, Chief. Got anything? Yes. She rented a room all right. How about those dress manufacturers? No, I checked the whole list. She hit them all last Wednesday. Filled out job applications. Do they know anything about her? No. Only that she seemed very nervous. In one place, they said they thought she was crazy. Why? Well, she filled out the application the secretary gave her, and she was waiting for an interview with the boss. He was out to lunch. When he came in, she took one look at him and ran out. Didn't even wait to talk to him. In which place was that? The uh, Frederick Grant Company, a big new outfit. You talked to Grant? Uh, no, no, I didn't. Well, why not? Well, he wasn't there, Chief. The secretary said he'd been home all week, not feeling well. As a matter of fact, he went right home after this thing happened with the Griffin girl. You get Grant's home address? It's a big place in the Ferndale Estates District. Too swanky for house numbers. I'll find it. I'm going out there. You meet Miss Miller at General Hospital and wait for me. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Garrett. I was dressing when the maid brought your card up. I'm Mrs. Grant. I guess the maid misunderstood me. It was your husband I wanted to see. Oh, well, he hasn't been feeling well. The staff has orders he isn't to be disturbed. Perhaps I can help you. Well, possibly. Oh, well, won't you sit down? Thank you. You have a lovely home. Oh, thank you. Just what is it you came here about? I wanted to get some information about a Mrs. Griffin. Mrs. Harry Griffin. That name mean anything to you? 
Well, I can't say that it does. Have you ever heard your husband mention her? No. Should he have? Perhaps. Perhaps not. If I could ask him directly... Are you in here, Elizabeth? Oh, yes, dear. For the last time, haven't I told you... Oh, I didn't realize you had company. Mr. Garrett, this is my husband, Mr. Grant. Mr. Grant? Hello. Elizabeth, I want to talk to you as soon as you're free. I'll be in the study. Oh, I can step outside for a moment if you'd like. Uh, that won't be necessary, Mr. Garrett. What's the matter now, Fred? I thought you were leaving for Acapulco tonight. Now Johnson tells me you've unpacked. That's right. Why? Because I don't want to go. Mr. Garrett, perhaps you'd better excuse us after all. I'm sorry we subjected you to this. Oh, don't apologize, Mrs. Grant. It's been very enlightening. Now, what kind of a smart crack is that? Who are you, anyhow? What are you doing here? Perhaps the name escaped you. Garrett. Paul Garrett. I'm the district attorney. Oh. As for what I'm doing here, I can make that very brief. Do you know a Mrs. Harry Griffin? What is this, some kind of a riddle game? Is that supposed to be an answer? I never heard the name before in my life. Anything else? No, that's all. For now. Good day. The doc said it's okay to see her, Chief, but isn't going to do any good. Why not? She's under heavy sedation. Miss Miller's sitting with her, but she doesn't even recognize her. Oh, it's the next room. If we question her while she's relaxed, half asleep, we may get something. Hello, Miss Miller. Hello. We've got to try to question her. She's barely conscious. It may help. Doris. I mean that I, I see him all the time. His face. You shot him, Doris. The, the baby. He was sleeping. What did you do with the gun, Doris? I threw it. Threw it away. Threw it in the water. Where? Where in the water, Doris? Wallace. Wallace Pond. It's all right, Doris. Go to sleep. It's all right. something to go on. Wallace Pond? Yes. Call for a lab squad. We're going to drag for that gun. We may find more than the gun. We may find Harry Griffin's body. I doubt it, Harrington. I doubt it very much. I told you to cover that end systematically. Your bare feet will find anything on the bottom. Those hooks are only stirring up mud. Thank you. Uh, a lot of junk down here, Chief. I should have been born with fingers on my feet instead of toes. Feel something? Yeah. Metallic. Solid. Right under my foot. Yep. I got it. Uh, cake with mud, but it's a gun, all right. Bring it out. All right, men. We've got it. Revolver. Small caliber. Only a twenty-two. Open the chamber. See if it's been fired. Uh, Rusted. Uh, uh. Three chambers empty. Hey. What is it? Let me empty this cylinder. Look. There's three shells aren't fired. Those are blank cartridges. Oh, sure they are. Uh, this is the wrong gun. No, Harrington. I don't think so. Now I'm convinced that I know where to find Harry Griffith's body. Where? In a very luxurious home belonging to Mrs. Frederick Grant. Or maybe at the airport waiting for a place to out the Poco. Let's go. Hey, 
Hey, my shoes. Put them on in the car. Oh, ouch. Oh. Just a minute, mister. What? Go up, me. My plane's loaded. Your name Frederick Grant? That's... No. No, it isn't. Well, let's go over there to the baggage room until we find out what it really is, huh? Let go. I said the baggage room, mister. Ah, ah, you're breaking my arm. Not if you stop twisting. Just walk. In. Ah. Hello, Mr. Grant. I don't have you broken for this. Making me miss a plane. I've got the money and the influence to do it, too. You mean your wife has, don't you? Your present wife. I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe you'll understand better if I call you by your right name. Harry Griffin. You're crazy. That's not my name. Easy enough to prove. Harry Griffin was arrested once on a charge of wife beating. Police have his fingerprints. Make it easy on yourself, mister. All right. I I was married to Doris once, but it was a mistake. I, I wanted out. She wouldn't give me a divorce. I met another woman, Elizabeth, my wife now. Keep talking, Griffin. Elizabeth had money. She didn't know I was married. I told her my name was Frederick Grant. Marrying her meant a chance to build something big, a company of my own, but Doris was in the way, ready to stick me with somebody else to take care of, a baby. Yes. And you were afraid to kill her, so you made her think she killed you. Who told you where to find me? Elizabeth? She didn't have to tell me. I knew she wasn't going to be using that plane ticket. I figured you wouldn't want it to go to waste. Come on, mister. There's a nice cell waiting for you. You can turn on the water in the sink and make believe you're in Acapulco. You take him in, Harrington. I have to wait here for a while. To meet an arriving passenger. Who? Doris Griffin's little boy. I called the people who were going to adopt him. They're sending him back to his mother. Chief, she's in no condition to be... No, but someday soon, when she knows the truth, she will be. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Harry Griffin, alias Frederick Grant, was convicted on charges of bigamy and fraud. He is serving a 10 to 20 year sentence in the state penitentiary. Doris Griffin, completely recovered, is operating a very successful school for models and raising her son in a manner that meets with the complete approval of juvenile authorities. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the files of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.
And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. One of the most important factors in fighting lawlessness is the person who has witnessed a crime or knows something about it. Usually, these people are cooperative and helpful. But sometimes, as in the case you are about to hear, the witness tries to turn his knowledge into profit, becoming a criminal himself. Okay, let's get him. Hold it, friend. We're going in with you. I'm sorry, but it's only 8.30. The bank doesn't open for business until 10. I just stepped out for some breakfast. Well, you know why you uh, stepped out. We know the manager of the joint. Now, fix this door so it's unlocked and don't argue. You, you mean it's it's a hold-up? Fix the door. If I find it locked when we leave, I'll blow your guts out. But I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. I'll fix it. There. Okay, let's go in. Straight back to the vault. All your people out from behind the counter. Act natural. Yes, sir. Will you please come out here, everybody? Everybody, please? You had it right, Willie. They already got the vault open for us. You still want to tie the hands? Certainly. That's what you got the wire for. All right, folks, against the wall. This is a holdup. You get your hands out. We're tying them up. The things too, Willie? Everybody, everybody. Let the manager do the tying. You get in that vault and get the money. Good idea, Willie. Mister, you finish him up. Wait a second. Don't nobody move. What's the matter? You got a guard in this place. Where is he? I, I, I don't know. In my office, maybe. He should have stayed there. All right, mister, freeze. And don't get any ideas about going for that gun. No, John. John, don't! You shot him. And you'll get the same thing if I hear one more bleed out of you. What's with the loot? I'm coming, Willie. I'm coming. All right, you people. Squeeze back against the wall and stay there. We're going out of here, and I don't want to hear a move, see a move, or smell a move. Let's get out of here, will you? I'm loaded. Stay right where you are, everybody. And don't try to follow us. Nobody. Open the door for me, will you? Yeah. Let's go. Folks, let us through here. Let us through, folks. Please, please. Oh, hi, Sarge. Where's the... Oh, oh, I see it. Yeah, lying in front of the vault, Chief. Yes. The officer tells me that you're the district attorney. I'm Harrington. This is the district attorney, Mr. Garrett. How do you do? I'm J.T. Barnes, manager of the bank. I went out for some breakfast this morning, and they practically kidnapped me. Breakfast? After you start at work? Oh, yes, yes. I'm the first one here, and my hours start long before the bank opens for business. And you first saw these men outside? Yes, that's right. And they must have known all about the way a bank is run. They had everything down just right. You, uh, you think it was an inside job? Oh, no, 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 no. I never saw either one of them before in my life. But one of them must have worked in a bank at some time. Hmm. Or they spent a lot of time casing this place. Are they waiting at the door, Mr. Barnes? That's right. They made me let them in. What could I do? They both had guns, and one of them told me he'd blow my guts out if I made the wrong move. What could I do? Very little, Mr. Barnes. We understand that. I only hope our Mr. Telford understands it. Uh, Mr. Telford is vice president in charge of this district. I hope he understands I wouldn't worry about it, Mr. Barnes. It's not your job to fight gunmen. No. Not when I have a wife and family to think about. Two children, Mr. Garrett. One, ten, the other seven. Man has to think about things like that. 
He certainly does. I, uh, I see the vault is still open. Yes. Wouldn't do much good to close it now. They got just about everything in the way of cash. How much did they get away with, Mr. Barnes? More than 40000 Imagine that. $40,000. And I can tell you everything they did. Everything. Poor Brady. Started to draw on them. They just pumped bullets into him. Poor who? That's Brady, our guard, under that sheet. He's dead. Oh. Well, let's take a look, Hank. Yeah. Tim Brady. You knew him? Yes, for many years. Yeah, both of us. How many were there? Two of them. Uh, what did they look like? Oh, nice-looking, well-dressed. When they first came up to me, I thought they were bank examiners. Young? Between 25 and 30, I'd say. Both had hats on. One of them called the other one Willie. Willie was the one that killed Brady. Nice, friendly personality. Hand me that piece of wire at your feet, will you, Harrington? They use that to tie up their hands. Ah, bailing wire. A lot faster than rope. Yes, and not many people use bailing wire in the city. Get on this right away, Harrington. Check the hardware stores. See if one of them has sold any bailing wire in the past few days. Okay, Chief. Is there a phone I can use, Mr. Barnes? Oh, yes, of course. Right over here. Thank you. District Attorney's Office. I'm at the First National Bank, Miss Miller. I'd like you to do a quick check on something for me. Find out if there's anything on a bank robber who uses Willie for a first name. Yes, sir. I'll get on that right away. Any characteristics? He's about 28, flashy dresser, and there's something else. He's a killer. You got that? I've got it, Mr. Garrett. I'll see you at the office. I'll be there in about a half hour. got the key? Yeah, I got it. Well, we made it better than 42,000 bucks. Of course, that was a fast count in the car, but it's pretty close. You slophead. What? I spent three weeks warning you about pulling boners, and what do you do? Pull the biggest of all. What are you talking about? I told you not to use my name, didn't I? Who used your name? You did. Well, eat this, will eat that. I don't knock your teeth down your throat. So I called you Willie. How did that hurt anything? There's millions of guys named Willie. But they ain't robbing banks. Ain't gonna have the cops looking for them. All right, all right, so I goofed a little. They were all too scared to pay attention. Uh, put that bag under the bed and let's get out of here. What are you looking around at? You seen the place before? You know, Willie, I ain't sure if the dough is gonna be so safe here after all. Well, what do you want to do with it? Carry it around in your hip pocket? This is what we rented the place for, ain't it? Yeah, but suppose somebody comes in and starts poking around. Who's going to poke around a garage apartment? It's all by itself, ain't it? And it'll be locked up? Yeah, how about kids? You know how kids are. Look, we figured this all out, didn't we? We have to have a place to keep the dough, don't we? What are the odds in somebody poking in here? What are the odds? Well, maybe we should split the dough and each take a share and leave town. Uh, like I said, you're a slophead. And you keep proving it. All we have to do to get cops on our back is to leave town or start spending the dough. We stay in town. We keep working on our jobs. We leave the dough here. We're mechanics. They don't figure mechanics are bank robbers. So we stay being mechanics, understand? All right, so I understand. You don't have to get so hot about uh, it. You're like a dame, always talking, always changing your mind. Knock it off. I'm warning you. Okay, okay. Okay, so let's get out of here. Come on, what are you dragging your feet for? I'm coming. Patterson? Yeah. Before we leave here, I want you to know something. What? We're going to stay together. I know that. Just make sure you know it good. Don't go trying to sneak back here to pick up the dough. Now, why would I want to do a thing like that? Just don't, that's all. Try it and I'll kill you. Let's go. Calls, Miss Miller? Oh, no calls, Mr. Garrett. I made that checkup you asked for. The only Willie I got to make on is a Willie Sloan, and he's in Alcatraz. 
Well, so we draw a blank. And that makes it tougher. District Attorney's office. Hello, Miss Miller, the chief there? Oh, yes, he is, Harrington. Hold on. Hello, Harrington. I've been to 16 hardware stores, chief. Where are you now? At the 17th. I'm waiting for a clerk to come back. The manager says the clerk sold some failing wire yesterday. He says he thinks the clerk knows the guy he sold it to. Sounds like a possible lead. Call me back as soon as you find out anything. Yeah, that might be pretty quick. Fellow just came in and went behind the counter. Must be the clerk. I'll let you know, Chief. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Oh, how are you? I think maybe you can. Are you Zimmer? Yes, I am. Well, I'm with the district attorney's office. I understand you sold some bailing wire yesterday. Uh, bailing wire? Yeah, that's right. Your boss said he thought maybe you knew the man you sold it to. You're from the DA's office? What's the matter? Somebody pulled something? Do you remember who bought the bailing wire? Hey... A bank robbery this morning. They used bailing wire to tie up the people. You heard about it on the radio. Uh, who bought the bailing wire, fella? Yeah. What do you know about that? Did you sell the wire? Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, I sold it. Did you... Did you know the guy you sold it to? Did I know him? Well, what makes you think that? Look, I'm asking the questions. Did you know the man or not? Well, uh, No. No, I don't think I did. You don't think you did? Well, how do I know? People come in here all the time, lots of people. Wouldn't want to accuse anybody Look, of doing something. I'm not something. asking you to accuse anybody of anything. I just want to know if you knew this man you sold the wire to. Sorry, mister, but I couldn't say definitely that I did know. All right. Have you seen him around here at all? You know, at other times. No. Can't say I have seen him around. Well, do you remember what he looked like? Look, I told you. A lot of people come in here to buy things I can't remember all their faces. Okay. I, uh, I might come back and talk to you later. District Attorney's office. Hello, Miss Miller. Is he there? Oh, just a moment, Harrington. It's for you, Mr. Garrett. Thanks. Hello, Harrington. What did you find out? Uh, I got nothing, Chief. I got a funny hunch this fellow was holding out on me. The clerk? Yeah. He sold bailing wire. He admits that. But he heard about the holdup, and I think he's covering up. He said he didn't know who it was he sold it to. But he acted funny, and, well, I think he was lying. Where are you now? Drugstore, across from the hardware company. Corner of 10th and Trent. I'll meet you in front of the place as soon as I can get there. Chief. Well, looks like we missed. What happened? Ah, Clake's gone. Must have ducked out while I was talking to you on the phone. Oh, that's too bad. Well, what do you think we ought to do? Well, hang around. This is our only lead, and somehow we've got to break the case with it. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the bank killer, here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A bank had been robbed, a woman slugged, a bank guard murdered. Indications were that the gunmen were first-timers, and these are often the hardest to catch. We had one important clue, the bailing wire used to tie up the bank workers. But the hardware clerk who sold it to the killer turned out to be an uncooperative witness. We had a hunch he wanted to play along with the crooks. As you'll see, we were right. can I do for you? I'm looking for Patterson. No peddlers here, bud. I'm not a peddler. I'm a friend of his. I'll call him. Patterson! What? Come here! Friend is, huh? What do you want to talk to him about? What are you, his keeper? 
This is personal. Don't get tough with me, chum. It'll get you nothing but wealth. What do you want, Willie? Oh, hello, Zimmer. This guy says he's a friend of yours. Yeah, yeah, I know him. Says he's got something personal to talk about. Anything I should know? What do you want, Zimmer? I want to talk to you. Private. Come on, spell it. I said it's personal. It's okay, Willie. Give us a couple of minutes, huh? Okay. A couple of minutes. Come here, kid. What's on your mind? Fellow come into the store today. Said he was from the district attorney's office. Yeah? Wanted to know about that bailing wire I sold you. What do you want to know about it? Want to know who I sold it to. Did you tell him? No, I didn't tell him. I brushed him off. Good boy. What's it good for? What's this about the DA's office? I thought you was going to let us talk private. Ain't your word good for nothing? Never mind my word. What's this all about? It's okay. You don't have to worry. All I hear is okay, okay. What's okay? Oh, this cop comes into the hardware store to ask about the bailing wire, and Zimmy brushes him off, so it's okay. How come this guy knows about the bailing wire? I bought it from him. You mean you bought that wire from a guy that knew you? Listen, the kid's all right. He brushed off the cop, didn't he? Why, you... What'd you have to do that for? You slop head, I ought to kick your face in. Well, I, uh, I guess I'll be going. Wait a minute, you. Let go of me. You're not going to push me around like that. What'd you come here for? Let him go, Willie. He's a pal. He's a creep. Let go of me. I brushed off the cop, didn't I? So you brushed off the cop and you come sucking around here telling us about it. You figure you're going to shake us down for a cut of the dough. I'll show you. I... I'll choke you. I'll choke a speaking inside that. Let me down, Willie. The boss is looking this way. <laughs> You and your pals. You shouldn't have shouldn't have done that to me. You shouldn't have done it. Take it easy, kid. Take it easy. You're gonna be all right. Oh, Willie loses his temper once in a while. That's all. This time he's not gonna get away with it. I'm just gonna ask you guys for a couple of hundred bucks. No, it's five thousand. You hear that, Willie? You hear? You hear what you've done? Shut up. He had it pegged for five grand from the start. I you ought to. You try that again, and I'll let you have it with this tire iron. All right, kid. So we do business. Put down the iron. I'll put it down when I walk out of here. How much dirt do you figure you have to have? I said 5,000, and I want 5,000. I want it this afternoon. We're supposed to be working here. We we don't knock off until 4 o'clock. I'll meet you somewhere. And don't get any ideas about getting rid of me. My wife's going to be somewhere close by. Anything goes wrong, and she yells for the cops. <laughs> Got everything figured, ain't you? That's right. I got everything figured. All right. Meet us at 430. 1034 Maxwell Street. It's in the back, up over the garage. I'll be there. You think anybody followed you here? I know they didn't. Uh, how about where you work? Ain't they going to wonder why you ducked out? That's my worry. I'll take care of it. I'll see you later. And now you, Patterson. Who's the boss, Willie? I got to get back to work. That's the guy, Chief. Good. Let's go in and talk to him. Zimmer. Yeah? Oh, it's you. This is the district attorney, Mr. Garrett. I just like to ask you a few questions, Zimmer. I already told this fellow everything I know. I understand you sold some bailing wire the other day. That's right. Your boss seems to think you know the man you sold it to. I'm sorry, but the boss is mistaken. You don't remember the man at all. I already said I don't remember the man. You've got a defiant attitude about this, Zimmer. Why? Who's defiant? Just tired of answering a lot of questions. I don't think you can say we've asked you a lot of questions. You keep asking the same questions over and over. I told your cop here the same thing I'm telling you. I don't know the guy who bought the bailing wire. You have a lot of people coming in here all the time. <laughs> Half of them I don't even look at. When do you usually take your lunch hours, Zimmer? What difference does that make? You mind answering the question? All right. I go at 12.30. Well, how long do you usually take? Half an hour. Yeah, it's almost 2 o'clock. You took a pretty long one today, didn't you? I had a couple of things I wanted to do. You mind telling us what they were? Yes, I mind. I haven't done anything wrong. I don't see why I have to keep answering your questions. I guess I got my rights, haven't I? You've got your rights, Zimmer. I just hope you have the good sense to keep them. Come on, Harrington. Good morning, 
Well, what do you think, Chief? He's too touchy. I'm sure your hunch is right. You stay here in front, Harrington. I'm going around to the alley. I don't want that fellow to get away from us again. It might take quite a while, but we're going to stay with him until something breaks. Zimmer coming? No sign of him yet. And what are you doing back up here? Eh, uh, I sure hate to see him get that five grand. I still think we ought to take all the dough and blow town. We ain't blowing town and we ain't giving up any part of the money. What do you mean? Made a couple of phone calls this afternoon. I found out that Zimmer ain't married. He was bluffing when he said he'd have somebody with him when he came up here. So what are you going to do? So when he once gets here, he ain't going to leave. You're going to kill him? He's got it coming, Patterson. Yeah. Yeah, there ain't no honesty in the guy at all. But what do we do with his body? Leave it here. We'll move somewhere else. But I want to be sure he ain't followed by cops. So you get down there and watch. Okay, Willie. Watch it, Harrington. He's slowing down. Yeah. He's going to take that next corner. Stay at least a block behind him. Right. Hang on for the turn. Slowing down again, Harrington. Watch it. Yeah. Yeah, he's pulling up. We better stop right here. Yeah, this is it, all right. He's getting out. Watch where he goes. Looks like that red house. He's going around the back. All right, Harrington. Well, let's take it easy. You found it all right. Yeah, I found it. Come on in. Yeah, good place for a hideout. This where you're keeping the money? You really want to be in on this thing, don't you? Hey, what's the idea of the knife? Beauty, ain't it? Six-inch blade. Don't move. No, no, wait a second. Who's this cop you talked to? There, 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 were, there were two of them. What all do they say about us? I told you. They just want to know who you are and what you look like. And you told them? No! Why should I tell him when you're going to give me a cut of the money? You told him. No, no. Get that thing away from me. How do I know they didn't follow you here? Look, I had my car parked three blocks from the store. I went out the back, ducked up the alley, cut across the parking lot, and went through the market. I know they didn't follow me. Good. Because now I'm going to do something I've been wanting to do for the last three hours. Get away from me. Get away. You didn't really think we were going to sit still for the shakedown, did you? Wait, wait. Please wait. I'm going to cut you, friend. I'm going to cut you, but good. No! Take your gun. Let go of me. Let go. Get him in here. Good punch. How about out there in the street? Anybody around? Don't worry, he wasn't followed. Just a couple of guys selling paint jobs for houses. Try to sell me one. Me. Oh, what's wrong with that? You can afford it. <laughs> Willie, you're a card, a real card. Yeah, he's getting up. Grab his arms. I got him. Listen, you gotta let me out of here. I won't say anything, I promise. I'll say you won't say anything. I want to get his throat patterned. Oh, no! Don't move, any of you! Pops! Watch the gun, Harrington. That's all for you, mister. You too. Drop the knife. Drop it. All right, all right. I quit, I quit. Get your face to the wall. Wait a minute, Zimmer. Where do you think you're going? Home. I got things to do. You're under arrest. What for? I didn't do anything. You'll find out what you did, and it's plenty. There's the money, Chief. And guess where they had it? Under the bed. Just, just tell me one thing. Are you the two guys who were supposed to be selling paint around here? That's right. Why? It just proves to me why I lost out on this deal. A real slop head for a partner. That's not why you lost out, mister. But you wouldn't believe the real reason. Your kind never does. Let's go. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the...
the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. I'm sure you read about this one in your newspapers. The two men we called Willie and Patterson were convicted of bank robbery, assault with intent to kill, and with murder in the first degree. Both will spend the rest of their lives in prison. The hardware store clerk we call Zimmer was tried and sentenced on charges of being an accessory after the fact and attempted extortion. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. district attorney pays special attention to crimes committed by juveniles, no matter how petty, because the incorrigible minority of the teenagers of today will include the major criminals of tomorrow. There are even a few who don't wait until tomorrow. This case started with a gang fight at night in a public park. Give it to him. Get those 300 for the pond. He asked for it. High school picnic. I told him this park was closed except for my gang. You're a nice boy from the high school. Look at him run. Can we fight? You cut out with sticks and bottles. Get that one, Eddie. Take his teeth out. Where is are coming? All right, guys, get lost. Meet at the clubhouse later. Come on. I hope they get caught. I hope the cops catch them and put them in jail. Shut up. Through the bushes and up the hill path. I don't have to run. I didn't do anything. You're my girl, and if I run, you run. I don't want to be your girl anymore. No, you want to go back to nice little Walter and his nice little picnic. You'll be my girl as long as I want you to. Cut up the old path behind the zoo. Go on before leave I... Leave her alone. Who's that? Never mind, just leave her alone. Walter. Well, if it ain't Brainy himself, the president of the G.O. I was wondering where you run to, Yellow Belly. Now, I ran to call the police, that's where I ran. Your gang with baseball bats and broken bottles. Oh, that ain't fair, is it? Maybe next time we'll bring a platform and have a debate instead. Come on, Julie, I'll take you home. <laughs> on the trolley car? Get wise, she likes automobiles, don't you, honey? I'm going with Walter. Oh, no, you're not. You haven't got your gang with you now, Jackie. Well, isn't the little man getting brave? I don't need the gang for you, Brainy. Now, well, I got this. Walter, it's a knife. Jackie, Look at him, Julie. Look at the big, brave basketball player. Look out, Walter. It's sharp. You might get cut. What's the matter, yellow belly? Afraid? Dad got your tongue? Come on, take it away from me. Because if you don't... You know what's going to happen, don't you, Brainy? You dirty... Ah! 
and get to the car. Run! You're sure the park has been thoroughly searched, huh? Chief, I've even gone over it myself. I've worked with ten different squads in the past five days. There's no sign of the murder weapon. Nothing. Mm, it beats me. None of the high school kids saw it happen. The main fight was down near the park pond. Now, whoever killed Walter Spicer got him off someplace alone up behind the zoo. This will probably be Spicer's parents calling again. Not that I blame them. Almost a week and that boy's killer is still at large. Yep. Yes, Miss Miller. There's a Mr. Hagen here to see you, Mr. Garrett. What about? He doesn't want to tell anyone but you. Oh, you tell him I'm busy. Ask Burton to see him. He says it's very important, Mr. Garrett. All right. Send him in. Well, I guess I've got to get down. No, no, stay, stay. If he's a crank, you may be able to help me get him out. Right in here, Mr. Higgins. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garrett? He's Mr. Garrett. Oh. My name's Jim Hagen, Mr. Garrett. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Hagen? It's all right. Mr. Harrington is a member of my staff. Well, it's about my daughter, Julie. I'm afraid she's in some kind of trouble. With the law? I'm not sure. I reckon it must be. Ever since we come here to the city, she's been changing. Staying out late, keeping things to herself. How old is she? Just 16. Can't you and your wife exert any authority over her? Oh, my wife said that Julie needed freedom, that it wouldn't hurt her none. She used to bring her friends to the house, and then she stopped. Ruby, uh, that's my wife, said it was because Julie was ashamed of me. Ruby says one look at me and everybody know I used to be a farmer. Mr. Hagen, this seems to be a family problem. I'd like to help you, but, well, what is it you want me to do? Oh, I thought maybe you might come to the house, talk to Julie. Might scare a little, you being a district attorney. Uh, Mr. Hagen, do you know that your daughter is in trouble, or do you just think so? She's hardly taking a bite of food all week. I've been hearing her crying in her room every night. Then last night... Go ahead. Julie was out late. I was setting up waiting for her to come home. Must have been about uh, one o'clock, I guess, when she come to the front door with a boy. I heard him talking. She's crying. He's twisting her arm or something, hurting her. Telling her to get hold of her nerves and keep her mouth shut. About what? Oh, I don't know. Well, if the boy struck your daughter, you could prefer charges, but she'd have to sign the complaint. Do you know the boy's name? Well, she called him Jackie, that's all. Could you identify him? It was too dark in the hall for me to see him. Julie never brought her friends in. I'd know his voice, though. And you have no idea what it is that he might have been telling her to keep quiet about? No. Well, you just said no sounded like yes. You said this crying had been going on for about a week. When did it start, exactly? I... Uh... No, well, maybe you're right. Maybe I'd better handle this myself. Hagen, does your daughter go to Central High School? Yes. Did your daughter know a boy named Walter Spicer? She went out with a boy named Walter before she took up with this Jackie I told you about. She used to go out with Walter Spicer? Yeah. That's why I came here. That's the night she started crying, the night Walter was killed. But she's a girl. She couldn't have had anything to do with it. But she might know who did. It's after three o'clock. School is out. Will your daughter be home? Sometimes she comes, sometimes she don't. She'll be home to eat, though, at six o'clock. All right, Mr. Hagen. You can go. We'll be at your home tonight at six o'clock. Ten o'clock? Where can she be? She's run away from home. That's where she can be. I knew she would. I warned him to quit nagging the girl, Mr. Gatt. She's old enough to take care of herself, and well, now she's gone because he brought you here. Your daughter didn't know I was going to be here, Mrs. Hagen. 
And a 16-year-old girl isn't as self-sufficient as you think. That may be Miss Miller, Chief. Well, may I take it? Go ahead. Hello. Mr. Garrett? Oh, yes, Miss Miller. We finally located Julie Hagen's teacher. The girl wasn't at school at all today. I see. You want me to stay here at the office in case there's anything else? For a while, please. Harrington will give you a lift home later. You could give me a ride to Central Avenue. I could take the bus from there. Well, Harrington goes close to your place, doesn't he? Y- yes, I suppose he does. It'll be fine. Good. We'll see you later. Your daughter never showed up at school today, Mr. Hagen. Where can she be? I told you where. She ran away. Did you see her during the day, Mrs. Hagen? Ruby? No, Ruby didn't see her. Ruby was at the beauty parlor all day. She wouldn't know if Julie did come. I was only at the beauty parlor for two hours. Just two hours. We're not living on a farm anymore. I've been a good mother. It wasn't me who drove her away. Better put out a missing persons report on Harrington. Right, Chief. Do you have a recent photograph of your daughter? In the bedroom. Oh, would you get it, please? We can have telephotos sent to nearby states along with her description. Oh, we'll do anything. Well, anything yeah. five, Mr. He Mr. never Mr. understood her. Any more than he ever oh, understood please. me. Harrington. I'm sure he didn't, Mrs. Hagen. He just wanted to sit around the house every night. I don't know how I lasted all these years. Except for Julie. I was the one who took care of her. I was the one who saw to it that we got away from that dirty old farm so she'd have a chance in life. I wanted her to have all the things I missed. It was all for her. Oh, I'm sure of that, Mrs. Hagen. Uh, Pete, we'll put it on the teletrap right away, Chief. Wants the photo as soon as we can get it to him. Well, I got it right here. Well, we'll take it in. Well, there's not much more we can do tonight. If Julie should come home, or if you hear from her, let me know no matter what time it is. We will, Mr. Garrett. Find her for us, please. Please find her. We'll do all we can. I hope you're satisfied, Jim. I hope you're satisfied now. Oh, Ruby, leave me alone, please. You'd better try to get some rest, Mr. Hagen. I'm sure Mrs. Hagen will take care of herself. Come on, Hagen. Well, why don't you say it? We was better off back on the farm. Make some excuses. Oh, that poor guy. She's got him in a bad way. I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about the daughter. Let's get this photo in as fast as we can. There's no need for you to drive me all the way home, Harrington. You can drop me off at the subway station. This time of night? Chief would eat me alive. It's out of your way. Oh, oh forget oh, it. Oh, please. The station's just ahead on the corner. Hey, and I... it's just ahead, all right. Look. An ambulance. Yeah. Quite a crowd this time of night. Something must have happened down there. I wonder what it is. It won't take long to find out. There's a police car there, too. Come on. Hey, get back there. We can't go down. The district attorney's office, officer. Well, let's see your credentials. Yep, yeah, hey, uh, what is it? Girl got killed under the train just to pull into the station. Oh, she pulled or jumped? The motorman on the train said she was pushed. Pushed? Well, that's what he says. Said he could see her and the boy on the platform as he came out of the tunnel. And the boy shoved her. Well, he was gone by the time the train stopped. All right, take me down there. The lady better wait up here. Yeah, I guess he's right, Miss Miller. You better go on back and sit in the car. All right. Down this way. The train was eastbound. It happened right at the beginning of the platform. Oh. Wasn't taking any chances on the motorman getting time to slow down and stop. All right. Put it back. No identification on her. I know who she is. Wonder why she was pushed. She knew too much about that boy who was murdered in the park last. Well, she isn't going to be able to tell anybody about it now. No, no, she isn't. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the knifing in the park, here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A 
high school boy had been stabbed to death in the park after a gang fight. A worried father led us to believe that his daughter might know something of the murder. But the girl died violently under the wheels of a subway train before we could find her and question her. Harrington called me to the subway station. I had no choice but to send for the girl's father. My little girl murdered. Murdered in a city. The city where people hate and kill each other, not like the farm. People live in peace on a farm. Take it easy, Mr. Hagen. How about let me drive you home? Home? Without Julie? Not anymore. There'd be just Ruby and me. Ruby got tired of me a long time ago. Only the girl held us together. She's all I had. Now I got nothing left. Nothing except her picture. Can I get it back? Yes, we had some blown up copies made. You can get the original at my office at any time. Uh, why don't you give him that copy of the blow up you got in the envelope, Chief? Oh, yes. Here, Mr. Hagen, I brought it down for identification purposes. I only had this taken three weeks ago at the amusement park. First picture of her in years. Almost like I knew something was going to happen. Three weeks ago? Yeah. Why, Chief? The blouse the girl was wearing tonight looks like the same one she was wearing in the photograph. It is the same one. Mr. Hagen, in the blow-up you have, your daughter's wearing a little pin on her blouse just over the pocket. Oh, yeah. She's been wearing it all the time for a few months. It isn't on the blouse now. No, she stopped wearing it a couple of days ago. I got it. With you? Yeah. May I see the pin? Thank you. What is it, Chief? High school club? No, boys club. See the crest and inscription? Oh, yeah. State Street Target. Got a clubhouse at the foot of State Street near the river. Rented an old store, painted the windows black with a tiger head on them. It was some sort of an organized gang that started that fight in the park. Those State Street kids are tough, Chief. What I want to know is, does one of the members go by the name of Jackie? Yeah. He might have given her the pin. He also might have pushed her off this platform if she saw him kill Walter Spicer. Where is that club? I'll find out if he's there. I want to get my hands on him. The law can handle this, Mr. Hagen. Officer? Yes, Mr. Garrett? You got a prowl car? Yes, sir. Drive this man home. Then go to the county building. My secretary should be back there by now. Yes, sir. Tell her to call Judge Macklin and get a search warrant for the clubhouse of the State Street Tigers. Right. After you get it, pick up a squad and meet Harrington and me at the clubhouse. Yes, sir. Come along, Mr. Hagen. Oh, my girl. Hi, Julie. I'll take my car. It's at the far exit. What's the idea of the clubhouse search, Chief? Well, even if there is a boy named Jackie who belongs to the club, we've got nothing but hearsay evidence against him. Circumstantial. We could never convict him. His fellow members will probably swear he never knew Julie Hagen. That pin could prove he did. No, any member might have given it to her. She might have found it on the street. We've got to prove she knew the Tigers. Find some evidence that she'd been at the club room at one time or another. For a dance, perhaps. Hey, some of those clubs keep a guest book, Chief. No, oh, that's a possibility. If there is such a book, we've got to find it. Club room is on the next corner. You better stop and leave the car here. What time is it? Uh, 1.30. Probably won't be anyone around to disturb us. Yeah. Boy, Judge Macklin will have a fit when Miss Miller gets him out of bed at this hour to sign a warrant. She can handle him. Judge is all right. It's a good thing I gave Miller the ride home. You'd have taken him a different way, and not that she'd have minded. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Chief, sometimes you surprise me. What? Oh, here's the place. State Street Tigers. No lights inside. Well, you wouldn't see them any, huh, with the windows painted over like that? Oh, I was looking under the door jamb. Uh, locked. Spring lock. I could probably pick it with a nail file. Go ahead. The warrant's coming. I'm, uh, I'm a little bit out of practice. <laughs> you mean you used to do things like this? <laughs> when I was a kid. Uh, my mother was forever forgetting her keys. We were locked out of the house more times than we were in it before I learned this little stuff. Uh, yeah? From now on, I want an alibi from you attached to every burglar report we get. <laughs> come on, come on. You better close it again. 
Yeah. I'll leave the lock off. You, uh, you got any matches? Yeah. I should have brought a flashlight. There's a floor lamp over there. Yeah, that does it. Well, quite a layout. Furniture, pool table, cue racks, even a telephone on the wall. Yes. Come here. Take a look at this. Hmm? What? On the wall here, by the phone. Names, phone numbers, scribbled in pencil. Yeah. Tigers seem to have a lot of girlfriends. Rusty Denton. Paul Frenchy. Elmwood 41111. Eddie, Marsha called. Fleming, 6589. Mm, no name on this one. Elliot Doe 261. Bread, lettuce, tomatoes. <laughs> Some kid wrote down the grocery list. You know, the things he's here, kiddled... Here, take a look at this one, Harry. Jackie Wilkes. Phone Evergreen 62050. Jackie? Yes. And Evergreen 62050 is Hagen's phone number. Hmm. Give us the kid's last name, too. Oh, what a break. I want a photo of this. We can check the handwriting on every boy in the club and find out who wrote it. He'll have to testify that Jackie Wilkes knew Julie Hagen. Hey, Chief. There's a car just stopped outside. It's too soon for the squad. Kill the light. What? Anybody in here? Dope's leaving the door unlocked. Hey! Just stand right there, son. Who are you guys? What are you doing in here? We're looking for Jackie Wilkes. Jackie Wilkes? Never heard of him. Well, that's strange. Since his name is written on your clubhouse wall right next to the telephone. Oh, oh, that stuff. That was there before we rented this joint. We've been meaning to paint it over. Oh, is that so? How long has the club been here? A little over a year. You cops or something? Those numbers have been there over a year? Yeah, that's right. That's funny. Because one of those numbers belongs to a girl who has only lived in this city a few months. A girl named Julie Hagen. She was killed tonight, pushed off a subway platform under a train. That's too bad. Mortimer on the train saw it happen. He got a fast look at the boy's face. Maybe just good enough to identify him if he sees him in a police lineup. You just parked the car outside, didn't you? Yeah. How old are you? Eighteen. I got a license. Good, because I want to see it. Sure, you can... What do I have to show it to you for? I didn't do anything. You know why he wants it, boy. We want to get a look at your name. Oh. Okay, sure. Take a look at this instead. Put that gun away, kid. You killed a girl tonight. Don't make it any worse. Why would I kill Julie? She was my girl. Because you also killed Wallace Spicer, and Julie saw you do it. And when you thought you couldn't keep her quiet any longer with your threats, you pushed her under a train. It was an accident. She tripped. Did she? What were you doing in a subway when you own a car? Yeah, Jackie, you hear it? Those are police cars. Better give yourself up, boy. Stay back. Gunner, no gun, Junior. Here I come. No, Harrington. Oh, oh, oh. Harrington. Stay away from him. Do what, he, do what he says, Chief. You tell him, Brainy. I'll take your gun, too. All right, mister. Now you douse that light and stay right in front of me. You're going to lead me out of here with one of these guns right in the middle of your back. <clears throat> Do it, Chief. He's, he's killed crazy. You can kill me, Jackie, but you can't kill the law. I won't call them off. One of them will get you. We'll see. Move. Hey, you cops out there. Who's that? Jackie Wilkes. And I got one of your big shots with a gun in his back. So listen. Is that you, Mr. Garrett? Yes. Don't let him bluff you. Take him. You try it and the DA is dead. Do what I tell you. Back off across the street. Let me and him get to my car and don't follow us. And if you're thinking of shooting, remember, to hit me, you gotta shoot through him. Never mind me. Take him. Mr. Garrett, we can. He'll be picked up someplace. He's a killer. He'll hurt somebody else even if I get away. He shot Harrington. He's in here, wounded. Wounded, but... Still alive. What? I can see you against those lights, Jackie. But you can't see me. I'm behind you. I don't have to shoot through anybody but you. Uh, I've got your gun. 
You should have looked for another one. No! Get down in there! I'll kill all of you! All right, stop! You all right, Mr. Garrett? Yes. Harrington. <laughs> Here, Chief. Grab him, sir. Radio for an ambulance, Don! Oh, it's, it's not much. Flesh wound on the side. How about the kid? He's dead. How old was he, sir? Eighteen. We had to do what we did, but... A kid? His age stopped mattering when he pulled the trigger. Kid or no kid. He'd have killed you, me, all of us. Yes, sir, I know. You did what you had to do. Thanks, Mr. Garrett. Harrington... When you distracted him with that shot from behind, he had your gun. Why did you start carrying a spare? <laughs> Ooh. I, uh, I didn't, Chief. Oh, but you fired a shot. Nope. Well, what was it, then? The electric bulb from the floor lamp. I unscrewed it and threw it on the floor. Oh, that was clever, Harrington. You heard what he called me, didn't you, Chief? Brainy. <laughs> you just sit still until that ambulance gets here. You'll be all right. I think it's coming now, Mr. Garrett. Yes, it is. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Death with a gun in his hand was the way Jackie Wilkes chose to avoid trial. The police closed the club room of the State Street Tigers and six of its members who were identified as having taken part in the gang raid on the high school picnic group were given prison sentences ranging up to two years. But life had ended for Julie Hagen, too. Her parents had taken an interest in her friends... Too late. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the files of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. District attorney and a watchmaker have one thing in common. 
They both know the value of accurate time. The ability to fix the exact time a crime has been committed can lead to the conviction of a guilty man or the saving of an innocent one. The time element became very important in this case. It started late on a Saturday night in a roadside diner near a railroad crossing on the south side of town. Hi, Charlie. Oh, it's you. That's a happy greeting for your favorite brother-in-law. Stop clowning, Jack. You're not my favorite anything, and you know it. How's the fight going? Rough. Could go either way. I got pins in front by one round. What round is this? Seven. Dinah sends you down for something? No, it's something I want to see you about, Charlie. Mind if I turn this down a little? What is this, Jack? Another touch? Because if it is, you're wasting your time. It's Saturday night. I got a date. I need five bucks. Try working. That might be a way to get it. Why don't you ask your sister? Ah, don't kid me, Charlie. You know why. She wouldn't give it to me. You told her not to. I told her to use her own judgment, Jack. Turning my own sister against me. She happens to be my wife. And I'd like to see her get herself a decent dress instead of shelling out fives and tens to you. No. All right, then. Maybe I'll just help myself from the register. I wouldn't touch that if I were you, Jack. You just stay on that stool and count your hamburger patties, brother-in-law. Jack! Don't get any crazier than you are. Put that gun back under the counter. Put it back and get out of here or I'll call the cops. Do I get the door, don't I? No. Too bad. Why, you... That's the way you wanted it, cheapskate. Good morning, Miss Miller. Harrington. Morning, uh, Hello, Jack. Chief. Have a nice weekend? Very nice, until I saw the Monday morning newspapers on my desk. Why didn't you send me a wire when this diner murder was discovered? I just thought you needed the rest, that's all. And yesterday was Sunday, and... I don't like to give a murderer a 24-hour start, Miss Miller. I'm sorry, Mr. Garrett. It won't happen again. Uh, besides, Chief, he didn't get a 24-hour start. He didn't even get 24 minutes. Foul car saw him running out of the diner and nailed him on the spot. That's why I didn't feel you had to be bothered right away, Mr. Garrett. I'm sorry if I spoke sharply, Miss Miller. I reckon Clake have been getting us reports on the suspect. We don't have much here, just these two cards. But uh, here's a batch of stuff from the other states. Walter Bailey, age 40, no visible means. Most of these are arrests for vagrancy. Yeah. Bailey's a hobo. Rode into town on a 1045 freight from the west Saturday night. Arrested for robbery and murder a half hour later. Where is he now? Interrogation room. Had him brought over, Chief. I thought you might want to talk to him. I do. When they get a complete make on him, Miss Miller, take it up to my office, will you? Yes, sir. Oh, and cheer up. I did need the rest. Fishing yesterday was a lot of fun. Thanks. Yes, sir. <laughs> did Bailey have the murder weapon on him when the prowl team caught him? No. No, he didn't, Chief. He left it on the floor of the diner when he ran out. It wasn't his gun to begin with. Huh? It belonged to the diner. The owner said his night man kept it under the counter. It was the night man who was killed, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Charlie Porter. Bailey's in here. We can handle this, Kerrigan. Wait outside until it's time to take him back. Walter Bailey? That's right. My name's Paul Garrett. I'm the district attorney. Cheers. Don't get fresh, Buster. What'd you expect, singing and dancing? What are you trying to hang on me? What reason would I have for killing a guy I never saw before in my whole life? Robbery seems to be the reason, Bailey. The cash register in the diner had been emptied. Not by me. I didn't have a nickel on me when the cops caught me. No. They chased you halfway across the railroad yard before they did catch you. You got plenty of time to throw the money away. Get the whole thing in a nice big frame, ain't you? Bailey, it isn't the money so much. The big thing is that you ran. Why? Want me to draw you a picture? I know my story doesn't sound good, but it's true. I rode a hotshot freight into the yards at 1045. Fifteen minutes later, I walked into a diner, found a guy murdered. I got scared. I ran. That's all there is to it. 
I'm going to be a pigeon for you, mister. I can't even hire a lawyer. The court will provide you with counsel without charge, Bailey. It's your constitutional right. <laughs> constitutional right? You mean a bum's got rights? I've been rostered on vagrancy charges in every state from Maine to Sunny Cal. You expect me to think I got a chance? I'll let you answer that question for yourself, Bailey. Meaning what? Meaning that you have a certain positive knowledge that I don't have. I don't know whether or not you killed that man in the diner. But you do know. Come on, Harrington. Take him back, Harrington. Uh, pretty weak story, wasn't it, Chief? Except for one point. Hmm? What? If Bailey did kill Charlie Porter, why didn't he keep the gun when he ran? If he'd already killed one man, he could have gotten into a gunfight with the police, too. He had nothing to lose by more killing, and he might have gotten away. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you punched the down button, Chief. Yeah, I know. Aren't you going back up the office? No, down to the garage. We're going to take a ride out and have a look at that diner. Basement, please. Anything been touched inside? Nope. Except for removing the body. Here, let me open the padlock. What's that white circle on the floor? That's where we found the gun. The marks at the end of the counter show where Porter's feet were sticking out when the body was found. And the rest of his body behind the counter... The lab figures Charlie Porter was sitting on that stool. Slid off when the slugs hit him. There were a couple of broken dishes there. Must have grabbed at the bottom part of the counter when he fell. How about ballistics? Mm, shots were fired a distance of about uh, eight feet by the register there. The owner says the gun was kept right here, under the counter behind the radio. Behind the radio? Yeah, there's no light under the counter. Not when the set's on. Here, let me show you. No back plate on the set. Tubes lighted up under there. I see. Is the radio playing when the police found the bunny? Yeah. What are you thinking, Chief? That stool. Why would Porter be sitting here without moving while somebody came around behind the counter to the cash register? Unless it happened to be somebody he knew. Bailey might have been behind the counter working on a meal. No, that's probably it. What's this? What? Pencil and scrap of writing paper on the counter. No, that was there. Something Porter was writing, I guess. It's two rows of small squares numbered, one to ten at the top. The letter C in front of one row and the letter P in the other. Numbers in all the squares up to six. He must have been figuring something out. Yes, but what? Certainly not a bill. Who knows? Some kind of puzzle, maybe. Well, whatever it was, he must have been working at it when he was killed. Let's... Hey! What are you people doing in here? District attorney's office and don't come in. Oh, I'm sorry. I knew the joint was closed and I saw a car outside and you guys nosing around in here. And you got kind of a long nose yourself. Wait out there. Seen enough, Chief? Yes. A railroad crossing. I see you guys. I figure you might be breaking in. Is that your crossing right over there, about 150 feet? Breaking in. Is that your crossing right over there, about 150 feet? Yeah, a little shack. Are you on duty Saturday night? Sure, I work a 12-hour shift, noon to midnight. Doing what? Opening and closing the crossing gate whenever a train comes. You ever eat here in the diner? Nah, just coffee. Come over every night to get hot coffee in my time, I said so. You do it Saturday night? Yeah. What time? Oh. 10.30, same as always. How long did you stay? Just long enough to get the timers filled. Had to get back to the crossing to lower the gate for that freight that pulls into the yards at 10.45. She passes the shack at 10.43. Only one comes in on Saturday night. That's the train Bailey rode in on, Chief. I know. Did you hear a shot Saturday night between the time you left here to go back to your shack and say 11 o'clock? No. You're certain of that? 
With only one train going through, it must have been a quiet night. It was, but I didn't hear anything, except when the cops started to chase that guy, that uh, hobo. What caliber was the murder weapon, Harrington? Forty-five. Yeah, that makes a lot of noise. You should have heard the report. Unless it was covered by another noise. Like what? A freight train going through at that crossing. But Bailey was on that train. If your figuring is right, he couldn't have killed Porter. We've got to find out exactly what time Porter was killed. Coroner couldn't measure it that close. Yeah, I know. Uh, I better be getting back to the crossing. Okay if I go? Yes. Oh, just a minute. Yeah? Those gloves you're wearing, you wear them all the time? Everybody around the railroad wears gloves, mister, even off duty. That's all. Thank you. Why'd you ask him that for, Chief? Because up until now, Bailey's story was hard to believe when only his prints and porters were on the gun. What makes it easier to believe now? You heard what the gentleman said, Harrington. All railroad men wear gloves. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the hungry hobo, here's an important message I'd like you to hear. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. The night counterman at a diner had been murdered, and all the available evidence pointed to a hobo. To convict or acquit him hinged upon establishing the exact time of death. For two days, Harrington and I tried to fight the clock with no results. Then I went to call on the dead man's widow. Yeah? Is this the porter's apartment? Yeah. If you want to call this dump an apartment, this is it. Well, I'd like to see Mrs. Porter. She ain't back from the funeral yet. Hey, you must be the lawyer I called. Come in. I'm afraid there must be some mistake. No, I... no, it's no mistake. I left the name when I called. You are a lawyer, ain't you? Yes, I'm a lawyer. Ah, good, good. Sit down. There's a comfortable chair over there. When do you expect Mrs. Porter back? Oh, I don't know, soon. She's all busted up. You know, about her husband. Oh, that's not surprising. Yeah, with a man, it's different. You know, you ball once and you're over it. Are you a friend of the family or a relative? I'm Jack Hausman. Nina Porter's my sister. Charlie was my brother-in-law. Didn't your secretary tell you about my call? Oh, not very much, I'm afraid. Oh, well, you're here now. That's what counts. Let's get on to business. Things are going to be pretty tough on my sister. You know what I mean? She ain't going to like it when she finds out I sent for you, but... It's all for her own good. There must be some kind of a suit you can file against the guy that owns the diner or somebody. Uh, Charlie got killed working there, didn't he? It ought to be worth something. You want to sue somebody for your brother-in-law's murder? Why not? Look, I know the tramp killed him and got beans, but a Greek guy owns the diner. He's loaded. Why shouldn't he pay off? Do you realize your sister's husband has been murdered? Is money all you can think about? He was my brother-in-law, wasn't he? We got a right to something. What's more important to you, profiting by his death or finding out who killed him? The cops got the guy that killed him. I'm not sure of that. And I'm getting less sure every minute. You ain't the lawyer I sent for. I don't think any lawyer would come near you with a ten-foot pole. Hey, what kind of a game are you playing? You asked me if I was an attorney. I am. I'm the district attorney. The DA? Uh... I was just trying to help my sister. Any law against that? No. You're supposed to be prosecuting a killer, not coming around bothering the family and its grief. What grief? You can't wait to get the... What's the matter here, Jack? Mrs. Porter? Yes? I'm Paul Garrett, the district attorney. Yeah, he comes waltzing in here trying to tell me that tramp didn't kill Charlie after all. That's not true. I don't know whether he did or not. That's what I'm trying to find out. What do you want to see me about? You don't have to help him protect some bum. Jack! What do you want to know, Mr. Garrett? Did your husband have any friends who stopped at the diner regularly? Men from the railroad? 
All the men at the yards were Charlie's friends. A lot of them came to the funeral. They sent a big wreath. In the diner, do you know if your husband ever let any one of them come behind the counter? Get their own food, maybe. Anything like that. I don't know. Jack might. Jack used to work in the yards. Did your brother-in-law permit that? How should I know? I haven't worked in the yards in six months. Where do you work now? I've been out of a job. Is there a law against that, too? You didn't try to work. What do you mean, I didn't try? You know what I mean. You left everything to Charlie and me. Live in office, borrowing... You're my sister. I was his wife. You were old enough to take care of yourself, Jack. You're a grown man. Get out. Get your things and get out. Oh, before you go, one question. Where were you when your brother-in-law was killed? I ought to clip you one for asking me that, but I won't. I'll tell you where I was. I was with my girlfriend from 8 o'clock until midnight. Her name's Helen Campbell, and she lives at 27 Denton Street. Any other questions? Good. Well, before I go, shall I ask one of the neighbors to come in and stay with you? No, I, I'd rather be alone. Tomorrow would have been our second anniversary. Charlie used to take Saturday nights off. Before we had Jack to take care of. He used to take me to the arena for the fights. He loved them so. I never cared much for him, but I never told him. I wanted to be with him. I wanted to be a good wife to him. I tried to be. I'm sure you are a wonderful wife, Mrs. Porter. Please leave me alone. Of course. Chief. Harrington, what are you doing here? Huh? Waiting for you. I had a squad of 20 men, including the two who arrested Bailey, come in the railroad yards for that money from the cash register. If he threw it away, we didn't find it. I don't think he ever had it. You learned something up there? A couple of things. The main one is that Charlie Porter was an ardent fight fan. Hmm. How does that help? I'll tell you later after you get a rundown on somebody for me. Oh, who? A woman named Helen Campbell... Check the neighborhood around 27 Denton Street. Get back to the office with a report as soon as you can. Right. Lab men just brought in the radio from the diner, Mr. Garrett. Good. Did you get the dial setting? Yes, it was set for the station the Daily Bulletin owns. Well, call the bulletin, then. See if they carried a fight broadcast and find out exactly what time it started. Yes, sir. I'll call from my office. Oh, sorry, Miss Miller. I didn't, didn't see you coming out. It's all right. Mr. Garrett's been waiting for you. Come in, Harrington. What about the Campbell woman? Anything? Uh, nothing pleasant. Broke, out of work. Seems to be a chronic condition. Reputation isn't too good. Oh, that doesn't surprise me, judging by the company she keeps. She seem to have any money lately? Yeah, and all of a sudden. She was behind the rent and paid it up Monday morning. Yesterday. Paid off a candy store for newspapers and smoke she's been coughing. And a couple of hours ago, she paid $5 on account at the Italian grocery store down the block from her apartment when the owner dunned her for part of the bill she'd been running. I wonder where she got it. I've got a fair idea. Oh, where? From somebody who knew Charlie Porter had a gun under the counter in the diner. His brother-in-law. His, his brother-in-law. Here's the information you wanted, Mr. Garrett. The station carried a fight broadcast Saturday night, just the main event between Kid Pings and Tiger Corey. What's that for? That slip of paper, numbered from one to ten, that we found on the counter of the diner. Yeah. Hey, Porter must have been listening to the fight and scoring it. That's what the P and C stood for. Pins and Corey, ten rounds. What time did the fight start? Went out at 10.15 sharp. Did it go the full ten rounds? Yes, sir. Porter scored six rounds. That's three minutes around with one minute rest periods in between. Twenty-four minutes. That brings us up to ten thirty-nine p.m. 
He didn't score the seventh, so he was probably killed during it or just after it. That's four minutes more, 10.43, just as the train was passing the crossing into the yards. With Bailey on it. I knew that was why that crossing guard didn't hear the shot. You find out the crossing guard's name? Yeah, Tom Wells. You got a $5 bill on you? Yeah, yeah, sure, here. Write the name Tom Wells on the margin. What's the gimmick? We're going to try and outsmart Jack Houseman's girl. I'm going to tell her that one of the bills stolen from the diner was marked. That a customer who had been in just before the murder remembered changing a bill he'd written his name on. Some people do that, you know, to see if they ever get the bill back again. Okay, Chief. Yeah, there it is. Thanks. Let's go. Look, I got dishes to do in this joint to clean up. What do you come in asking me crazy questions for? How am I supposed to remember one $5 bill from another? The Italian grocer up the street claims you gave him this one as part payment on a bill, Miss Campbell. So then I gave it to him. What's this all about? I'll tell you what it's all about, miss. That $5 bill was stolen from the diner when Charlie Porter was killed. How could you know anything like that? We know because the bill is marked with a name. A customer gave it to Porter just a few minutes before the killing. Spending that bill makes you a candidate for a murder trial. It isn't my money. I didn't know. Jack Hausman gave it to me. He'll kill me for telling you. Where is he? Here. When you rang the bell, he, he went in there, the bathroom. He must have heard us. Lock. Open up, Hausman. Better break it. All right. Uh, uh, gone. Out the window. He wanted me to swear he was with me. There he is, gone over the fence at the back of the alley. Stop, Hausman! Give me a, give me a boost when we hit the fence. He may be armed. Up, up. Pull me up. Yeah, right. There, behind that old washing machine. Back off! Don't come for me. Give up, Buster. You had your chance. You hit him. Ah. How bad is it? Through the head. He's dead. I have to call a wagon and take him away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we can go out that way. The gate from the fence. Oh, uh, watch out for those broken bed springs, Chief. I might tell you close. Yeah, I see them. What kind of a place is this, anyhow? Sign on the fence. It's junkyard. Appropriate place for a man like him to end. Yeah. I, uh... I still don't know how come he didn't leave fingerprints on Porter's gun. He used to work on the railroad. I think he knew what he was going to do when he went into the diner. Probably wore gloves. Oh. Uh, you know, there's only one thing that bothers me, Chief. No? That bill I wrote the name on. What about it? You still got it. Ain't I going to get it back? <laughs> sure, I didn't. Here. <laughs> <laughs> This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Walter Bailey, the hobo who was almost convicted on circumstantial evidence, was found to be an amnesia victim. He was sent to a hospital, recovered, and reunited with his family, which he hadn't seen in nine years. He was also restored to a successful business. Jack Hausman's girlfriend, Helen Campbell, is serving a penitentiary sentence as an accessory after the fact. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord.
Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney listens to all kinds of statements in the course of a day. Some are confessions from people who want to pay their debt to society and make a fresh start. But even a confession can be an attempt to outsmart the law. This case began more than 500 miles from my county, in another state. How you know, Pete, the old dame didn't give you a phony combination? Oh, she wouldn't do that, would you, Grandma? Because the wrong combination would mean bruises. Wouldn't it, Grandma? Maybe we'd better take the gag off and let her open it for us. She wrote down the combination, didn't she? She couldn't talk it any better than she could write it. Now, keep quiet a minute. Oh, this tip better be good, Pete. It's good. Nice old lady, afraid of the bad, bad bank. Keeps all the jewels and money nice and safe at home. It's open. Look at this. What rocks in the dough. 20s, 50s, C-notes. Ah, must be 15, 20 grand there. Shove it in the briefcase. Hey, what about her? We just can't leave her like she is. No, because if somebody took that gag off, she could talk. Only one way to stop that. Why didn't you muffle that with a pillar? People, I'll take it to backfire. Come on, let's get going. Car okay? Sure, there it is. Hey, Pete, the other way, somebody running. A cop. You go ahead, get the car started. Okay. Stay where you are, copper. They're gone. Take the corner. You crazy? I made him duck into a doorway, didn't I? Suppose the car hadn't started right away. You were right under that street light without a hat. Why didn't you leave your picture? I'll be 500 miles from here by morning. He wasn't close enough to get our license number. He might have been close enough to see what state we're from. If he asked for mug shots, you got a record. He might just identify you. Then he'll be making a mistake. You taught me a trick when we were in the pen together. Remember, Boland? Never risk ten years of the electric chair when you can get away for six months. And that little hall's worth six months, ain't it? Yeah. It'll work for me when I pull it on with Costico. Yeah. And it'll work for me. It'll work just fine. What time is it? Uh, 12.20. When we get home, we'll get the newspapers. See if our DA has any little crimes kicking around unsolved. Anything nice and simple committed around uh, midnight tonight. <laughs> We might save Mr. Garrett a lot of work. <laughs> Hello, Miss Miller. Oh, Mr. Garrett. How did it go? <laughs> I wish I knew. You know how I feel about speaking at luncheons. I hate... Oh, this gentleman has been waiting for you since 11 o'clock. I told him you'd be back late. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I know you, don't I? Yes, sir. I'm afraid you do. My name's Pete Grable. Oh, yes. I remember. Burglary, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Three years ago. I did six months. And what can I do for you, Pete? Well, I'm in trouble again, Mr. Garrett. Come into my office. Thanks. Oh, no calls for a while, please, Miss Miller. Unless they're urgent. Yes, sir. Switch the routine stuff to Burton. Oh, and ask Harrington to come up when he's finished at the lab. All right, Mr. Garrett. 
Sit down, Pete. Thanks. Tell me about it. Well, I... I don't know where to begin. Uh, after I did time on that rap, well, I wanted to straighten myself out. I tried. I got a job, even went to night school. I, I guess I wasn't very good at working, though. I got fired. I've been bumming around for a few months, broke. Uh, well, I, I guess I'd better give it to you straight. The night before last, about 11.30, I guess, I was out walking. I, I passed this hardware store... And the hardware store on Southern Boulevard and Finch Street? Yes, sir. I guess you know what comes next. I went around the back, broke in. There was $94.62 in the cash register, and I took it. Why, Pete? Why after doing time before? I don't know. I've been asking myself the same question all day, yesterday and the day. The heat must have got me or something. I was crazy. Do you still have the money? No. I played big shot and spent it. Well, I'm glad you walked in here by yourself, Pete. You were playing it tough the last time when we had to catch you and bring you in. Well, you can hang it on me good this time, Mr. Garrett. I had a chance and I blew it. I'll deserve everything I get. Well, what you'll get will be up to the judge, Pete. But the fact that you came in here is going to weigh in your favor. If I recommend a short sentence and probation, will you promise me to work out the money you stole, make restitution? Oh, Mr. Garrett, I'd do anything for a break like that. I'll pay back every dime. All right. Miss Miller? Yes, sir. Come in, please. Bring your book. I want you to take a statement. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Harrington said he'd be here in a couple of minutes. Good. Take this. Head it with the date and location. Statement of Peter Grable, re the burglary of the Amalgamated Hardware Company at 1154 Southern Boulevard, this city. I'll fill in the date. The date before yesterday. Between 11 and 11.30 p.m. Got it? Yes, sir. Now, Pete, do you make the statement you're about to make with the full understanding that it will be used against you as evidence? I do. Do you do so of your own free will without coercion or other undue influence of force? I do. All right, Pete. Tell us in your own words just what happened. Well, at uh, 11.30 Thursday night, night before last, I was... Oh, Chief, I... Uh... Oh. Oh, excuse me. I, I didn't know you had anybody in there. It's all right, Harrington. Come in. And this is Pete Grable. Yeah, I remember him. Sit down. He's given us a voluntary confession on the amalgamated hardware burglary. <laughs> Go ahead, Pete. Oh, uh, well, where was I, you know? At 11.30 Thursday night, night before last, oh, I was... Oh, yeah. Um, I was walking past the store. I went into the alley, leading around to the back. I jimmied my way in. I stole $94.62 from the cash register. I spent it, and I can't give it back. That's all. Are you prepared to sign this statement after it's typed? Yes, sir. Good. All right, Miss Miller. Type it up. Have Kincaid take him over to the county jail. You'll have to be held, Pete, until bail is set. It won't be too long. I'll have you arraigned Monday morning. Thank you. Hey, just a minute, Pete. Don't you think I'd better go out there with him, Chief, until Kincaid comes up? Oh, I don't think that'll be necessary, Harrington. He came in voluntarily. You're not going to run, are you, Pete? No, sir. Go ahead. What about those parking lot robberies? You got anything? Nope, not yet. The stuff the lad had is no good. No, keep on it. Then I want you to ballparks, bowling alleys, fight stadiums, any place night parking is heavy. Yeah. Uh, Chief, um... Yeah? You know... I like to see a guy get a break if he rates it. But this Pete Grable, he was a tough monkey. We got nothing at all on that amalgamated hardware job, but all of a sudden he walks in here like a lamb. Bothers me. I know. It's been bothering me, too. I thought you were sold on him. He wants me to be sold on him. Let him walk around a while until we see what he's got on his mind. While he's walking, he's got a chance to run. He's also got a chance to trip. Yeah, see what you mean. Uh, you want me to check on him? Home? Family? No, not until he's arraigned and makes bail. Why wait until then? Because then it can be a friendly visit to, oh, somebody we're sold on. Let's see if that confession is ready yet. I assume will that be ready, Miss Miller? Just a few more lines. No, you take it over to the jail and have him sign it, Harrington. And be friendly.
No, Peter hasn't been home yet. I cooked dinner for him and I had to throw it all out. Even had to borrow the money to make it for him. And your son's bail was $500, Mrs. Grable. Where did you borrow that? $500. Now, where would I ever get my hands on that much money? Uh, you mean you didn't put up the money? You're not the one who sprung him? I didn't even know where he was until I got a note from him saying he'd be let out this morning for me to bring him a razor and his best suit of clothes. I see. Do you know who did arrange for his release? Was it his father or your husband? His father's been dead since Peter was 15 years old. You don't know where Peter is now? He didn't come home at all after he was released this morning? No. I waited for him outside the prison. But he said he had to go someplace. He'd see me later. So I got on the trolley car and came to see that there'd be a good meal on the table for him. The probation officer will be checking on him before he's sentenced, Mrs. Grable. It's after 10 p.m. If he's keeping late hours, it won't help him. I tried to get him to come home with me. Maybe we can find him and bring him home for you, if you can give us some idea of where he hangs out. Perhaps the name and addresses of some of his friends. He never tells me about his friends. But you know... There's a place he must go to a lot. I'm, I'm always finding these matchbooks in his clothes. Uh, Boland's Bonanza, it says on them. Uh, with a picture of a man and a woman dancing, you see? Name ring a bell with you, Harrington? Yeah, yeah. It's a dance hall out the south side. No, I'm not familiar with him. Yeah, and you'd be familiar with the owner if you saw him. Boland? Ray Boland. You set him up twice for lust. Well, how did the next con get a permit to run a dance hall? We never had him on a felony. Oh, I remember now. Petty larceny both times. Misdemeanor convictions wouldn't stop him from getting a dance hall license. You remember when it was we last sent him away? Yeah, uh, two, uh, uh no, no, uh, three years ago. He pulled six months. Oh, that means he and Peter Grable were in prison at the same time. They might even have been cellmates. Yeah, but what's that got to do with this case? Just a small detail from Boland's last conviction that you may have forgotten. Hmm? What? He also walked into my office and confessed. Oh, and now Grable pulls the same stunt. Why? They can't like prison. Maybe they like it better than something else. What? That's what we're going to find out. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the man who confessed, here is an important message from my sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A man had walked into my office and confessed to a crime of burglary involving less than $100. His family had no money, but somebody posted $500 bail for him. He was certain to go to jail, but he seemed happy about it. It didn't add up. Harrington and I headed for Boland's Bonanza, a dance hall on the south side. I ought to have two bands, Boland, like the uptown joints. Continuous dancing. People don't like to sit around. Do they, Dolly? Look, when you wake diamond dance joints like I have, you're happy to hear the horn stop. <laughs> you see, Pete? Besides, it's a warm night. Give the concessions a chance to do a little business. I make money there, too, you know. <laughs> yeah, and if this don't work, there are other ways, huh? You ought to know, boy. Hey, uh, you didn't tell me how'd it go with the DA. A breeze. You should have seen it. <laughs> hey, prim it up. Keep quiet. What's the matter, honey? Those two guys coming across the floor. Garrett, the DA, and that shadow of his, Harrington. Don't move now. They've seen us. It'll look funny if you go. Good evening, Pete. Oh, hello, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Harrington. Uh, I'd like you both to meet uh, Miss Dolly Weeks. Miss Weeks. Miss Weeks. How do you do? And uh, this is Ray Boland. He owns the place. I believe we've met Mr. Boland before. So fast. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm glad you're meeting at my place this time instead of yours. Oh, a band's been off the stand too long. Customers getting restless. I'd better go outside and hurry them in. <laughs> nice to see you gentlemen again. Bye. Hello. 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 Uh, yeah, you better go looking for your date, Dolly. 
or he'll think you got lost. Huh? Oh, oh yeah. Um, excuse me, please. Don't you think you should be leaving too, Pete? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I didn't realize it was so late. Uh, good night. Night. Oh, Pete, uh, just a minute. Yeah, Mr. Harrington? Uh, how did you jimmy your way into the hardware store? Through a back door or a window? Uh, what difference does it make? Well, it might make a difference in court. Nothing can make any difference in court, Mr. Garrett. I ain't fighting the case. You got my confession. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. Skip it. Uh, night. We can get to the parking lot through the back door. Okay. What was that question all about, Harrington? About whether he jimmied a door or a window? Oh, just something I remembered. The bagel to gain entry by cutting out a ventilator screen with wire clippers. For a man who says he robbed the store, he doesn't seem to know too much about the details, does he? If you ask me, he never saw the inside of that hardware store. His confession is a phony. I know that. But why? Oh, a psycho. We get him every day, don't we? Trying to make people think they're tough, or big shots. Or... He's no psycho, Harrington. At least not that kind. There's another reason. There was another reason when Boland did it three years ago, too. He had all the... Hey, Chief, look. Yes, Miss Weeks. The girl we just saw with Pete. Yeah, that's quite a car she's got. About 5,000 bucks on wheels. Yes, and she's no society debutante. Come on. You want to follow her? Yes. She turned right going out. Yeah, I saw her. There. Parked just past the entrance to the dance hall. I'm just driving past her. Don't stop until you get to the end of the street. Dark area under those trees is all right. Okay. What's she waiting there for? See for yourself. Hmm, sure. Little Petey boy. Should I tag them when they go past? No, I'll just get the license number. Get it? Yep. I had jot it down. Ah. Now what? Take me home. We've got a lot of work to do tomorrow. Yes, Miss Miller? Harrington's on extension one, sir. Okay, put him on. Hello, Harrington. Hello, Chief. I got a rundown on that registration. Now, who owns the car? It belongs to the Dolly Weeks dame, all right. She bought it last Saturday. Forty-six hundred and fifty-two bucks cash. Does she have a record? No, but she doesn't have any way of earning that kind of money either. I just got all the reports from the burglary detail on that job at Amalgamated. You were right about the burglar gaining entry through the ventilator screen. There's something else that doesn't fit, too. Well, what? Pete confessed to stealing $94.62. Yeah, Store owner's statement lists the amount stolen at $84.62. That's funny. I've got an idea about it. I'll have it worked out by the time you get up here. I'll be there in a minute. Wait a minute. No, no. Before you come up, pull the record view of files on both Bolin and Pete. Everything we've got on them. Bring them with you. Okay, Chief. Be up as fast as I can. Good. Miss Miller? Yes, sir. You get those back issues of the newspapers from last Friday? Yes, sir. I just finished going through them, but there's only one small item on the amalgamated hardware burglary. Well, bring it in. It was on page nine of the post transcript, Miss Garrett. It's only one paragraph. Well, let me see. Burglar broke in through the rear of the store. Go to the cash register of $94.62. Now, that's it, all right. That's what? Now, well, that's where Pete Grable got his information and his confession. Only the information happens to be wrong. Get Harrington again in the record room. Tell him to wait for me there. I'm on my way down. Yes, sir. All right, all right. Keep your shirt on. Who 
is it? It's Pete. Let me in quick. I tried to phone you. I was busy. I take it out the hook when I'm sleeping. What's the idea of getting me up so early? I think we're getting hot, that's why. Did you goof up on something? It's that gumshoe Harrington from the DA's office. He's been checking on Dolly. Well, what's that to get an uproar about? They saw you to get her, that's all. Well, they... They saw the car, too. What car? I gave Dolly Doe to buy a new car. With hot money less than a week after a killing? Well, I thought it'd be safe in her name. You're... Goodbye, Pete. What do you mean, Bowen? I mean goodbye. I'm taking myself a vacation to South America. From now on, I don't know you. Goodbye, Pete. I ought to... You pull that gun on me and you'll really be cooked. And you got a chance. Be smart. Take it. That's the only reason I'm leaving you alive. office. Miss Miller, this is Mr. Garrett calling from the record room. I want you to get some more newspapers for me. Yes, sir. Which ones? Out-of-town papers from all surrounding states. Last Friday and Saturday editions. Get the whole staff together and comb them page by page. I want a list of all major crimes committed in those cities last Thursday night, and I want it within an hour. Yes, sir, Mr. Garrett. I'll get right on it. What's the idea of that, Chief? What are you after? I'll tell you what I'm after. Look at this record on Boland. His confession about stealing a car radio? Yes, a car radio. He does six months in jail for taking something worth less than $50. Then two weeks after his release, he buys a dance hall for $20,000, spends another ten decorating. Oh? What are you driving at? Now, look at this FBI teletype. Received by us while Boland was doing time. Uh, request all available information, Ray Boland, your county. Mugshot selected as possible suspect, armored car robbery, state capital. Night of October 3rd to last. October 3rd. Hey, that's the same night he confessed to stealing the car radio. Sure. And the record bureau wired back that he was serving time for an offense committed at the same time, the same night, more than 200 miles away. We provided him with an alibi. And now Grable is afraid he was seen on some job and he's pulling the same stunt. Only this time it isn't going to work. Have a squad pick up Dolly Weeks for questioning. Then get up to the office and let's help with those newspapers. Mr. Garrett and Mr. Harrington. Your son home, Mrs. Grable? Oh, why, yes, he came home this morning. Says he's going to stay. I can watch over him now and he'll give you no more trouble. He's really not a bad one, you know. Must have been the company he was keeping. We'd like to see him, Mrs. Grable. Well, he's in his room, our car. Uh, we'll see him in there if you don't mind. Which room is it? The second door. Mr. Garrett, Harrington. I, I was just getting dressed to come and see you. Or are you, Pete? Yeah. I guess I, I guess I was confused the day I gave you that statement on the hardware store. You see, I um, I, I really went in through a ventilator screen and and, and then too I, I told you the wrong amount on the money. And we know you did. We also know that you stopped in the hardware store a couple of hours ago and bought a wrench. And spent ten minutes asking the storekeeper about the burglary. You see, we've been doing a little checking, too. The police at Harrisburg are looking for two men who robbed and murdered a wealthy old woman. You know anything about it? <laughs> go ahead, Pete. Go ahead. If the gun's in there, go for it. Or do you only use it on old ladies? It's stolen. The whole idea was Boland's, not mine. I'm here, ain't I? He's running away. Not far. The police will be waiting for his plane when it lands at Dallas. And Dolly is waiting for you, downtown at my office. Please, Mr. Garrett, you gotta give me a break. I'll give you a break, Pete. The only kind of a break the law permits. What's that? The same kind of a break you gave that old lady in Harrisburg.
This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Pete Grable, Roy Bolin, and Dolly Weeks were extradited to the county where the brutal murder had been committed. Grable and Bolin were convicted in the first degree and executed. Dolly Weeks is now serving sentence on a charge of being an accessory after the fact and receiving stolen property. Now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the files of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney must see people through different eyes than others. The man who passes on the street may be a criminal, one of a prosecution. Or he may be an innocent man who will one day find himself amassed in the law by a chain of circumstance. To tell them apart is the function of justice. This case started on a lonely road on the outskirts of town. How is he, Francine? He's still out, Rocky. You hit him awful hard. Well, what'd you expect for 93000 A love tap? Well, he isn't just another gambler who can't go to the law. He's an important man. He'll make trouble. Yeah. For who? An undertaker? Rocky, you're not gonna... Yeah, I'm gonna. What do you want me to do? Wake him up, tell him I'm sorry, give the dough back to well, him? Well, he won it. Suckers ain't supposed to win. I run that game for me to win, one way or another. Yeah, this place is as good as any. Rocky, I, I'm scared. Oh, you just shut your mouth and help me get him out, will you? Rocky, please. So help me, Francie. One more bleed out of you and I'll shove the muzzle of this gun down your throat and pull the trigger. Now, you're going to help me get him out or you want me to drag you out with him? <laughs> don't, don't hurt me, Rocky. I'll help oh, you. That's better. Come on. Let's will you? That's it. That's better. All right. Yeah, you hear anything coming? How could I hear anything in this rain? That's good. Nobody else will hear anything either. Well, goodbye, Mr. Ferguson. Too bad you got so lucky.
In here, Ryan. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about, Mr. Harrington. District attorney will tell you. Morning, Miss Miller. Morning, Harrington. Chief in? Yes? This is Joe Ryan, the cab driver we've been looking for. And you better tell him. Yes, Miss Miller. Harrington's here, Mr. Garrett. He has a Joe Ryan with him. Well, send him in. Yes, sir. All right. Through here, Ryan. You've been a little difficult to find, Mr. Ryan. We've been looking for you for four days. I didn't know that until this morning. Are you in the habit of taking four-day vacations from driving your cab? No, sir. I took the time off because I've been looking for a good buy and a new cab. Why didn't you register a change of address with the Motor Vehicle Bureau when you moved a couple of months ago? Yeah, I forgot, that's all. Well, you know that's a violation, don't you? Yes, sir, but... Look, is that why you picked me up? No, that isn't why. Four nights ago, Ryan, just before you took this unusual vacation, you picked up a fare outside the Chelsea Club. Just a few minutes before midnight, remember? Ah, so that's it. What did you expect it to be? Story of the murder's been in all the papers. I know it. You picked up a fare who was found murdered the next morning, and you know about it. But you don't get in touch with the police. Why? Why should I? I don't know nothing about it. I picked a man up and I drove him home. His body was found out on Pendleton Road. What's that got to do with me? I took him home. Look... If you think I had anything to do with this, you're sending your dogs on the wrong trail. Are we? Do you know we impounded your cab at the garage? No, I didn't know it. I haven't been near the garage. Maybe you should have been. Police lab crews gave the cab a going over. This is their report. Like me to read it to you? I'd like anything that helped to clear this up, yeah. According to this report, Ryan, there were blood stains on the back seat and the floor mat of your cab. Type O. The report also states that John Ferguson's blood was type O. Yeah, what's that prove? Lots of people have type O blood. You've been reading up on the subject? I don't have to read up. I was in the medics in the service. I got type O blood myself. You trying to tell us it was your own blood on that back seat? No, a guy got hurt in my cab. When? Why, it, it was the same night I picked Mr. Ferguson up at the Chelsea Club. Look, I've driven Mr. Ferguson lots of times. Yeah, we know. The doorman told us. That's what started us looking for you. Who got hurt in your cab? I don't know who he was. I Can I tell you about it, uh, about how it happened? Well, that's why you're here. All right. Well, it was after I dropped Mr. Ferguson off. I picked up these six guys. They were wearing those hats, you know, uh, the convention that was in town last week. Shriners? Yeah, that's right. Well, there were six of them. And brother, was it raining? They flagged me down. I don't usually take six, but, well... With the weather and everything, I, I packed them in. Then what? Well, like I said, it was raining cats and dogs. They wanted to go to Saverin Plaza. I took the freeway in. Some guy cut in front of me at Montrose Turnoff, and I had to go for the brakes. The road was wet, and I went into a skid. Threw him around a little bit in the back seat. One of the guys in the drop seat bumped something. Got a nosebleed. That's it. That's the whole story. Look, you you got to believe me about this. Ryan... Just before he left the Chelsea Club, Howard Ferguson cashed a check for $2,000. That was at midnight. You say you drove him home, but his body is found the next morning out on Pendleton Road without a cent on him. And we find you out shopping for a new cab. And it doesn't look good, Ryan. I don't care how it looks. Where'd you get the money for the new cab? I won it. Won it where? Well, I, I won it a couple of months ago, just before I moved. That's where I got the dough to move. Well, what do you mean by one? Oh, the guys around the garage. We used to play the numbers. You know, the numbers racket. And you won. Yes, I won. Then you won in a million in that sucker racket. I know it, but that's where I got the dough. I spent part of it moving, and I was holding the rest until now to buy a new cab when the new models came out. They came out the day before yesterday. Uh-huh. That's where the dough come from. Honest it is. Okay. Then there's only one other thing you have to tell us about. Who sold you the numbers? A guy named Willie Lamont. Where can we find him? I... I, I don't I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, he he hasn't been around the garage in a couple of months. All, all of a sudden, he, he just stopped coming around. Can any of the other cab drivers verify that you won that money? No. No, I, 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 I never told any of them. Ryan, your story is pretty thin. You can prove the part about the blood, can't you? Find the six guys I picked up. Almost 40,000 of them come in for the convention from every state in the country. The convention ended yesterday. 
Our chances of finding them might have been good while they were still in town. Yeah, but we couldn't find you until this morning. And you didn't come in on your own. I swear to you, I took Ferguson home. Then how did his body get out on the Pendleton Road? Uh, wait. Wait a minute. I just remembered something. You better remember for your own good. What is it, Ryan? Uh, wait a minute. It, when I took him home, there, there's a big circular driveway at his place. Well, there was a car in front of the house when I let him out. I, I passed right next to it. Mm-hmm. It, there, there was a couple of people in the car. It was a limousine. Why didn't you mention this before? Well, I, I didn't think of it. I figured they were waiting to get into the house. You didn't wait to find out? No, I collected them a fair and blue. Ryan, nobody saw that car except you. Servants didn't see anything. They didn't even hear your cab, Ryan. It was raining so hard, th the rain kept them from hearing. Now, that could be one explanation. What other explanation could there be? The one that all the evidence seems to point to. Ryan, you never took Ferguson home. This is a frame. Take it easy, It's Mr. a frame. Mr. Ferguson was a big shot, so you got to pin this on somebody in a hurry. And I'm the patsy, ain't I? It's a frame, ain't it? No matter what I tell you. Everything you said will be checked, Ryan. Every single point. If you're innocent, I want to know it. I have no choice but to hold you. I know. Take him over to the county jail and book him, Harrington. Then come back and meet me in the record room. Okay, Chief. Come on, Ryan. Miss Miller? Yes, Mr. Gass. Call the county sheriff's office. Vice squad detail. Ask for Sergeant Payne. Sergeant Payne? Yes, sir. Tell him I'd like him to come over and meet me in the record bureau. Yes, sir. All right, Chief. Had Ryan booked all right? Yep. Well, what would you think of his story? Weak, but it has possibilities. Like what? This, for instance. There's a petty gambler named Willie Lamond. Three times arrested as a runner for various bookies. Always the same charge. Taking bets on the numbers record. Yeah, but those arrests are all dated before you convinced the state legislature that gambling ought to be a felony. He's probably been more careful since then. Gamblers are hard to put out of business. No regular joints operating. No, but there are floating places. And runners like Willie Lamont picking up bets. Well, can't be much of it. More than you think. I've had somebody on the sheriff's vice squad working on a report. Oh, who? Young sergeant. His name is Ed Payne. He's on his way over now. I thought he might be able to give us some information on Willie Lamont. Look, couldn't I have handled this gambling report? Now, you're too well known to the professionals, Harrington. I need a young man who could work right in with them undercover. Payne's well qualified, fresh out of army intelligence and a comparative stranger in town. Oh. Ah, uh, don't worry. You'll be there when we have a complete report and the time comes from the crackdown. Uh, Chief, even if we do find this Willie Lamont, he's not going to stick his neck out to help Ryan. He won't admit taking that bet. We'll have to find a way to make him admit it. Without Lamont's testimony, Ryan will be a cinch for conviction. He... Oh, Chief... There's a fellow over there looking around. Oh, that's Ed Payne. Over here, Sergeant. Hi, Mr. Garrett. The secretary said you wanted to see me. Yes. Sergeant Payne, this is my assistant, Harrington. Hello, Sergeant. Glad to know you. I heard a lot about you. There's somebody else I hope you've heard a lot about, Payne. A bookmaker's runner named Willie Lamont. He's still operating? Uh-huh. Left town a couple of months ago, went to Chicago. No, oh, that's rough. It's all right. We can extradite him if we have to. That might not be too easy, Mr. Garrett. Why not? There's been some talk about him since he's been gone. They say he got ambitious in Chicago. Word got around that he was holding out some bets on his new boss. And also slipping in a phony winner or two to turn himself a dishonest dollar. The boss got wise to it. You mean Lamont is on the run again? I need him badly as a witness. Mr. Garrett, you know how the mobs are. If you want my opinion... Willie Lamont isn't on the run. He's standing still. Somewhere on the bottom of Lake Michigan, wearing a pair of cement shoes. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the vanishing runner, here is an important message from my sponsor. A 
And now, back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A prominent citizen had been murdered, and a cab driver surrounded by a mesh of circumstantial evidence had been taken into custody. We needed a small-time gambler to verify the cab driver's alibi. But the underworld grapevine indicated that the only possible witness was dead. For two days, I had Harrington and Sergeant Payne of the Sheriff's Vice Squad check on every possible source of additional information. Haven't you been able to locate Harrington yet, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. Uh, basement garage called. He just drove in. He's on his way up now. Oh. You don't look well today. Well, I had to get a grand jury indictment against Ryan this morning. It isn't a very pleasant prospect. Well, it's not your... Oh, well, here's Harrington now. Yeah, sorry it's gone so long, Chief. But I ran into some pretty funny things. What? It's Howard Ferguson was having an awful lot of trouble before he was killed. And what kind of trouble? Well, believe it or not, financial. Howard Ferguson? Yeah, that's right. Here. Here's a complete rundown. He was draining money away from his business investments and putting it into his personal account, stalling his creditors. Few of them even had him on a COD basis. And a couple of other things, too. He was the... Oh, co- excuse me. Am I interrupting? No, it's all right, Payne. Come in. Answer just came in from Chicago. No line on Willie Lamont. Well, I guess the scuttlebutt you heard was right, then. Go ahead, Harrington. That uh, $2,000 check wasn't unusual. Ferguson would been cashing checks for that amount or more a couple of nights a week. What would he need it for? Only one thing I can think of, Mr. Garn. Gambling? Only kind of business I can think of where a lot of money changes hands in the middle of the night. Payne, when players go to one of these floating games you've been looking into, how are they notified where the game is going to be held? Well, they aren't notified. A slip-up could lead to a raid. They don't tell the customers where to go. They come and pick them up in a limousine. Limousine? Chief, Ryan said there was a limousine parked in Ferguson's driveway the night he drove them home. Gamblers wouldn't have killed Ferguson for $2,000, though. They had an easier way to take the money away from him. Unless he won. Yes. If a man got lucky in a big money game, he might win fifty or 100000 with a hot paradise. Well, that's enough for a killing. No, I'm not in, Miss Miller. Yes, sir. Hello? It's the Holloway Bank and Trust for Harrington. Oh, that's Ferguson's bank, Chief. They were checking something for me. Oh, I'd better take him. Hello? Miss Harrington? Yep. Uh... What's that name again? Uh, no, no. First name. Spell it. F, uh... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Thanks, Miss Miller. Ferguson had been writing some other big checks made out to cash, in addition to the one he cashed at the Chelsea Club. The bank says the others were endorsed by a Francine DeVoe. Francine DeVoe. Uh, Mr. Garrett, can I call the record room for a minute? Go ahead. Get it for him, Miss Miller. You got a max pain? Yes, sir. Oh, thanks. Mm, sure will. Record room? Just a second. Thanks. Hello, Mike. Ed Payne. You still got that Willie Lamont fold you pulled for me? No, his wife's maiden name. Yeah, Mike, plenty. Thanks a lot. That's something, Mr. Garrett. Francine DeVoe... Alias Francine Lamond. She was Willie Lamond's wife. I heard about it when I was trying to get a rundown on Lamond. How come she didn't go to Chicago with him? She divorced Willie a couple of years ago. Started to run around with the big time gamblers, working for boys like Rocky Jessup. Well, what do you mean by working for them? Bait. A shill. Stirring suckers to their games. Men like Ferguson? He cashed an awful lot of checks. Can you find out where Rocky Jessup is holding his next game? No, well, I could find out, but I couldn't get in. Why not? You've been making contact. Yeah, as a small-time gambler. I've never flashed the kind of money they're interested in. And if I did flash it all of a sudden, they might get curious. Well, suppose you called up and said you had a wealthy customer, somebody you'd steer to the game for a percentage. Yeah, that could work. But who? You or Harrington, they might know. How about me? Oh, uh, please. No, no, wait a minute, Harrington. How about it, Payne? No. Yeah. Could be good. Wealthy young woman from out of town looking for kicks. Hey, I was only joking, Mr. Garrett. I... Well, I wasn't. Well, I'd be scared silly. They won't try anything inside the place. There'll be other people. 
Anything they do will be outside. And when you come outside, we'll be waiting. But I won't know how to act or what to say. Or... Oh, we'll tell you. But first, take this. A hundred dollars? What would Go I... Go to a costume rental place. Run an evening gown, the best they have, and a fur wrap. Buy some good-looking costume jewelry. You drive it, Harrington. But... Come on, Cinderella. <laughs> You know what I want you to do, don't you, Payne? I I think so. After we get in, ask questions. Make them suspect I'm a cop. That's right. Maybe if you tip your hand, they'll tip theirs. Now call Rocky Jessup and arrange for the pickup. Scared pain. Do you like a little action, huh, Miss Miller? Yes, I. I think gambling's very exciting. Well, I run a good game. You'll like it. What's your poison? I, I beg your pardon. I can't hear you too well back here. No, I, I said, uh, what do you like? The wheel, bones, baseboard, roulette, Rocky. She likes the wheel. Oh, good, good. You'll be happy that Payne suggested my place to you. Payne tells me you're from out of town. Yeah, that's right, Cleveland. Family and business, eh? Yes, they have a, a chain of grocery stores. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> People got to eat. Yeah. Huh? I said that's right, Mr. Jessup. Yeah. Oh, just call me Rocky, huh? But don't let the name fool you. I'm really a soft guy. Payne will tell you. <laughs> Rocky's tops, Miss Miller. I don't see any particular car following us, Payne. The working relays on the radio car set up. One turns off, another one turns in behind us. You say something, Payne? Uh, uh, just telling Miss Miller about the percentages in the game. <laughs> Odds, law of averages. Yeah, yeah. You want to listen to him, Miss Miller. This boy knows the score. You know, you might make a killing tonight. Well, here we are. <laughs> Target for tonight. Well, what, what kind of a place is this? Oh, don't be scared. This is just an abandoned airplane hangar. Used to be an airfield here and a flying school. There's no use letting the building go to waste, huh? <laughs> you sure know how to pick the spots, Rocky. Yeah, and you sure know how to pick the dolls. <laughs> well, come on, Miss Miller. <laughs> Thinking you're liable to cost me some money tonight. Nobody's going to be looking at the dice with you around. <laughs> Just got to be careful, you know. All right, go ahead now, folks. Dark. Well, it'll be light as soon as we get through the other door. Oh, don't be afraid. Come on. Well, hey, looks a little better than you thought, huh, Miss Miller? Well, it's surprising. Well, all my customers go first class. Uh, Francine? I'll be there in a second. All righty. Francine's a hostess. She'll tell you where the action is. Oh, uh, Francie, this is Miss Miller. She's from Cleveland, friend of Payne's. You know Payne, don't you? I've seen him around. Francine. My uncle mentioned meeting a Francine the last time he was here on a visit. He likes to gamble, too. Is that so? What's your uncle's name? Miller. Same as mine. Robert Miller. I don't remember him. Well, it could have been another Francine, of course, but... Well, it is an unusual name. How long ago? Just about a, a week ago. Yes, just the night before he came back to Cleveland. I didn't run no game last week. Uncle Bob said the game was in uh, some kind of an old restaurant on uh, uh, Penderson Road, something like that. No, uh, Pendleton Road. That wouldn't be our game. Would it, Rocky? No, 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 not out there. Must have been somebody else, Miss Miller. No, he said, Francine. He said it was raining like blazes. Oh, yes. And some man won a lot of money. Practically broke the game. Uncle Bob was standing right next to him. His name, uh, his name was Ferguson. Your uncle tells you things in detail, doesn't he? Uh, you better, uh, you better show me what refreshments we got, Francine. Huh? Payne and the lady can just drift around look things over. Okay, Payne. Oh, uh, sure. Come on, Miss Miller. I'll show you the dice table. I thought that same Mr. Ferguson might be here. If he was. I bet the way he's there. I sure don't like this, Francie. Neither do I. Why didn't you tell me Payne was coming? Why? Because he's the one who's been nosing around asking questions about Willie. Well, we had nothing to do with what happened to Willie. No, but we did with Ferguson, and he was asking questions like a cop. Yeah. Why would a cop steer a rich dame here? Rich dame nothing. Hmm? 
Did you see the label in that fur jacket she's dragging around? No. Madame Pompadour Costume Rentals. Get him over to the door. Well, I... I... Do like I tell you. They've got to get rid of him tonight and blow town, but fast. Now, go ahead. Um, Miss Miller. Oh, we were just watching. Uh, there's, a, there's a much bigger game in another room around the side of the building. Rocky thought you and Mr. Payne would rather go in there. Uh, which way? Well, we have to go outside first and then around. Well, that sounds interesting, Miss Miller. Yes. Dark place again. It's only for a second. All right, cop. You and this team outside to the car. And no funny moves, or I got a hole in my pocket and you got a hole in your back. Do what they say, Miss Miller. Where are you going to take us? Same place we took Ferguson. And we're going to leave you the same way. I wouldn't count on that. Rocky. Rocky. You're covered every way. Don't move. You dead. Hey. Down, Miss Miller. Let me help you, Miss Miller. Oh, thanks. How is he, honey? Rocky, he's not dead. He'll live to stand trial. Well, I, I'll testify. I'll make a deal with you. We don't need any deals, thank you. Take him in, Harrington. Payne? Right, Chief. Yes, Mr. Go. Round up that crowd inside. They can do their gambling in a cell for the night. Come on, Miss Miller. I'll drive you home. Thank you. You're shaking. You scared? Oh, Mr. Garrett, I just kept thinking... When they were shooting, what could I ever tell a Madame Pompadour costume company if I brought back this fur jacket with a bullet hole in it? <laughs> what? <laughs> Miss Miller, if I didn't hear it, I wouldn't believe it. Oh, I shouldn't have expected a man to understand. <laughs> This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here's the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Rocky Jessup was tried and convicted on a charge of murder in the first degree. The death penalty was mandatory. His accomplice, Francine DeVoe, alias Francine Lamont, was sentenced to the woman's prison for 15 years. Now, this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney, starring David Bryan. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. This is David Bryan. In a moment, we'll bring you another case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. 
But first, a word from our sponsor. And now, here is our star, David Bryan, as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A district attorney learns that in every man's mind there is a secret compartment. It can be the hiding place for guilt or for fear. And fear is a deadly enemy of justice. Take this case. It started at one o'clock in the morning in the shadows of a waterfront pier. All right, start it up. Where'd you get this heat from, Crow? That's my business. Looks later, you just drive. Let me do the thinking. Uh, you do the thinking, I do the dirty work. Is that it? You want to keep working, Slater? You want to brass check it to my old shape up? All right, all right. If Rimlinger isn't straightened out, I'm going to be finished. And no stumble bummer like him is going to finish any crew. All right, turn down River Street. You'll be leaving the pier in two minutes. Suppose somebody sees us, Crow. Who's going to see us? He's the only longshoreman I got working on that dock tonight. He'll be coming out alone. Get him in the middle of the street. It's nice and wide. He'll have nothing to duck behind. Better slow down a little. Right. Now, be careful on this stretch. Hey, this thing's sliding all over. Why do you think I told you to slow down? The oil truck turned over here last night. They put sand and gravel on it, but it's still slippery. Watch it now. Pier 37, just past the ferry shed. There's people in that ferry shed, Crow. They're not close enough to bother us. Watch the street. Hey, there. There he is now. Let him walk further into the street. Now, gun it. He stopped, Crow. To let you go by. Perfect. Cut into him. Keep going. Think we got him? We knocked him a hundred feet later. But the front of the car's all smashed. So what? I'll give the kid a hundred bucks to have it fixed. That's getting rid of Rimlinger pretty cheap. And the newspapers ain't gonna try to pin this one on any crew. I can see the headlines now. Longshoreman killed in hit and run accident. <laughs> <laughs> Keep in this office, Miss Miller. He's waiting for you, Harrington. Go right in. Hi, Chief. How'd you make out? Lab identified the hot rod we found at the Midtown Garage. It's the one, all right. Any line on the owner? Yeah. We picked him up. A newsboy, 16 years old. Name's Jimmy Leonard. I got him down to the detention room now. You want to see him? Yes. I'll be down in the detention room, Miss Miller. Yes, sir. What's the boy's background, Hank? He lives with his father. Cold water walk up on the east side. No trouble with the police before. As a matter of fact... What? He peddles his papers near the 9th Precinct house, Chief. Every cop in the place swears by him. They don't think he'd do a thing like this. It's his car, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He keeps it in a public garage near the paper. Says when he went in this morning, a fender and a headlight was smashed up. We picked him up when he took it to a body shop to have it fixed. Four, please. This Leonard kid's hot rod isn't the only one in town, Chief. Half the kids who peddle papers own cars just like him. But not with a smashed fender. Now well, somebody might have backed into it in the garage. Kid says he didn't drive it last night. And I believe him. Sure, you're not being influenced by the opinions of the men in the ninth precinct. Yeah, it takes somebody pretty cold-blooded to run a man down and then beat it without stopping to help. And this kid, he, well, he just isn't cold-blooded. Sixteen-year-olds can do a lot of foolish things when they're frightened. Well, here we are. All right, Mike, open up for Mr. Garrett. Thanks, Mike. Jimmy Leonard? Yes, sir. My name is Garrett. I'm the district attorney, Jimmy. He'll help you if he can, boy. Just be honest with him. We'd like to know where you were last night. I already told him. I was home. Your father says you weren't. Maybe I... Maybe he didn't hear me come in. He was sleeping. 
I, I guess I got up this morning before he was awake. Mm-hmm. The man who was killed was struck down just after 1 a.m. Can you tell us where you were then? No. If you're hiding something to protect yourself, son, you're being very foolish. If you're trying to cover up for somebody else, you're being even more foolish. I don't want to say no more, that's all. I just can't tell you, sir. Why don't you go away? Why don't you leave me alone? Your father says you weren't home all night. Not since you left to sell papers yesterday afternoon. Jimmy, did you ever lend your car to anybody? There's anyone else in the habit of using it. Anybody who might have a duplicate of the ignition key. No. I, w- I was the only one who ever drove it. Only assembled the car a month ago. You made it yourself? Yeah, a bunch of us made them. We all chipped in and bought parts so we could get them, you know, whole- wholesale. Mm-hmm. Any of the other newsies keep their car in the same garage? Right near the paper? Yeah. Rembrandt, I don't know his real name. Guys call him Rembrandt because he goes to an art school at night. And, the- and Frankie Cutter. They're the only ones. Is that all you can tell us? Yeah. No use, Harrington. Come on. Lock him in, Mike. Let's get down and get a car. Where to? I want to talk to the other newsies who keep their hot rods at the Midtown Garage. kid they called Rembrandt was no help, Chief. No, he wasn't. But I still want to see that other newsboy, Frankie Cutter. Did you find out where his stand is? Yeah, 12th and Madison, but he won't be there. Well, why not? He works the corner nights. Somebody else has it in the daytime. He lives over this way in Tenement Row, a couple of blocks from the Rimlinger place. I've got to see Rimlinger's wife sooner or later. Maybe I'd better go over there while you're talking to Cutter. Oh, give me the address. Hey, uh, it's written down here. Ground floor flat. Should be the next street to the right. Where good night, so he'll probably be sleeping. You want to drop me at the corner? <sighs> Sorry to wake you up, Frankie. Ah, uh, those kids in the street wake everybody up anyhow. So Jimmy Leonard's in kind of a jam, huh? A bad jam, Frankie. I understand you've got a car just like his. Sure. Bunch of us got him. We all made them together. You garage them in the same place, too. Gotta keep them someplace. What a racket. Eight bucks a month garage rent. I could leave it in the street and save the dough, but the cops keep slapping tickets on it. These your keys on the dresser? Yeah. Is your pair of dice, too? Oh, yeah. I must have left them out without thinking. Shove them in the top drawer for me, will you? Thanks. My old lady spotted those. She'd scream like an eagle. Frankie, did you happen to see Jimmy Leonard any place last night? No. Why? He say I did? No. And where was your car during the night? Last night while you were working, I mean. Was it in the garage? Where else? Is it there now? Of course it's there now. Rembrandt's too. Well, thank you, Frankie. That's all I want to know for now. You don't have to go through the kitchen. Other door leads right into the hallway. <laughs> this is supposed to be a parlor. <laughs> Some laugh, huh? A parlor in this rat trap. Thanks. Well, why don't you stick around for a few minutes? You being the DA got the old lady all excited. She went out to get some breakfast rolls. She'll fix some coffee or something. I'm afraid not, Frankie. Well, thank your mother for me. Tell her some other time. You're the boss. So long. So long, Frankie. Oh, hang on. Didn't think you'd be back so soon. How did Rimlinger's wife take it? Hard. A couple of neighbors with her now. Yeah, she'll be all right, I guess, if she isn't left alone. Two cute kids. Oh, uh, I'd like to stop by the precinct house. Right. The Rimlingers need some help from the police fund. He left no insurance, nothing. And he gets killed coming home from work last night. The first week he's had in three months. Three months? Long showman should be busier than that. Plenty of shipping. Yeah, I know. But his wife said he'd had some kind of a beef with the hiring boss, something like that. Anyhow, he was laid off for quite a while, until yesterday. The local union had a meeting yesterday afternoon, and he was elected delegate. I guess that helped him to get working again. Yes. Yes, it did. For one night. Harrington, I want you to check the license plates on Jimmy Leonard's car. Compare them with registration. Make sure the motor number is right. Why? Rembrandt and Frankie Cutter have cars exactly like Jimmy's. 
One of them might have switched parking stalls and license plates. I want to make certain that Jimmy's car is Jimmy's car. His key fit the damaged car, Chief. He drove it out to a repair shop. Well, I can always tell his own car, even for mothers like it. You know that. No, I don't, Harrington. As a matter of fact, at this point, I'm beginning to wonder whether we can tell a case of hit-and-run manslaughter from murder. This is David Bryan. Before we continue with Mr. District Attorney in the case of the hot rod killing, here is an important message I'd like you to hear. And now back to David Bryan, starring as Paul Garrett, Mr. District Attorney. A longshoreman had been killed by a hit-and-run hot rod driver. The car had been located, but the 16-year-old owner would neither admit guilt nor speak in his own defense. While Harrington was continuing to check on the death car, I went to see the boy's father. I told him. I told him a hundred times. If I told him once, that car would get him into trouble. Now, where is he? Behind bars. If I get my hands on him, I'll break his neck. You're talking about your own son, Mr. Leonard. What kind of a father are you? The kind of a father he should have listened to. I've been too easy with him. Just like his mother was. Blood will tell. That's what she'd do, too. Kill a man and run. Never had the guts to face anything. He's a 16-year-old boy, Mr. Leonard. He's alone, and he's frightened. <laughs> he may go to the reformatory for five years. Doesn't that mean anything to you? No! I never should have kept him. She wanted him. She couldn't get him. Not when I got finished with that divorce court. You mean you divorced your wife and you got custody of the boy? Yes. I was too smart for her. You took him away from his mother? I did everything for him. Tried to make something out of him. How could anything like that happen in the name of justice? What do you mean by that crack? You never wanted that boy. I took care of him. Made a home for him. You took him so you could do just what you have done. You took him so you could punish him. So you could use him to revenge yourself on his mother. So you could ruin both their lives and separate them for your own satisfaction. To appease your petty vanity for whatever you think your wife did to you. Get out of here. You're not going to talk to me like that in my own house, even if you are the district attorney. Go on, get out! And when you see that son of mine, tell him I hope they keep him in jail forever. Tell him I hope he rots there! He'll never rot the way he might have rotted here. If your boy is guilty, I know who should really go on trial. A reformatory won't hurt him. Compared to the home you've given him, his life there will be a paradise. Yeah? Excuse me, but is Mr. Garrett here? I'm from his He's office. just leaving. Hello, Miss Miller. Well, there was no phone listed for here, so I came over We can to talk just... outside. Mr. Leonard was right. I'm just leaving. Well, does he blame you because the boy's in trouble? No, he blames the world for whatever trouble he has inside himself. Well, why did you come after me? Well, as I said, there was no phone listed for Leonard. Some of the policemen at the 9th Precinct were trying to help Jimmy. Yes? One of them found out where he was last night. Where? Well, it's kind of strange. They found out from another newsboy who has a stand near the park district. Saw Jimmy going to the Saverin Plaza Hotel. They checked with the desk clerk. The boy was registered there. Jimmy Leonard registered there at the Saverin Plaza? That's one of the best hotels in town. Mm, the desk clerk says he comes there one night every month, always on the 15th of the month. Do you know why? No. Have you heard from Harrington? Yes. The registration and serial number match Jimmy's car, all right. Well, where is Harrington now? Well, he said to tell you he was going down to the docks, near where Remlinger was killed. Now, how did you get here? By cab. Good. Take another one going back. Make out an expense voucher. Couldn't I ride back with you? I'm going to stop at the docks and meet Harrington. Well, there's a couple of things I want you to do. Yes, sir. Get the cop that found out Jimmy was registered at the Saverin Plaza. Tell him to go back to the hotel and check the register for the past year. See if he can find one other particular name besides Jimmy's that appears on the register for the 15th of each month. Get the name, find out who it is and where they come from. Yes, sir. And then go into the civil court's records. About ten years back, I want a transcript of a divorce case. Leonard versus Leonard. Have it all at my office by the time I get back. Yes, sir. See you there. Hey. 
Hey, you. Buster. You talking to me? Who do you think I'm talking to? Docs ain't no place for sightseeing. Voice and everything might get hurt. Why don't you just blow out of here? You Ernie Crow, the hiring boss? Yeah. Say, you must be the guy that's been nosing around here asking the longshoremen questions. Yeah, that's right. You shouldn't do that. Those guys got work to do. So have I. Oh, DA's office, huh? You're working on that hit run case, huh? The guy that got killed, uh, Fred Rimlinger? Yeah, that's right. Well, none of my boys know nothing about that. Poor Fred. I just sent some flowers. Bad thing, the poor guy getting killed like that, leaving a family. I bleed for him. Bleed what? Ice water? You're a pretty fresh guy, ain't you? I've been talking to your men, the few that ain't afraid to talk. Troublemakers? <laughs> What'd they tell you? And you make them kick back 20% of their pay every time you hand them a brass work check at the shape up. And they don't like it. You think you can get one of them to say that in court? Rimlinger didn't like it either. He'd have said so in court. That's why the men elected him delegate. And you gave him a brass check for the first time in three months. He gave him the only night job on the dock. And he got killed on the way home. By a hot rod driven by a crazy kid. You blaming me for that? Something wrong there, Ernie? Yes, Slater. Come here. This flatfoot's been going around the dock, stirring up the men, keeping them from working, making cracks about why Remlinger got killed. Who's this, one of your muscle boys? He's a guard for troublemakers. Now, why don't you hit the road? I think this has gone far enough, gentlemen. Chief, where did you come from? I've been behind those bales for the past two minutes, listening to your very enlightening conversation. You gentlemen have any plans for Mr. Harrington? No. No, oh, of course not, Mr. Garrett, but uh, you ought to tell him to be careful about believing what he hears from troublemakers. He shouldn't repeat it. A guy like you has to stand for re-election every once in a while. I know you wouldn't want a taxpayer like me making complaints. I got a lot of connections. I think I'll be able to get by when election day comes without you or your connections. Come on, Hank. Where'd you leave your car? Right over here, under the shed. Where's yours? A couple of blocks down. You can take me to it. Yeah, sure. Which way? Turn right when we reach the street. Now pass the ferry slip. That, uh, that hiring boss crawl. I think he knows something about the rimbling of killing. Yes, but well, we can't prove it. If only Jimmy Leonard would talk. Or if he'd been able to find a car switch. There was no switch. It was his car. He was the only one who could have been driving it. He took... Look out, Harrington! <laughs> that screwball almost skidded right into us. Yeah, it wasn't his fault. It's this road. Yeah. Slippery. Oil truck turned over here day before yesterday. They tried to cover it. Yeah, you hear that sand and gravel kicking up under the fenders? Yeah, I hear it. Never mind my car, Harrington. Turn south to the Midtown Garage. Watch up. That car that killed Rimlinger must have come through that oil slick and gravel. Yeah? Then the death car will be bound to have some oily sand and gravel stuck under all four fenders. I want to see Rembrandt's car and Frankie Cutter's. Hurry. Anything under that one? Normal road tires, no sand or oil. Have a look at cutters. Now, well, well, this one's okay too. It's, it. Hey, wait a minute. Let me get this flashlight focused. Well, that's funny. Hey, give me a hand out, will you, Chief? Sure. <clears throat> what did you find? Well, right front fender is clean underneath. But the left front and the two rear fenders are covered with oil and sand. That's what I was looking for. Cutter's car is the one that killed Rimlinger. But Jimmy Lennon's car has the smash fender and headlight. Because the right front fender and the headlight from this car were taken off and switched for the fender and headlight on Jimmy's. That's why the underside of this fender is clean and the other three aren't. There a phone here? Yeah. I saw the garage man using one in that little office over there. Mr. 
district attorney's office. Mr. Garrett, Miss Miller. Oh, Mr. Garrett, Jimmy Leonard's mother's here waiting for you. What? Yes, sir. She just came in on the train from upstate. She heard about his arrest on the radio. Her name's Mrs. Goodrich now. She's remarried. I see. Well, there's something else. Her name has been on the Saverin Plaza Hotel Register the 15th of every month, the same as Jemmy Leonard's. She said he's been meeting her there, so his father wouldn't know. I thought it was something like that. Tell her to wait. Harrington and I are going down to pick up Frankie Cutter. Meanwhile, call Homicide and tell them I want a plain clothes squad to meet me at the River Street Ferry Shed in about a half hour. Tell them to wait. Let's get Cutter. Where are you taking me? I didn't kill the guy, I tell you. Hey, what are we doing down here by the docks? There ain't no police station on River Street. You know what we're doing here, Frankie. You want to tell us who was using your car? Or shall we tell you? You know, don't you? It was Ernie Kroll, wasn't it? Better answer, Frankie. Yeah. He came by the stand. Wanted to know could he borrow the car. To a guy like him, you don't say no. So I give him the keys. What time? Midnight. I was just going to eat. Then he brings the heat back about 2 a.m. Tells me he had an accident. Give me a C-note to have it fixed and keep my trap shut. I I thought I'd keep it all, so I glommed onto the fenders and light from Jimmy's car. You want me to drive right on to the dock, Chief? Yes. A lot of guys walking up. Long Sharman finishing their shift. Climb into the back, Frankie. Get on the floor and stay there. Don't worry, mister. I don't want no trouble. Stop here. There's Crow by the hiring shed. Yeah. And that muscle boy Slater, paying off and taking their kickback. Two money, happy to see us. And they'll see us in a minute. Morgan, fan your squad out along the dock. Nobody gets off this pier. And try to take them in peacefully, Harrington. I don't want any of the workmen to get hurt. I'm with you. All right, Crow. Business is over for the day. But what are you guys doing back here? You're under arrest for the murder of Fred Rimlinger. Slater, come here. Huh? What are you guys trying to pull? We're not trying to pull anything. We have a confession from a newsboy whose car you used, Crow. A, a, a confession? I didn't drive the car. I just borrowed it. Who did drive it? Don't move for a gun, Slater. Stay back, Coppin. Way back. We got six men on this pier. If you get by me, tell Slater to drop that gun. Hit, drop it, Slater. Do it before they kill us. Uh, all right, all right. Yeah, 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 we're coming. All right, you men. The law can handle them. They'll get all they deserve. And from now on, you men will get all you deserve. A full day's pay with no kickbacks. Let's go, Harrington. This is David Bryan. I hope you enjoy this case from the files of Mr. District Attorney. I'll be back in just a moment after this message from our sponsor. Now, here is the star of Mr. District Attorney, David Bryan, with a word about the program you have just heard. Jimmy Leonard's father tried to regain custody of the boy, but the court reversed its original decision when the true facts were presented. Meanwhile, hiring boss Ernie Kroll and his strong-arm man, Bud Slater, were sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Fred Rimlinger. Frankie Cutter is awarded the juvenile court until he reaches the age of 21. And now this is David Bryan inviting you to join us when we present our next case based on the facts of crime from the file of Mr. District Attorney. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord.
Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by Vitalis, V-I-T-A-L-I-S. Vitalis, the famous preparation that keeps your hair well-groomed and used with the speedy 60-second workout, helps you to keep your hair. Friends, before we start tonight's dramatic story, I'd like to have a personal word with you. With our country at war, with each and every one of us determined to win this war, our government needs your material support. One way every man and woman can help is through the purchase of defense savings stamps and bonds. Buy a share in America. Buy all the defense savings bonds and stamps you can, this week and every week. Do your share in helping our country to win. Our story tonight begins in the vaulted, echoing galleries of the city museum in your district attorney's city. It is shortly past midnight, and in the lofty Egyptian hall, a single light high on the ceiling casts eerie patterns of black shadow. Suddenly, a phone rings on the desk of the night watchman, rings and shatters the silence of this modern tomb of ancient art. Hello? Hello? Oh, this is Patrick Hawk, night watchman of the city museum speaking. Hello? Hello? Well, don't be answering then. The devil take you for disturbing a man's rest. Now, what in the name of all the holy? Who's that? Stop! Stop in your tracks or I'll shoot! Stop, I tell you! Oh, no, you don't. Ah, uh, but I do, my friend. <laughs> well, what do you make of it, Chief? No watchman. No corpus delicti. No, nothing. Yes, I know, Harrington. And we can't tell what's been stolen until the director of the museum gets here. Oh. Meanwhile, I want you to search this section of the museum. Yeah, okay, Chief, okay. I'll take a look around. Oh. But the boys in the precinct figure it was probably just some kids got locked in after closing time. Well, that wouldn't account for the disappearance of the night watchman. That's right. And those bloodstains there. Yes, and the telephone the police found off the hook. Mm-hmm. Now, they all seem to indicate he never left the building. No. Yeah, what did you find out about that phone call, Well, Miss Miller is checking with the telephone company now. But meanwhile, we've got to locate that night watchman. Yeah, or what's left of him. Yes, look in the Egyptian room first, Harrington. That's where the night watchman's desk is. Yeah, okay. Hey. Huh? Hey, Chief, here comes somebody. What? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's probably Anderson, director of the museum. Oh, yeah, okay, Chief. If that night watchman's here, I'll find him, dead or alive. Right. How do you do, sir? How do you do? I'm Cornwell Anderson, director of this museum. I'm the district attorney, Mr. Anderson. Oh, how do you do? Exactly what happened here tonight? <laughs> That's what I'm hoping you can tell me. Well, Patrick Cork, the night watchman, a devoted and trusted guard of long service. I think he could tell... He's vanished. Vanished? Yes. But how? We don't know. But tell me, is there anything in this section of the museum that might easily be sold? Oh, my dear sir, the museum is full of priceless relics. Well, yes, of course. But do you know of any particular item that might be marketable? My word, so you think... Well, yes, now that you mention it, yes. Uh, right in the next room, a real collector's prize. Our latest and proudest acquisition. Yes, what is it? A priceless miniature, a Holbein. Mm -hmm. An exquisite and flawless masterpiece of the golden age of miniature painting. For a moment, I was afraid... Afraid it was stolen? Yes. You see, there was a previous attempt. Yes, when? The last spring. Didn't you report it to the police? No, no, it happened in London. In London? Yes, where the miniature was purchased for it. Oh, yes, I see. 
And is this miniature protected by the burglar alarm system? Oh, yes, yes. Even the breaking of the glass will set off the alarm system. Well, then the breaking of the showcase in the other room must have set off the alarm. Yes. Poor Patrick must have seen the intruders, struggled with them. Then suppose you take me to the case where this miniature is kept. Of course. It's right over here in the corner of the room. I see. Well, there's nothing wrong with this case. No glass broken. No. No, there isn't. Oh, there, there's the miniature. No one has touched it. Yes, yes. Come here, quick! Who is that? my chief special investigator. Chief, Chief, I found him. I think I found the night watchman. Yes, where is he? Right over there in one of them Egyptian coffins, all all laid out like an undertaker's done the job. My word, in a mummy case? Mummy case or coffin, he's in there. Yes, which one? The middle one, the one with the dogs and palm trees painted on it. Here. Here, I'll just open it again. Is he dead? If he ain't, he ought to be. Oh, my word, I... You said it. Oh, boy, this gives me a turn. I'm used to corpses, but this... Hey, Harrington, this man isn't dead. Huh? He's unconscious, but there's pulse action and a faint heartbeat. Well, for the love of Pete, let's get him out of here. No, he may be suffering from internal injuries. Phone for an ambulance. Yeah, right, Chief, right. <laughs> We're getting something. Oh, poor Patrick, why, what could have happened? You see that red welt around his throat? Why, yes, extraordinary. No, not at all. This wasn't the work of mischievous boys or amateurs, Mr. Anderson. This man was strangled by an expert. Well, Chief, it certainly looks like this museum robbery was planned by some very clever crooks. Yes, yeah, extremely clever, Miss Wyndham. We're not dealing with thugs and gunmen. No. So any word from Harrington yet this morning? Oh, yes. He's on his way down here to the office. Mm -hmm. And he says something about Scotland Yard. Oh, yes. I wonder what he could have... Yes, this case has an international angle. Oh. See, Anderson, the director of the museum, tells me there was an attempt to steal a prize miniature shortly before it was purchased in London. Oh, but, Chief, if there was a previous attempt, won't it be hard to check with Scotland Yard what with the war and the heavy cable traffic? Oh, yes, but fortunately, a yard inspector is over here now on other business. I met him just a few nights ago. His name is Essex. Oh, yes, yes, I've heard of him. I'm having Harrington check with you. Oh, that sounds like Harrington, Chief. He always slams doors. Hello, Chief. Hello, Hello Miss Miller. Hello. Well, it seems Anderson of the museum got a bum steer about that there miniature, Chief. Uh, how so? Well, according to the Scotland Yard inspector, they had a man watching the miniature and other things from the time they arrived from Amsterdam until it was shipped over here. Yes, yes. And what happened? Well, nothing. Not a thing, Chief. You mean to say there was no attempt to steal it? Not a ghost of a snatch. Well, Chief, this case is beginning to go soft. Things are stolen, and they ain't stolen. Guys are dead, laid out in a coffin. The next thing you know, they're up walking around. And there's a woman in the case, Harrington. A woman? <laughs> eh, wouldn't you know it? No wonder nothing makes sense. Where does she fit in? She made the telephone call to the museum just before the watchman was strangled. Well, who is she? Where'd you pick her up? She made the call from a payphone in a drugstore. No, we haven't picked her up. Well, and we haven't enough of a description to broadcast an alarm. <sighs> hey, Harrington, let's you and I go back to the museum. And, Miss Miller... Yes, sir? I've jotted down a list of questions here, and I'd like to have the answers as quickly as possible. So phone Mr. Williams, chairman of the board of the city museum. Right away, Chief. <laughs> This is Pierre Jolet. Oh, oui. It was unfortunate. Well, we must wait. How about no? The museum will be guarded extra well in the night. What? Today is this afternoon? But say damn possible. Does not matter if you are pressed for the money. But... But, monsieur, I tell you. Oh, mais oui. This is very clever. They would not expect such a move. You have missed your calling, monsieur. Yeah? Who is it? Be quiet, Your Honor, Maman. Uh, it is only my confederate, monsieur. And uh, your plan is good. And I shall not fail this time. Now be at your home this afternoon and have the money ready. Au revoir, monsieur. Yvonne, how many times must I tell you? Pierre, you are not going to try again. The police will not be expecting you. But last night you almost killed a man. Many times I have almost killed Yvonne, but never yet. You think you are so very smart. But one day, 
You will hold the silken call the moment too long, and someone will die. The use of the silken garotte is a fine art, ma chérie. I, I am master of that art. Even so, why can we not wait? The radio and the newspapers report it will sleet and snow this afternoon. The museum will be deserted. By tonight, we will have the money. I do not like this. You must do your part this one more time. You must talk to the guard. Keep him interested. Now, where is my cane? Fetch it to me, Yvonne. The cane? You mean the sword cane? Me, certain. Hmm. The noisy gun, it is not for me. You are a fool, Pierre. Do as I say, Yvonne. Bring the cane or I get it myself. And I use it on you. This here museum's nearly as creepy by daylight as it was last night, Chief. <laughs> oh, I was meaning to ask you, how come you stopped so long at the police lamp? Well, I was having the chief chemist prepare something that may prove to be a solution to this case, Harrington. Well, now that we're... Well, for the love of Mike, or Patrick Cork, I should say. Yes, a night watchman. Good afternoon to you, Mr. District. Yes, oh, good Harry. afternoon. To you, Mr. Harrington. How are you, sir? And thanks for your interrupting me premature way. Yes. Think nothing of it, Mr. Cork. Hey, what are you doing on day duty, Cork? Well, after what happened last night, I was transferred to the day duty because they're shorthanded here at the museum, owing to a couple of the boys being out sick. Oh, I see. Did Mr. Anderson transfer you? No, no, it was his assistant. Mr. Anderson's off home for the day with a cold. Huh? Hey, he didn't have no cold at one o'clock this morning. Well, I was hoping to get some further information on the history of the Holbein miniature from him. Well, now, his assistant, Miss Jones, might be after having it, sir. Mm -hmm. There is a pamphlet. First, that might do. Uh, go get one of those pamphlets, Harrington. Yeah, okay, Chief. Right. Oh, hello, Miss Miller. Hello. What brings you here at 90 miles an hour? No time for that now, Harrington. Oh, Chief, yes? I have the information. Good, but just a minute, Miss Miller. Right. Harrington. Yeah, Chief? Get that pamphlet from the assistant director right away. Yeah, right. Down the hall, first door to the right. Yeah, thanks. Right away, Chief. Now then, let's have that report, Miss Miller. Here you are, Chief. Mm. Your hunch was more than right. Uh -huh. Yes, so it would seem. Hmm. Oh, Miss Miller, this is Patrick Cork, the watchman who was nearly strangled to death last night. Oh, hello, Mr. Cork. You had a lucky escape. <laughs> How do you do, Miss Miller? Sure and as thankful I am to be alive this day. I should say. Well, Chief, uh, what do you make of the report? Oh, it's pretty much what I'd expected to have confirmed. Um, do you have the key to the showcase guarding the Holbein miniature of Cork? I have that, Mr. District Attorney. Good. Open the case, William. Open the case? Yes. Well, now, I don't rightly know, sir. Well, I'll have to disconnect the alarm system first. That'll be quite all right. Well, if you say so, sir, I'll uh, disconnect the wire here at the switch. Uh, would you be wanting to take the miniature out, sir? No. No, I'm not even going to touch the miniature myself. Mm, well, let that day body just try to touch it. I'm itching to get me hands on the devil that came across to choking me to death. Oh, just a minute, Clark. And now get this straight. If anyone, anyone, tries to steal this miniature, don't raise a hand to stop them. Uh, but the, now remember, don't try to stop them. <laughs> It's almost closing time, and we must act quickly. The museum is deserted. Pierre, this may be a trap. Nonsense. It is sleeting. That is why no one is here, and it is perfect. Now, go talk with the guard. Get him away from the miniature case. Into the Egyptian room. And give me time to cut the glass. Suppose the alarm goes off, as it did last night. Even so. There is only the guard. I will take care of him. There he comes. Engage him in conversation for me. Get him away from here. Oh, watchman, I beg your pardon. Oh, good afternoon, miss. Well, what can I do for you? I came to see the Egyptian collection. Where is it? Well, right down the hall, miss, around the corner to your left. Can you not take me there? Oh, that I can. And the gentleman, too. Oh, oh I beg your pardon. The young lady and I are not together. Oh, I see. And uh, what would you be wanting to see? Mm, nothing in particular. Uh, you wouldn't be interested in miniatures now, would you? 
Uh, please, monsieur, take me to the Egyptian room. Well, I can't, no. Speak up, man. Let me hear your voice again. What is my voice to you? It is the same. You tried to steal that miniature last night. You tried to strangle me. Are you come along with me? Pierre, the old man has recognized you. Yes, yeah, so he has. That I have, all right. Now, come along. Not now. I have another idea. Oh! Oh! You have killed this old man. I have merely destroyed a witness. Come, Yvonne. Now we will get the miniature. Well, Patrick Cork has ignored your district attorney's warning. We'll learn the outcome and hear the surprising developments of this case in just a moment. But first, men... I think you'll agree that the quick way to succeed in your business is to look successful. For as you know, men who look successful, men who are well-groomed and confident, get attention mighty fast. And Vitalis helps you to look successful, helps you to look like a winner so that you're always ready when opportunity comes your way. Because Vitalis gives you good-looking, well-groomed hair. You see, Vitalis makes your hair obey your comb, makes it lie smoothly and smartly in place and makes it stay in place all day long, all evening, but with none of that offensive, gooey, patent leather shine you see on some men's hair. Instead, Vitalis gives your hair a natural look, a really well-groomed look. So men use Vitalis and have the kind of handsome hair that helps you register a winning impression in your business contacts and in your social contacts, too. Use Vitalis and have the kind of good-looking hair that helps win you the respect of men and the admiration of women. Why don't you get a bottle of Vitalis the next time you're in a drugstore? Now, back to your district attorney. Sergeant Goshen of the 4th Precinct is on the phone. He's calling from the museum. It's all right. I'll take it here. Hey, I'll bet you the trap sprung, Chief. Hello? Worse than that, Harrington. Hello, Sergeant. Yes? What? The miniature is gone? Cork is injured? What? Seriously? Yes, well, get him to the hospital. Get him the best specialist in the city. Oh. Yes, I'll be there as soon as I can. It's all right. Goodbye. What happened, Chief? I thought you told the old geezer to lay off. Yes, I did. I should have known a man can't forget a lifetime of training in an emergency. He tried to stop the thieves. A man and a woman with a French accent. And got strangled again. No, Harrington. This time, the thief used a cane sword. Ran him through. What? Well, what are we waiting for, Chief? They've grabbed the bait. Let's go get them. Come into the study, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Was it necessary to bring your wife to my home? Yes, uh, we are leaving the city immediately, Monsieur Anderson. Monsieur, give us the money and let us go quickly. Why? Why are you in such a hurry? What happened at the museum? Did you bungle again? No, this time I have the miniature. But unfortunately... Unfortunately what? Unfortunately, the watchman recognized me and tried to prevent our escape. Oh, how could he? Cork is on the night shift. It would seem that he was transferred to the day shift. Ah, yes, it would. Did you use that silk cord again? No. I had only my cane so. You murdered the guard? There was nothing else to do. Well, you shouldn't have come here after doing a thing like that. I have no intention of getting mixed up in a murder. It is too late for that, monsieur. You are mixed up with us. And if we are cut, you also will pay for the crime. I have your $5,000. Give me the miniature. I beg your pardon, monsieur. Now we need $10,000. Yes, though there is a little more expensive. You agreed to sell the miniature for five. I haven't 10000 and I can't raise it. Well, how much money have you, monsieur Anderson? $5,000. That's all I agreed to pay, and that's all you'll get. Pierre, we are wasting time. Take the money and let us get out of here. Here is the miniature. Now, where is the money? The money is in my private safe over here. Ah, a private vault for all their treasures. 
This is not the first time you have robbed your museum. That is my business. It seems practice in crime has steeled your nerves, monsieur. Hmm. Pierre, someone is at the door. Whom are you expecting? Is this some trick, monsieur? I'm not expecting anyone. The servants are off, and I'll have to answer the door. My car is out front. <laughs> Whoever it is will know I'm at home. Then go to the door. Get rid of them. Oh, it may be some friend. I'll have to admit for a moment. Here, you must hide. Uh, get in the vault. Quickly, both of you. Don't be ridiculous, monsieur. Harry, get in that vault. Oh, here, here. Take this miniature with you. We have no intention of getting into your vault. It would kill us both. For once, Yvonne, you are right. However, we will take the miniature. I have no time to argue with you. You involve me in one murder. It is a trap. He has a gun. A trap or not, get in that vault. It all depends on how badly you've bungled. If it's the police, if they followed you here... Get in, do you hear me, madam? You wouldn't dare use that gun, monsieur. Wouldn't I? I think you would, Yvonne. Come. You know I would. Get in that vault. Mr. District Attorney. Yes. And my secretary and assistant, Miss Miller. How do you do, Mr. Anderson? How do you do? You mind if we come in? The snow is rather wet. Oh, of course, of course. Thank you. I suppose you're here for some more information about the Holbein miniature. A miniature has been stolen, Mr. Anderson. What? Why, how did it happen? Had the police any clues? Oh, yes. Yes, there were quite a number of clues. Oh, I see you have a nice fire going in your study... Suppose we talk in there. Oh, yes, yes, of course. This is terrible. I want to help in every way I can. I... Oh, Mr. Anderson, you're so pale. Are you sure your cold hasn't turned to grip? No, I don't think so. Perhaps you'd like a drink. I know this must be very upsetting for you. Oh, yes, I, I believe I will. Oh, will you join me? The whiskey is right here. Or rye, if you prefer. Uh, some soda? Thank you. But if you don't mind, I'll have a plain glass of water. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Well, that'll be enough water, thank you. Oh, I... Clumsy of me. I've spilled the water all over your hands. Quite all right, no harm. Chief, you're all right. Look at Mr. Anderson's hands. Uh, what about my hands? Look at them, Anderson. Why, that turning purple. He's had the miniature in his hands, Chief. It must be somewhere in this house. What's the meaning of this? What are you talking about? How dare you insist? Save insane? your indignation, Anderson. Where is the man with the French accent and his woman accomplice? Oh, I don't know. I know nothing about them. We'll get them. The guard described them. Well, then catch them. Why come here and accuse me? Your telltale hand. You've had the miniature in your hand. That's a lie. This purple in my hands means nothing. <laughs> it isn't proof of anything. Sufficient proof to place you under arrest, Mr. Anderson. Arrest? You're going to arrest me? Yes. And on the basis of evidence I already have, I'll get a warrant to search this house for the miniature. You can't. You have no right. A perfectly legal right. <laughs> well, will you come with us of your own free will? Or must I call in my special investigator and have him handcuffed? You? Handcuffed? Oh, no. I'm not going, and you won't take me. Chief, he's carrying a gun. Yes, so I see. You'd better hand over that gun, Anderson. It's rather late in life for you to start making murder your business. Don't make me kill you. I'm getting away, that's all. Now, don't follow me. I'm going to get away. You ain't going. No! Oh, oh, all right, Aaron. Not too rough with him. I'm trying to be as gentle as I can. Boy, did I have a time getting in the back way. But I didn't do it. I didn't tell him to kill poor old Cork. I'm not to blame. You're a pretty cold-blooded man, Mr. Anderson. But a judge and jury will decide that. And I think I know how they'll decide. Oh, Harrington, just as soon as you've got the handcuffs on him, come over here to this vault. I think that's where we'll find Mr. Anderson's two companions in crime. <laughs> Before your district attorney tells you when and why he first suspected Anderson and the means he used to prove his guilt, here's a special message for every woman listening in tonight. Now, you want your husband or your sweetheart to do all he can to keep the hair he has, don't you? Then tell him about Vitalis and the famous 60-second workout. Yes, tell him to use Vitalis and the speedy 60-second workout because it helps a man to keep the hair he still has. For you see, men, the easy Vitalis workout helps in four different ways. Four very important ways. It loosens up your tight, dry scalp and really gives your hair a chance. It stimulates the circulation. It routes unsightly loose dandruff. 
And it helps prevent excessive falling hair. So, men, why don't you start using Vitalis and have good-looking, well-groomed hair every day? Use Vitalis in that easy, speedy workout and let it help you to keep the hair you still have. Ask your druggist for a bottle of Vitalis tomorrow or even tonight. And now, here is your district attorney. Well, ladies and gentlemen, fortunately, Patrick Cork did not die. But Anderson, Pierre, and Yvonne were tried, convicted, and received long prison sentences for their crime. Oh, Chief, I think it was grand you knew Pierre and Yvonne were in that safe. Well, muddy footprints leading to the vault gave me that clue. Oh, and Chief, hadn't you better tell our audience why you suspected Anderson? Yes. His one simple lie caused us to investigate him. We soon discovered other art treasures had vanished from the museum and had been unreported. We learned that the city trustees were investigating and had already given Anderson a notice of dismissal as of January 1st. That and the need of money prompted him to take one last desperate chance. Yeah, Chief, and the trap you set for him was something. Boy, you sure caught him (laughs) purple-handed. Yes, Harrington. And that was simply a matter of sprinkling the miniature with an almost invisible aniline powder dye, which causes the hands of anyone touching it to turn purple if they come in contact with water. What about next week, Chief? Well, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we again have quite a different case and one of the most baffling sagas of double murder this office was ever called upon to solve. The case of the bittersweet. So don't miss the case of the bittersweet at the same time next week. Until then, thank you and good night. And remember, buy defense savings bonds and stamps. of all characters in tonight's dramatization are fictitious and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Jay Justin was featured in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, Vicky Vola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden and the author was Jerry McGill. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by the Bristol Myers Company, makers of Vitalis the largest selling preparation of its kind for keeping your hair well-groomed. Just think of the word vital and add I-S. Vitalis, Vitalis for your hair. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by Vitalis, V-I-T-A-L-I-S. Vitalis, the famous preparation that keeps your hair well-groomed and used with a speedy 60-second workout, helps you to keep your hair. And it shall be the duty of the District Attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Our case tonight opens in a recently completed defense factory located in your district attorney's city. Mr. Winstead, the personnel manager of the plant, is busily working at his desk. Winstead speaking. Hello, Mr. Winstead. Yes? My name is Preston. Yes? I'm calling you about that ad you got in the paper. The one where you're looking for skilled workers? Oh, yes. Did you get any answers to that ad, Mr. Winstead? Not a single one. Why? I didn't figure you would. Are you applying for a job, sir? No, I'm just interested in your problem. Well, look, old man, I'm very busy right now. You want skilled workers, don't you? Yes, yes, I need them very badly, but it's one. How many guys do you figure you need? 
Well, at least a hundred immediately. But why should that concern you? I can get them for you. How? I got an angle. Now, look, you're wasting my time. I've spent weeks combing every available source for, to find men. There just aren't any to be found. I said I could get them for you, Mr. Winston. Where? I'd like to tell you that first. Could you meet me someplace, maybe? Well, Suppose I... Suppose I drop by in my car and pick you up. You can get me a hundred skilled workers. That's right. Very well. I'll be ready in half an hour. Where are we going, Mr. Preston? Oh, we'll just ride around a little. I can't spend much time with you. Well, this shouldn't take long, Mr. Winstead. You say you can get me 100 skilled workers. Is that all you need? No, I can use as many as you find. Uh, we're working on a very important government war contract. Uh -huh. It's being delayed by lack of manpower. I've got to get men. Well, I'm the guy that can do it for you. Oh? Yeah, I got an angle. What is this angle? How long will it take you? A few days, a week maybe. Where will you get them? I don't know yet. You certainly make this all sound very mysterious. Well, you wouldn't tell me your business secrets, would you? Just what do you get out of it? Well, I collect what you call a commission light. Oh, from the workers? Oh, no. From you. How much? Well, say 10% of each guy's pay. And their first week's pay. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> Why, that wouldn't even pay my expenses. Well, what is your price? Ten percent every week as long as you use them. Well, that's ridiculous. They might work at our plant for years. Sure. That could amount to almost a thousand dollars a week. I know. Well, that's way out of line, Mr. Preston. That's my price. No cut rates. So how about it, mister? Well? If you stall around, it'll cost you more. All right. It's a deal. Okay. Where can you be reached if I want you? A friend of mine runs that bowling alley over on West Street. You can get me there. Very well. Now, I think we ought to put our deal in writing, Mr. Winston. Did you send for me, Chief? Oh, yes. Come in, Harrington. Right. Uh, let me have that letter on my desk there, Miss Meadow, please. Oh, this one, Chief? Yes, yes, that's it. What's up, Chief? I just received this letter from District Attorney Sanford. Sanford, West County? That's right. And this is rather important information he's passed on to me. Mm -hmm. I want you to hear it, both of you. Yes, sir. All right, okay. Dear D.A., I want to report a condition that has arisen up here in West County that is likely to spread down into your county as well. Huh? Due to the war, we've had a rapid expansion of defense industries. Many new factories have been opened up here. Huh? We welcome such effort, of course. But this welcome is tempered somewhat by a rapidly rising menace which is undoing all the good the expansion has brought. And this menace is labor pirating. Pirating? What's that? Yes, Harrington. And he goes on to explain. Labor pirating is the act of enticing workers from one plant to another by any and all available means. <laughs> of course, the real evil resulting from this pirating is that it slows up vital war production. Gosh. There's an acute shortage of skilled workers of nearly all kinds... So it's difficult indeed to replace those who are taken from one job to another. Oh, is yes, that a scurvy racket? Okay. Any more, Chief? Yes, he says the bait used ranges from the lure of higher wages to out and out kidnapping. Mm -hmm. In most instances, neither the employers nor the workers are at fault. The real offenders are a group of unscrupulous negotiators, usually ex racketeers. <laughs> one of these is a man named Barney Preston. Preston. He has been indicted by our grand jury because of his activities in hijacking labor. Preston. I regret to tell you, however, that Preston has avoided arrest by leaving town. Mm -hmm. I have information that he may have gone to your city. Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly, he will continue his practice there. Any efforts on your part to apprehend him will be appreciated. Sincerely yours, George Sanford. Oh, how do you like that? Something new has been added, huh, Chief? Yes. Another field has been opened to the racketeers. Well, that kind of business is practically fifth column work. Yes, I know. I never heard of this Preston guy. Did Sanford enclose any information about him? There's a complete description. Good. I get out a general alarm on him right away, Chief. Yes, Harrington, I wish you would. Right. And, Miss Miller. Yes, Chief. I want to send a letter to the heads of all the factories in town. I want to warn them that labor hijacking will not be tolerated here. Uh, 
nice one, Eddie. Gives you a spare. Yeah. Well, how's the bowling going, fellas? Oh, hello, Mr. Monroe. Hi. Hiya. I'm sorry I can't use that other alley. We're short of pinboys tonight. Oh, that's okay. We can do enough damage to one alley. Right, Eddie? <laughs> sure. <laughs> how's everything over the factory? Oh, the same as usual. Well, you boys better make it while you can, I guess. What do you mean? Well, I... I really shouldn't tell you this, but... You fellas get good customers of mine. Yeah? I guess it's only right you should know. About what? Well, a couple of the big shots from the plant were in here bowling a few strings last night. Yeah? They'd also been hitting the bottle a bit, so I guess that's why they were careless about what they were saying. Uh Uh-huh. I happen to overhear them talking about the government's going to cancel all the contracts with your factory. What? Did you hear that, Eddie? Yeah, how come, I wonder? Well, I heard this man say something about the motors didn't operate right when they were used on the fighting front. Well, what do you know? Did they say the factory was going to shut down or something, Mr. Monroe? Well, if they blow the contracts, what else can they do? Yeah, sure. Yeah. None of my business, but if I was you fellas, I'd start scamping around for another job. Yeah, you're right. Uh, by the way, I just happened to hear about a plant that's looking for men right now. Yeah, where? You did? Yeah, it's a new factory just opened up on the other side of town. They need fellows in your line real bad. I think maybe we ought to hop over there, huh, Eddie? Oh, you said it. Well, thanks for tipping us off, Mr. Monroe. Oh, glad to do it. Hey, but look. Yeah? Uh, don't say anything to anybody else about it, will you? Oh, don't worry, Mr. Monroe. We won't tell a soul. The way I got it was this, see? The government's canceled the contracts, and the plant closes down next week. Sure, sure. I heard it from one of the managers. The government inspector told me the whole thing. The plant closes down in four days. Sure, that's a fact. Now, if you're smart, you'll jump over to that new factory that just opened up over... How many men did you say you've lost in the past few days, Mr. Burris? Over a hundred, Mr. District Attorney. Mm. And they're still leaving. It's serious. War orders are being held up. That's why I came here to see you this afternoon. Well, did you tell them there was no truth to the rumor? Yes, of course. But the story has been magnified so by now that there just doesn't seem to be any way of stopping it. Well, a published statement of denial from the government ought to take care of that. I'll arrange for you at once, sir. Well, that would help. But it still doesn't get back the men I've lost. No, I'm not. Hey, uh, look, Mr. Lewis, have you checked up on where these guys of yours have found new jobs? Yes. Most of them have gone over to that new factory on the north side. Mm -hmm. Are you sure of that? Yes. They're doing important work, too, of course. Mm -hmm. War orders, but so are we. They've got no right to hire my men away from me. And, Chief, I guess that guy's in town all right. Yes, I'm afraid he is. Uh, Who's that? There's a man named Preston. Oh. He's a racketeer who specializes in hijacking labor. Say, tell me, Mr. Lewis, do you know why your men left? Is this new plant paying higher wages? No, no, they're not. I'm sure of that. We're both paying union scale, and Mm -hmm. my men were getting plenty of overtime. I see. I've already spoken to a Mr. Winstead over there. He's the personnel manager. Winston. I asked him to explain the coincidences that made so many of my employees go to his place yes. for work. What did he say to that? He just denied any knowledge of conspiracy. I suppose I talked to him. Yeah, his number is uh, Main 2800. All right, thank you. Yes? Uh, Miss Miller, would you get me Main 2800, please? Yes, sir, I wait. I want to talk to a Mr. Winstead. Right, Chief. Uh, Have you any idea how this rumor started, Mr. Lewis? No, I haven't been able to trace it at all. Eh, It sure don't take much to make them spread, does it? I should say not. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll take him. Yes? I have Mr. Winstead for you, Chief. Oh, fine. Put him on. Go ahead, please. Hello? Hello, Mr. Winston. This is the district attorney. Oh, yes. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. What's on your mind? Well, I have Mr. Lewis, the president of Amalgamated, here in my office. 
We're trying to track down the source of this rumor that's robbed him of some of his best workmen. I see. I understand that most of his employees have gone to work for you. Is that correct, sir? Well, I, I guess we have hired some of his former employees. Well, why did they select your plant? No, I, I don't know, Mr. District Attorney. Well, the reason I ask is that we believe there's a man named Preston behind all this. He specializes in hijacking labor. I wondered if he'd been to see you. Why, uh, why, no. I see. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Winston. I may call you again if anything develops. You see, a serious offense has been committed against Mr. Lewis's factory. I intend to prosecute whoever's at the bottom of it. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, well, good day, sir. Goodbye. Did you get anything out of him, Chief? Oh, nothing definite. But he did seem rather upset by my questioning. Yeah. I think I may call on Mr. Winston. Huh? A good personal talk with him might accomplish a lot. Yeah. I'll see him the first thing in the morning. Looking for me, Mr. Winston? Oh, hello, Mr. Preston. I didn't think you'd ever get here. I've been waiting almost two hours. Oh, that's too bad. Never mind that. I've got to talk to you, privately. Okay. We'll use the office here in the back. Come on. Yes, thank you. Why didn't you try a little bowling while you were waiting? Well, I did, uh, till I got too tired. Oh. We'll go in here. Yes, very well. Now, what did you want to see me about? Well, it really has to do with a misunderstanding. How's that? I had no idea that you'd use the methods you employed to get those workmen from me. No? No. How'd you think I'd get them? I Pick them you... off trees? I thought you were going to use legitimate means. You already tried that, didn't you? Yes, but... But what? Now, look, Preston. We need workmen badly. Uh... We've got a lot of government contracts, and they're important in winning the war. Yeah? But I know, somehow, you've been... What? Well, stealing men from the amalgamated plant. Stealing? Their work is important, too. I don't know how you got those men to leave, but I'm against getting them your way, that's all. You're a little late with that idea, ain't you? Not necessarily. What do you mean? I'm doing the only thing a patriotic American can do. I'm sending those men back to their original jobs. Your what? I'm calling the deal off. That's what you think. Now, see here, Preston. I don't want to have any trouble with you. No? You see, I happen to know something about your background. Uh Uh-huh. I learned that you make a specialty of hijacking labor. Where'd you find that out? The district attorney told me. Oh, now I get it. You're trying to wiggle out from under to keep your own nose clean. I'm merely trying to do the right thing, that's all. Look, Winston, you made a deal with me, you're going through with it, see? I intend to do just that. I'm going to pay you the commission on one week's salary for those men. That's strictly for chickens. My payoff comes every week. That's impossible. Don't forget I've got a contract with you, my friend. The DA might like to see that. That contract is not binding if I don't keep the men. Now, look, sucker. I don't want to waste no more talk on you. The deal stands. Oh, no. I'm not going to let you blackmail me. I'll go to the district attorney and tell him everything. Wait a minute. You stay right here. Get out of my way. Stay here, I said. Put down that bowling pin. Sure, where do you want me to put it? No, don't. Well, I guess they better set him up in the next alley. This labor pirating situation is a very serious one for all of us because of the way it cuts down on war production. And now, with Winstead murdered, your district attorney's job becomes doubly difficult. Before we hear from him again, though, you know, men, in these busy days when so much depends on the work we turn out, it's very important to keep physically fit. That's why we get as much outdoor exercise as we can. It's so good for our general health. But it can be mighty bad for your hair, for the hot sun bakes it and makes it look dry, and the shower bath or swim afterward drenches your hair, making it look lifeless and stringy. Yes, that's true. But there's an easy, speedy way to help overcome the damaging effects of sun and water. A 60-second workout with Vitalis. V-I-T-A-L-I-S. Vitalis. This brisk massage with Vitalis loosens your scalp, stimulates the circulation, routes unsightly, embarrassing loose dandruff, and helps to prevent excessive falling hair. The pure vegetable oils of Vitalis come to the rescue of your oil-depleted scalp. So when you comb your hair, it lies smartly and smoothly in place and looks well-groomed. 
And that's why thousands of men in all walks of life use Vitalis and the 60-second workout in spite of summer sun and soaking water. This famous Vitalis workout helps you to keep your hair for the days to come and keeps your hair good-looking every day. Now back to Mr. District Attorney. Mr. Winston's body was found early this morning, Miss Miller. Where, Chief? In a ditch beside a road on the outskirts of town. Well, how was he killed? Hit on the head with a blunt instrument. Oh, that's terrible. Yes. Were there any other clues? And the police are working on that now. Oh. The thing that bothers me is I might have prevented this if I'd gone to see him last night. But... Oh, I doubt that, Chief. I honestly do. Uh, Where's Harrington? He went over to Winstead's factory to see what he could pick up. Chief, do you suppose this man Preston killed Winstead? That's quite likely he did, yes. Well, the police still haven't been able to find any trace of him. Oh, I know. Uh, excuse me, Chief. Yes, come in, Harrington. Okay. How did you make out? Well, I, uh... I picked up some very tantalizing information. Good or bad? Well, one thing is very good you can make book now, Chief. That the killer was this Preston guy. Oh, really? Yeah, I got that from Winston's secretary. Well, how did she know? Well, she didn't. It's what she told me that adds up to that. Yes, what was it? Well, right after you called Winston yesterday, he made another call. He dialed the number himself. But his secretary happened to overhear him ask for a Mr. Preston. I see. Well, Preston wasn't there, but he was expected. So Winston told whoever was on the other end of the line that he'd be right over. Then he grabbed his hat and hightailed it out. Well, does the secretary know what number he called, Harrington? No, she don't. There's no way of checking it either. Uh, I see what you mean by tantalizing information. Uh, we know everything but the whereabouts of the murderer and the location of his hideout. Yeah. Well, where do you go from there, Chief? Well, there's one thing we can try to trace to its source. What's that? The origination point of that rumor. Uh, we can be reasonably sure now that Preston started it. Uh, that might lead us to him. That's right, Chief. But how do you find that sword? Well, I think Harrington can help us out there. Me? What do I do? Yes, I want you to go to Winstead's factory. Yeah? I'll arrange for you to get a job there. All right. And try to talk to every man who left Lewis's plant because of the rumor. Right. One of those men must know where that rumor started. <laughs> Well, he's still at police headquarters, Harrington. Oh, boy, I got a red-hot lead for him. Really? Yeah, I think I found out where that rumor was started. Where? Well, I got it from two guys. They didn't want to tell me at first. I had to flash my tin before they'd even talk. Well, what did they tell you? Well, it seems they got the story from some guy who runs a bowling alley right near Lewis's factory. Yes? He handed it out to them as very confidential stuff. Well, that's <laughs> how all rumors are planned. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm going over and see that guy right now. Well, what'll I tell the chief? Well, just give him the information I just gave you and tell him that I'll call back as soon as I make sure I'm on the right trail. Well, when will that be? Just as soon as I make that guy in the bowling alley talk. Come in. Uh, yes? Uh, are you Mr. Monroe? Yes, that's right. Oh, good. My name's Harrington. District Attorney's Office. Uh, I want to ask you a few questions. Okay. Sit down, Mr. Harrington. <laughs> Thanks. What seems to be the trouble? Well, I'm on a kind of a tough assignment. Yeah? Yeah, I'm uh, chasing a rumor. See any laying around here? <laughs> no, but that don't prove nothing. They never show up till you get them in the light. Oh, that makes it tough, huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, not always. Uh, what made you look here? Well, I got information that this is the place where the particular rumor I'm chasing got started. Is that so? Yeah. As a matter of fact, Mr. Monroe, I understand that you were the guy who put it underweight. Uh, what was this rumor? Well, it had to do with the factory across the street closing down. You spread that report, didn't you? No. No? Huh? I might have talked about it, but that was only because of what I heard some other guys say. Uh, but you did talk about it to men who were working in that plant. Well, sure. Yeah. They were good customers of mine. I didn't want to see him wind up on the limb. No. Uh, Monroe, did you ever hear of labor pirating? Uh-uh. Well, suppose I ask you another question. Did you ever hear of a guy named Preston? Barney Preston? No. 
Don't know the answer to that one either. <laughs> I'm doing very good this quiz game, am I? <laughs> no, you ain't, but don't let that worry you, brother. I, I ain't got to the jackpot question yet. <laughs> What's that? Well, it has to do with a guy named Winston. His body was found in a ditch outside of town. Winston? Yeah, he was doing business with Preston. Preston was hijacking labor. Mm -hmm. He was able to do that because of a rumor. Now, you started the rumor. Now, give me the answer to that one, wise guy. (laughs) I'm sorry. I got to blow that one, too. Oh, that's too bad. Well, suppose we play this game in a new location. What do you mean? I'm going to take you down to headquarters. The DA will ask the questions from here on. Hi, Monroe. Uh, Who's this? My name's Harrington. Who are you? What's it to you? Your name wouldn't be Preston, would it? Why? I've seen pictures of a guy by that name that looks just like you. Yeah? Yeah. Don't reach for that gun, copper. I got you covered. What? Nice going, Monroe. Who is this guy? Cop from the DA's office. Well. He's been playing a game, trying to get some answers. I got my answers. Sure, only they ain't going to do you any good. No? Sit down again, copper. Sure. We're going to play another game. Only this time, we ask the questions. Is that you, Chief? Yes, Mr. Well, how'd you make out at headquarters? Oh, very well. I examined Winston's body and found what may be an important clue. Really? Yes, it more or less identifies the type of place in which he was killed. Oh, that's swell, Chief. Uh, have you heard from Harrington? Well, yes, he came in about an hour ago. He seems to have found something, too. Well, the source of the rumor? Uh, yes, at least he thought so. Mm-hmm. He was on his way to investigate when he called. Who is he after? The proprietor of a bowling alley located near Lewis's factory. A bowling alley? Yes. You say he went there an hour ago? Well, yes, Chief. What's wrong? Well, the clue I found revealed that Mr. Winston was murdered in a bowling alley. <laughs> What do you want to jockey around with this guy for, Monroe? Let me knock him off now and get him out of here. No good. I came up with that Winstead guy before he was cold. Just because you were in a hurry. What do you think we ought to do? Put him on ice till the joint closes. Then you can put him away for keeps. Don't you guys know it's rude to talk about somebody when they're right in the room? Keep quiet, copper. You mean just because you tell me to? Shut up, I said. Oh. Brother, if you didn't have that gun in your hand... Look, Monroe, I can't wait around here till the joint closes. There's too much heat on me. You want to get rid of this guy, don't you? Sure, but why can't you take care of him? Because that ain't in my line. Nice, clean fellow. Well, I ain't hanging around, see? Look, suppose I give it to him now, then you can get rid of him. You can do that, can't you? Well, okay. But no guns. I don't want any noise. I'll give him the same thing I gave Winston. No, you won't, brother. You ain't got nothing to say about it. I got this much to say. You're going to have to use a gun on me and use it now. I ain't waiting for that bowling pin. Give me the gun. Get him of it, Monroe. Tell me. Get out of it, All right, you two. Stand where you are. You're covered. Take that gun away from him, Harrington. Right, Chief. Thanks for the lift. Uh, who are these men? Well, this character here is Barney Preston. Oh, well, this is a pleasant surprise. Harrington, you may arrest him for the murder of Mr. Winston. Of course, we know Preston murdered Mr. Winstead. But how can your district attorney be so certain of it? Well, we'll hear the unusual clue that gave him the solution of the case in just a moment. First, men, when you crawl out of bed these August mornings and your face feels hot and sticky, enjoy a quick, smooth shave with Ingram's. Yes, with Ingram shaving cream. Because Ingram's lather is purposely made cool to make your face feel cool and keep it feeling cool for hours. But that's not all this cool lather of Ingram's does for you. It piles up on your face in great velvety billows. It conditions your skin and softens and wilts your whiskers. Get your beard and skin all ready for your razor. So with Ingram shaving cream, you shave quickly. Yes, some men say that by using Ingram's, they cut minutes off their shaving time. Also, you shave smoothly and cleanly, and look younger when you're finished. Finally, you shave pleasantly, for the cool lather of Ingram's makes your face tingle with a feeling of delightful coolness. And it keeps your face feeling cool long after you put your razor away. So, men, why don't you use Ingram's? That's I-N-G-R-A-M-S. Ingram shaving cream. 
It's that famous shaving cream that you can get in either a jar or a tube, whichever you like. Now, why not get a jar or a tube of Ingram's from your druggist tonight and enjoy a quick, clean, cool shave with Ingram's tomorrow? Now, here is your district attorney. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think the first thing you should know is that we were able to get a conviction against Barney Preston for the murder of Winston. And he paid for this crime with his life. Oh, Chief, I think you should tell the folks about the clue that you found when you examined Winstead's body. Very well, Miss Miller. That clue was some powder-like substance that I found under one of Winstead's thumbnails. On examination, this substance turned out to be a special kind of chalk that bowlers use to keep their fingers dry when they handle the ball. I was then able to establish that Winston must have been in a bowling alley at some point just before his death. And that's why you came running over to Monroe's alleys on the double, huh? not you? Yes, Harrington. It... I knew there was a good chance of your meeting the same fate. Oh, I'm glad you sent that Monroe guy away too, Chief. He was getting a cut from Preston. he would have time of 15 years to think up some new rumors before he gets out. Yes, and speaking of rumors, Harrington, I'd like to repeat at this time a message that I sent to every employer and war worker in our city. And these were the words. If you are engaged in any work that will help our nation win this war, stay with your job. Don't listen to rumors or offers of better pay or even seek easier work. The production line is the front line here at home. Anyone who disrupts this line is guilty of sabotage, just as Preston was. This is the people's war. By your effort, we can win it. Right, Chief. And if a guy's looking for a job where he can help win this man's war... The place to find out where he's needed is the nearest United States Employment Service office. They give all the dope on all kinds of defense jobs. Yes, indeed they can. What about next week, Chief? Well, next week we'll have another dramatic case. The case of the phony payoff. It's a colorful and exciting story. I hope you'll remember to join us again next Wednesday. And until then, thank you and good night. The names of all characters in a nice dramatization are fictitious and in resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Jay Johnston was featured in the title role. Len Doyle as Harrington. Vicki Vola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden and the authors were Ed Byron and Jerry Devine. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by the Bristol Myers Company, makers of Vitalis, used by more men to keep their hair well-groomed than any other preparation of its kind. Just think of the word vital and add I-S. Vitalis, Vitalis for your hair. Friends, the sponsors of Mr. District Attorney cordially invite you to hear radio's most popular modern songsters, Dinah Shore in person, over another network every Friday night. Consult your local paper for time and station. Hear Dinah Shore next Friday. program came to you from New York. This is the night Good evening. This is Peter Lawrence. Say, would you be inclined to give your attention tonight to the subject of murder? Yeah. Well, you don't have to do anything. No, really. Except follow the thread of story. Just surrender yourselves to a strange tale of murder. Listen, my friends, to the mystery playhouse. Take you backstage to one of those little secondary Bulldog theaters. The home of one night stands, stale grease paint, half hearted audiences, and struggling performers. The world of comics, street men, chorus girls, and tennis. A world of make believe, yes, but with a harsh reality of the everyday world in the background. And it's a company in chorus of jealousy. Passions and disappointments. Yes, yeah, disappointments. A woman opens the door of her dressing room, then comes quickly down the iron stairs and crosses to the stage door. 
The manager of the theater calls out to her. May. May, where are you going? Out. Well, what's with the street clothes? You're on in about 15 minutes. Not me. Now, wait a minute. Look, Mr. Walton, just let me get out of now, here. Now, hold on, baby. Take it easy. But I just, just want... calm down. Relax. Now, what's the trouble? I'm through. I'm done. Oh, Another fight with Al, huh? Just don't mention that guy to me. Man, you got to use your head. You can't walk out like this. It ain't professional. Oh, please, don't hand me that show must go on routine. And uh, does Al know you're leaving? Makes no difference. Wait. Hey, Pop. Yeah? Go up to Al Graham's dressing room and ask him to come down here, will you? Okay. Now, look, there ain't no point What's in having him... this time, May? I just can't stand working with the guy. It's your husband. He's also a comic. That I can't put up with. Honey, will you tell me what happened? Just dripping water. I step on his last, he says. I sing off keys, he says. Oh, every comic's that way. You can't walk out for a little thing like that. No, that ain't why I'm walking out. Oh, what's that? Guys. Huh? He's got a new thing now. Guys. He thinks I'm flirting with the tenor in the flash Well, are you? Are you kidding? What would I want with a tenor? Well, what makes her think you're flirting with him? This tenor thinks I got talent. He tells Al that. Right away, Al thinks the guy's in love with me. Uh, and the whole fight is on account of that? Yeah. But it was just one fight too many. If you think I'm going to let any black-faced comic, even if he's my husband... Excuse talk... me, Mr. Walton. Oh, yeah, Pop. And yeah, Mr. Graham can't come down. Why not? He just ain't able to. How come? He's got a knife in his back. <gasps> he's dead. <laughs> Chief? Yes, Miss McLean. You said you wanted me to take a description of the body here? Oh, yes. Well, you may put down his tired and dressing gown. Uh-huh. Wearing black face makeup. A wig. Can I come in, Chief? Oh, yes. Come right ahead, Hank. Have you finished the examination? Uh, more or less. Yeah? Any prints on that knife? No. Well, they called off the performance tonight. Mm-hmm. I told them you'd be questioning a lot of people. Good. What's the story on this man here? Well, he was a vaudevillian. Black face comic. Well, of course, you see that. Yes, yes. He did an act with his wife. Where is she? Downstairs. She did kind of a breakup when she heard about the guy getting it. Oh. I told him to send her up when she felt a little better. Good. I got a few witnesses outside the dressing room here if you want to see him, Chief. Well, who's there? Well, the doorman, he found the body. Mm-hmm. A guy named Walton, he's the manager, and the wife, uh, when she's ready. All right, have the doorman come in. All right. I'll finish that description later. Sir. Okay. Come on in, Pop. Yes, sir. This is the doorman, Chief Pop Bradford. How do you do, sir? How do you do? You discover the body here? Yes, sir. Can you tell us how that happened? Sure. Uh, Mr. Walton, uh, he's our manager, uh, asked me to come up here and tell uh, dead fellow there to come down on stage. I, I knocked on the door, and when he didn't answer, I opened it and come in, and I seen him lying on the floor. Uh, pull back that covering, Harrington, would it please? Yeah, right, Chief. There we are. Uh, was he in the same position when you found him? Uh, yes, sir. Ever see that knife before? Sure. You did? Of course. When? In the prop room. Been there for years. Now, that's the room where they keep stage prop. That's right. Uh, have you got any idea, Pop, who might have done this to him? Nope. Did you hear any disturbance or argument before the stabbing? Mm, nope. And any strangers enter or leave your stage door? No. Nope. In other words, you don't know nothing about it. Yeah, that's right. Very right, well. And then we all come out. Yes, sir. Uh, don't leave the theater, Pop. We may call on you again. Why should I leave the theater? Well, I'm paid to work all night here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, have that manager come in. Harry. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm taking all this testimony down, Chief. Yes, that's fine. Thanks. Would you come in, Mr. Walton? Yeah, yes, yeah, sure. This is Mr. Walton, Chief. How do you do? You're the manager here. That's right, sir. Do you know this man who was killed? Yeah, sure. Good little comic. Yeah, when did you see him last? Alive, you mean? What else? You told me downstairs you didn't see the body. That's right. Well, when did you see him last? Um, during the supper show. How long have you known this man? Oh, on and off for years. They played here three or four times. Mm-hmm. 
How'd you get along with him? Fine, fine. Hey, look, you don't think that I... Wait, I just asked you a question. We were very good friends. Have you had any trouble with any of the other performers? Or anyone who works backstage? Well, uh, answer the question. Yes, he did. Who with? His wife. What was it about? Well, they've always fought more or less. All two acts do, especially when they're married. Yeah, what was this fight about? Well, he was jealous of his wife. She was walking out of him. Mm. I found her leaving the theater. That's why I sent for him. What was this jealousy based on? Well, he thought she was going for a guy who sings in one of the other acts on the bill. What's his name? Kent. Tom Kent. He's a tenor. How did you know about this? His wife told me. Mm-hmm. You say you found her when she was leaving this theater? Yeah. Did she use this dressing room, too? No, she was in a room on the other side of the stage. Well, ain't it customary for a man and wife to dress together? Yeah, but like I told you, the Grams didn't get along so good, so I separated them. Come in. Um, do you want to see me? Are you Mrs. Graham? Yeah, that's right. Yes, come in, please. Yeah. I'm the district attorney. Uh-huh. You know what happened, of course. Yeah. We've just been asking Mr. Walton here some questions. He, uh, he happened to tell us about a fight you and your husband had. Uh, could you give us a fill-in? I guess so. Well? He thought I was flirting with a tennis. Were you? No. <laughs> what made him think you were? How makes her liable to think anything? They ain't like normal people. And you were walking out on him on account of this fight? I guess so. Then why did you... <clears throat> hey, hey, what's this? What's the matter? That body on the floor. Well? That's supposed to be my husband? Yes. Why? That isn't him. Huh? What? Take that wig off him. Okay, lady. There we are. My husband doesn't have blonde hair. That's Tom Kent. Headquarters, Chief. Mm-hmm. I had him check to send out an alarm on that guy, Graham. Oh, well, that's fine. I also checked again with the doorman. He swears Graham didn't leave this theater. Well, there are other exits. The stage door is the only way out. Yeah, that's true, but I sent a couple of detectives to search around backstage here anyway. What did you do with Mrs. Graham? Oh, she's downstairs in the green room with that Walton guy. Mm-hmm. I got a cop with him. Sure. Chief, why do you suppose a doorman didn't recognize the body here as not being Graham? Well, it was quite a natural mistake when his black face makeup on with a wig. Yeah, sure. And he's laying on his stomach. His face is only partly exposed. Well, why did Graham bother to put a makeup on this man? Well, it's very simple, Miss Miller. He figured it'd take time before the real identity of the guy was found, and that gives him a head start for a getaway. I see. Well, all we got to do is nail Graham, and this case is sewed up. We got motive and all. You mean the jealousy angle? Sure, the jealousy. We... Hey, hey, Chief, what are you doing there? I'm just figuring out something. Yeah, what? Well, now, first of all, I believe the makeup and the dressing gown were put on this man after he died. Huh? You notice the tear in the back of the robe? Yeah. It was made to slip over the handle of the knife. Oh, yeah. It would also seem that he died immediately. And there's... Just this one blood stain here on the floor, indicating the man didn't move. Yeah. Well, now, here's what puzzles me. Mm-hmm. Hey, look over here, on the other side of the room. Yeah, what is it, Chief? Blood stains on the floor <laughs> and also on the windowsill. Hey, that must be how the guy got out. Graham? Sure. Yes, but these aren't the cursory stains that a man would have on his hands after killing. They're quite pronounced. Yeah, like maybe he was bleeding. Yes. Yeah. I don't see how that would be possible. This man was stabbed from behind. No sign of a struggle. Well, it could be that the... Uh, what? Huh? what was that? Hey, sounds like the old doorman. Come on. Yes, yes that is the doorman. Yeah. Hey. Wait. All the stage lights are up. Is that a flashlight, Harrington? Yeah, sure. Here we are. Here we are. The steps are right here. What do you suppose has happened? I don't know, but it ain't good. Here, watch your step on these stairs. Yes, we're all right. Just keep going. Right. You okay, Pop? He doesn't answer. No. Stage door's right over this way. I'll just lead the way. Hey. Hey, look. What is it? The old boy stretched out on the floor. Oh. Yes. Now, 
just don't try to Let move. Him. Stop him. What's wrong? What happened? He hit me on the head. Got away. Who? Al Graham. <laughs> How do you feel now, Mr. Bradford? I uh, guess I'm a bit better, thanks. Oh, good. Uh, Chief, could I have some more water? Yeah, sure. Yeah. There you are. Oh, that's fine, thank you. You're sure you don't want a doctor here, Mr. Bradford? No, no, I, I'll be all right. I'm just done, that's all. Oh, you put the lights on. Mr. Harrington did that. It'd been turned off on the switchboard over there. Oh, that's what I figured, yeah. Oh, Chief? Yes, we're over here by the state and tower. Huh? Oh, okay. Well, how's the old boy? He's much better. I've just done a checkup around backstage here to see where Graham might have been hiding. Yeah? I stopped by in the green room. What do you think? What? Mr. Walton, the manager, ain't there. What happened? Oh, he cons that cop I left in charge to let him go out to the box office. When was this? Well, Chief, as near as I can figure, it's right before the lights go out. I see. Did he go to the box office? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I just called. He's out there. Uh-huh. Well, what about Graham's wife? Oh, she's still in the green room. Oh. Uh, uh, Pop. Uh, yes, sir? Yeah, tell me, Pop, did you actually see the guy who assaulted you? Well, I thought I did. Mm-hmm. Were the lights on or off at the time? Mm, it was off, I guess. Uh, was dark here then when you were slugged, huh? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Pop, then you don't know for sure if it was Graham or not. Well, I ain't sure, but... What's your point, Harrington? My point, Miss Miller, is that I talked to a cop who stationed out in the alley, and someone did come out there. It was Mr. Walton. Now, I understand Graham was a little guy, and Walton's a little guy, too. Now, Pop, you, uh, you could have mixed them up, couldn't you? Uh, no, but I, I still say it was Graham. Yeah, mm-hmm. all right. I picked up a filler on Walton from one of the stage hands, Chief. Yes, what was that? He had a fight with Tom Kent, that tenor guy, yesterday, right here on the stage. You sure? Yeah, sure, I'm sure. Three or four people heard it. Well, I think you should go out to the box office and have a talk with him. There's something I want to look into back here. And check with me when you finish. <laughs> Oh. What's the idea, Walton? Of what? Of sneaking out here. What do you mean? I told you to stay back there in the green room. I had some business to attend to. Yeah? Like what? You canceled the show tonight. That meant a lot of refunds. I had to take a look at the receipts. Mm-hmm. Why didn't you ask permission? I did, from the cop. I mean from the district attorney. Well, I didn't figure we were playing school. What? Oh, you didn't figure we were playing? Well, well, well. This ain't playing school, Walton. There's a murder mixed up in this. I know that. Now, how did you come out here? The backstage, of course. Through the stage door? No, one of the fire exits on the side of the theater. Uh Uh-huh. Were the lights on backstage when you left? Yeah. I suppose you don't know nothing about what happened to the doorman. No. Well, what's wrong? Well, the lights were turned out and he was slugged. Oh, is he all right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's all right now. Oh, how did that happen? That's what I'm asking you. Whoever gave it to him got out the stage door into the alley. Look, are you trying to pin this on me? You were seen in the alley? I didn't touch... Well, who did? How do I know? Look, if I was beating it out of here like you're suggesting, I wouldn't be here now, would I? Oh, yeah, yes, you would. Oh, how do you figure that? That cop in the alley would have kept you here. There's another cop in front of the theater. He'd have stopped you if you tried to leave by the front. You cased that out and decided to stay. Oh, stop talking like a straight man. (laughs) You're very funny, Walton. Look, what about this fight you had with the tenor, the guy who was killed? Who told you that? One of the stagehands. Okay, so I had a fight with him. Well, that don't make very good character for you. Listen, I had nothing to do with that killing. Well, let us be the judge of that. Come on backstage. I want to finish it. Look, Walton, there's another straight man who'd like to talk to you. The district attorney. 
The chief is up here in the dressing room, Harry. Oh, that's good. I left Walton down there with that cop. Oh? How'd you make out with him? Well, I think he knows something. Really? Yeah, I'll let the chief pick up from there. Wait a minute. Hmm? Isn't this the room here? Yeah, sure. That's it. Go ahead. Thank you. Hey. Where's the body? Oh, the chief had it taken to the morgue. Yeah? Where's the chief? Well, I saw him come in here. Huh? You sure? Sure, I was watching him from down on the stage. Hey. Hey, what is this? Oh, I don't know. There's no other way out of here except... Hey, look, that window's open. Yes. Something screwy here. Chief. Oh, Chief! Yes, Hanson. What? Where are you? I'm down below here on the fire escape. What oh. in the world is he doing down there? Right up. Oh, okay. Gee, I got a, I got a scare for a minute. <laughs> Me too. I've been doing a bit of exploring. Well, we didn't know what happened here. Here, let me give you a hand. Oh, it's all right. I'll make it. <clears throat> there we are. Oh, Chief, look at you. You're covered with dust. That's all right. It shouldn't rush right off. Yeah, here, yeah, I'll help you. All right, thanks. I got Walton downstairs, Chief. I, I think you'll want to talk with him. No, I'm sorry, Harrington, but I don't believe I will. Huh? Why not? I'm releasing all the suspects in the case. What? Chief, did you find the murderer? No, but I believe I can. Oh, Chief, I don't get this. You will. Let's get downstairs. Come right over here, Mrs. Graham. Here. The uh, district attorney wants to talk to you. More questions? No, I don't think so. Uh, Chief, uh, here's Mr. Graham. All right, fine. Well, Chief, that brings them all together. Yes. Well, what happens now? I'm letting you go home, Mr. Walton. It's about time. Say go for me? Uh, Yes, Mrs. Graham. You can grab a powder, too, Pop. These are my working hours. Nice day. Oh, okay. We're going to concentrate on our search for Graham. Oh, I must ask you all to be available for questioning again in the morning, though. Sure. Okay. If you should find Al, I wish you'd let me know. I won't sleep much anyhow. We will, Mrs. Graham. Well, come on, Miss Miller. Oh, all right. Well, can I go back out to the box office? Yes, go right ahead, Walton. Here, I'll get the door. Thanks. Go ahead. Right. After you, Chief. Right. Well, now where do we go? Back into the theater. Huh? But this time, we're using the fire escape. Okay, Chief. Now we, we get in through this window right here. Mm-hmm. Are you up to window climbing, Miss Miller? Sure. What's in here, Chief? The property room. Isn't Graham's dressing room right above this? Yes, that's right. Well, I'd better go in first. Right. There we are. Now... Give me your hand, Miss Miller. Right. There. You make it, Harry? Yeah, sure. Sure. How about lighting this place? No. No, we'll have to remain in the dark. We'll stand over here behind this crate. Fine. Oh, better close the window. Oh, okay. Here, Chief. You looking for something? Uh-oh. Oh, we're waiting for someone. Yeah? Who? I don't know. Huh? Hey, hey, Chief. Look, what is this? Oh, I honestly don't know whom to expect. But whoever it is should be along soon. Where are they coming from? That door leading onto the stage. Huh? Uh, have your flashlight ready. Yeah, okay, Chief. Whoever appears should be on the Really? Yes. Well, if any... Use your 
you find it? Right, Harry. Right. <laughs> what is it? It's the old doorman. Yes. Yeah. Hold on there, Pop. Stay where you are. Let go of me. Stay What's in that box he was taking? The body of Al Graham. What? No, no. Oh, they're no. taking him down to headquarters. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, our catching Pop Bradford in the act of removing Al Graham's body enabled us to obtain a confession from him to the killing of both Graham and Tom Kent. Because of a mental condition, he wasn't sent to the electric chair. However, he will spend the rest of his life in a state institution. You know, Chief, that old guy sure had me fooled. <laughs> Why don't you tell how you pegged him? Well, Harrington, as I told you in the property room when we were waiting for someone to appear... I didn't know for certain who that person would be. But you did know Graham's body was there. Yes, Miss Lamb. I discovered that earlier as a result of examining those blood stains I had noticed near the window in Graham's dressing room. I followed their trail out of the window and down the fire escape and into the prop room. And there I found Graham's body stuffed into a large covered box. Uh, the body had been dragged there. Yes. But I wasn't certain who had done it. And that's why I suggested our leaving the theater. I knew this hiding place could at best be a temporary one. I felt that, given the opportunity, the killer would attempt to move it to a more permanent spot. Which he tried to do. Yes. Uh, how about the motive for the killing, Chief? Well, we learned that when the old man confessed. It seems that in his younger days, the doorman had been a singer. Quite well known, as a matter of fact. And Tom Kent, the tenor, knew this and used to kid the old man about the croaking attempts he made to sing backstage. Bradford developed a great hatred for Kent. And in his warped mental state, he conspired to get revenge. He overheard the argument that Graham had earlier that evening after the supper show over Tom Kent. And so Pop Bradford decided to take advantage of it. He saw Al Graham leave the theater. And he then told Kent that Graham wished to see him in his dressing room. And when Kent came there, the old man let him have it. Yes. But while he was fixing up the body, Graham came back. Well, that's right. So the old man killed him as well. And that, pupils, was tonight's murder lesson in a mystery playhouse. Thank you, Mr. District Attorney, for presiding over our cast this evening. Thank you. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by Vitalis. V-I-T-A-L-I-S. Vitalis, the famous preparation that keeps your hair well-groomed. And used with a speedy 60-second workout, helps you to keep your hair. <laughs> District Attorney, not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. Our case tonight opens at the dairy farm of Samuel Putnam, a resident of one of the rural sections of your District Attorney's county. Mr. Putnam and his 15-year-old son, Billy, are working in their barnyard. Their chores are interrupted as a car enters the yard, and a man hails them from the driver's seat. Hello there. Yeah? Are you Mr. Putnam? That's right. Oh, very well. Who's that, Pop? I don't know. I never see him before. Nice-looking car. Yeah. How do you do, Mr. Putnam? How do you do, sir? Well, my name is Grant, sir. George Grant. I see. I wonder if I could have a few minutes of your time, sir. Well, if you're selling something, Mr. Grant, I can tell you right now... Quite the contrary, Mr. Putnam. <laughs> Quite the contrary. I'm here to buy. How do you mean? Uh, tell me, how many cows do you have here on your farm? About 60 head. 60, eh? Well, sir, I'm prepared to take them off your hands. <laughs> well, where'd you ever get the idea I wanted to sell? That's what your neighbors are doing. Pop, does he mean everyone's selling their cows? That's right, young man. Well, uh, what's the purpose of all this? Haven't you heard of the meat shortage, sir? Yeah. Folks in the city need meat very badly. Oh, sure, yes, but this is dairy country. None of us has beef cattle. We all have milk cows. Well, they're beef, too. Sure, sure, but 
supplying them folks in the city with milk is a lot more important than giving them beef. Now, look, uh, Mr. Putnam, you farmers had better face the facts. There's a war on. That means a shortage of manpower needed to help run your farms. Well, me and my boy here can manage all right. Sure we can. Yeah, and so can most of the other fellows around here if they just put their minds to it. Uh, now, listen, Mr. Putnam. No, you do the listening for a change. Your coming up here to buy our stock is a pretty serious affair. How? Well, if my neighbors sell the cows to you, they're just killing off their only means of livelihood. Uh? Ordinarily now, I wouldn't pay no attention to their short-sightedness. But this very war that you speak of, that makes it more important than ever that we keep on producing milk. Is that so? Yes, sir. Youngsters and mothers down there in the city, they need all we can give them. I've got a little influence in this community, Mr. Grant. Really? Yeah. And I'm telling you right now that I'm going out and talk to these men you've been dickering with and get them to change their minds. Uh, look, Mr. Putnam, I never get along very well with people who meddle in my affairs. You don't. You'd better lay off those other farmers. Listen, are you threatening me? No, just giving you some good advice. I came up here to buy beef, and you or anybody else had better not try to stop me. Chief. Yes, Mr. Uh, Lim. Do you know where Harrington could be? I haven't had any word from him all day. Well, I can explain that. He's doing a special job for the mayor's office. Oh, I see. Yes, his honor is trying to put a check on some of the black market activities that have been overrunning our town. Oh, how? Well, he has men stationed on all roads leading into the city. What for? They're stopping trucks to see if they're carrying any meat that hasn't been tagged with a government-inspected stamp. Oh. And if this stamp is missing, the men have orders to confiscate the meat. Well, that's a good idea. Yes. Now, if we can only enforce... Excuse me, Chief. Yes, come in, Harrington. Thanks. How are things on the black market? <laughs> Very good, Miss Miller. In fact, almost too good. Yes, what happened? Well, I was checking trucks that came off the ferry. Mm -hmm. And believe me, Chief, business was terrific. You found a lot of illegal meat? Oh, about six truckloads. Oh, hey. right. And don't forget, that was only my score. There are half a dozen other inspectors working today, too. Yes, yes. I know. And, Chief, wait, wait till I tell you this. Yes? That job was just like old home week. Uh, what do you mean? Well, you'd have thought I was spending the day down at the police lineup. Uh, the guys who were driving those trucks took me right back to Prohibition days. Mm, they were old acquaintances of ours. Every eh? one of them. The only switch was they were driving meat instead of beer. Who were they, Harrington? Well, everyone I pegged used to work for Mike Sutter's old mob. Mike Sutter? Yeah. Yeah, I asked some of them if Mike was operating this racket, and they all clammed on me. Well, yeah. it's pretty safe to guess that he is. Well, here's one angle I did get out of him, Chief. Yes, what's that? Well, all of the trucks came from in and around Centerville. Centerville? Yeah. Well, that's dairy country. Sure. Yeah, I don't like the sound of that. Hmm? It means this beef must come from slaughtered milk cows. Hey... Hey, I guess that's so. Well, Chief, won't that have an effect on milk production? Yes, Miss Miller, very definitely. Well, isn't there anything we can do about it? I believe there is. What, Chief? I think we can carry the mayor's campaign one step further. How? By checking this racket at its source. We're going to pay a little visit to the farmers of Centerville. Who is it? Me, Grant. Oh, come in. Hello, Mike. What are you doing in town? I came in to see you. Yeah? Yeah. Looks like we're in a little trouble. You mean the trucks? Well, uh, that's just the mayor trying to grab a headline. I put a mouthpiece to work. We'll get the meat back. Think so? Sure. Same thing happened out west. The operators got their meat back before the headlines even got cold. Oh. And there's things going up in the country. Well, that's, uh... That's what I come into the office to talk to you about. What's the matter? Something wrong? To be truthful with you, yes. Well, what? What is it? Well, a lot of the farmers have canceled out on me. Well, how do you mean? They changed their minds about selling their cows. Well, how come? There's one man who's responsible for the whole thing. Oh, yeah? He's called several meetings and influenced them to hold on to their stock. Who is this guy? A man named Putnam. Well, what's his angle? Is he moving in on us? No, no, no. Just some stupid patriotic motive. Patriotic? He feels that milk is more important than beef. He's got the others thinking the same way now. Did you talk to him? Sure, but he just won't listen to reason. Reason? Now, listen, Grant. You never get nothing with that stuff. I know, but... Now, this guy has really jammed up the work, Sam. Yeah. Well, it looks like maybe it's time for me to take over. What do you mean? Now, listen... I put you in the front for this thing because you're the white-collar guy with a smart approach. 
I figured that would work a lot better than muscle. Yes? But the collar's no good on a deal like this. Your Putnam guy needs a different treatment. Oh, now, look, you're not going to use any violence. Remember, you promised me when I came into work for you there'd be no rough stuff. Who said anything about rough stuff? But you, this old farmer, just needs a lesson, that's all. And we can give it to him without our ever seeing the guy. <laughs> boy standing there in the yard. Yes. I'll, I'll call him over, Chief. Uh, hey, son. Yes, sir? Is this the Putnam farm? Yes, sir, that's right. Yeah, is uh, Mr. Putnam around? No, sir, he's gone into the village. Are you his son? Yes, sir, my name's Billy. Mm-hmm. Golly, ain't you the district attorney? That's right. Gee, I'd know you in a minute. You... You look just like you. <laughs> really? <laughs> sure. My brother took a lot of pictures of you when you made that speech in Centerville last year. Remember? Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> My brother was a photographer on the Centerville Herald. Mm-hmm. He's in the Signal Corps now. He takes pictures for them, too. Oh, I see. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do when I'm old enough. Go in the Signal Corps and take pictures. Well, that's fine, Billy, but just remember that working on a farm is very important, too, right now. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, when do you expect your father back from the village, son? Oh, he'll be gone most of the day. Men? You see, we've had some trouble here at the farm. Hmm? Trouble of what sort? Five of our cows died last night. Oh, what a shame. Yeah. Pop thinks there was something funny about it. Yeah? He had Dr. Thomas, the vet, out here this morning. Dr. Thomas thinks they was poisoned. I see. Pop has gone into the high school laboratory. They're going to analyze stuff for him and make sure. Billy, your father has been active in trying to organize the farmers around here against selling their livestock, hasn't he? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Chief, do you think his poisoning was done to get get him to lay off? Well, it could have been. Yeah, sounds like something Mike Sutter might do. Yes, but the description that the other farmers gave us of the man who tried to buy their cows doesn't sound like Sutter. Well, he probably has a front man working for him. Yeah. He's always been a smart operator. If the cows were poisoned, you sure could find out who'd done it, couldn't you, Mr. District Attorney? <laughs> well, I could certainly try, Billy. <laughs> I think we'd better be moving, Chief. We're going to cover the rest of this territory. Yes, you're right, Harrington. Now, what shall I tell my pop? Well, just say that we were here to see him and we'll come out again in the morning. So, boss. So, boss. So. That's the girl. That you, Billy? I got a pail of water once this evening, son, but if you want... Uh, Good evening, Mr. Putnam. Huh? Remember me? Grant is the name. Oh, yeah. Yes, I, I'd like you to meet an associate of mine, Mr. Sutter. I am. What'd you come here for? Just dropped in to see you. Yeah? I wondered if you'd change your mind about selling your cows. No, sir. We heard down in the village that you'd had a little uh, tough luck up here last night, Putnam. Yes, we understand you lost some of your livestock. That's right. Too bad. What happened to them? I was just wondering whether you fellas couldn't answer that. Why? Them cows was poisoned. Is that a fact? Now, why should anyone want to do a thing like that to you, Mr. Putnam? Well, I sort of have an idea. Really? Yeah. I got to thinking that if somebody wanted to show the other farmers hereabouts that it didn't pay to interfere with certain transactions, why, killing off my cows might be a good way of doing it. Oh, now, Mr. Putnam, surely you aren't implying that we had anything to do with your misfortune. I am. Well, you make us sound like very desperate characters. I imagine that's what you think, yeah. Well, that's hardly Wait the attitude. Wait a Grant. Quit kicking the words around. The old guy knows what goes on. You mean to say that... that you're admitting that you did poison my cows? Sure. That's only the beginning, mister. Is that so? Yeah. We got a nice touch work in here. And we ain't gonna let you jam it up for us. How do you intend to stop me? We'll kill every cow you got in this barn if we have to. I wouldn't advise that. Now, listen. We're running this show. You do as we tell you. Do what? Get to them other farmers. Tell them you was wrong about not selling their beef. Not a chance, mister. Hey. You can't pull any of your cheap gangster stuff on me. Them farmers are keeping the cows. Yeah? Yeah. And furthermore, I'm having you both arrested for what you've already done to me. 
You talk real big. This is more than talk. Yeah? I happen to know that the district attorney is in Centerville right now. I'm going to call him up. Wait a minute. You stay right here. Let go of my arm. Take it easy, Mike. This guy ain't calling no district attorney. Oh, ain't I, though? Come back here. Oh, no, sir. Mike. Mike, why did you do that? The old bum had it coming to him. Hey, he's bleeding badly. So what? Mike, I, I think he's dead. Ain't that a shame. Pop! Pop! Hey, that's his kid. Yeah. yeah he, he may have someone with him. We better get out of here, quick. Pop, what's the matter? Yeah, that, that door. There may be another way out. Come on, Mike. Okay, okay. Pop! Yeah, this is okay. The car's right outside. Come on. Right. Uh, the kid didn't get in there in time to see us, huh? All right, all right. Quit worrying. Yeah. All right, get in quick. You better drive, Mike. I'm too jittery. Sure, sure. That's the way out. Around the front of the barn. Okay. Oh, I... Mike, I never thought you... No! Stop that car, you! The kid. Yeah. He's running for the car. I know. Stop! Stop! Hey, look out, Mike. He's running right in front of us. You'll hit him. Ah! Mike! Mike, you ran over him! Sure. That's what I was trying to do. Our case tonight makes very clear one reason we should all help stamp out black markets. Your district attorney has an idea of what's behind this brutal crime. But securing proof is another matter, as we'll learn in just a moment. Right now, a word to the men. Do you know that you can have a smooth, close shave and, at the same time, have the cool, refreshed feeling on your face that every man likes to have when he's through shaving? Yes, you can have both benefits with Ingrams. I-N-G-R-A-M-S. Ingram's Shaving Cream. You get a close, smooth shave with Ingram's because Ingram's helps condition your face for the razor. Gives you an abundance of velvet smooth lather that helps wilt the toughest beard. And in addition, you get a cool shave with Ingram's because Ingram's is made to be cool. Made to leave your face feeling delightfully fresh and invigorated when shaving is over. So remember, for a face that feels fine after a shave that makes you look your best, it's Ingram's. Ingram's Shaving Cream. Now back to Mr. District Attorney. Nobody answers from the farmhouse, Chief. Well, maybe they're down in the barn. Yeah, okay, we'll take a look down there. Oh, you know, it's mornings like this that make you wish you lived in the country. Yeah, this is swell, huh? I'll say. Say, Harrington, yeah? have you any idea where Mike Sutter makes his headquarters? Sure I have, Chief. I think I can put my hands on him any time we want him. Good. Say, Chief, I wonder where he ever got the idea. Hey, 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 wait a minute. Yes, what, what is it? Hey, look right there beside the road. Hmm? That grass is covered with blood. Yes. Well, what in the world? Yeah, trails on up the road. You see? Yes, in the direction of the barn. Yeah. Do you suppose it could be some animal? Well, I don't know. I think we should find out. Uh, it's easy to follow, all right. Wait. Huh? Whoever or whatever it was seems to have fallen down right here, and then got up again. Yeah, that's right. And then the trail leads right into the barn. Uh, I don't like the looks of this. Neither do I, Harrington. Come on, let's go into the barn. All right. Go ahead, Miss Smith. Yes, sir. Uh, hey. Look, the lights are still on in the place. Yes, uh, so Oh, look! Holy... It's the boy! Yes, there's another body, Chief. Yeah, don't come any closer, oh. Miss Miller. How are they, Chief? Well, the old man is dead. Huh? Hey. Hey, that must be the kid's father. Oh, Two geez. bullet wounds in the head. <clears throat> what about the boy? I'm just looking. I'm afraid, though, that... Hmm. Hold on. I seem to feel a faint pulse beat. Here? Yeah. Oh. Yes, yes, the boy is definitely alive. Good. Chief, is there anything I can well, do? There's something we've all got to do. Get this boy to a hospital at once. And there's none in Centerville. Well, we'll have to take him into town. Here, give me a hand, Harrington. Right. Yeah, Miss Miller, bring the car down here. Sure, Chief, right away. If we right. want to save this youngster, we've really got to make time. Mike. Mike, look.
look at this. How many times have I told you to knock before you come into my office? I just got the afternoon papers. They got the whole story. About the farmer? Yeah, look here. The kid didn't die. So what? He may identify us. Is that what it says in the story? No. According to this, he's still unconscious. Very close to death. Well, what are you worried about? Well, I guess... Now, look, you said yourself last night that the kid never seen us when we did it. Huh? He didn't even know we were in the barn. I know, but... I mean, even if he lives, what have they got on us? The boy might have seen the license plates or the tire marks might even be traced. And that makes it tough on somebody else. Not us. Why? That was a stolen car, you chump. Oh. Well, the boys picked it up for me before we went out to the sticks. Oh, I see. Now, listen, Grant. I'm going to get awful fed up on this crybaby routine of yours. Well, I can't help being concerned. Let that be my department. Well, well, the only thing we got to do now is to let this thing cool off for a few days before we start operating again. You mean you're going to continue this thing? Why not? It's better set up now than it ever was. How? That old man being dead will teach them farmers a real lesson. I guarantee we won't have to poison no more cows to get them guys in line. Oh, but, Mike, it'll be much too dangerous to operate up there again. I, for one, don't want any part of it. No? I should say not. Now, oh, look, chum. You're in this thing whether you want any part of it or not. But I... Shut up. Now, sit down. Yes? You and me are going to go over the books this afternoon and figure just how many cows is left up there to grab. I'm over here, Miss Miller. Oh. Did you call the office? Yep. No messages. Is the boy still in the operating room? Yeah, yeah. The chief's in there with him. Oh, I do hope they can save him. It's going to be a tough fight. That kid took plenty. He's been in there over two hours now. Yeah, I know. If it was my own kid, I, I couldn't feel any worse. Yes, I know. Harrington. Do you think Sutter was behind this thing? Sure he was, the dirty punk. But how are we ever going to be able to prove it? We got to, Miss Miller. But there wasn't a clue, even. I know. Our only hope is this kid. If he pulls through and can talk, we may get some. Oh, I wish that... Here's the chief. Oh, how is he? Well, he's still alive. Oh, good. Has he got a chance? We don't know yet. Is there anything I can do? Yes, Miss Miller. They're taking the boy up to one of the hospital rooms. Yes. I want you to go up there and stay with him. I'll join you up there as soon as I talk to Harrington. Yes, sir. He's on the fifth floor. Right, I'll find him. What have you got for me, Chief? I want you to pick up Mike Sutter and take him to my office, Harrington. Oh, Chief, believe me, this will be a pleasure. Chief. Yes, Miss Miller? Come here. Yes, Look, the boy's moving his hand. Do you think we should call a nurse? Oh, well, she'll be right back. Do you suppose he's coming around? I don't know. Well, what should we do? Nothing. Just watch and wait. Oh, oh. did you hear that? Yes. Yes, oh. he seems to be regaining consciousness. Bob. Uh, what happened, Bob? No, it's all right, son. It's all right. Just take it easy. Bob's... Been hurt. Don't try to raise your head, Billy. Huh? What? Where am I? You're all right, Billy. I'm just trying not to talk too much. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Billy, do you recognize me? Sure. District attorney. That's right. Now, can you understand what I'm saying? Sure. Good. Now listen carefully, Billy. Can you tell me what happened to your father? To... To Pop? Yes. Yes, your Pop. What happened to him? I... I don't know. Oh. I... I gotta get back to the barn, though. Back to the barn. Oh, easy, son. Easy. The door. The side door of the barn. Hmm? District attorney will get you. Uh, he knows. He's delirious, Chief. Yes, yes. Signal core. Side door barn. Billy, please. Signal core. Side door barn. Chief, I think he's trying oh. to tell us something. Miss Miller, I think he has. You know, 
Chief, this is all a great mystery to me. Uh, how's that, Miss Willem? Well, in the first place, we come all the way out here to Putnam's barn just because of a little boy's delirious talk. Yes, that's quite true. Then the first thing you do when we get here is pick up a broken piece of string and wander around with well, it. Well, I'll admit that... Uh, just a minute. Do you see something, Chief? Yes. I'll get this box over here to stand oh, on. Oh, can I help you? No, that's all right. I just want to reach this cross beam. There we are. Can you see all right? Yes. Well enough to find what I've been looking for. Oh, that's wonderful, Chief. Is it a definite clue? I have a feeling it can break the whole case for us. Oh, good. Come on, Miss Millen. Why to now? Back to the city. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Listen, Copper. Yeah? How much longer do we have to hang around this mousetrap? Until the district attorney gets here. And, brother, that may be a long time. I hope you know that you're violating our rights as citizens by detaining us here. No kidding. What about the rights you violated, Mr. Grant, when you guys knocked off that old man? Now, uh, listen, are you digging that one up again? Sure, Sutter. I'm just keeping in practice for the time when I really go to work on you. You ain't never going to get a chance to work on me. Don't be too sure. Look... We don't know nothing about that old bomber. Uh, oh, hi, Chief. Oh, hi. Did Miss Miller get here yet? No, but I got some customers for you. Good. This here is Mike Sutter. He knows me. And this added attraction is Sutter's front man, the one he used on the farmers. I see. He was in Sutter's office, so I brought him along. I demand to know why we're being held here, sir. Uh, hasn't Mr. Harrington explained that to you? I did, Chief. But we, we know absolutely nothing about the death of that man in the country. I'm inclined to think otherwise. Now, look, D.A., I can tell you right now. You're wasting your time on this thing. I don't think so. What does he mean? What happened to that old man and his son was one of the most vicious crimes I've ever encountered. Listen, save the speeches, D.A. What evidence have you got? Excuse me, Chief. Yes, come in, Miss Madam. This may be the answer to your question, Sutter. Here's the envelope. Thank you, Miss Miller. What do you got there, Chief? It's the evidence we've been waiting for. Huh? Definite proof of who killed Mr. Putnam. Yeah? Harrington, you may arrest these two men on a charge of murder. Your district attorney will be back in just a moment to explain what he learned from Billy Putnam's delirious cries that led him back to the farm and clinched his case. First, though, here's a fact about Vitalis you'll be glad to know. While wartime Vitalis is manufactured under government restrictions that affect most products during these times of war, Vitalis and the 60-second workout gives you the same three benefits that you and thousands of other men have always enjoyed with Vitalis. And here they are. First, Vitalis gives you really well-groomed hair. Keeps your hair in place in a natural, masculine way. With Vitalis, your hair doesn't have that obnoxious plastered down patent leather shine. Second, Vitalis and the 60-second workout helps route unsightly and often embarrassing loose dandruff. Third, and very important, Vitalis and massage helps prevent excessive falling hair. It stimulates circulation, you see, loosens up your tight, dry scalp. So Vitalis and massage helps you keep your hair. And since wartime restrictions affect the amount of Vitalis we can make, please be patient if your druggist doesn't always have it. We will continue to keep him as well supplied as possible. And please remember, wartime Vitalis gives you the same three benefits you've always enjoyed. Used with a 60-second workout, it gives you well-groomed hair, helps route loose dandruff, and helps you keep your hair. That's V-I-T-A-L-I-S, Vitalis. <laughs> Now, here is your district attorney. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence that solved tonight's case was given to us by a very alert and courageous young man, Billy Putnam. It was his timely thinking that enabled us to try and convict Mike Sutter and his accomplice, Grant, on the charge of first-degree murder. And they paid for their crime with their life. Chief, don't you think you ought to tell the folks just what that evidence was? Well, yes, Miss Miller. I learned about it in young Billy's hospital room. In his delirious ravings, Billy repeated two important things side door of the barn and signal core. I remember the side door in the barn, but the signal core reference eluded me until I suddenly recalled our first conversation with the boy. You mean about his brother being a photographer in the signal core? Well, yes, Harrington. I took the chance that this meant he had some camera arrangement hooked to that side door. Which he did? Yes. The boy had rigged it up the day after the cows were poisoned. 
He hoped to get a picture of anyone who might attempt it again. And he sure got a mighty important one. Grant and Sutter leaving the place with the old man dead on the floor. Chief, I'm sure that everyone will be glad to know that Billy has fully recovered from his ordeal. Yes, Miss Miller, and we're seeing to it personally that he gets a good home until he's old enough to realize his ambition to join his brother in the Army Signal Corps. Good. Now, what about next week, Chief? Well, it's a case I believe every one of our listeners will find very interesting and exciting. The case of the weekend murders. And so, friends, join us again next Wednesday, and until then, thank you and good night. of all characters in tonight's dramatization are fictitious, and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Jay Johnston was featured in the title role, Lynn Doyle as Harrington, Vicki Bola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden, and the author was Jerry Devine. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by the Bristol Myers Company, makers of Vitalis, used by more men to keep their hair well-groomed than any other preparation of its kind. Now, just think of the word vital and add I-S, vitalis, vitalis for your hair. Good evening. This is Peter Lorre. Disillusionment does strange things to people. When the world delivers a crushing and saddening blow, there is an impulse to renounce life completely. But a barred door is no insurance against death, as you will hear tonight in a mystery playhouse. Playhouse is host tonight to that champion of the people and defender of truth, Mr. District Attorney. Well, Mr. D.A. has been putting a finger on a criminal element of the big city for some time now. He's dealt with all sorts, racketeers, thieves, murderers, and come out on top every time. Let's see how he does it tonight, huh? In a business district of Mr. D.A.'s city, surrounded by tall gray buildings, stands a lone house, its windows boarded, its walls faded, the unkempt and gentle remains of yesterday's splendor, striving valiantly but hopelessly to hold its own against the strong and overwhelming odds of today's commerce. Within the house, a single kerosene lamp dimly lights a dusty, disordered room. Here, an old lady seated in a chair, rocking, rocking back and forth. Another old woman enters the room and speaks to her. Elda. Uh, Elda. What is it, Mary? I don't like to bother you, but isn't it time that I went to the store? You're not going to the store, sister. But I go every day. I have my reasons, Mary. But there's no food in the house. I know. And we need kerosene for the lamp. I'm aware of that. Well, then why don't... Please remember, my dear. I am your older sister. Oh, oh, I'm not questioning your decision, Ella, but... Uh, what is your reason? We have no money. No money? Mr. Douglas has not sent us our cash allowance for the last four weeks. Why not? I don't know. Then what shall we do, sister? I am going to see Mr. Douglas. You... You are going outside the house? Yes. But, Ella, your vow... You'd be breaking it. 
You haven't left this house for nearly 13 years. I know. Why can't I go, Ella? Oh, my dear child, you're much too young to handle business matters. Oh, I was 67 last month. You're still my baby sister. I have qualms every time I send you around the corner to the store. You could hardly expect me to send you on an errand like this. Oh, very well. Uh, listen to me for a minute. Uh, yes? I want you to wait here in the house for me until I return. Yes, yes, of course. You're not to answer the doorbell if it rings. Oh, I understand. I shall bring the food back with me. All right. I never intended to break my vow and leave this house. But for your sake and mine, I must. Why? There's Ella? some important reason why we've not received our allowance. I'm going to see Mr. Douglas and find out. <laughs> Mr. Douglas? Yes? I came here to your home for only one reason. Our allowance. Well, uh... My sister and I have not received any money from you in the past four weeks. Yes, I know that, Miss Crawford. Well? I've been meaning to drop around and go over the entire matter with you. Well, what do you mean? Well, I have some rather shocking news for you. Well, what is it? You haven't any more money. You mean it's gone? All of it? Yes. I regret to say it is. I don't understand. You and your sister were receiving a weekly income from the interest on securities that were left to you both. I know. As the administrator of the estate, I have handled these securities to the best of my ability. Yes. Unfortunately, the companies that you held stock in were non-essential industries. The curtailments of war wiped them out. Mr. Douglas, I don't believe you. Well, I... I'm sorry you feel that way, Miss Crawford, but... It's true. I think you have been dishonest with us. Oh, now, just a minute, please. And in view of that, you leave me very little choice. Why, what do you mean? When I leave here, I shall go to the police. Well, what for? To have you arrested for stealing our money. Oh, I see. It was too large a sum to just dissolve in the manner you described. Why did you lock that door? I've been hoping you'd come here. That's why I stopped sending you the money. Are you trying to frighten me? No. I'm merely going to kill you. <gasps> You're joking. You think so? Keep away from me. Keep away. Keep away. Yes, Mr. Uh, you know Sam Green, don't you? He runs the little delicatessen store right off Main Street. Yes, yes, of course. Well, he's outside. He'd like to see you for just a minute. What about? Oh, it's something about a customer of his. Probably wants you to collect a bill for him, Chief. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, send him in, Mr. Green. Right. Yeah, he's quite a guy. Go right in, Mr. Green. Thank you very much, ma'am. Hello there, Sam. Oh, hi, you, Mr. Harrington. <laughs> and you, Mr. District Attorney. Hello, Sam. What can I do for you? Well, it's about a customer of mine. Uh-uh. A very nice little old lady. Oh, yes, yes. She ain't been into my store for the last two days, and uh, so I'm worried. What'd I tell you, Chief? I know it'll be something like this. He wants you to find customers for him. <laughs> <laughs> You're some joker, Mr. Harrington. But that ain't it. For this particular lady not to come in, there must be a special reason. Well, how's that? For over 12 years now, this is the first two days she has missed. Huh? Who is she? Her name is Crawford, Miss Marie Crawford. Uh, maybe you remember reading about her in the papers a couple of years ago. Crawford? She and her sister lived in that old tumble-down house right in the business district. Oh, yes, yes, I know the house. Oh, yeah, I remember the story, too. The building inspectors were going to close it up, and the two old ladies wouldn't let them in. Mm. <laughs> oh, boy, did the feature writers jump on that one. Exactly. They were a very wealthy family once. Well, this woman is coming to your store every day until just a few days ago, is that it? Yes, so I'm worried. Huh. If something has happened to her... If she is sick or something, there's no way to find out. No one goes into the house. Well, Sam, we'll be going through that neighborhood a little later on. We'll stop by at the house and see what we can find out. Oh, 
I'm wearing my knuckles to the bones knocking on this door, Chief. Well, what do we do now? Well, I think we'd better try to get in somewhere. Yeah. Now, how about skeleton key? Yes, yes. Chances are the poor old woman is sick. Either that or very deep after all that knocking. Well, I'll try this key here. This one ought to do it. Mm. Well, there we are. Go ahead, Chief. Thank you. Well, we'll have to use a flashlight in here, all right. Those windows all boarded up. Just like night. Yes. Oh, there we are. Hmm. Well, this is quite an establishment. Yeah, looks like an abandoned junkyard. Hmm. What are all these empty boxes scattered around the hall? Well, I guess they might have been placed there to trip up any unwelcome intruders. Huh? Hey, look down there at the end of the hall. Hmm? Three pianos. Yes, covered with dust. Hmm. Well, let's see if we can maneuver around these boxes. Yeah, right. Let's be a little quiet. Yeah, sure, Chief. I feel like little Eva hopping cakes of ice. Hey, wait a minute, Hank. Huh? Listen. Hey, what's that? I don't know. There seems to be a faint light coming from that room down there. Yeah, that's where that sound comes from, too. Well, let's see what's in there. Okay. Hey, hey, look, Chief. Yes. yes, it's an old lady. Just sitting there, rocking. Well, we better let her know we're here. Is that you, Ella? Uh, no, ma'am. May we come in? Oh. Oh, I thought it was Ella returning. Well, who are you and why are you here? Well, we've just come to see if you were all right. Of course I'm all right. But you really shouldn't be here. Oh, Ella will be angry. Who is Ella, ma'am? She's my sister. Is she around? No. No, she went out on an errand. Mm-hmm. I'm rather worried about her. She's been gone for such a long time. How long? Well, almost two days. Uh, two days? Where'd she go? Well, I... I've been trying to remember. It was something about money. I know that, because that's why I didn't go to the store. Why didn't you let someone know about this? Well, because Ella told me to wait here. I always do as Ella says. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm her younger sister, Marie. Uh, Are you sure you can't recall where she went? No. No, not quite. Uh, But it did have to do with money. Mm -hmm. You see, there was nothing to eat in the house, and she was going to get money for food. Mm -hmm. You mean you ain't eaten since she left here? No. No, I guess I haven't. Well, have you a lawyer, a business advisor, anyone who handles your affairs? Oh, yes. Well, you know who that is. Well, I'm trying to think. Uh, now, wait, this this might help. Yeah. Ella wrote out a card a long time ago. I carry it when I go to the store in case anything should happen to me, and I have it here someplace. Uh mm-hmm. Oh, here it is. Oh, may I see it, please? Surely. Thank you. Ella wrote it down very plainly. Yes, yes, I see. In case of accident, notify William Douglas, 14th floor, Spire Building. Oh, that's it. Yes? And that's who she went to see, Mr. Douglas. You sure? Oh, yes, of course. Well, Harrington, call Miss Miller to have her bring some food over here, and we'll pay her call on Mr. Douglas. <laughs> Sit down, gentlemen. Thank oh, you. thanks. Now, uh, what can I do for you, sir? Well, Mr. Douglas, we'd like some information from Anything you. at all, sir? We've just come from the home of a woman named Crawford. Marie Crawford? Yeah. That was her first name, Chief. Oh, yes. Do you know her, Mr. Douglas? Oh, very well. I handle her estate. Oh. Nothing wrong with her, I hope? No, it's her sister that concerns us. Her sister? Yes, she's been missing for almost two days. Yes, the old lady told us that she left the house to come to see you. To see me? Uh Yes. Didn't she ever show up? Uh, Tell me, Mr. District Attorney, how did you ever get mixed up with Marie Crawford? A storekeeper brought her to our attention. He was worried about her because she hadn't put in her daily appearance at his shop. So you went to her home to investigate? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Was there uh, anything about her behavior that struck you as unusual? Uh... Vagueness of manner, perhaps? Yes. 
Yes, she did have trouble recalling things. I'll bet she couldn't even remember my name. Oh, that's quite true. Well, what's that got to do with her sister disappearing? Oh, a great deal. Yes? Yeah. You see, Miss Crawford indulges in flights of fancy. Huh? You mean she hasn't a sister? No. I mean she had a sister. She's in Northside Cemetery. She died in 1931. Hello? Oh, I see. Well, get that information for me, will you please, and call me back. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, come in. You busy, Chief? Oh, no, come in, Harry. Come oh, in. thanks. Well, Chief, I've just been out to the North Side Cemetery. Mm -hmm. That old gal's buried out there, all right. You see the grave? Well, uh, it wasn't a grave, Chief. It was one of these, uh, uh, well, these here above-the-ground jobs. Yes, a mausoleum. Yeah, that's right. I copied off the carving, though. It said, uh, Ella Crawford, born January 10th, 1870, died December 25th, 1931. Christmas Day. Yeah, I also checked with the records out there. This was the Crawford family plot. Yeah, that Marie's down for some space when she kicks in, too. I see. Eh, I guess the poor old dame is just a little loose upstairs, huh, Chief? Well, she is eccentric. Mm. There's no doubt about that. You know, for a minute and a half, I thought we had a red-hot case. Uh, I'll take it. Okay. Hello? Speaking. Oh, yes, yes. In 1935. Eh? You're sure of that? Well, thanks a lot. Goodbye. I think I have an assignment for you, Harrington. Right, Chief. I want you to go over to Sam Green's delicatessen. Mm -hmm. See if he kept a copy of the grocery list that Miss Crawford used to bring him. Right. And if he hasn't got them, ask him to recall just what food she ordered. Yeah, sure. Have you got a new angle, well, Yes, I have. I've just found out something that makes me question whether Ella Crawford did die in Take a little more soup, Miss Crawford. Oh, thank you, Miss Miller. <laughs> now, you really haven't eaten a thing. Oh, yes, I know. Ella would scold me for that if she were here. She's always after me about my eating. Oh, really? You're very dependent on your sister, oh, aren't you? Oh, yes. I don't know what I'd do without her. Mm -hmm. You see, mother and father both died when I was quite young, and Ella took charge of me uh -huh. from that day on. I've always been with her, even when she married. Married? Yes. Ella was married to a very wealthy young man named Robert Elliot. They fell in love at their first meeting, and two weeks later they were married. Well. His parents, however, did not approve. They forced them to separate before they'd been married a year. Oh, how awful. Ella was never the same. Did she uh, ever see him again? But about 50 years later... When he died, oh. he'd been killed in an accident. His parents had long since passed on, and he died alone and penniless. They found a picture of Ella in his possession, so she was the one who was notified of his death. I see. As he died on Christmas Day in 1931. She buried him two days later and never left the house again. She felt that her soul had passed on with him. And, uh... That's why you lived like this? Yes. Ella took a vow that she'd never leave the house again, and I've stayed with her. I see. Uh, Miss Crawford, do you mind if I leave you for a few minutes? I want to make a phone call. Why, oh, not at all, my dear. I'm sorry there's no telephone here, but we had so little use for it. I understand. Uh, that nice Mr. Green on the corner has a telephone in his store. All right. I'm sure he'd let you use it. Well, thanks a lot. I'll be right back. Such a nice child. I do hope she finds Ella. I don't think she will. Oh, me. oh, who is that? Uh, Mr. Douglas. Oh, Mr. Douglas. Well, how did you get in? I came in the side door. Where is my sister? Uh, she's all right, Marie. Well, but she's gone gone for two days. I is someone taking care of her? I took care of her. Now I've come to take care of you. <laughs> Well, Chief, have we got something on this case or ain't we? I'm beginning to think we have. Yeah? Yes, before you got here, Miss Miller phoned from Green's Delicatessen. Yeah? I must have just missed her. Yes, she called to report that Marie Crawford's sister, Ella, was once married to a man named Robert Elliott. 
Robert Elliott. Yes, it seems as though it was an unfortunate marriage. His parents broke it off. Robert Elliott, let me think a minute. He died on Christmas Day in 1931. Hey, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. December 25, 1931? Mm -hmm. That's on the old gal's epitaph, too, Chief. Yes, I know. That's why I think... What? I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Chief. It's yes. me again, back at Green's Delicatessen. Yes, Miss Miller. What's up? Well, after I left you, I went back to the Crawford place and found that Mr. Douglas there. Yes? And what was he up to? He was trying to talk Marie Crawford into packing her things and leaving with him. What? Did she do it? Well, no. I stopped it. Good. Mr. Douglas says the old gal's batty and wants to put her away. But I wasn't having any of that. Well, good for you, Miss Miller. Where's Douglas now? Oh, he went off in a huff, muttering about court orders and stuff. Well, that's all right. Where's Miss Crawford? Oh, well, I brought her down here to the store with me. Mm -hmm. She's right outside the phone booth now, listening to what Sam Green thinks about Hitler. Oh, well, that's fine. And don't let her out of your sight. Okay. I'll send Brophy out to stay with you. Uh -huh. You've done a good job, Miss Miller. Thanks, Chief. Bye. Bye. Hey, hey, look, Chief. Yes? While you was talking, I remembered something. Yes? Robert Elliott. Mm -hmm. That name is carved on a tomb right next to the Crawford Games. I saw it. Well, that buttons it up, then. He... Come on, Harrington. Where to? Oh, what did Miss Miller have yeah, said? Never mind that now. We're going out to Northside Cemetery. Chief, mm -hmm. this ain't exactly my idea of a pleasant way to spend an evening. Taking a walk through a graveyard. Well, if you feel like whistling, go ahead. Oh, no, no. That only wakes up the ghosts. You remember the location of the mausoleum? Yeah, it's right along here someplace. Wait a minute. I think that's it right down there. Good. What are we looking for on this excursion, Chief? Proof that Miss Crawford did not die in 1931. What? Well, if she didn't die, where is she? That's something Mr. Douglas may have to answer. What? You think he knocked her off, Chief? I'm not sure. Oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Hold on, I think this is it. Shine your flashlight on it. Right. Mm -hmm. There you are. Ella Crawford. Yeah. Hey, look, look here, Chief, right mm -hmm. next to it. I was right. Because here's the tomb of Robert Elliot. Yes, I see. Died December 25th, 1931. Yeah. Well, what do we do now? I'm going into that mausoleum. Yeah. Huh? Yes, it's quite necessary that I do, Harry. Well, uh, Chief, do you think it'll be okay? I mean, uh, well, don't you think we ought to get permission for a thing like this? Well, no, no, I'm afraid that might lead to complications. We'll just have to do it on our own responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, how do you get into one of these places? Well, just open the gate, I imagine. There we are. You wait out here, Harrington. Yeah, yeah, glad. I mean, right, yeah. If you get stuck, holler, Chief. I will. <laughs> hey, uh, shut up, you. Oh, Harrington. Yeah, Chief? Come on in here. I want to show you something. I was afraid of that. <clears throat> what is it? There. Uh. There's the answer. Where? Oh, I get it. What do you know about that? Well, that's that, Chief. Come on, let's go. Let's... No. No, let's wait here. Huh? Put your light out. Huh? I said put your flashlight out. I want to wait here. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess he's part of the franchise here. Yes. How, uh, how much longer do we wait in here, Chief? Oh, just a little while. I had an idea that something might happen, but uh, I guess maybe I was wrong. Yeah. Hey, hey, Chief, I've just been thinking. Shh, shh. Wait a minute. Huh? There's a car coming. Right. Hey, somebody's getting out here. Yeah. Need some help, what? Mr. Douglas? Uh, who's that? The district attorney. Well, uh, what are you doing here? I was going to ask you the same question. Well, I, uh, 
I have come out to Miss Crawford's grave. Yes, so we see. What's that you're carrying in your arm? Cover him with your gun, Harrington. Right. He's carrying the dead body of Ella Crawford. Sure, and he wants to put it in that empty casket we just looked at. Why, really, gentlemen, Never I... mind the alibis, Douglas. Come on with us. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, the clever plan that Mr. Douglas had evolved to cover up the death of Ella Crawford failed. And he paid the full penalty for his crime. Yeah, and for his swindling those old women out of their dough, too. Don't forget that, Chief. What a mean guy. Yes, indeed he was. What made you first suspect Douglas, Chief? It was the identification card that Ella had given to her sister, Marie. It was in Ella's handwriting. And it gave Douglas's address as the Spire Building. I recall that the Spire building hadn't been erected until 1935. I had this point confirmed. And that was four years after the supposed death of Ella Crawford. Yeah, how about that mausoleum, Chief? That had a spool for a while. Well, Ella Crawford built that for herself when her husband died. In her own eccentric way, she believed that it was a harbor for her soul. The soul that she had lost when he passed away. As we know, she'd even gone so far as to have the date of her husband's death carved on her own tomb. For in her mind, she regarded it as the date of her own death. And that little eccentricity nearly enabled Douglas to get away with the murder of Miss Crawford, too. Yes, Miss Miller. Unfortunately, we were able to catch him, proving once again that the criminal never can win. Ain't a Douglas fellow was a pretty low character, huh? Can't you just see him as a little boy playing happily, pulling the wings off the flies? <laughs> well, Mr. District Attorney, more power to you, sir. Many thanks, and I hope you and your cast pay us another visit soon. Now, my friends, are you ready for our trip to the green room? Huh? The players are rehearsing our next performance there, you know. Well, just come with me. Please. Come. Come, come. <laughs> you hit a rock. Uh-huh. Oh, I... It sound like a rock. It's a little hollow. Dig it up, whatever it is. Yeah. What? Well... It's a skull. Yes. Oh, well, Spears is right. This place must have been an old Indian burial oh, ground. Please put it back. No, oh, keep it. Carl, perhaps you'd better put it oh, back. No. Please, please bury it again, Mr. Cruz. It will bring bad luck to all of us. No, Spears, that's just a silly, silly superstition. Well, uh, what about the rest of the skeleton? Well, well it doesn't... It doesn't seem to be one. No. Just a skull. Uh... Uh, you bring it into the house, will you, Spears? Oh, no, uh, I'd rather not. All right, I'll take it in myself. But don't either of you mention this to my brother, Arthur. He's terribly scared of things like this, and he's just gotten over his nervous breakdown. Carl, perhaps you should put the skull back. Well, Seal, you're not being taken in by this hokum about curses, are you? Oh, that, that sounded like my wife, Mary. She was cleaning the windows. out of the wind. Mary. 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 But well, she's unconscious. Please do something. You must do something. I'm afraid there's nothing we can do, Spears. She hit her head against a rock. She's dead. How, oh, Spears? He's quieted down. I can't understand it. There's only one rock underneath the window, and Mary hit that. That one rock. There isn't even a pebble around for yards. Well, don't go imagining things again, Arthur. Spears kept talking about a curse. Spears believes in pixies and gremlins, too, don't forget. Well, I feel rather funny about it all. Oh, Carl, maybe you'd better switch some more lamps on. This living room feels gloomy. Oh, let's cut this nonsense out. Wait. Do you hear anything? Oh? No, I don't. Yes. Something is coming from the ceiling. What's coming from the ceiling? I don't hear... What is it? What? It must be the beams. 
They sometimes do that from the heat. It's not the beams. It's too regular a sound. What room is directly above us? It's, it's an old bedroom. We use it as a storeroom now. It hasn't been opened in years. Hmm. There's something up there. Of course, there's a lot of old things from years back, Lucille. Did you put the skull in the score of Dora? Yes, yes, I did. What are you two whispering about? Coming down the stairs. We'll take a look and settle this. So far. <gasps> look at your feet, Carl. The skull. How, how did it get down here? It came down the steps. Seems to be looking up at us. A skull. How, how did it get into the house? Carl found it while digging. Spears said it belonged to some Indian. Spears was right. There is a curse on the house. We'll all be killed. I'm leaving. I can't stand it. Mm-hmm. Skulls that come bouncing down the stairs all by themselves. See, that's a little unusual, isn't it? Huh? Well, why don't you try to be on hand next time when the inner sanctum's boy, the Raymond... Is it the lowdown on some skullduggery? <laughs> this is Peter Laurie closing the doors of the mystery playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it shall be my duty as District Attorney, not only to prosecute for the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. As our case opens tonight, your district attorney and Harrington are seated at a council table in a hot, stuffy courtroom. They've been impatiently awaiting the return of a jury who have spent many hours deliberating a verdict. Word has come that this verdict has been reached. Spectators have filed into the room. The judge has returned to the bench. Finally, a side door is opened and the jury returns. Silently, they enter the jury box. An air of tense excitement grips the court as the clerk calls upon the foreman of the jury to rise. In droning tones, he asks... How say you? Do you find this defendant guilty or not guilty? We, the jury, find him not guilty. Huh? Oh, Chief, did you hear that? Yes, I heard it. Oh, what a swindle. I don't understand it. Why, a bunch of ten-year-old kids that know Stanley committed that murder. I thought we had everything we needed on this one. But evidently, there was a reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury. A reasonable doubt? <laughs> Oh, oh, look at Stanley grinning all over the place. He should be. He'll never be as lucky again. Oh, look at... Hey. Hmm? Hey, he's coming over here. Oh, yes. Hiya, Mr. D.A. Hello, Stanley. Ain't you going to congratulate me? For what? For winning the Duke. You still done that killing, Stanley? 
Oh, Ain't how to Jerry call it. That's what they pay off on. See you later, boys. Oh, brother. How could they let that punk off? I don't know. One thing is certain, though. What's that, Jim? This merely postpones Mr. Stanley's engagement with the chair. How come? He's a professional killer and will continue to be one. And the next time we pick him up, we'll make it stick. <laughs> Oh, Chief. Yes, Harrington. Did you see the morning papers? You mean the account of the trial? Yeah, they mm. certainly blasted that verdict yesterday. Yes, I know. Yeah, they took particular pains, though, to point out that it wasn't your fault. Well, unfortunately, that isn't much consolation. No. Excuse me, Chief. Yes, Miss Miller. Uh, there's a Mrs. Clark in the outer office. Yes. Uh, she was one of the jurors on the Stanley case. Oh, she want to see me? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. You know what about? Well, I don't know. She said it's important. Well, all right, have her come here. Yes, sir. Huh. Wonder what this is, no, Chief. No, no. Oh, thank you. Uh, you remember Mrs. Clark? Oh, yes, of course. How do you do, Mrs. Clark? And this is Mr. Harrington. How do you, How do, you do, do, Mrs. Clark? Sit down, won't you? Yeah. Very well. Sit here. Now, what can I do for you? Well, uh, I have something to tell you. It uh, mm-hmm. has to do with the trial. Yes? I, uh, well, I feel that there's something very suspicious about the verdict. Mm-hmm. That's why I came here. Yeah, you better get your pad and pencil, Miss Miller. I have it right here. I'll take this down, Chief. Thank you. And just what are your suspicions, Mrs. Clark? Well, in the beginning, most of us believed that Stanley was guilty of the murder. Mm-hmm. But there was one man especially who insisted he wasn't. And, well, he had a lot to say about it. Yeah, who was that? Uh, Mr. Taylor, he was the foreman. Yes, I remember him. He insisted that Stanley was innocent. And what did he base this on? Mm, Well, he never would give a reason. Mm -hmm. Just kept saying he knew he wasn't guilty. Well, how did he get everyone else to come around to his way, you think? Well, the first change came when we were taken out to lunch the second day. Mm -hmm. Uh, This Mr. Taylor sat with two other men on the jury. And when we returned... Well, they had changed their vote to not guilty. Did they give any reason for this change? No. Uh, these two men were more or less leaders. Their changeover gradually influenced most of the others. And finally, by the third day, another juror and myself were the only two who were for conviction. Mm-hmm. Well, what made uh, you both switch? Well, at dinner time, this Mr. Taylor sat with the man who was siding with me. Mm-hmm. Whatever went on there made him change his mind. So after dinner, you were the lone holder? Yes. And then you finally just uh, gave up? Oh, no. No? Well, I I mean, I was prepared to stand my ground to the finish when I received a message from an attendant. It was about my son. Yes? It said he was coming home on a final furlough before going overseas and... He'd only be in town overnight. And, of course, you wanted to see him. Yes. And besides, by this time, all the others agreed he wasn't guilty, so I I voted with them. Well, I can understand that. But the message wasn't true, sir. What do you mean? My son called me this morning from camp. He he knew nothing about it. Hey. That's really what convinced me I should come here. Well, I'm certainly glad you did, Miss Clark. Do you think that Taylor guy had anything to do with the phony message? I don't know. Well, I think we should try to find out. I'd like to have a talk with this man, Taylor. Find out where he can be located, Harrington, and bring him in for questioning. Hiya, Mr. Butler. Well, how old, Stanley? I wonder what happened to you. I kind of did a little celebrating last night. Yeah, I sort of figured you would. Come back to the office. Okay. You hungover? Yeah, a little bit. I have to fix that. So well. Go ahead. Thanks. Sit down again. Okay. What'll it be? Scotch or ride? Oh, shot a ride, too good. Right. I want to thank you, Mr. Butler. For what? For the fix. You mean the verdict? Yeah. Well, you killed a guy for me. The least I could do was rig a jury for you. Yeah. Drink up. Thanks. That should ease the pain. How did you ever do it? What? Swing them jury guys. 
The way that D.A. piled the points on me, I figured I was cold. You told you I'd take care of things, didn't I? Sure, but even the mop, he said I didn't have a chance. He just didn't know the score, that's all. How was it, Kim? I knew the foreman. A little fat guy? Well, yeah. How come? Well, he was in a pocket and needed dough. I just took care of him. What about the others? Well, I used a kind of a smart maneuver then. How do you mean? Most people somewhere in the past have got something they'd rather not have brought up again. Yeah. So I had a checkmate on a jury and dug up enough on three of them to turn a little heat on her. Well, how did you get to her? Well, it seems that there's a waiter in the joint that jury ate in who happened to be a friend of mine. A guy I'd kind of done favors for. Oh. I sent a note through him to the foreman, giving him a rundown on these three guys in the jury. So we went to work on them. You really operate, Mr. Butler. That's my business. Anything can be fixed, kid. You just got to know how, that's all. Well, you've done a swell job. And just to show you I mean that, the next killing you want done is on me. Right in here, Mr. Taylor. All right, all right. Chief, you remember this fellow? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Hello, Mr. Taylor. How do you do? He wasn't too happy about coming over here, Chief. Naturally. I've neglected my business enough serving on that jury. Well, I'm sorry, but this is quite important. Well, sit down, please. Very well. Mr. Harrington, did you explain to Mr. Taylor why I wanted to see him? Uh, no, Chief. I thought you could do that better than me. All right. Uh, just what is this all about? Well, it has to do with a verdict reached by you and your fellow jurors yesterday. Yes? We have a report from a woman named Clark. She served with you. What about? She seemed convinced that several of the jurors were pressured into changing their views on the case. Well, that's ridiculous. Why, that woman... Well, Mr. Taylor, uh, why don't you wait till you hear the whole thing? Very well. Go ahead. She also believed that you were the one who exerted this pressure. Why, this is fantastic. She named three specific jurors who were influenced. We're trying to contact these men now to substantiate her story. Well, I must tell you right now, sir, this is the most libelous thing I have ever encountered. You deny the charge? Completely. Look, Mr. Taylor... Just a minute. Yeah. I think I see behind this whole thing now. What do you mean? Wouldn't it be possible that having lost the case, you are now looking for some excuse to justify it? Oh, hardly. Well, it certainly appears that way. Now, just a minute. Now, wait, Harrington. Yeah. I called you in here, Mr. Taylor, to acquaint you with the charge that's been made. Frankly, I intend to investigate it thoroughly. So I advise you to remain available for further questioning. Yeah. May I see you for a minute, Mr. Butler? Oh, come in, sir. What are you doing here? Something has come up. I had to talk to you. It wasn't very smart of you to come here. I had to. Well, what is it? I have just come from the district attorney's office. What are you doing there? He sent for me. What for? A woman on the jury has charged that I was responsible for the acquittal. So what? She implied that I exerted pressure. How would you know? Well, that isn't the point, Mr. Butler. The fact remains the charge has been made. The DA said he's going to make a thorough investigation. Okay, let him investigate. But if those men I influence should talk... Well? Well, I, I have a reputation to think of, Mr. Butler. I'm a respected man. Sure, sure. You've got to do something. You have to help me. Look, Taylor, nothing's going to happen. How do you know? Just take my word for it. I'm sorry, that isn't enough. No? No. I demand a guarantee of protection. The same protection you gave to Stanley. You... Demand it, huh? I most certainly do. Don't forget, you have as much to lose as I have. How do you figure that? Well, you were responsible for my swaying that jury. So? If the district attorney were to find that out, you'd be in this thing, too. How do you figure the DA would find out about me? Well, I... Um, uh, you, too? Possibly. Yes. That's very interesting. Who's that? Hey, Stanley. Come in. You get company. Ah, remember? 
Yeah, the Jerry guy. That's right. He's got trouble. What's the matter? The DA smells of fix. I've just come from his office. He's worried. Afraid I won't take care of him. Why? I don't know. He says if he falls, I fall too. Oh, I didn't exactly say that. That could mean a new trial, kid. Hey, now, wait a minute. He can uh, fix that, though. How? Remember that favor you owed me? Huh? You promised me one on the house. Oh. Well, what are you going to do about this, Mr. Butler? I'm taking care of it. How? Show him, Stanley. Right. Oh. Oh. Yeah, it's good to be working again. <laughs> Excuse me, Chief. Yes, Mr. Uh, here are typewritten copies of all the testimony we took. Oh, fine. Put them right on the desk. Yes, sir. Well, that should be just about all the evidence we need against Mr. Taylor. Yes. And all three of the jurors said they were willing to repeat this testimony in court. I know. Uh, one thing puzzles me, though, Chief. Yes, what's that? How did Taylor find out these things about the other three jurors? Well, I'm certain he didn't. What do you mean? I think it was passed on to him by someone else. You think he was just acting as a stooge for Stanley? No, no, no. Stanley wouldn't have been smart enough to fix a jury either. Then who was it? I'm afraid I can't answer that. But I felt right along that Stanley had someone higher up behind him who was trying to save his neck. How do you know? Well, he's a professional killer. He commits murder for profit. Whoever his client was on this killing we tried him for could very easily be the one who helped him. And also the one who dug up the paths of the men you just talked to and bought them with it. Yes. Well... I should think he'd be as important as in this thing as Stanley is. Oh, he definitely is. However, we still have to learn his identity. All right, Chief. Oh, come in, Harrington. Right, Mr. I'm trying to locate you. How's it down at headquarters? We talked to those three jurors. All of them admitted finally that Taylor had influenced them to vote for acquittal after he had threatened to reveal some damaging fact in their past. How do you like that? It's okay. I want you to get Taylor over here at once. Well, there ain't much chance of that, Chief. Mm-hmm. Why not? His body was found about half an hour ago out in Fairview Park. Oh. And laying next to him was a cop with two bullets in his chest. most of the morning for you. Why? I run into a little screw-up. What do you mean? Can I talk to you? Sure, sure. I took Taylor's body out to dump it last night, just like we planned. Yeah? I bring him to Fairview Park. Uh Uh-huh. I park the car and come out. Just as I planned them, there turns up a cop. Oh, fine. He throws one of them what's going on here routines at me. Yeah? While he's in the middle of it, I put two slugs in him. That wasn't very smart. What else could I do? Got a stiff with me, remember? Shooting cops is bad business, Stanley. What'd you do with Taylor's body? I dumped it beside the car. Are you kidding? Huh? Oh, that's great. Well, what do you mean? Why don't you put a label on it? I don't get it. The DA is going to mildly suspect that you killed Taylor anyway. This for you, never get any proof, that's all. Well, finding that cop beside him is something different. They'll turn the whole force loose on you, kid. Oh, that's okay. It ain't man. with me, Stanley. I got a piece of this thing, too. Well, what do you want I should do? Well, you better go under. Go on, now, look. You want anything to do with the heat's off, anyway? Uh, I was just starting to operate. You do like I say. You go under, and fast. <laughs> Chief, Miss Miller. Oh, he's been over at Taylor's office doing some sort of an investigation on him. Well, what good does that do now? Well, he believes that Taylor was acting for someone else when he fixed that jury. Sure he was. For Stanley. No, Harrington. The chief believes there's someone above Stanley. Above? Who? Well, that's what he's trying to find out. Well, I hope he gets something. Yeah. Any word on Stanley? Not yet, but there's a pretty healthy search on for him. Mm -hmm. How's the policeman? The one who was shot? Yeah. I just checked City Hospital. The condition's about the same. I see. Has he uh, regained consciousness yet? No. 
Well, if he should die, then there's no way of proving that Stanley did the shooting. That's right, unless we come up with some new evidence. Oh, hi, Chief. Hello. Oh, how'd you make out, Chief? Well, I think I found something. Oh, good. Was this in Taylor's office? Yes. Well, what is it, Chief? Well, I did a pretty thorough check on his business affairs. Yeah? A representative of his bank worked with me. Uh-huh. I learned that he'd had a good deal of financial trouble lately. He owned several small enterprises, and they were all heavily mortgaged. Yeah? These mortgages were held by a man we're all familiar with. Who's that? Mr. Joe Butler. What? The fixed guy, huh? That's right. How did Taylor get mixed up with him? Oh, Butler has many legitimate investments, and these were some of them. Oh. Just before the trial, these mortgages were canceled. What, you mean called off? Yes. And there's no record of Taylor having paid. Well, huh? that sounds like Butler made a deal with him, Chief. Yes, Miss Miller, it certainly seems that way. Well, that sure looks like the tie-in, all right. Yes. Oh, um, any word on Stanley? No, not yet. And how is that cop? He's still unconscious, Chief. Are there any clues at all on the thing? Just two, the bullets and some tire tracks that were found. Police lab is working on both of them. I see. What are you going to do on this Butler angle, Chief? I intend to pay a call on him. When? Right now. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, this is a real surprise. Really? Yeah. What's in your mind? Murder. Well, it's okay for openers. Got anybody in mind? Now, this murder has already been committed. Oh. The body of a man named Taylor was found this morning on Fairview Park. How was he? I believe he was a business acquaintance of yours. Taylor? Yes. You held several mortgages on some of his enterprise. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, I remember the guy. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear about that. How did it happen? Well, we believe a man named Stanley was responsible. I is one I don't, though. Well, I think you do. Another business acquaintance? It could be. Stanley is a professional killer. Taylor served on a jury that just acquitted him of murder. Why should he want to kill somebody who acquitted him? Well, Taylor was bribed to swing that acquittal. Oh. It's my belief that the bribing was done by you. <laughs> Very funny. I didn't intend it to be. You know, you legal guys kill me. How's that? Everything with you is uh, deduction, ain't it? Oh, well, this is more than straight deduction. You mean you have proof? I will have. How? Oh. Whoever got rid of Taylor's body ran into a policeman in the park. Yeah? He shot the policeman. No kidding. But fortunately for us, he didn't die. The cop? That's right. Well, that is a break. He's in city hospital right now. Still unconscious. Uh -huh. When he comes around, he should have an interesting story to tell. Yeah. I'd like to hear it. You will. Army. Oh? Yeah. Just a minute. For you. Thank you. Hello? Oh, yes, Harrington. What's that? I see. Yes, yes, fine. But I'm glad you called. Right. Goodbye. And that was another report on the officer who was shot. The doctors believe he'll be well enough to talk tomorrow. Good. I'll get in touch with you again after I've heard his report. I'll be waiting to hear from you. Now, here is your district attorney. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think the first thing I should tell you is that Stanley was tried again on the charge of first-degree murder, and with the evidence we gathered, we made it stick this time, and he paid for his crimes in the electric chair. Yeah, and that little visit was long overdue, Chief. Yes, Harrington, it was. Uh, Chief, I think you should tell the device you used to trap him. Well, it was really a desperation measure. You see, the call I received from Harrington when I was in Butler's office was a report that the police officer had died. I knew that his death just not eliminated any real chance we might have to pin the murder on Stanley. The feeling that Butler was working with the killer and also knew his whereabouts, I trumped up the story that the policeman was recovering. I hoped this would go them in getting rid of him before he could talk. Which it did. <laughs> we spent most of the day in that hospital room waiting for Stanley to show. He didn't know that the body in the bed was a dummy. Oh, no, with the lights out, he couldn't tell. Mm. You forgot about Butler, Chief. Oh, yes. Well, Mr. Butler has been sent to prison for a long term for his part in the affair. You see, Stanley thought Butler had double-crossed him with a hospital story. So he implicated him in the killing. Well, that's what usually happens, isn't it, Chief, when thieves fall out? Yes, it is. Thank you, and good night. The names of all characters in the ninth dramatization are fictitious, and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, and Vicki Bola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steen. This is Peter Lorre opening the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Tonight we bring you a story featuring Mr. District Attorney, a gruesome tale that begins outside a metropolitan hospital. A large oil truck is parked above an underground oil tank. Yes, it, it begins as simple as that, but it ends in murder and a finding of a charred belt buckle and human teeth inside the hospital furnace. A fiery death. Hey, Sid. Yeah? Let's make this fast we can, huh? What do you think I'm doing? Much oil in there? Enough. What's going on out there? What you doing, mister? Delivering oil? Well, that's a break. I didn't think we'd do it again any till next week. Uh, we just got a shipment in. We thought you could probably use some here at the hospital. I should say we can. You, uh, new man with the oil company? Yeah, yeah. Who are you? I'm my janitor here. Oh. Say, what kind of truck are you using? What do you mean? Don't look like one of your regular company trucks. We use any kind of truck we can get these days, brother. Who are you talking to, Sid? Eh, uh, janitor guy here. Look, mister, do you have any papers? Delivery papers I, I could look at? Sure, sure. There you are, brother. I hate to act suspicious, mister, but i just been reading in the papers about them fuel oil hijackers. What's that? Some fellas that's been draining oil out of the tanks at public buildings, making out like they were delivering the stuff. No kidding. Yes. Police have warned all of us to be sort of on the lookout for them. Oh, I don't blame them. Say, you're not the regular outfit that's been selling oil to us. What makes you say that? These papers here. Something funny about them. Yeah? Yeah. I think I'm going to have to ask you and your friend here to come inside. Hey, <sighs> that was the old bum. Hey, what happened, Sid? I had to clip that janitor guy. Now, let's get this truck filled and get out of here quick. Oh, brother. Hmm? Of all the dirty, low-down tricks I ever heard of. What's the matter, Harrington? Sure, what's wrong? Chief, I'm about to tell you of a new low in thievery. Sure. Yeah, you know these guys that have been hijacking fuel oil from the tanks of public buildings? Yes, yes. Well, last night they took away just about all the oil in the tanks that heat the city hospital. Hospital? Yes! How awful. Yeah, the building was without heat for over ten hours. 
Till they finally found some more that they could use. Well, that certainly is a contemptible trick. Yes, I say so. The same thieves who pulled the other jobs, I suppose. Well, I think it was cheap. Any clues? Yeah, yeah, we got one to work on. What's that? An old janitor over at the hospital. Yeah. Robinson's his name. He caught the guys at work. Mm-hmm. He got suspicious of them, so they slugged him. Was he badly hurt, Harrington? No, no, they just knocked him out. What did he have to say? Well, the main thing was that he got the license number of the truck. Good. I gave it to the boys at headquarters, of course. Mm. They're sending out an alarm on it right now. Oh, that's fine. Mm. Could the old man give you any description of the thieves? Well, Chief, he only saw one of them, and it was pretty dark, but Robinson thinks he could recognize him again. Not having any heat in that hospital for ten hours. Mm. Must have been terrible for the patient. Ah, it must have been frightening. Well, that's about the seventh job this crowd has gotten away with. Yeah, I know. Chief, yeah. where do you think they get rid of the oil? Well, it's pretty easy to dispose of these days with this desperate shortage we have here. I'm afraid that some of our selfish citizens will be only too glad to buy it, regardless of where it came from. Even from a hospital? Yes, Miss Miller. I'm sorry to say that too many people refuse to let any part of this war interfere with their own comfort. And ain't that right. But right now, I'm not as concerned with who's buying the oil as I am with who's stealing it. Harrington, we must make every effort possible to find those men. <laughs> Okay. Oh, hi, you, Sid. Hi. How'd you make out? Not bad, not bad. Sell all the oil? Sure. How was it take? Best yet. You know, there's one thing about some of these dough heavy characters. They don't care what they spend just so long as the house is warm. Yeah, I wish we'd sold some to the landlord of this dump. I've been freezing all day. Yeah, room and house guys don't pay off like the rich guys. Yeah. Sit down, Sid. Yeah. What'd you do with the truck? I left it out on a country road. You left it? Mm-hmm. You mean for good? Yeah. Well, what you want to do that for? We just about wore that one out, Artie. You're crazy. It was running just as good oh, as... Oh, I ain't talking about the motor. We done too many jobs with that truck, kid. There should be a lot of people who know it by now. Oh, you mean it's too hot? That's right. Yeah, but this has been a nice touch, Sid. We ain't giving up the touch. We're just changing trucks. Yeah, how do we get another one? Same way we get this one. We heist it. Oh. Huh. Oh, say, uh, did you see the good news in the paper? No, what? There's another cold spell on the way. No kidding. <laughs> I guess we just live right, Addy. Come on in, Harrington. Okay. Well, what did you find out about the oil thieves? Well, something, Chief. Yes? First, their truck was found on a road just outside of town. Mm-hmm. was abandoned there. I see. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got that old janitor, Robinson, coming over to look at pictures. Mm-hmm. I thought maybe he could dig out a suspect for well, us. I'm glad to hear he's coming over here, because I have some news for you, too. Yeah, what's that? Pratt over at the parole board called here a little while ago. Huh? He'd heard about the alarm we sent out on the license number of that truck. Yeah. And it seems that he has a weekly visitor, huh? a man who's on parole named Sid Sheldon. Sheldon? Yeah. Sheldon? Hey, I know that guy, Chief. And a mean little punk he is, too. Yes. Well, yesterday morning, Sheldon made his weekly call to the parole office. Yeah. The board wasn't satisfied with the story he told about his activities. So when he left, they detailed a man to follow him. I see. He trailed him for a couple of blocks, and then Sheldon climbed into a truck. An oil truck. What? The man wasn't able to follow the truck, but he didn't get the license number. Yeah? Yes. And that license number was the same as the one we're looking for. What? Oh, what a break. Yes. I asked Miss Miller to get me Sheldon's picture. If he is our man, the old man from the hospital may be able to identify him. Sure. Excuse me, Chief. Yes, Miss Miller. Here's that picture you wanted of Sid Sheldon. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you. And uh, there's a Mr. Robinson outside to see you. Oh, okay. That's the hospital janitor, Chief. I'll send him right in. Yes, sir. Won't you come in, sir? Thank you, Miss. Well, hello there, Mr. Robinson. Hello, Mr. Harrington. <laughs> this is the district attorney. Oh. How do you do, sir? How are you, Mr. Robinson? Uh, Miss Miller, you'd better stay in here. I'll want you to take down this conversation. Yes, sir. Here you are. Sit right down here, Mr. Robinson. Thank you. <laughs> there you are. We've picked up another lead on this case since Harrington spoke to you, sir. We have one definite suspect in mind. There's a man named Sid Sheldon. Uh, this is his photograph right here. Oh. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Wait, wait till I get my glasses. Sure, take your time, Pop. Yeah. Yeah, there we are. Yes, fine. Well... Does he look familiar to you? 
Well, yes. Good. Uh, I, I really couldn't be positive, though. Huh? Oh, why not? Well, it was quite dark when I saw him. Mm. And my eyes ain't so very good. But there is a general resemblance. Oh, yes. Yes, there is. If I could hear him talk, it would be better. Hmm? I always remember a voice. Well, I think we can take care of that all right. Sure we can. Uh, Harrington, send out word to have this man picked up. Read me the last part again, Artie. Sure. Uh, It's in the front page of tonight's paper. The license number on the truck that Sheldon entered when leaving the parole board earlier in the day definitely checks with the one that hijacked the hospital fuel oil. Oh, that's great. That's great. That dirty janitor punk is the one who messed this up. Well, what are you going to do, Sid? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to think. Yeah? Let me see. Give me a match. Here you are. Yeah. If I was to have an alibi, Artie... I could break that parole guy's story down. They seen me get in the truck in the morning, but that don't prove I was in it that night. Yeah, but the janitor's a tough rap. He's seen us do the job. Yeah, that's right. How can you square that one? I think I know a way we can try. Yeah? Come on, Artie. We're going over to that hospital. This is that door the janitor come out of the other night. Yeah. Guess it leads into cellar, huh? Now, we see. What's in there? Just a hall. Come on. All right. There's a basement room right up ahead here. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Huh? Here's the old guy now. See him? Sitting in that chair with his back to us. Yeah. Anybody else in there? Uh, I don't see nobody. Let's go. All right. Hiya, Pop. Huh? Who's that? You got company. Wait a minute. You sound like that fella. I am that fella. What are you doing here? We come to have a little talk with you. You've been shooting your mouth off too much, Pop. Sure, we come here to tell you to lay off. What do you mean, lay off? I mean, you ain't never seen him before in your life, especially around no oil truck. Now listen, you do the listening. We can shut you up real good. You're not scaring me. Not yet, we're not, no. But we ain't even started yet. Now listen, you let me up out of this chair. Down. No, let go of me. Stay there, I let said. Me go. Why, you dirty oh. truck. What? <sighs> now maybe I'll keep quiet. Hey, uh... He landed kind of hard, sir. All right, serves him right. He ain't moving none. So he got knocked out. Hey, Pop. Hey. Hey, wake up, mister. Leave him be, will you? Sid. Huh? Think the old bum's dead. What do you mean? He ain't breathing. Come here. Look for yourself. Uh, I... Yeah. I think you're right, Artie. This ain't good. This is a murder rap, Sid. Never been into that before. Let's get out of here. Are you crazy? We gotta get rid of him first. Yeah? How about putting the old buzzard in that box, maybe? Oh, no good. Look, what's that big thing over there? What? That, that, that coal furnace light. I don't have no coal furnace here. They burn oil, remember? Yeah. It says inc- inc- incinerator on it. What's that mean? Incinerator? Yeah. Hey. That's where they burn up the trash. Maybe you found something, Artie. Huh? Sure. Sure, that's just a spot for him. He never get found there. Give me a hand with him. Sure. <laughs> you know, this is real nice of us. First we make the hospital cold, then we use the old bum to make it warm again. Okay, Artie. Now open the incinerator door. <laughs> Understand it, Chief. 
That Sheldon guy should have been an easy pickup. Well, I'm afraid that newspaper story drove him undercover. Mm. I shouldn't have printed that until we'd found our suspect. I know. I think you'd better send out a statewide alarm on him in case he's gotten out of town. Right, Chief. Chief? Yes, Miss Winter. Believe it or not, there's a Mr. Sheldon outside to see you, huh? Uh-huh. Not Sid Sheldon. That's right. Well, what do you know? Well, I'll make him send him in. Yes, sir. Well, I don't get this one, Chief. I confess I don't either. This is Sid Sheldon. Yeah. So I see. Hi, gents. Sheldon, I suppose you know we've been looking for you. Yeah, that's why I dropped in. I want to see what it was all about. You know what it's all about? No. I don't get it. Well, let me enlighten you then. You must have read in the papers that we have pretty conclusive evidence that you and a confederate were responsible for that oil hijacking job at the hospital. Yeah, yeah, I read about that. Did you get the wrong cookie, dear? No, I don't think we have. You see, we've taken particular care with our investigation because we were most anxious to get our hands on the thief who'd be low enough to deprive a hospital of its heating facilities in times like these. I don't blame you for feeling that way. But I didn't do it. We got witnesses who say different. Not the parole board. No, we got them stronger than that. Well, trot them out. We will. Harrington, go over to the hospital and get that old man back here as fast as you can. Yep, excuse me, Chief. Come in, Harrington. Where's the old man? I think we've run into a little trouble there. What do you mean? I couldn't find Mr. Robinson. Didn't he come to work? No, he was three hours overdue when I left. You must have found out where he lived. Oh, sure, Chief, I went there. He hadn't been home all night. Did you check on his working hours? Yeah, sure. He usually comes in at four in the afternoon and leaves at midnight. Well, this doesn't sound so good. No. Did you find out anything about where he might have been going last night from the man who relieved him? He wasn't there when the relief man showed up. Well, didn't the relief man report that? No, you see, Chief, it seems Robinson used to do that quite a bit. Yeah. Leave early, I mean. Mm-hmm. So the relief man didn't pay any attention to that. Then no one actually saw him leave? No, nobody. Yeah, what did you do with Sheldon, Chief? Oh, when you were delayed, I had him taken over to the city jail. Good. Did you book him for the hijacking? No, no. We needed more evidence for that. Huh? I held him for violation of parole. That'll keep him safely locked up till we can prove our other charge. Yeah, that may be a little tough now, Chief, with the old man missing. Yes. What do you suppose could have happened to him? I'm not sure, but I have my suspicions. Yeah, what do you mean? Doesn't it seem a little odd to you that Sheldon would just walk in and give himself up as he did? Knowing we had practically an airtight case against him. Hey, hey, I never thought of that. If Sheldon is our man, his only reason for doing it could be because he felt safe. Mm-hmm. Sure that the old man wouldn't testify. Mm-hmm. And that means you think Sheldon took care of the old boy. In some fashion, yes. And you're probably right, Chief. <laughs> yeah, but how can we prove it? By finding Mr. Robbins. And that can be a very large order. Well, at least we know where to start looking. Sure, at the hospital. And I think we ought to get over there right now. Oh, Chief. Yes, I'm back here, Harry. All right. Well, well, I talked to a lot of people upstairs in the hospital. Yes. Nobody seemed to know anything about the old guy. I see. Now, did you find anything down here? Yes. Yeah, what is it? There's something that just about proves to me that the old man didn't leave the hospital. No kidding. I'm looking around now for further evidence. Grimmer evidence. Hey, do you, do you think he was knocked off? What would be your guess? Uh-oh. Well, <clears throat> where have you looked so far? In several of the little rooms back there. Mm-hmm. They're storerooms, mostly. Mm-hmm. No sign of anything, huh? No. Well, suppose we case this one out. Yes, I think we'd better. Not an awful lot of places he could be hidden in here. No, no, there are. Nothing in this box. I'll try this closet here. All right. Anything there? No. Well, there's only this storage bin left. Hmm. That's stark empty, Chief. Yes, I see. Well, what do we do now? 
We looked at everything in here. There's just one exception. What's that? This incinerator here. Holy catch, if you don't think he was stuffed in there. Well, I hope not. But it should be investigated. Yeah. Hey, not with the, that fire going in there. Hey, Harrington, this incinerator is fired by oil. Have it turned off, and as soon as it's cool, we'll see what's inside. Well, the sides of this incinerator feel pretty cool now, Chief. Yes. Where's your flashlight? I got it right here. I'll open this door. All right. Yeah. Just look around from out here first. Mm-hmm. Come on, Harrington. This door is big enough. We can both look in. Right. Golly. There's more room inside than you'd think. Yes. Run your flash along the sides first. Right. Hmm. Don't see a thing. You? No. No, well, there's no telling what may be in those ashes. I think I'd better climb in and take a real look around. Oh, wait a minute, Chief. I can do that That's all right. I don't mind. Stand back there a minute. Right. I think I can squeeze through all right. Can I help? No, no, thanks. I can make it. Where do you want I should shine the light, Chief? Right by my feet will do for the present. Mm -hmm. Right. If I can sift through some of this broken glass... You see anything? No, not yet. Wait a minute. Hmm? Oh, what's this? What, you find something? Yes. Badly blackened, but it looks like a belt buckle. Hey. Wait a minute. Here's the remains of a watch case that was right beside it. Where are you? Well, there were initials on the belt buckle, but they're pretty badly distorted. Huh. How about the watch? Well, the outside is scorched. Let's see if I can open this case. Yeah, there we are. Hey, Harrington, the old man's name was Robinson. Right, Chief. You know his first name? Yeah, Fred. Well, here are the initials, F.R. on the inside casing of the watch. Hey, that's not so good. Let me see. I'm not sure, but I think that some of this refuse here is the charred remains of bones. Oh, holy. Harrington, I think we found Mr. Robinson. Oh, that's awful, Chief. Yes. Now we've got to find his murderer. Yeah. Well, wouldn't that be Sheldon? I think so, yes. But we'll have to prove it. That's right. And he's probably covered up good. Well, he might have left a loophole. I'm playing a long chance that he did. Yep. Help me out of here, will you? Yeah, all right, Chief. Yeah, give me your hand. There you are. Well, where do we go from here? Back to the office. After you call Miss Miller and tell her to have Sheldon brought over from the city jail. Right. And ask her to make sure that he wears his own shoes. Look, Copper, at least will you tell me why the D.A. took my shoes away with him? I haven't the slightest idea, Sheldon. Well, it's the screwiest thing I ever heard of. Harrington. Yes, Miss Miller? Do you suppose it would have anything to do with Mr. Robinson's body being found in that incinerator? No, no, no. Mr. Sheldon here doesn't know anything about that. You're absolutely right there, Copper. Mm -hmm. You can keep me here in your office from now on, and you never stick me with that one. Mm, of course, it would have been pretty convenient for you to have him out of the way. I don't know nothing about it. You will, brother, you will. Oh, hi, Chief. Hello, Harrington. Uh, bring back my shoes, D.A.? No, I'm afraid I didn't. Look, what's the idea of They're being held at the police laboratory as evidence. What kind of evidence? That you murdered old man Robinson. Uh, that's a lie. Did you find proof, Chief? Yes, Harrington, enough proof to send Sheldon to the electric chair. Now, here is your district attorney with the solution of tonight's case. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to say that with the evidence I uncovered, I was able to convince the jury of the guilt of Sid Sheldon... And he was executed in the state penitentiary for his shameful crime. Yeah, and Chief, you might add that Sheldon's pal, Artie, was picked up and executed, too. 
after he confessed to his part in the murder. Yes, Harrington, and that took care of both of them. Uh, Chief, don't you think you ought to tell the folks just what the clue was that made you certain that Sheldon was the murderer? Well, it was something that I found in the basement of the hospital. It served two purposes. It told me that the old man was still in the building, and it also led to Sheldon's downfall. Yeah, but why don't you tell what it was, Chief? That's what I was just going to, Harrington. That'd be a... It was the old man's eyeglasses. I found them on the floor near the incinerator. And when he was in my office, you'll remember, he said that his eyes were bad. So I knew that he wouldn't have gone out without his glasses. And how did the glasses lead to Sheldon's downfall, Chief? Well, one of the lenses was crushed. It appeared to have been stepped on. I claimed the chance the murderer might still have some evidence of ground glass on the bottom of his shoe. When I took Sheldon's shoes from him, I found several particles of glass embedded in the rubber heel. The police laboratory confirmed that fact for me, that these particles matched the broken lens in Mr. Robinson's glasses. And faced with that evidence, Sheldon admitted his guilt. Yes, that was a case where fiction was so realistic, it strongly resembles truth, huh? Now I want to warn you about our next story. For it has not one murder, but three. And when Detective O'Malley hides under the sheets in a morgue, his sneeze invites his own death. Until next time, then, this is Peter Laurie closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by two famous Bristol Myers products, Vitalis and Sal Hepatica. Vitalis for hair that's well-groomed. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Vitalis... Sal Hepatica. And it shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. The Case of the Deadly Train. Our story opens tonight in the station master's office of a Chicago railroad terminal, just off the main waiting room. I think you know the members of my party, Mr. Billings. This is Miss Miller, my secretary. Mr. Billings? How do you do? And this is my chief special investigator, Mr. Harrington. How are you, Mr. Harrington? And this is Tom Niles. Uh, Mr. Billings is the conductor of the train we're taking back home, Niles. Go ahead, Niles. You can talk in here. Look, can't we get going? I mean, isn't it time to get on the train? He's handcuffed to you, Mr. Harrington? Yeah, that's right. Just a precaution, Conductor. This is one trip we're going to be sure to make, huh, Chief? I've told Mr. Billings the importance we attach to getting Niles back home with us, Harrington. I might say again, while we're all here, however, that we'll stop at nothing to make sure of it. I read in the papers how important he is. Going to identify that killer for you in your trial, isn't that it? Yes, Niles has agreed to make the identification. Unfortunately, the newspapers have also printed the fact that he is the only witness I have against Johnny Galena. 
And that sort of publicity isn't helpful at all. The journal gave it the front page this morning, Chief. Yeah. Did you see it, Harrington? Yeah, I'll say I did. They hit it right on the nose, too. Said the district attorney considered Niles so important, he came out here personally to extradite him. Hey, look, can't we... Yeah, okay, okay, Niles, calm down. Calm down, there's nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about? Are you crazy? Johnny Galena's got friends, ain't he? You think they're going to let me identify him if they can stop me? Oh, well, they'll do nothing, Niles. You're in my protection now, and I'll keep my promise to you. Uh, is the train ready, Mr. Billings? I've got everything arranged. Sure, you keep your promise. They let me out of jail here to go back with you, sure, and all I get out of it is to be a target. Don't you uh, see, you Harry? better get going, Harrington. Yeah, right, Chief. Come on, Niles, and remember, when we go out that door, don't look to the right or the left, see? Just follow the conductor here. I'll take them directly to drawing room B. Is that right? Fine. You have your ticket, Miss Miller? Right, Chief. Bedroom H. I'll get on last, the way you said it. Hold me, Mr. Harrington. Let's go, Niles. I'll check with you later, Harrington, as soon as I get to my own bedroom. Passengers holding tickets. Just remember, C.A., you're responsible for me. Niles, I assure you, you won't be out of my mind for a moment. Not until I've got you safely on the stand against Galena. All right, Harrington, go on. Right. Let's go. You wait a few minutes, Miss Miller, and then board with the crowd outside, all right? Yeah, I know what to do, Chief. Good. I'll find you when I need you. In the meantime, don't recognize me on the train. It's better if we're not seen together. Chief? Yes? You're worried about this trip, aren't you? Frankly, Miss Miller, I am. Niles is my only witness in a trial that means... Well, you know what it means. Sure, I've got to get that man there to testify. Yes, and in condition to testify, too. So let's hope for the best. Well? They're on the train, all right. The DA's assistant has Niles in drawing room B. Harrington? Is that the name on the orders? Yeah. There's pictures in the folder. Never mind, Elsie. It's him, all right. Niles was handcuffed to him. They're in B, right in this car. The DA's with him? He's in bedroom alone. This car, too. Mm, the boys sure worked that all right. <laughs> We're right between them. Oh. Johnny's got money, you know. Why shouldn't he get things worked right? Uh, he will. Getting me to pull this job for him was the smartest thing he ever did. Getting us, Ben. I come in on that fee. Don't forget. Well, don't you always come in on what I do, baby? Oh, sure. Like that washed-out blonde in the lobby last night. Huh. Oh, I was just a kid, Elsie. Forget it. Forget it? Sure. You leave me sitting in that lousy hotel room for two solid hours, and when I come down, okay, they... Okay, okay. Forget it, will you? We got work to do. One of these days, so help me... Will out. you shut up? You've been hopping about that dame all day. Well, why not? If I hadn't come down for that movie magazine when I did, you'd probably be with her yet. Just a kid. Will you pipe down? We got plans to make. Sure, sure. If you want the ticket stubs. Huh? The guy collected while you were out. No, no, keep them. I got plans to make, I said. Let's have it. Now, now, look. The way I figure it, we... Well... You stop glaring at me. How can I work with you shooting off your face all the time? All right, go on. What's the plan? All right. Well, they're all three on this car, see? Harrington, Niles, and the DA himself. Yeah. The best thing is to get over with it fast, Elsie. That way we can get off at Toledo and be back in Chicago before they know what hit them. Back to the blonde, I suppose. <laughs> Will you listen, Elsie, and get this straight. I got a job to do now. A big job. For Johnny Galena, too. The biggest guy in the racket. I know that, sir. So I don't fool around, get it? Now you shut up and listen to your orders, baby. Because this is one show I'm going to run right. Excuse me. May uh, I get through, please? Yes, certainly. Oh, here, I'll open the door for you. Well, 
Is everything all right, Chief? Yeah, so far, so good, Miss Miller. The conductor's collected all the tickets in our car, and he reports everything seems in order. Harrington's in the drawing room? With Niles, yes. Uh-huh. I'm going to relieve him while he gets some dinner. In the meantime, I think you might circulate a little, see if anyone strikes you as out of the ordinary. I will, Chief. I was just going into the ladies' dressing room when I saw you in the aisle. Yes, I see. We might try the club car later on, too. You know what to do. Right. I'll wait here a moment until you're out of sight. If you need me, I'll be in the drawing room with Harrington. All right, Chief. If I can't get back to you without being seen, I'll send a note by the porter. All right, that's fine. And be careful, Miss Miller. Be just as careful as you can. Oh, pardon me. Are you using this dressing table? Oh, uh, go right ahead. Thank you. I was just going to see if I can do anything with my makeup. Honestly, the way your face can get dirty. <laughs> Isn't it something? You're going all the way through, are you? That's right, dearie. Say, uh, you don't happen to have an extra cleansing tissue, do you? Why, well, yes. Yes, I do. It's right here in my oh, bag. Oh, thanks. There you are. Thanks a lot. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. The twain, uh, train swerved and I must have knocked your purse on the floor. Well, don't worry. I'll no, get here, it. I'll, let me. I'll get it, I said. Let my purse alone. But I was only... Never mind. You can have the makeup table if you want it. I'm finished. I'm sorry about your purse. Surely you don't think Stop I would... It. So long, dearie. Uh, uh, thanks for the tissue. Yes, you're quite welcome. Oh, Porter. Oh. Down here, please, and hurry. Here's a seat, young lady, right here. Oh, thanks. You sure it ain't taken? Not if you want it, it ain't. Best seat in the club car, too. Gives you a view of where you just been. It's exciting, ain't it? That's Indiana. Nothing exciting about that. Oh, I don't know. Ever been in Gary? We just passed through it, little girl. Hey, uh, can I buy you a drink? After a while, maybe. Ooh, I got such a head from last night. I don't think I can look at one. Uh, Gary, huh? You in business in Gary? I'm in business wherever I hang my hat, mister. Yeah? What kind of business? Why don't you guess? Well, let me see. Could be a model, you know. Got the looks for it. Thanks. But you're not. I guess you'd call me a booster. Huh? Always sticking up for the hometown. That's one definition, ain't it? There are others, you know. Like shoplifting. Yeah. So I've heard. Want to trade handles, kid? Mine's Ben. Ben Mott. Hi. Smith. Edith Smith. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Girl's got to be careful, Ben. She can't go around spilling her name, can she? She can if she's out from the wall. Maybe she ain't. Ever been nailed, lady? By the cops? Yeah, in Denver. Yeah? Where in Denver? In the shed. Railroad station to you. I know the lingo. What was the rap? Boosting? I was doing the hook for the troop. It was a go-back deal, and I end up with a bad man. Ah, you know the lingo yourself. Uh, St. Paul, you said? <laughs> What are you doing, kidding me, Ben? Nobody but a lamster gives St. Paul a play. This was Denver. The fix was in, so here I am. You know, Edie... Yeah? You're okay. Really okay. Oh, sure. I'm in great shape, I am. What's the matter, you broke? I said the fix was in, didn't I? What do you think happened to my fall, though? You, uh... Got any plans, Edie? Oh, the big city... I thought maybe if I spent my last buck on a train like this, I could line up a mark. Who for? Traveling with somebody? No. No, I'm alone. I just thought I'd get in a new troop faster if I arrived with a sucker all set. Yeah. You would at that. You're smart, Edie. You don't sound so dumb yourself, Ben. Hey, um... Uh, I'll take that drink now. Sure thing. I'll ring the... Oh, wait a minute. Maybe we can go back to my compartment and have a real drink. <laughs> you got a view of Indiana back there? I got a plan, Edie. 
I think maybe you're just the kid would go for it, too. How's the score? Plenty. Matter of fact, this is a business trip. Big business. Oh? I got a partner already, but... Well, you know how it is. The way my business runs, I need new blood. You know, Ben... Yeah? I got plenty of blood. Let's go back to your trap and, uh... Have that drink. Yeah, I won't be long, Chief. It's early. The diner shouldn't be crowded. It's all right. Take your time, Harrington. I'll stay here with Miles until you get back. What about me? When do I get to eat? I don't think it would be wise to take you into the diner, Niles. We'll have something brought back here later on. Yeah, I'll take care of it, Chief. Right. Say, uh, is Miss Miller in her bedroom? Uh, she's checking the train. Oh, and it'll be safer all around. If you... All right, take your time. Safer all around. And you do think somebody might... Now, might... take it easy, Niles. Take it easy. Nothing's going to happen to you. I'm scared, I tell you. I was a fool to tell the warden I'd do now, it. Now, relax, I said. There's nothing to worry about. Sure, that's easy for you to say. I'm the guy they want to shut up. They won't. I've told you the trial in which you're going to testify means just about everything to me. So help me, I'm going to see that you do. Back. You sent her in to get some food. She... Oh, I see. <laughs> Do you? What's the matter, Ben? She cramp your style? You wouldn't. Would you, Edie? What do you think? What's the job, Ben? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, not so fast, lady. Let's see who you know first. Well, uh, let's see. Did you ever hear of uh, Swede Larson out of Cincinnati? Point out, man, yeah. Coogler? Runs a cannon mob in shape. Well... How about a big boy, Edie? Say, like Johnny Galena. He's standing a rap, ain't he? Won't be a rap if Tom Miles doesn't identify him at the trial, you know. Yeah, that's what I heard. What would you say if I told you Niles is on this train? And that's the job, Tom Niles? Maybe. <laughs> you must be big yourself, Ben, doing a job for Johnny Galena. I'm big enough to take care of you, Edie. The two of us for a long, long time. Ben, I... Why, you louse. Elsie, I thought you were in the diner. Yeah, I bet you did. Well, that ties it. It's her. Look, Why, Elsie, you I... poor fool. That's the dame I was telling you about. Huh? She's the one gave my purse the once over in the ladies' room. What? Why, that's true, but I... I told you you'd make a false move, Ben. Now you've blown it for good. Sit down, Elsie. Let's straighten this out. Yeah? You think I'm nuts? She's probably got the train swarming with cops. I'm getting out of here. Sit down, I said. And stay for the rap? What kind of a fool do you think I am? Now, wait a minute. There's been a mistake. I'll say there's been a mistake, dearie. Him. I should have pulled out long ago. I warn you, Elsie. Sit down. You let go of me, you shoot diamond and bum. I'm going to see to it that you get yours once and for all. Elsie, put that gun down. I knew she had a gun in that bag. That's right, dearie. Now, here's where you get off the joyride, Ben, and right into the arms of the law. Look, honey, calm down a minute. A minute, my back is turned. You know that ain't true, Elsie. I've always come back to you, haven't I? Yeah, you've always come back, but that's not good enough. Look, Elsie, this dame don't mean a thing to me, and she's not hooked up with a cop. She's a booster out of Denver. That's right, Elsie. I'm not after your guy. You keep out of this. Elsie, look at me, baby. I love you, honey. You know that, don't you? Don't you? Oh, Ben, if I could only believe you. You know me, baby, why I'm all for you. Always have been. Oh, uh, come on. Come on. Let me have that heat. Oh, Ben, if you'd only play square with me. I get all riled up like this and I don't know what I'm doing. That's my girl. Now let me have the gun, Elsie. Here. Here, take it. That's right, Elsie. <clears throat> Thanks. You see, Ben, I... Yeah. Oh, oh, don't. Don't. I haven't even started on her. Pull a gun on me, will you? Ben, no. Trevor, let me have it, won't you, Elsie? Huh? And with a rod, too. Nice and noisy so the whole train can hear. I didn't mean it, Ben. It was just my temper. Yeah, well, I do be it, kid. I'm through with that loud mouth of yours once and for all. Ben, no. Look out, Elsie. He's got a you knife. You keep out of this. Come on, Elsie. Here's where we say goodbye. Ben! Yeah. Oh! 
You, you killed her. Yeah. You... It's like we said, Edie. You blood for old. Now, come on. Let you and me straighten this out. Yes, but... You got you... questions to answer, little girl. And while you're talking, just keep your eyes on this night. Oh. We'll see what your district attorney makes of this in just a moment. But first, a definition of an optimist. An optimist is a man who takes the worst of it and makes the best of it. Now, a man is certainly getting the worst of it when he wakes up in the morning feeling sick and headachy due to the need of a laxative. But if he's an optimist, he makes the best of it. Yes, chances are he reaches for his sal hepatica. For you see, a sparkling glass of sal hepatica when you get up brings quick, gentle relief, usually within an hour. That means you don't have to risk feeling miserable all day waiting until night to take a laxative. And that's not all. In addition to quick, gentle relief, sal hepatica brings you another important advantage. This famous saline helps sweeten an upset stomach by helping to reduce excess gastric acidity. So, friends, be sure that you, too, keep a bottle of sal hepatica handy. Remembering this caution, use only as directed. Noon or night, see how much faster you feel better... Thanks to gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. Now back to Mr. District Attorney. I'll take another look through the train, Mr. District Attorney, if you think that'll help. Well, yes, I wish you would, Mr. Billings. I can't understand where she is. I told you something would happen. I knew it. Pipe down, Niles. Hey, Chief, you sure Miss Miller ain't in her bedroom? I'm positive. Suppose I have that look at the other cars. Will you be here? Well, no, I think I'll go back to my bedroom, Mr. Billings. You'll find me there. She'll turn up, I'm sure. One thing, she can't get off the train. Yeah, Chief, I don't like this at all. You ain't seen her since she started back for the club car? Before dinner. Did you hear the conductor? He said she couldn't get off the train. Well, she couldn't. It must be doing 70 through here. She could get pushed off, couldn't uh, she? Ah, that'll be enough of that, Niles. I'm scared, I tell you. You promised to take care of me. Shut up, Niles. Shut up. You're all right. Oh, I'll go back to my bedroom, Harrington. I don't like to stay in here with you too long. Yeah, right, Chief. We'll see what the conductor's search reveals. And if he doesn't find Miss Miller... Yeah? Then we will, Harrington. I promise you, we will. Yes, yes, come in. Oh, come in, Mr. Bennett. She's not in sight, Mr. District Attorney. I cover the whole train. I see. But this turned up. Yes? It seems a young lady gave the porter a note for you before dinner. Miss Miller? I think so, sir. Yes? Here, it's written on the back of a ticket stub. Let me see it. The porter had been warned about this car, you see. I told him myself to be careful. See. You say she gave him this note before dinner? He held it, sir. He was afraid to deliver anything without checking with me. I've got to get out of here, Conductor. Which way is compartment G? To your left, four down. Wait for me. I may need your help. Excuse me, will you please? May I get through? Take it easy, bud. Just let me get out of your way. I'm sorry, but I'm in a hurry. You sure are. Thank you. Excuse me, please. I've got to get through. Tell you, you can't stop people like Johnny Galena. He'll do anything. Oh, look, Niles, you've been whining ever since we left Chicago. Will you shut up? Take off my handcuffs, Harrington. Chain to you this way, I haven't got a chance. Look, for the last time, my job is to protect you, do you understand? These cuffs stay, kid. You and me, real cozy-like. I'm scared. Yeah, you said that. If I were you, I'd... Hey! 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 It's a wreck! Hang on, Niles! Hang on! Let go! Let go! Niles, are you all right? 
I'm pinned, Harry. I can't move. This beam inside my chest. Can't move, I tell you, Harrington. Shut up, shut up. There's no need to get in a panic. Get me out of here. Get me out. Oh, I can't move either, I tell you. If you ain't hurt, just shut up. Hey, listen. Hey. Hey. They're coming in for us already. Do you hear them? They must be using the axe. Yeah, we're all right. Just, just get this beam off it. Go in there, Niles. I'm pinned. I can't move. <laughs> Just keep coming. I can see the light where you broke the side. <laughs> keep coming. Joe Harrigan. Where? Yeah. Keep coming. Through the side, see? Through the side of the car. Don't worry. I'll get there. <laughs> Just take it easy. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. Who are you? You'll find out, Harrington. Uh, so you're pinned, are you, Niles? Harrington. Uh, don't get panicky, Niles. Wait till I reach for my gun. Just stay where you are, Niles. I'll take care of you. Harrington, it, it's Ben Mott. He's going to kill me. I remember him from Chicago. Uh, I can't, can't reach my gun. I oh, want this beam if I could only push this beam up. Harrington, you said you'd protect me. Uh, there you are. Just a minute now and I'll be there. I mean, to look, he's got a knife. <laughs> hey, drop, drop that knife. Drop it, the you hear me? Uh, sure, I've got a cover. Uh, right in your little pal here. No, my dog. So you thought you'd turn right on Johnny Galena. Harrington. I'll, I warned you, I'll, I'll do nothing, copper. Uh, I just lie there till I finish with him. No, no, uh, Ben, please, please, one Ben. One more push, Niles, and I got you, uh, dirty rat. Harrington, help me, help me. I can't. Wheel on Johnny, would you? Here's where you... No. Harrington. Oh, Chief. You all right in there? <coughs> I can't see over this body. Yeah, you got him, Chief. It's okay now. Just lie quietly, Harrington. We'll be through to you in a minute. Right. Hey, Niles. 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 Niles, are you all right? I, I'm all right. He's dead. All right, men. Let's cut away this beam. Oh, Chief. Chief, that was close. Can you get some water, Miss Miller? Right. There's a doctor out on the tracks. So. Well, I'm okay, Chief. Was There's any... no one dead or hurt, Chief. This is the only car that went over. The train hit an empty truck on the road. Oh, oh good. Miss Miller, where did she go? Well, it's quite a story, Harrington. But first, let's get you and Niles outside. We've got a trip to finish, you know. All right, men, let's go. <laughs> Your district attorney will return in just a moment to explain his rescue of Harrington and Niles. But first, here's a young lady who seems to be very happy indeed. Hallelujah, my guy's come back. Well, glad to hear he's back, young lady. And you know, in lots of other ways, too, life is getting settled again. For instance, Vitalis is back. Yes, back on drug counters everywhere. Vitalis? What's Vitalis? Vitalis is for keeping dry, unruly hair under control. It is? Well, then I guess that guy of mine must be using Vitalis. His hair is always well-groomed. Well-groomed in a natural masculine way? Mm Mm-hmm, that's right. Well-groomed, yet free from that patent leather shine? (laughs) Yes, sir. That's Vitalis, all right. What's more, Vitalis and the 60-second workout stimulate circulation, prevents scalp dryness... Routes embarrassing loose dandruff. Helps retard excessive falling hair. And that's why we say to men, to look your best tomorrow, get a bottle of Vitalis tonight. Now, here is your district attorney. Well, I want to say first, ladies and gentlemen, that Tom Niles went on the stand in my prosecution of Johnny Galena, and because of his testimony, we were able to secure another very important conviction in our war against crime. Yeah, I still say that was close, Chief. If you hadn't been right behind Ben in that wreckage, he'd have killed Niles, sure. Chief, I think you'd better explain just how you knew Ben was making his way through the wreck to Harrington and Niles. But it was your note that did it, Miss Miller, the note the porter delayed in delivering until just before the wreck. When you were in the ladies' dressing room with Elsie, that started the whole thing. When her purse fell, Harrington, I noticed it was heavy. Too heavy for an ordinary lady's handbag. Oh, she was carrying a gun, huh? I'll say she was. Fortunately, when I picked up the bag, her compartment receipt fell out. I wrote the note to the chief on the back of it. Yes, and as soon as I got the note, I went immediately to that compartment. 
As Miss Miller had written, the occupant seemed suspicious. That's a mild word for Ben, Chief. <laughs> After he tied me up, I thought I was done for. Yeah, so you found Miss Miller in Ben's compartment, huh, Chief? Yes, Harrington, and Elsie's body. Miss Miller told me Ben had started for you, and so I followed him. Fortunately, neither of us was hurt in the wreck. Ben managed to get out of the car first, but I wasn't far behind him. Boy, am I glad you stayed on his tail. Oh, hey, Chief, what about next week? Well, next week, ladies and gentlemen, our story concerns one of the most unusual and interesting criminals in our files. It's the case of the dangerous clown, and I invite you to join us for it. And until then, thank you, and good night. <laughs> The names of all characters in tonight's dramatization are fictitious, and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, and Vicki Vola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden, and the authors were Edward Byron and Robert Shaw. And remember, Vitalis for hair that's well-groomed. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Vitalis... And Sal Hepatica, two famous Bristol Myers products, which each week bring you Mr. District Attorney. Men, so often the girls say... What a man. If only he had that clean-shaven, masculine look. But many men say their faces are too tender for close, clean shaving. And girls say, no alibis, please. And I say, no alibis necessary. Not when you rely on Ingram shaving cream. That rich Ingram lather helps condition your face for the razor. You get cool, soothing shaves in comfort. Remember, men, comfort means coolness. Coolness means Ingram. I-N-G-R-A-M. Ingram, the cooler shaving cream. Try Ingram yourself. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people... Defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by two famous Bristol Myers products, Vitalis and Sal Hepatica. Vitalis for hair that's well groomed. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Vitalis, Sal Hepatica. shall be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. The case... Of Baby, Cradle, and All. Our story opens tonight on the Lancaster Estate in the suburb of your district attorney city. At the front door, Mrs. Lancaster is just getting out of her lawyer's car. Time for a drink, Walter? There'll be ice and things on the terrace. Oh, I can't, Maeve. Got to get back to town. Oh, I wish you'd change your mind. Oh, I can't, really. Hey, isn't that Drew on the terrace? Why, yes, it is. That's strange. He said he was lunching in town with some friends of his from college. Drew? Oh, Drew, dear. If you ask me, your son's busy. Busy? Who's the girl? I don't know. That's what I meant by busy. <laughs> well, I'll phone you when I want those tax reports signed. Yes, Walter, do. Mother, I... I thought you were in town. And I thought you were. Oh, what a shame. I told Julia there'd be no luncheon. Uh, yeah, she told me. Walter have to leave? Yes. He's busy in town. I didn't 
didn't know you were having a guest. Oh, I'm not. I, I mean, Laurie and I just drove out. She, uh, wanted to see the house. Really, dear, you might have said... Laurie? Lorelei Ross. Lorelei? Uh, come on, I'll introduce you. Rob. I don't remember you ever saying... True, wait a minute. Hope I didn't scare Walter away. Oh, mother? Uh, Miss Ross? Laurie, this is my mother. Miss Ross. Swell to meet you, Mrs. Lancaster. Thank you, my dear. Oh, do sit down. Drink, lady? It's rum. Thank you, girl. This, uh, sure is a beautiful place, Mrs. Lancaster. Just like something in the movies. I was telling Laurie about your archery, Mother. She got quite a kick out of it. Really? I'd say I did. I never shot a bow and arrow. Never really had to. I do it for exercise, mostly. Oh, yes, I understand. You aren't having lunch with your friends from school, Drew? Uh, no, Mother. No, I'm not. It's a shame, Miss Roth. If it weren't so late, I'd insist you stay and have luncheon here with us. Oh, sure, but... As a matter of fact, Mother, we're going back to town. Uh, I'm taking Laurie to a matinee. This afternoon? But, darling, you can't. Oh, but, but I have already... I mean, surely you haven't forgotten Dr. Marks. I made my major appointment myself. He is sick, Drew? Uh, he's a dentist. But that can oh. wait, Mother. You, you can call now, him. Now, isn't he terrible, Miss Ross? Honestly, I have to leave him around like a great big baby. Now, Mother, really, there's no reason oh, but to go. Drew, we can do it. It'll be fun. Certainly, Drew. Miss Ross doesn't mind, I'm sure. Oh, of course not. We'll go to your dentist this afternoon and take in the show tonight. But I... Oh, I can get off at the barbershop all right, Drew, and then we can eat together and everything. Oh, that sounds swell, Laurie. But you don't understand. Oh, sure I do, Mrs. Lancaster. I know Drew pretty well, too. You do? Like you say, you gotta lead him around like a big kid. <laughs> Golly, don't I know. This is the complete file on the girl, Mr. District Attorney. Uh -huh. I had my trustee collect everything he could get. I see. Uh, take this, will you please, Miss Miller? Right, Chief. Uh, the girl's name is Ross, Mrs. Lancaster. Lorelei Ross. Lorelei. She's apparently called Lori. Mm -hmm. A manicurist, you said, Mrs. Lancaster, huh? It's all there in the report, Mr. Harrington. Uh, my son met the girl in this barber shop. Uh, I see. And after you met her, you had your trustee investigator, is that right? Walter Lambert, yes. Mm -hmm. He's been my trustee for years. Ever since my husband died, he's handled everything for me. Mm. But you'll find the information accurate, all right. Well, yes, I don't question that, Mrs. Lancaster. But, uh, frankly, I'm not exactly clear on what you expect us to do. Do? Yes. Why, well, it's the most obvious thing I ever saw. Mm. This manicurist is deliberately trying to marry my son. Oh, for his dough, huh? I beg your pardon? Well, oh, well we've got to be practical, Mrs. Lancaster. <laughs> Everybody in town knows your son comes into $8 million pretty soon now. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Well, I remember seeing his picture when he got turned down by his draft board. Drew always had publicity, no matter how I tried to avoid it. Yes, well, I don't think you quite understand, Mrs. Lancaster. If you find this girl undesirable as an associate for your son, well, that's a matter for you and the boy. But I... As for any action against the girl, well, there's no complaint. She's committed no crime, Mrs. Lancaster. You admit that yourself. You don't think it's a crime to marry my boy for his money? Uh, Mrs. Lancaster. <laughs> yes? I'm sorry, Chief. Well, but go around. Go around here, Miss Miller. Well, I just wonder if you're giving this girl a break, Mrs. Lancaster. Have you talked to her? Maybe she loves your son. Maybe he loves her. After all, we... I see. I see. He, well, I sure don't. I've created the wrong impression here, haven't I? Oh, be honest. To you, I seem one of those awful society mothers. Nothing's good enough for my boy, that sort of thing. Well, this does strike me as unusual, Mrs. Lancaster. As Miss Miller has just pointed out... Well, I'm not, you see. I'm not at all. I know this girl, and I know her game. Her game? Yes. I know this girl because I was this girl myself. Huh? Yes, it's true. I hooked Drew's father just exactly the way this kid's trying to hook him. Yeah. No kid. Well, I'm sorry. And I'm, I'm ashamed of it. Oh, not to tell you. I'm not ashamed to admit it to the whole world. But I am ashamed to let it happen to my son. And believe me, it won't. Down, 
on me. I've nothing but sherry here in the office. Would you care for some? Calm down. Walter, do you realize what this girl is trying to do? Yes. The record's pretty obvious, isn't it? No family to speak of, battered around from one town to another. Quite a record with the police in Norfolk, apparently. Walter, she's got her hands on Drew. And what does he say? Oh, he won't even discuss it. He thinks she loves him. You pointed out to him that under the terms of his father's will, you turn over the trust to him in August? Of course. And he still thinks this Lorelei Ross isn't after his money. Her record and his trust, he can't add that up. Hmm? Would I have gone to the district attorney if he could? Now, Maid, uh, yes. I've handled things for you for a long time. I wish you'd let me handle this Ross matter as well. But there's no question of you handling it, Walter. I'm sorry you went to the D.A. I know, I know. But when he defied me again this morning, when he walked out of the house to see her again, I, I just didn't know what to do. Well, I do, May. From now on, let me handle this in my own way. Anything, Walter. Anything you want. First, I think I want you to call the D.A. Call him? There's the phone. Call him and tell him to forget the entire incident. But I... I know what I'm doing, May. Call him, please. Now. Yes, I understand, Mrs. Lancaster. Yeah. Yes, yes, I think that's wise of you. Well, these things often work themselves out. Yes, of course. No, no trouble at all. Thank you. Now what, Chief? Does she want the girl put on bread and water? Well, as a matter of fact, Miss Miller, Mrs. Lancaster has changed her mind. What? what? Yes, she's decided to do nothing, Harrington. Uh, well, what do you know about that? I know this about it, Miss Miller. She had that Ross girl pegged pretty good. Oh? Yeah, Chief, I uh, did a little checking up during the noon hour. Mm -hmm. This Laurie Ross has been bragging all over town about how she's hooked a millionaire kid. Oh, no. Well, from what I saw, Mrs. Lancaster, I'd say the girl has her work cut out for her. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that again, Chief. Just like she said in the office, she knows that game herself. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll admit I did admire her for saying it. Most women wouldn't. Well, Chief, I guess uh, we can forget about this one, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I'd be perfectly happy to forget about it, but there's one thing I can't forget. Yeah, what's that, Chief? Eight million dollars, Harrington. Sometimes that means trouble. <laughs> You want the cuticle push back, mister? I always ask for some men don't like it. Oh, no, that's fine. Thank you, Laurie. Just the way they are. I'll just finish up now. And... Say, how'd you know my name? One of the barbers tell you? No, I've never been in this barber shop before. That's what I was thinking. My name is Lambert, Laurie. Walter Lambert. I'm trustee for the Drew Lancaster estate. Oh, you are. Will you listen to don't me? Don't get excited, Laurie. Go on, finish my nails. We can talk here as well as any place. You can take your fingernails. Don't you know... be foolish, Laurie. You don't want to lose your job here, do you? Listen, when I get through with Drew Lancaster, he and I'll be like that, see? This job. Your old man's mustache, Mr. Wiseguard. Going to marry him, Laurie? You're darn right I'm going to marry him. He loves me. And what do you love, kid? Drew or his eight million bucks? None of your... Now, listen here. Keep your voice down. Without me, you haven't got a chance. Did you ever hear of a frame, kid? Did you ever hear of even innocent little girls getting framed right out of town? Why, you dirty... Remember Norfolk, Laurie? Ever lie to the probation officer down there? Ever think he might like to hear from you, Laurie? Norfolk. Uh-huh. I know a lot about you. Wait a minute. Let me peg this. You handle the dough, huh? Why, Sure. You got Mama hogtied, and in August, all that scratch goes to the kid. You're getting very smart, Laurie. And if Mama loses, so do you. Right? Right. Now I'll talk. I can have you out of town in one hour, kid. And you know I can do it. Talk some more. But if we team up, if we handle this my way, we both get rich. Eight million rich? Oh, that's the neighborhood, Laurie. 
How'd you like to live there? I see what you mean, mister. Good morning, Drew. Is Mother with you, Walter? Why, no. Isn't she here? Here? She got your phone call about an hour ago. She went right into town. My phone call? Oh, but that's impossible. I was on my way out here. Oh, you drive? I didn't hear your car. I parked it down on the highway and walked across the lawn. Oh. My only chance for exercise these days, I'm afraid. I didn't know you went in for archery, too, Drew. Our mother's the expert. I was just fooling around. Here, you... Want to try? Oh, no, thanks. I don't need that much exercise. You're sure May went into town to see me? Hmm? Well, you know, Mother, she's always getting things mixed up. Uh, there's a bottle and some mix on that bench, Wooly. Want to drink? Why, yes, I think I do. I'll get it, Drew. Yeah, help yourself. Huh? Good shot. Mix you one? Please. Have you seen much of Miss Ross lately? Don't start on it, Walden. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's your drink. Thanks. Here's to Miss Ross. Don't be coy, Walter. It doesn't suit you. You don't really believe I'm for you, do you, Drew? Any reason why I should? I know all about you, Walter. In the matter of Miss Ross, for instance. Mays told me how you feel. <clears throat> Mother's always told you... So much, Walter, that's been one of the mistakes. Oh, now that's a little harsh, isn't it? After all, I've kept your trust fund intact for you. Mm. Your mother's lived entirely on the income. Who are you kidding? Would you like another drink? Oh, no. No, thanks. That one seems to have hit me. Oh, the sun, probably. It is hot out here. I think I'll sit down. When you say handling the money was my job, Drew, you infer now that look, I... look, Walter, if this is a plea, forget it. I'll be 21 soon, and when I am, I'll handle my own affairs. I see. Then you won't retain me, hmm? Never bothered to spare your feelings before, Walter. Why should I begin now? I, I think you're a crook. <laughs> oh, you're frank, Drew. I like you for that. Always frank. Very... Why, what's the matter? Aren't you feeling well, son? Uh, I'll be all right, man. Archer is too much for you, probably. It takes quite an arm to bend this bow. Mind if I try? Not so much. It's, it's easy. <laughs> Look at me. I can hardly pull this thing back. Funny, I, I feel so sick. You put I... the arrow in like this, don't you? Oh, I gotta lie down a minute, Walter. Uh, I'm dizzy. Put the arrow along the bow like this, don't you? Now, be careful how you point it. Hey, look out! Don't, don't point that thing at me. I'll be careful, Drew. It's quite a pull, isn't it? Uh, there's nothing to it. What did you say, Drew? I, I, I said that there's nothing. Who is... Walter! Do you want to see the reporters, Chief? They want a statement on your raid at the Five Juices Club. Yes, well, I'll be with them as soon as I can. Ms. All right. Man. Did you put that gang through the lineup, Harrington? Yeah, all of them, Chief. The head waiter, the four guys we got running the tables, everybody. Yes, and? Well, it proves we were right on one count, Chief. Nobody wanted them, so they must be from out of town. Get circulars out on all of them, will you please, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. They're being prepared now. Well, I hope it's a good sign, Chief. The first joint on the list being a gambling outfit. Oh, I think our list is all right. What bothers me is the real head of it. These men we took in last night are obviously just employees. Yeah, that's right. I pegged that bum Parsons that way. The name Joe Parsons may be on the liquor license, but he sure don't own the place. Yes, exactly. 
Well, there's nothing to do but work down the list, then. We'll stage another raid tonight. I'll get a control sheet ready, Chief. Yes, please, Miss Miriam. Now, anything else, Harrington? What? Oh, there's a dame showed up in the morgue this morning. Homicide. Oh, I meant to go down. Any story yet? No, I'm working on it. She was dumped out of a car up the suburbs. Shot once through the back of the head. Yes, I saw the examiner's report. Oh, there's lots of leads to go on, Chief. Fully dressed. Handbag full of stuff. I'll know something in a couple of hours. All right, keep me informed, will you? Right. And stand by for tonight. We'll keep on raiding until we find the man we want. Uh, Betsy was a good kid, Walt. Oh, it's too bad. Well, here, Jim, you've got to settle down to work. Have you any idea what last night's raid on the five deuces cost me? Well, she was just jealous. You can't blame her for that. Oh, stop it. This is big time. Losing that club will set me back $60,000 at least. Yes, and losing Parsons doesn't help matters. You're going to let him take a fall? Parsons was paid to take this, and at least he did his job. Meaning I'm not. Well, what about her? Has she said anything? Oh, I told you. She just doesn't talk about the D.A., I wonder if she could be wise. I don't see how. Oh, she doesn't make a phony move all the time I'm with her. You're not followed. Anything like that? <laughs> I'm not that dumb, Walt. I could spot a tail a mile away. We can't waste time any longer, Jim. Miller knows what clubs the D.A. intends to raid, and I must get that list. <laughs> not from little clam up, you won't. Uh, when's your next date? Tonight. I paid one of the hairdressing kids five bucks to tell me your favorite movie star. <laughs> so we're going to the movies. All right. Now listen to what I want you to do, Jim. It occurs to me now, perhaps we've been... Well, let's just say too gentle. <laughs> See why you don't like him, Harrington. You haven't even met the man. I suppose he's a big shot in the stock market. Mr. Hubbard? Mm. Oh, I'd hardly say that. Well, you were just telling me he talks about the market all the time. Oh, Harrington, honestly. No, 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 Miss Miller. Tell me more. Now, when you go to the Emerald Room, the head waiters all jump up at once. Huh? Now, what else? I didn't say that. And what, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. They bring a phone to his table. Boy. <laughs> What a man of distinction. That's better than bringing you a bowl of pretzels at the Dutchman's. Yeah. For your information, Brenda, the Dutchman serves peanuts. Oh, why don't you stop? You haven't even met him. Please give him... Oh, I'm sorry I'm late, Harry. Hi, hi, Any calls, Miss Miller? Uh, they're on your desk, Chief. Oh, and your Christmas seals came. Good. Remind me to send a check tomorrow. Yes, sir. Harrington and I bought ours this noon. Yeah. Oh, that's something we never forget, those Christmas seals. Right. Oh, Chief, I got most of the story on that girl, the homicide in the morgue. Oh. Her name's Mitzi Page. Cased her apartment this afternoon. I see. Anything promising? Well, nothing much from the neighbors. Oh, there's a boyfriend in it, I think. I took his picture off her dresser. Wait a second, I got it right here. Uh, that manila envelope, Harry? Yeah. It's right here. Oh, open it, will you please, Miss Miller? Sure. Looks like a newcomer, Chief. Else he's just straight. That one, Miss yeah, Miller? Yeah, I'll have it copied for you. Oh. Oh, no. What's the matter? Harrington, this, this picture, this was on the dead girl's dresser? Yeah, sure it was. Why? There's something the matter, Miss Miller? Well, Chief, this, this man... This is Jim Hubbard. Who? Why, I can't... Jim Hubbard, Harrington, yeah. my friend, the man I... Why, why, I've got a date with him tonight. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This man, this is the one you met at the charity bazaar? Why, I don't understand it, Chief. It, it, it's the same man. Mm. It, it doesn't make sense. Oh, brother, this is something new. Miss Miller. I'm shocked, I... Well, I mean, surely there's some explanation. Surely... Well, now, wait a minute. Let's not be too well, hasty. I, I know, Suppose but... we just talk about this man a little. If you're willing, tell us just what you already know. Honestly, Jim... 
this is one of the craziest nights I've ever spent. I told you I had a surprise. All my friends upstairs. He'll be down in a minute. Uh, you are unpredictable. Oh? First we go to the Robert Montgomery picture, and after five minutes you want to leave. Oh, I'm funny that way. If I can't get interested, I walk out. Gee, we, we sure did. And then this uh, long ride out here. A friend of yours lives here, you said? Yes, you'll like him. May I intrude? Oh, come in, Walt. We were waiting for you. Miss Miller? Mrs. Walt. How do you do? Pleasure, Miss Miller. I had your car put around in bag, Jim, all right? Sure, sure, Walt. That's fine. We won't be leaving. We won't? Oh, well, my goodness. I ought to leave right now. I'm a working girl, you know. I have to get up in the morning. Yeah. Yes, Jim's told me of your work, Miss Miller. Oh? Does the district attorney always have one of his men follow you in the evening? Follow me? <laughs> well, well, I don't know what you mean. Sure you do, Ken. Tonight. I must say he was easily lost, Miss Miller. Jim tells me you merely went into the movie theater by one door, left by another, and your shadow was gone. Now, really, I don't think this is very funny at all. Why would anyone follow me? I'll be happy to explain, Miss Miller. No, don't get up, please. <laughs> because you're going to talk, little lady. And you're going to start right now. No, never mind. But tell him I want to see him the first thing in the morning. Right. Yes, and keep this line clear. I don't get it, Chief. You told Miss Miller to phone in by ten. It's after midnight. And I'm beginning to get it, Carrington. Hubbard knew he was being followed. Don't tell me. Oh, Chief. Yes, Brophy followed them to a movie theater, and he lost them shortly after they went in. Lost? Oh, I know it. I should have gone. I know it. No, it's not your fault. It's mine. But I certainly didn't think he'd expect to be shadowed. Yes, she was supposed to call in by ten. Yes, I know. I know. Carrington, where in the world has he taken that girl? I don't know anything. I don't. You're his secretary. I don't know anything. Oh. Please, please stop Jim, it. I yes, don't boss. know anything. Look in that humidor on the desk. I want some cigars. cigars. Yes, cigars. Whole handful. Sure, sure, boys. Whatever you say. <laughs> ever get burnt, Miss Miller? What? Anybody ever put out a cigar in that pretty face of yours? You're crazy. I tell you, I don't know anything. Except the list of gambling places, huh? Nothing but that list. I never heard of the list, believe me. There you are, Walt. Light one. Oh, well, I'll light it. Sure, please. sure, Walt, right away. Please, won't you understand? I don't... Here, give it to me. Wait a second, will you? I've got to get it going. No. Press, Miss Miller. Rather no. tell me what places are on that list, would you? I don't know. Hurry, Jim. No, it's okay now, I guess. No, no. Here, thanks. Please don't. See the end, Miss Miller. No. See how it blows? I don't know. I tell you, I don't know. I don't know. Walt, who the... Oh, oh, oh. You boys Miller. take too long. Oh, Harry, the Miss Miller. Miller. Don't move a muscle, sweetheart, because, brother, how right. I'd like to take a shot at you. Are you sure you're all right, Miss Miller? Yes. Now, wait a minute. Now, look. Fire. Okay, Chief. Okay, Harrington. Let's take this pair away. Your district attorney will return in just a moment to explain how he and Harrington found Miss Miller. But first, you know, there's at least one point on which a surprisingly large number of people agree. On which they say, that goes for me, too. Does Mr. Arnold agree? Yes, indeed. How about Mr. Murphy? Certainly. Mr. Bailey, too? Right again. Well, Fred, just what is it so many people agree on? That it's so easy to wake up now and then feeling dull and logy... Due to the need of a laxative. Yes, but it's also easy to take sal hepatica. And a sparkling glass of sal hepatica when you get up brings quick, gentle relief. Usually within an hour. That means you don't have to go through the day waiting until night to take a laxative. And another thing. If you're troubled with excess gastric acidity, let sal hepatica sweeten your stomach. Better keep a bottle of sal hepatica handy. 
Then any time you need a laxative, morning, noon, or night, see how much faster you feel better thanks to gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. your district attorney. I'd like to point out, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, that a gun found in Walter Montello's possession proved to be the weapon used against Mitzi Page, and that, confronted with this evidence, he made a full confession of the murder. Yeah, and his slick stooge, Chief. Yes, and Jim Hubbard, Harrington. And, of course, as a result of their arrest, we were successful in closing all of the gambling establishments he'd set up in the county. Gosh, Chief, I still feel terrible about it. To think I went out with that man. Well, you're hardly to blame, Miss Miller. Walter Montello was unusually clever. In fact, he made a study of you just to get Jim Hubbard into your good graces. You can have those graces. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Miss Miller. Oh, hey, Chief, why don't you explain just how we knew where they took her? Well, that was a chance we had to take, Harrington. When we realized you were gone, Miss Miller, Harrington and I tried to remember every word you'd said about Jim Hubbard. That's right. And I remembered you said he used a telephone at this nightclub. Yes. That's right. At the Emerald Room. Exactly. Fortunately, switchboard operators in hotels and nightclubs make a record of outgoing calls. It was fortunate, too, that they'd kept a record of Jim's call to Columbia 5027. Right. Because when you trace that number, it's Waltzhausen. And that's where we found you. Gee, am I glad you did. <laughs> Gee, what about next week? Well, ladies and gentlemen, for next week we have another story in our continuous war against the underworld. A story of great dramatic excitement. It's the case of Death on Wax, and I invite you to join us for it. So until then, thank you, and good night. It's new. It's quick. It's Benex. B-E-N-E-X. The new brushless wonder shave that wilts your whiskers so they whisk off like... Mr. Try Benex. See how the special beard softening formula actually makes your beard one-fifth water. Makes your whiskers so waterlogged they don't stand a chance against your razor. Result? Quick, easy, comfortable shaves. Get Benex. B-E-N-E-X. Benex Brushless Shave Cream. The names of all characters in the ninth dramatization are fictitious, and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, and Vicky Bola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden. The program is produced and directed by Edward A. Byram and written by Robert Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Phillips H. Lord. Remember Vitalis for hair that's well-groomed, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Bristol Myers, makers of Sal Hepatica and Vitalis, invite you to tune in again next Wednesday for Duffy's Tavern and Mr. District Attorney. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by two famous Bristol Myers products, Vitalis and Sal Hepatica. Vitalis for hair that's well-groomed, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Vitalis, Sal Hepatica. And it shall be my duty as district.
district attorney, not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. The case of one slip meant death. In the spring, a young man goes to the circus. And that includes your district attorney, Harrington, and Miss Miller. As our story begins, they're busy with popcorn, peanuts, pink lemonade, and watching the show. Boy, what's this now, Miss Miller? What? Boy, did you ever see tigers like that? Where, Harrington? Which ring? In the center. Oh. Hey, who is that guy, Chief? He's great. Uh, I was just looking at the program, Harrington. Oh, here it is, number 24, presenting Chris Kane and his death-defying dance of the wild beast. Oh, gee, they're beautiful, aren't they? Yeah. The tigers? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, watch Kane's footwork, Miss Miller. That's what's beautiful. Yes, yes, isn't it? See that one snarl at him? Yeah. Boy, they ain't kidding. Now what? Uh, it's the finish of the act, Miss Miller. Oh. Okay. He's supposed to light a cigarette in front of that tiger. What? Yeah, yeah, the big one, Miss Miller. Look. Oh, I don't want to look. Watch him, watch him now. He keeps getting closer to the tiger. Oh. And all of a sudden, he lights that cigarette right in his face. Well, I'm just as glad I'm up here, aren't you, Harrington? <laughs> and now, Chief. <laughs> hey, hey, there he goes. Yeah. Watch him, Miss Miller. Yeah. That tiger got him. Oh, no. hey, let's get down there. This crowd might get out of hand. Come on. Now let's get this straight. You're Kane's assistant, you said? Yes, sir. Jimmy Parsons. Okay, Jimmy, you stay right here. Who are you? Uh, uh, my, my name is Drew. Carol Drew. Hmm. Is Kane dead, you know? Yes, ma'am. He's dead. Oh, how horrible. What do you do in the act, Miss Drew? Uh, Uh, Carol's not with us, sir. hmm? She's an aerialist. Oh, I see. Well, you don't need to hang around that little lady. District Attorney just said those in the Kane Act had to stay. Oh, but I I want to stay. You see, I... She's with me. Oh, here you are, Harrington. Yeah, I thought I'd better stick close to the cage, Chief. Mm -hmm. I did what you said. Nobody has touched it. Good. Uh, will you bring Mrs. Kane over here, please, Miss Miller? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Mrs. Kane. This won't take long, I know. Mrs. Kane, I... I don't know what to say. It's just awful. Madura got him. Hmm? I saw from the entrance it was Madura. Madura? Uh, the cat, Mr. Harrington. Oh. Oh, but Mr. Kane slipped. I saw him. What did you say? Uh, this is Carol Drew, Chief. She's part of a trapeze act. Oh, yes. And you saw Mr. Kane slip, Miss Drew? Well, I, I'm sure he did. I, well, I was watching because I was looking for Jimmy. Yes, yes. That was my impression, too. Uh, we were in a box just over there to the left. I want to have a look inside that cage, Harry. Yeah, right, Chief. Mrs. Kane, I... I know this must be a tough time to talk, but about this tiger. Is it vicious especially? They're all vicious. My husband's act was no fake. Oh, of course not. I just meant... Uh, Madura is faster than the others, Mr. Harrington. Uh-huh. You have to watch her every minute. I can't understand it. I just can't. Well, can't I get you a chair, Mrs. Kane? I- I'll be all right. Thank you. Oh, Harrington, will you come in here a moment? Yeah, right with you, Chief. Excuse Ms. me. Miss Drew, I think if you could get Mrs. Kane's glass... Yeah, uh, watch your feet yeah. there, Harrington. Hmm? There's something on this canvas I don't like. What's that, Chief? Right here. Right in front of the perch that tiger was on when it happened. Huh? Here, do you see it? Hey. Hey, Chief, that feels like grease. Yes, it is a grease of some sort. And only in front of this perch. Well, I... Now I'm sure Kane slipped in front of that animal. Oh, brother. Come on, let's see if we can't find out why. Jimmy. Yes? Jimmy, this is... This is awful to think about now. At a time like this, I mean... But... Think about what? Us. Well, the show will have to go on, Jimmy. You know that. And everybody knows you know the act. Well, you can handle the cat just as good as Mr. Kane did. Carol, wait. But we have to think about it, Jimmy. What, why, if you do the act, that'll mean more money. And and then we... Honey, can... please, wait. listen. I know we've waited, baby. Golly, I know every minute of it. Even before I went over to see you. Well, then? I, I don't want to do the act. What? Oh, don't get me wrong, baby. It isn't that I can't. Well, don't you see? The cats belong to Velma now. All of them. 
Velma. Mrs. Kent. Well, sure they do, Jimmy, but... Well, my goodness, she can't do the act. She isn't even circus. I know that. Jimmy Parsons, what are you trying to say? You're like a little boy. Velma got... likes me, Carol. She... Oh, for Pete's sake, I don't have to spell it out for you, honey. She's in my hair. She's been that way for months. Mrs. Kane. Yeah, don't you see? If I did the act now with her cats and everything, it'd be worse than ever. Much worse. Oh. I didn't know. I had... I... I had no idea at all. I didn't want to worry you. Mrs. Kane. I, I just can't believe it. Don't let her fool you, Carol. She's tough. Yeah, I heard that once. One day in the commissary, someone said... Someone said she'd been arrested or something a long time ago. Come in. Uh, Jim, I... Oh. Uh, come in, Mrs. Kane. You, uh... You know Carol Drew, I think, with the Parkers. You'll forgive us, won't you? Jim, I want to talk to you alone. Well, I... Uh, yes, of course. Is the phone connected in your dressing room, Carol? Uh, yes, it is, Jimmy. Room 72. I'll call you, okay? Yes, please do. Uh, um, Mrs. Kane, I, I want to say... Some other uh, time, my dear, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm sorry. You... Do you want to sit down? Sorry if I was rough with your little friend, Jim. It happens there's a lot to think about. If there's anything I can do, any way I can help, I oh, wish Oh, for you'd... the love of heaven, Jimmy, don't you start to. I look lousy and black and crying makes my mascara run. Sorry. Just glad our farm's near here. I can get away from the sympathy routine. Sit down, will you? You uh, said you wanted to talk to me, Mrs. Kane. Oh, I see. See? The Mrs. Kane routine. You know, Jimmy, in all my life, I never... No, I'll be darned if I will. It's getting late, Mrs. Kane. But darned if I'll sit here trying to think of how to work this. Is it that girl, Jimmy? The one that just went out here? Carol? I don't care. I don't care about anything, Jimmy. Not anymore. Look at me. But, but I... Look at me, I said. Do you think this is for last? I think you'd better... Ever since you got here. Ever since you smiled for the first time. Ever since I saw the way your hair falls over your eyes when you laugh. Since I watched you walk. Cut it out. Don't talk. Ever since I loved you, Jimmy. Loved you so hard. So far down deep inside me, it aches and pains like it was going to kill me. Jimmy, please, I'm dying with a pain. Jimmy, please. You'd better go. Please, dear Lord, please. I'm sorry, Mrs. Kane, but it's just no good. It isn't, and it never could be. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to find Carol. Jimmy. <laughs> Raven oil, odorless, tasteless, colorless. I think that's a new one on me, Kate. Mm. Raven oil? I've heard of it before, Harrington. It's, um, a, well, it's like a baby oil, I think. It has a number of uses. Yeah, it's including murder, it seems, Miss Miller. Oh, you think that'll stand up, Kate? Well, not the way the case shapes up now. Oh, it's murder, all right. There's no doubt of it. You take this fact alone. Chris Kane had done that cigarette trick in front of that particular tiger for three years. That's right. And the trick, obviously, is largely a matter of footwork. And that's right, too. Then one night, there's a neat patch of this raven oil right in front of that tiger's perch. Yeah. Right where Kane does his stuff. Exactly. So, what's the result? He starts the trick, slips on this oil, and the tiger claws it. Mm. Well, that's murder. Well, I see all that, of course, Chief, but, uh... I was just trying to think who could have done it. Yeah, that's quite a thought, Miss Miller, quite a thought. Oh. Something we'll all have to think about. Yes, and do something about. How long is the circus scheduled to stay in the auditorium, Harrington? Not long, Chief. It moves on Friday. Friday. It's not much time, is it? Well, we'd better get to work, and fast. <laughs> Play, Carol. I'd better go back to my hotel and let you get some sleep. Have you started packing yet? I will tonight. And, and, and tomorrow you'll... Leave. I'll tell her right after the matinee. Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy, I'm scared. Oh, baby, no. There's nothing to be scared about. It, it's best this way. Honestly. Well, I know all that. It's, it's just that everything's so mixed up. It won't be for long. You'll see, honey. I'll get a job just like that. 
I know. Well, gee, smile then or something. I'm going to miss you, too. Oh, you know? Jimmy. Oh, Carol. Oh, gee, honey, don't cry. I can't help it. Let's see, all, all while you were in, in the army, I used to think about us being together. And, and how you do the cat act someday, and, and me with the part. And, and now it's all different. Oh, now, baby. <laughs> oh, I, I'm just sorry, I guess. Sure you are. Hey, you'd better get some sleep, young lady. All right now? I'm fine. Miss Drew, fair damsel. Hey. I, I, I'm i listening, Mr. Parsons. You're supposed to smile, Dopey. Oh? I'm listening, Mr. Parsons. That's better. I just want to tell you, fair lady, that I... that I love you. Jimmy, wait. Very, very nice. Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Okay, come in. Jimmy, I... Mrs. Kane. Does he usually stay in your hotel room until now? What? Don't give me that wide-eyed stare. I've been waiting in the street. What do you want? That's a neat question coming from you. All right, I'll give it to you straight. I want Jimmy. I don't want to talk like this. What's more, I want you out of my way, kid. Is that clear enough? Mrs. Kane, I will not stand for you to come in here I'm and talk talking. to me. I'm talking. There's a show organizing in Texas this week. They need another wire girl, and I can get them to take Mrs. you on. Mrs. Kane. Just to show you my heart's in the right place. I'll stake you to the fair. Oh, please, Mrs. Kane, won't you try to understand? Oh, I understand, kid. Oh, sure. Now, do you go? Do you get on that bus tomorrow and that's the end of you? Well, you must be crazy. Do you really think you can get Jimmy that way? Do you go? He loves me. Doesn't that mean anything to you? Jimmy loves Shut me. Shut up. And you think you can get rid of me and have more to yourself? You're crazy, I tell Shut you. Shut up. He isn't staying with you, Mrs. Kane. Don't you know that? He's leaving. He's leaving, do you hear? He's getting away from the whole thing. What did you say? You heard me. Jimmy isn't yours. Why, why, you couldn't have his little finger. He loves me, do you hear me? He loves me. You shut up, you crazy little fool. You don't know what love is. And you think you could take him away from me? You? He hates you. Did you hear that, Mrs. Payne? He hates you. Rotten little rat. You couldn't have Jimmy if you were to... Get away. Nibbling little idiot. Hey, no! Hey, go, no! No! You fool. Let's see if he loves you now. Carol Drew, who didn't know why she was afraid, dead. We'll hear the next development in this case in just a moment. But first, some tips for the man who wants to look his best. If you're on the heavy side, wear a double-breasted suit. You'll look thinner. If you're short, wear a striped suit to make you look taller. And whether you're short or tall, keep your dry, unruly hair looking neat. You'll make a better impression. That is, if you keep your hair under control in a natural, masculine way. So be sure to use Vitalis. Because Vitalis contains natural vegetable oils. No mineral oil. No slick, greasy look. And remember, Vitalis does lots more besides make your hair look right. In fact, Vitalis and the famous 60-second workout brings you an extra advantage so many hair preparations cannot give you. Vitalis and workout stimulate your scalp, makes it tingle all over, feel just grand. The Vitalis workout also routes embarrassing loose dandruff, helps retired excessive falling hair. And due to the natural vegetable oils in Vitalis, eliminates the irritation of dry scalp. Better try Vitalis, mister. Scalp tingling Vitalis is available at drug counters everywhere. To look your best tomorrow, get a bottle of Vitalis tonight. <laughs> Back to Mr. District Attorney. Shut the dressing room door, will you, Harrington? I don't want any of the performers in the halls to see us. Yeah, right, Chief. 
The Parsons boy is out in the arena? Yeah, I checked again, Chief. He's standing just at the entrance way. Well, we'll wait here for him, then. We'll talk to him first, and then move right down the list. Uh, Harrington. Yeah, Chief? What'd you... What? What will be done? Raven oil. Yeah. Almost amateurish, wouldn't you say? The boy's <laughs> obviously all packed. Yeah, and a half-empty bottle of that raven oil tossed behind the makeup stand. <laughs> I'll be a son of a gun. Yeah, be careful. I'll pick it up in my hack. Yeah, boy, this one's going to end fast, huh, Chief? <laughs> I thought we'd be questioning half the circus before we're through. Yeah, better put Brophy next to the boy. We can't take any chances now. Yeah, right. Uh, that's the phone, Chief. Do you want to let it ring? No, oh, I think we'll answer it. Anything concerning James Parsons is of interest to us now. Yes? Hello, I'm calling the district attorney, please. Is he near that extension? Oh, yes. Go ahead, Miss Minnick. Oh, Chief, I've been tracing you through every dressing room over there. Well, we won't be long. We've just made quite a discovery. But, Chief, the teletype just came in. The squad's on the way there now to her hotel. Teletype? What, Miss Miller? I don't understand. Well, the report just came through, Chief. Carol Drew's been murdered. <laughs> Five. Sixty. All right, take it. I'm sorry you feel this way, Mrs. Kane. You're quitting, aren't you? you? Got your salary, haven't you? Go on, get out. If I can do anything, I mean if... For me? You've done enough to me, boy. All I want to do now is to get out of here. When I slam that dressing room door, that's the end. You're taking the animals, Mrs. Kane? Yeah. Madura, especially. We'll go back to the farm together. Me and that cat... I should think after the accident, after what Madura did, you'd... Uh... I'd what? Uh, nothing. I'd better go. More company. I must be getting popular. Come in. Excuse me, Mrs. Kane. I just... Uh, it's okay, Chief. He's in here. Uh, what do you want? Wait out here, brother. Sorry to disturb you, Mrs. Kane, but maybe you'll be glad it's all over. Come on, Parsons. Let's go. Let's go, but I... We have a car outside, Parsons. We leave as quietly as possible. Leave? But, but what for? I don't get it. For murder, Sonny. Come on, put on your hat. All right. All right, we'll start again. Now listen to me, Parsons. Listen, I said... Look at the district attorney, Parsons. I told you. You've told us nothing. Now, thank Parsons. Chris Kane was killed because someone put oil in front of that tiger. Raven oil, Parsons. Raven oil that we found in your dressing room. Yeah, where'd you get it? Let me go, please. Mm -hmm. Carol's dead. Can't you understand that? We understand it, all right. You were in her hotel room last night, not ten minutes before they found her body. You hear me? You were there. I don't know. Oh, Oh, it's getting late, Chief. Well, all right, all right. Where's Mrs. Skin, Miss Miller? Oh, uh, now at yes. the farmhouse, Chief. But she and her husband kept the tigers in this place just outside of town. She'll make a statement, I think, Harrington. Suppose you go out there and get it. Right. Yeah, you'd better go, too, Miss Miller, to take it. Right. Oh, and send Dorothy in here, will you? Yes, sir. Jimmy and I aren't through, not by a long shot. All right, Parsons, we'll start again. <laughs> Crack, Miss Miller. Huh. <laughs> Boy, he's stubborn, though. I'll say. Is that the house? That uh, second driveway, Harrington. You see that mailbox? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should have stopped at the squad room, I guess. Mike's fixing my gun. Is this it? Yeah, right here. Hmm. Hope we don't have to ask her to come downtown. No. That poor dame's been through a lot. She sure has. Got your notebook? Are you kidding? Go on, ring the bell. I did. She must be here, Harrington. The door's open. Mm -hmm. mm. Come on, Mrs. King. Come on. This is no time to take a bath. Harrington, I don't think she's here. Hmm? Do you hear anybody? Not a thing. Come on. My book going in an open door ain't so bad. Come on. All right. Mrs. Kane? Anybody home? Mrs. Kane? That's funny. Come on, let's look around. Okay. All of that must go to the kitchen. Yeah. Mrs. Kane? Hey! Anybody home? That's strange, isn't it? The house wide open, not a soul here. 
Yeah. Oh, where's that door go, Harrington? Basement, I guess. Uh, Come on, let's have a look. Yeah. <laughs> Harrington! Oh, that love. Miss Miller, get back. It's, it's a tiger. No. <laughs> Don't yell, Miss Miller. Move slowly. Go on. Get over in the corner. Harrington, it, it stopped. In the corner, Miss Miller. Now, don't even breathe. He's, he's coming closer. Get behind me. Harrington. Slowly, Miss Miller. Give me that chair. I hope this is the way they do it. Now, you left the hotel at 10 after 12. Are you sure? I I don't know. You just said it was ten after twelve, Parsons. Now make up your mind. Hello. No. Yes, yes, go on, Brophy. You're in the lab now. What? Are you sure? No, no, that's all right. Get a car and meet me downstairs. Yes, at once. Parsons? Yes, sir. I owe you an apology, Parsons. Come on, son, I'll explain in the car. I think I'm going to... For the love of Mike, don't pass off, Miss Miller. Watch him, Harrington. Look, there's something in the hall. Watch him. Easy. Easy does it. If he turns that head again, we make a break for the door. All right. Easy. Madura! It's Mrs. Kane! Keep your voice normal, Miss Miller. In the kitchen, Mrs. Kane. Madura! You fools. Didn't you know... Oh, you fools. Can you control him, Mrs. Kane? Who will control Madura? Watch me. Get him, Madura. Get him. Harrington. Watch it, Miss Miller. Keep behind me. Get him, Madura. Kill him. Harrington. You killed him, Madura. It's all right, Miss Miller. It's all right. Take Mrs. Kane, Harrington. Parsons is in the car. Mrs. Kane? Yes, for murder. Easy, Miss Miller. Easy. It's all right, Harrington. Let's go. <laughs> Your district attorney will return in just a moment with an explanation of the clues that led to the arrest of Mrs. Kane. But first, about something that concerns almost everyone listening. Whether you're a bank president... Or a bank clerk. A shop foreman. Or a shop apprentice. A secretary. Or a bookkeeper. No matter who you are, what you do, where you live, the chances are you too wake up now and then feeling sick and headachy because you need a laxative. So better heed this good advice. When you feel like that, take Sal Hepatica. Yes, take Sal Hepatica. For a sparkling glass of this famous saline when you get up brings quick, gentle relief. Usually within an hour. That means you don't have to feel miserable all day, waiting until night to take the laxative you needed in the morning. In addition, Sal Hepatica helps sweeten an upset stomach by reducing excess gastric acidity. So keep a bottle of Sal Hepatica handy, remembering this caution used only as directed. Then, any time you need a laxative, see how much faster you feel better thanks to gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. <laughs> Here is your district attorney. Uh, This was a case of double murder, ladies and gentlemen, and under questioning, Mrs. Kane has admitted both crimes. Boy, she was a weird one, wasn't she, Chief? Yes. She knocks off her husband so she can make a play for young Jimmy Parsons. Then when he says no dice, she shoots his girl. And darn near finishes us with that tiger, Harrington. Golly, I feel shake when I think about it. Well, Mrs. Kane is obviously a mental case, really. A woman so deranged by her emotions that murder meant little or nothing to her. As we know now, she put the oil in front of the tiger's perch, knowing that her husband would lose his footing in it and be killed. And then she plants the oil bottle in Jimmy's dressing room. Oh, brother. Yes, she did, Harrington. 
Unfortunately, she acted emotionally rather than with the deliberate count of the trained criminal. She planted a bottle of oil in Jimmy's dressing room, yes, but in her emotional state, fingerprints never occurred to her. And it was her prints on the bottle of oil that did it, huh, Chief? Yes, exactly, Miss Miller. As soon as Brophy called with a report from the files in Washington, there was no doubt about it. Mrs. Kane had a criminal record of some years standing, and her fingerprints very clearly matched those on the bottle. Yeah, to say nothing of the gun, Chief. The one she shot Carol with was right there in her house. <laughs> Oh, hey, what about next week? Well, friends, before telling about next week's case, we have a man with us tonight who has something of unusual interest to tell us. And it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce our sponsor, Lee Bristol of Bristol Myers Company. Mr. Bristol. Thank you, Jay. Fellow radio listeners, from time to time during the past five years, on this and on other radio programs, you have heard your favorite stars and announcers break away from the usual radio script to make special pleas for the Red Cross, for the recruiting of nurses, for treasury bonds, for employment of veterans, and many other subjects that affect the lives of practically all of us. Perhaps you have wondered how these announcements came about. Actually, the announcements you have heard have been an endeavor on the part of radio artists, their sponsors, and the networks and stations which bring them to you to provide a public service for the American people. It has been an effort to employ all the media of communication to inform Americans everywhere in the world of the problems facing their country. Here we are carrying them through the great medium of American radio. It had to be an organized effort because of the number of people involved and the great number of radio programs. All this difficult work of organization was done by the Advertising Council. It would take me too long to recount the fruitful results of what you, the listeners, have done as a result of the appeals made on commercial radio programs. All that you needed were the facts, and then you acted. All through the war, and now in the disturbed peace that has followed. Naturally, like any advertiser, we like we try to sell our products on our radio programs. But in our newspaper, or even in our newspaper and magazine advertisements, but on this, the fifth anniversary of the Advertising Council, we are continuing as best we may to keep Americans informed about the problems that most vitally affect them. We believe in the American system of broadcasting, which exists nowhere else in the world. We wish to preserve this system, but far more important, We wish to preserve the freedom of the individual man, which has made our country the great nation it is. This voluntary, cooperative undertaking expresses for you and for me the very essence and spirit of America. Thank you, Lee Bristol. And next week, ladies and gentlemen, our story is the case of perpetual care, and I invite you to join us for it. Until then, thank you, and good night. The names of all characters in the night's dramatization are fictitious, and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, and Vicki Bola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden, and the authors were Edward Byron and Robert Shaw. And remember, Vitalis for hair that's well-groomed, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Now, Bristol Myers, makers of Sal Hepatica and Vitalis, suggest you stay tuned for the big story. We invite you to hear the Alan Young Show on Friday night and join us again next week at the same time for Mr. District Attorney. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. I Panna for the Smile of Beauty, Sal Hepatica for the Smile of Health present Mr. District Attorney, champion of the people, defender of truth, Guardian of our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Mr. District Attorney is brought to you by two famous Bristol Myers products, Ipana and the Sal Hepatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty. Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Ipana, Sal Hepatica. <laughs> Yeah.
it be my duty as district attorney not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor the rights and privileges of all its citizens. In our constant experience with men who live by fraud and deceit, ladies and gentlemen, it is obvious that they succeed largely by one old and simple method, that of making it seem easy to get rich quickly. I need hardly add that never in that same experience has this proved to be so. Tonight's case of murder in rhythm and rhyme begins in an old and disreputable office building here in our city. Harry, here's yeah. one. The jerk and close the ten spot in cash, too. In cash? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me have it, baby. Oh, you said the next letter with cash in was mine. If you finish the recordings, Dolly. Oh. Come now, let Harry have the money. That's a nice girl. Look who's talking. You ain't even printed the song sheets for the last six poems we got. I will, my pet, I will. Uh, what's a poem? Huh? Uh, the one with the ten spot. Who thinks he's Irving Boyle in this time? Oh, just reading the letter. And I read your ad... Where you say you can write music to fit my poem. So I enclose it. <laughs> Smart boy. And there's more. Also, where you say in the ad, you will send me a record of my song as sung by an international star of stage and screen. <laughs> That's me, Buster. Uh, yeah, he didn't send for the signed copy, did he? Oh, uh, there ain't no extra two bucks if that's what you're looking for. Oh. Oh, brother, get a load of the title. On the poem? Yeah. Granny's making cornbread up yonder tonight. Oh, no. Granny's doing what, Pat? <laughs> making cornbread, whatever that is. Let's see now. Dum -de -dum -de 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 -dum -de -dum -da boom. Granny's making biscuits tonight. Boom, boom. Cornbread. Cornbread tonight. Boom, boom. Gra uh, what's the rest of it? What do you care? We'll use the same tune we always do. Yeah. Who's that? Well, how should I know? One answer? Uh, uh, you go, Dolly. Whoever it is, get rid of him. That's a help. I I'm not here, Dolly. All, all right? All right, go on. Uh, duck in the back room. Hello. Uh, excuse me. Is this the Great White Way Music Publishing Company? Yeah, it is. What can I do you for? Well, I beg your pardon. I... Out with it, chum. I'm a busy girl. Hey, wait a minute. If that stinking Sam Denver sent you, we can fly a kite for his dough. Sam Denver? Yeah, the book of you. Did you come? Wait a second. What do you want, huh? Why, I sent you my poems. I'm Tim Newton. You're who? Tim Newton. I have Mr. Madison's letter right here. Oh. oh, I see. Oh, you're a customer. Huh? <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> Excuse me for living. <laughs> I thought you were somebody else. <laughs> have I come to the right place? Oh, you sure have, Mr. Newton. Come right in. have a court appearance at 11, Chief, mm -hmm. and uh, lunch with the commissioner at 1.30. Oh, yes, thank you, Miss Mutter. Now, anything else? Let me see. I don't... Uh, 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 Come uh, out, morning, Chief. Morning, little Colleen. Little what? Uh, yes, I don't believe I quite caught that, Harrington. Sure, little... you're not knowing what the day it is, Chief. Day? Well, let me see. March 17th, isn't it, Miss Miller? Wednesday, Chief. Wednesday. Oh, Miss Miller, look. Yes. Look at my necktie now. What color is it? Uh... Kind of orange, isn't it, Chief? Orange! Oh, my grandmother's spinning in her grave in County Cork. It's green. This is St. Patrick's Day yet. No. No, is it really? Well, I hadn't heard, had you, Miller? Oh, Not a Saint thing, Patrick's Chief. Day. Who's St. Patrick? Oh, Miss Miller, that does it so <laughs> help me in a minute. I'm... Sure, Harrington, me boy, we're known. It's a good saint's day, to be sure. I'm sure, Harrington, to be sure. <laughs> oh, Corny, that's what it is, an orange tie, can you? Me with an orange. I take it all back, Harrington. That's the greatest piece of neckwear I've ever seen. Oh, oh well, thank you, Dan. Better. Sure is. Ah, anything for me today, Chief? Well, now, there are a few things, Harrington. However, if you're busy, perhaps Brophy can take care of What yes. is it, Chief? What's on my schedule? <laughs> Do you have that advertisement, Miss Miller? Uh, the one the Better Business Bureau sent over? Yes, that's uh, let's see. Oh, it's right on top of your folder there, Chief. Oh, yes, thank you. Did you ever hear of the, um, uh, wait a minute, the Great White Way Music Publishing Company, Harrington? Oh, 
that old racket again, Chief? Well, as a matter of fact, this particular ad puzzles me. Yeah? It's apparently been running in small out-of-town papers. Sure, that's where they get them. Well, this isn't just the usual ad, however. Now, this one says that for a service fee of $10, they'll write music to fit your poem. Send you a copy of the published song, and uh, what was the rest of it? Uh, send it to a nationwide radio network. Yeah. I remember that, That's Chief. right, that's right. Oh, and finally, you get a phonograph recording of your song made by an... Uh, let's see, where's that wording? Oh, here. Made by an internationally famous star of stage and screen. <laughs> Boy, that's some ten bucks worth, <laughs> That's my impression, too. You know, it's strange how one of these crops up every so often. You'd think people would learn. Oh, not poets, Chief. No. I have a cousin who sends me his latest masterpieces every week. Sure, and that's how these bums stay in business. Yes, well, let's put this one out of business, Carrington. Check on it, will you, and let me know. Oh, Harry, for Pete's sake... The kid's been hanging around for three days. Hmm? Kid, pet? Um, uh, what kid? Tim Newton. He's sitting out in the other office. No, uh, Tim, yeah, fine boy, Dolly. Great talent. Great talent, my foot. He's got a ten spot for every one of his drippy poems, you mean. He, he has more? Yeah, bucket full. Only, oh, I, I don't think you ought to do it, Harry. Honest. Uh, we don't, uh... I do it honest, Pet. Very funny. But, Harry, he's such a nice boy. Yeah, and he's getting sore, too. Oh? Yeah, well, why wouldn't he? This dump don't exactly look like big dough, you know. My dear girl, some of the finest songs in the business have come out of modest surroundings. Oh, yes. Why, when I was in Vaudeville, I found numbers practically anywhere. That I can get. Huh? You still say get rid of the kid. Send him back where he came from before he gets too smart. Hey, this is unlike you, Dolly. Is the boy by any chance attractive? Who, me? Just the thought, just the thought. I'll have a talk with him today. Perhaps run over a few of his uh, epics with him. Well, I still say get rid of him now before he gets smartened up. Tell you what, baby doll. Just a few more taps at his tail and away he goes. All right? He's getting sore, Harry. Oh, nonsense. He'll go home singing. Oh, uh, in the meantime, Pat. Yeah? Be, uh, be nice to him. Poets, you know, they have a tender soul. Well, I guess that about cleans up my little black book, Chief. Mm -hmm. And he's a cinch for a conviction? I think so, Harrington. Uh, who was assigned to the trial, Miss Miller? Uh, Fred, Chief. Jack's assisting. Oh, good. Ask them to go over it with me when they're ready, will you please? Yes, sir. Now, anything else, Harrington? Well, I slapped a discount charge on Weepin' Willie, Chief. Mm -hmm. I told you about him. Did it stick? He was up in front of Judge Higgs this morning. He drew three years. I have the verdict report on that, Chief. You're fine. Oh, um, what about our song publishing friends, Harrington? Mm -hmm. Any progress? Chief, there's a lot of up-and-up up music publishers in this county, but mm. I don't think our great white way boys are one of them. Oh? Are they licensed? They are not. I see. Who's running the show? Well, as near as I can get it, Chief, a guy named Harry Madison. Harry Madison. Yeah, one of the boys that helped kill Vaudeville. Yeah. Uh, and a dame named Dolly Racine. Who? She's the international star of stage and screen, Miss Miller. <laughs> she sounds like mm. it. Yeah, the whole thing's as phony as they come, Chief. Give me a couple of days to seal it up, and I'll take them. Now, my boy, let's just get a few kinks signed out here, and we'll be all set. Uh, uh, just read me the first line again. Not today, Harry. I'm tired. Nonsense. <laughs> now, Tim. Uh, the catfish are a-biting down in Honeysuckle Bay. Uh -huh. They'll do it every time. Uh, that's the first line, Miss Racine. Uh, like I said, I, I wrote this one when I was fishing. No. Yeah. Did you hear that, Dolly? Yeah. An outdoor song. Woodsy stuff. Goes over big, my boy. You think so, Mr. Madison? Think. Why, I know. Uh -huh. Now, uh, we'll just get the old piano warmed up and uh, we'll let it go. We've got to do it now, Harry. No time like the present, Dolly. Uh, got the recording machine on? Wait a second. You, you make records on that? Finest equipment in the world, my boy. Made it myself. Uh, ready, Dolly? 
Give me the words. Oh, here they are, Miss Racine, on my manuscript. Uh, right. All set. A one, a two. The catfish are a-biting down in Honeysuckle Bay. The moon's a feather pillow on which my head to lay. Uh, Wait, not just now, a son. Go on, Dolly. But, but you've got the wrong tune, Mr. Huh? Madison. Uh, what do you mean, uh, the wrong tune? Well, that's the tune you used before, remember? On my poem about the way the sun shines on the cornfield? My dear young man, I never use the same melody twice. But but, but, but that's the same one, though, and, and I think it sounds like the other ones, too. Harry. Uh, never mind, Dolly. Uh, look, son, I've been turning out hits since before you were born. I know music. Oh, I know that, Mr. Madison. Good. Now, uh, shall we make the record, Dolly? No. Uh, not with that tune, Mr. Madison. That ain't fair. Harry, maybe we Stay ought... Stay out of this, pet. What isn't fair, my boy? Using the same tune for all my poems. I've been thinking, Mr. Madison, you ain't just playing square about this thing. Uh-huh. Dolly, be quiet. You have a complaint, Tim? Well, just that it ain't fair, Mr. Madison. You say in the ad you write special music for my words. I go on. But, but you don't. It's the same thing over and over, and while I'm getting it off my chest, Mr. Madison, it ain't fair about her, too. Now, just a second. What ain't fair about me? The way the ad says my song will get recorded by an international star. Well? Heck, Miss Racine, you don't sound like a star at all. I don't, huh? Why, you small time hick. Where do you get off making a crack like that? Now, now, there's no need to get sore, Miss Racine. I, I just think you folks are cheating people, that's all. Why, you bum, you two for nickel. Uh, oh, hold it, darling. All right, young man. You're dissatisfied with our service? We will give you your ten dollars back. Oh, it ain't that, no, Mr. Madison. No, 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 I insist. Uh, get him ten dollars, Dolly. No, no, don't do that, Miss Racine. It, it ain't the money so much. It's the principle of the thing. It's what? Cheating folks this way. Uh, that's a phone you got there? Phone? Uh, yeah, what for? It ain't easy to get me mad, Mr. Madison, but you got no right making people out fools this way. Oh. Who are you calling? Policeman. Harry! I figure we can just sit down and have a little talk about this, Mr. Madison. I've been thinking about it a long time now. Harry, do something, Harry! Put down the phone, son. Not now, Mr. Madison. In fact, the more I think, the matter I get. I said put down the phone. Harry, stop him for crying out loud, Harry! There's no need to get all excited, Miss Racine. I just wanted to be sure... Hello, hello, operator? Crazy country jerk. Operator, I wonder if you can tell me how... Oh, no! Oh! Harry, you knocked him cold. Dumb cluck. Pick up the phone, Dolly. Yeah. What you hit him with? Just a paperweight. He'll come around. Pick up the phone. Yeah. Crazy kid. Now what will we tell him? Oh, I'll get rid of him somehow. What's the matter? Hey, Harry. This is Tim Newton. What? Gee, Harry, he's dead. Tim Newton, amateur poet, would-be songwriter, dead. We'll hear the next development in this unusual case in just a moment. But first, tell me, Jan, what's your pet superstition? My pet superstition? Mm. Well, when I spill salt, I always throw some over my left shoulder to avoid bad luck. How about you, Bob? Uh, I'm one who believes in knocking on wood. Yes, lots of us have little superstitions. But it takes more than some pet superstition to help you avoid a troublesome day. For example, if you wake up in the morning feeling dull and logy because you need a laxative. You take Sal Hepatica, eh, Fred? Right. A sparkling glass of Sal Hepatica when you get up brings quick, gentle relief, usually within an hour. And that means you don't have to feel dull and logy all day waiting until night to take the laxative you needed in the morning. In addition, if you're troubled with excess gastric acidity, Sal Hepatica helps sweeten your stomach. So keep a bottle of Sal Hepatica handy. Then any time you need a laxative, morning, noon, or night, see how much faster you feel better thanks to gentle, speedy Sal Hepatica. <laughs> And 
And now back to Mr. District Attorney. They got the guy's body up on the pier, Chief. You want to take a look? Yes, I think so, Harrington, as long as we're here. Uh, who discovered it? Yeah, one of the dock hands. Mm-hmm. It ain't been in the water very long. Over here? Yeah, under the blanket. All right, Johnson, I'll watch it. Okay, Harrington. Oh, uh, hello, Johnson. Hello, dear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Young boy. Hmm? Yeah. Thought as long as you were on your way home, Chief, you might as well see it. Yes, yes, yes. I'm glad you called. Any identification? No, nothing too good so far. Some kind of book in his pocket, I'll dry it out. Mm-hmm. Death due to drowning. Well, I, that's one reason I called, Chief. I'm not sure. Yeah, look. Hmm? Look at that bump on the side of his head. Yes, yes. I was just noticing. Has the examiner been called? Yeah, he'll be waiting when they bring the bunny in. Mm-hmm. You know, strange. Suicides are usually careful to avoid hitting anything in the water. Yeah, and they usually don't clean out their pockets this way either, Chief. No. I think you'd better follow through on this, Harrington. Mm. Are you on something else? Just that song publishing thing. Yes, well, I'll check on that for you. Stick with this, if you will. It might be murder. Dolly, you got to stop thinking about it. It's done. Forget it. But you killed him, Harry. Gee, I never meant for nothing like that to happen. And neither did I, but it's done, ain't it? Now we just got to be sure everything is covered up. But what about his hometown? They'll know he came to see us. What? Well, you know how it is. Small town boy goes off to the big city. He's bound to have talked about it. Yeah. Yeah, he would. And sooner or later they'll wonder what happened to him, won't they? All right. So... So he never got here, that's all. We we never saw him. Suppose he rode home while he was here. Suppose he told somebody we were recording his song. Yeah. Huh, okay. Uh, so we did see him, but he left. Get it? He, he started back home. Then what? Well, after that, uh, we don't know nothing. Hey, wait a minute. We can cinch it. How? We'll send him a letter. Huh? You know. Uh, glad to have seen him in the city. Hope he... Oh, we got home okay? Uh, that kind of thing. To prove he left here all right. Sure. Huh? Oh, yeah, Harry. Say, we'll even do better than that. We'll send him one of his records. We got one, haven't we? One? Dozens. Look at that pile. Okay, we'll send him one. Then, when anybody asks us, we're surprised, see? Shocked. We don't know a thing. <laughs> Yes, Harrington. What is it? Well, I'm over at the lab, Chief. On that kid we fished out of the river last night? Oh, yes, yes. What about him? Any identification? No, not yet, but I did get something. There's a bookstore label in that book we found on him. Oh? Yeah, it's kind of a crazy book, too. It's what they call a, a rhyming dictionary. I see. Yeah. If you don't want me, Chief, I thought I'd take a run out and check on who bought the book. It ought to be easy to trace. Take a run out where? Collinsville, about 50 miles west, Okay. Sure, go right ahead. Oh, and on that Great White Way song publishing matter. Oh, yeah, yeah, Chief. My report's on the desk. Yes, yes, I've seen it. There's no need to wait for you, Harrington. I'll close that case while you're gone. How much mail, Dolly? Did you pick it up? Twenty-two letters. Well, we're doing better. Much better. Harry. Yes, Pat? Harry, I was thinking... Couldn't we quit? Well, may- maybe just for a while, even. Quit? <laughs> when we're getting 22 letters a day? Well, we don't get that many every day. Besides, well, it, it, it seems kind of low. Huh? Like, well, like he said that night, like cheating people. Dolly, some people were meant to be cheated. Besides, we do what we promise them. I print a copy of their song for them, don't I? Yeah. Well. One copy. Same as the gag about sending one to a radio network. Okay, who who says anything about what the network does with the song? We send it. That's the big thing. Oh, well, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Oh, you'll be fine, Pat. Uh, see who's there. I guess so. 
Maybe I think too much. That I doubt, Pat. Oh, I beg your pardon. Is this the Great White Way Music Publishing Company? It is. Good. My name is Howard, James Porter Howard. Yeah. Oh, permit me to introduce myself, sir. Howard, James Porter Howard. Oh, so, uh, what's the trouble? Trouble? Why, my dear Mr. Madison's a name, sir. My Chum. dear Mr. Madison, there's no trouble. Not now. You see, sir, I have brought you my poem. Oh, <laughs> you write poetry. Oh, I do indeed. Yes, indeed. And you, I understand, have been favored by the other muse. How's that again? Well, in short, my verses, your music. Together, a fortune. Am I not right? Uh, look, Mr. Yes, Howard, before you get unwound, there's a fee goes with this kind of thing, you know. Well, naturally, naturally. I've read your advertisement, Mr. Madison. That's why I'm here. Now come then, can't we do business? Well, sit down, Mr. Howard. Yes, thank uh, you. Uh, take off your coat. Thank, thank you. I uh, get the man a chair, Dolly. Huh? Oh, sure. And uh, dust it off. Yes, sir, we can do business just fine. <laughs> Miss Miller, you're sure, you're sure you don't know where the chief is, huh? Thanks, and for heaven's sake, calm down. He went out, I tell you. Calm down, Miss Miller. What I got here in this little bag is a bum shelf. I got to find the chief. Well, I told you he probably won't be back at all. He said something about stopping at that mm. publishing place yeah. and then going on home when he was finished. Yeah, public... What? Music publishing? Yeah. Holy smoke, you mean my boy? The Great White Way outfit? That's right. He read your report and decided to make the arrest himself. Oh, no. Why, what's the matter? Call a car, Miss what? Miller. Come on, step on it. This is much worse than the chief thinks. You have it right, Mr. Howard. Yes. For ten bucks, I write music or fit your poem. And uh, i give you a printed copy. Well, imagine that. Yeah, and a recording, Mr. Howard. Yes. We guarantee to send it to a big radio network. But I am delighted. Hey, you'll take my ten dollars now? Well, sure. <laughs> makes everything easy to keep track of. Yes, here you are, sir. Thank you, Mr. Howard. And thank you. That does it. I think you're both under arrest. Well, arrest? Hey, that's right. Hey, what kind of... Who are you? The district attorney, Madison. Oh. Now, come on. Get your hats and coats, both of you. I've wasted enough time. Harry, do something Listen, for you. you can't pinch us. What for? For fraud. Now, do you come downstairs, or should I ask one of the officers? Oh, tonight? no, wait a minute. Hey, but... hey, 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 you all right? All right. Why, of course, Miss Miller. Why shouldn't I be? Well, hey, now, listen. Talk what? to him, Harry, please. Chief, you pinched him? That's right, Harrington, for fraud. Yeah, well, you can change it if you want to, Chief, to murder. Murder? No, Harry, don't let him Shut hurry. up, Dolly. Chief, it's true. Look, Harrington, there's a phonograph oh, right yeah. over here. Have you got a minute, Chief? This yeah. record is really hot. Uh, can you work it, Miss Miller? Sure, it's easy, Harrington. Now, just let me get the record. No, going. just a second. You uh, can't put it here like quiet, that. Quiet, Madison. You're already under arrest. All right, go on, Harrington. Let's hear that Listen record. To this, Chief. Yeah, just the last part will do it, Miss Miller. Okay. Gee, Harry, you knocked him cold. Dumb cluck. Pick up the phone, Dolly. Stand still, you two. Yeah. What'd you hit him with? Just a paperweight. He'll come around. Pick up the phone. Yeah. Crazy kid. Now what'll we tell him? Oh, I'll get rid of him somehow. Hmm. What's the matter? Hey, Harry. This is Tim Newton. Where'd you hear this, Chief? Mm -hmm. What? Gee, Harry. Gee, Harry. He's dead. Heard enough, Chief? Yes, plenty. Turn it off, Miss Miller. Right. Harry, no, do something, Harry. Sorry, Harry, darling. For... I'm afraid the two of you have already done quite enough. Come on, Carrington, let's go. Your district attorney will return in just a moment to bring you the solution to tonight's case. But first, to every girl, a word about one of your greatest assets, your natural good looks. Every girl was born with at least one touch of beauty, one claim to charm. I mean that warm, winning beauty in her smile, in your smile. Make the most of your smile. Remember to give your smile the thoughtful care it deserves. Remember that Ipana toothpaste is good for your smile. Remember the fact. According to a nationwide survey, dentists recommend Ipana two to one over any other dentifrice. And what's more, these dentists prefer Ipana two to one for their own personal use over any other toothpaste on the market. Ipana cleans teeth clean, safely too. And followed by gentle massage promotes the health of your gums. Help your dentist help your smile. Begin now getting your Ipana smile. Taste the freshness. Feel the cleanness. See the sparkle. See how you look with an Ipana smile. Just try Ipana. Ipana toothpaste. 
Now, here is your district attorney. I'm happy to report that with Harrington's unusual evidence against them, ladies and gentlemen, Harry Madison and Dolly will pay the full penalty demanded for the murder of Tim Newton. That was certainly something, wasn't it, Harrington? Our routine, Miss Miller. After the medical examiner said Tim Newton died from a blow on the head, I started to follow up the lead. Yes, the label on his rhyming dictionary took you out to his hometown, didn't it, Harrington? That's right, Chief. It was easy to trace the dictionary to him because it was the only one they'd sold in years. And then while you were there getting the whole story... That recording arrived addressed to him in the mail. Sure, of course we had a pretty good case without it, Miss Miller, but the record sure clinched the deal. Yes, I'll say it did. As we know now, Dolly didn't turn off the recording machine at the time of Tim Newton's death. Yes, and what's worse, she sent that same record in the mail, thinking it was just another one of his songs. Boy, oh boy, I guess they never learned. The old battle goes right on. That's right, Harrington. And speaking of battles... I wonder how many people realize that there are thousands of our boys still overseas on occupation duty. Many also on duty here at home. Yes, that's quite right, Miss Miller. And just as in past years, we can show our appreciation for the job they're doing through our Red Cross. Wherever American forces are stationed, our Red Cross is on duty, helping them with personal and family problems. Lending a friendly hand in military hospitals, too. That's a pretty big job, isn't it, Chief? Yes, a tremendous job. One that will need the support of all of us. And it's another reason, friends, why your contribution to the Red Cross right now is so important. Give and give generously to your local Red Cross drive. Remember, as our present says, many times a year the people turn to the Red Cross. And once a year the Red Cross turns to the people. And that time is now. Right. Oh, Chief, what about next week? Well, next week, ladies and gentlemen, our story concerns a man and his love for his daughter. It's a tremendously dramatic story I'm sure you'll enjoy. It's the case of the grand old man. And I cordially invite you to join us for it. And so until then, thank you and good night. It's new. It's quick. It's Benex. B-E-N-E-X. The new brushless wonder shave that wilts your whisker so they whisk off like Mr. Try Benex. The special beard softening formula makes your beard one-fifth water, makes whisker cutting a breeze, Benex doesn't clog your razor, instantly rinses off razor and hands, which all adds up to quick, easy, comfortable shaves. Get Benex. B-E-N-E-X. Benex Brushless Shave Cream. The names of all characters in a nice dramatization are fictitious, and any resemblance to names of living persons or actual places is purely coincidental. Our stars were Jay Justin in the title role, Len Doyle as Harrington, and Vicki Vola as Miss Miller. The music was under the direction of Peter Van Steeden. The program is produced and directed by Edward A. Byron and written by Robert Shaw. Mr. District Attorney was originated by Philip H. Lord. Remember, I panel for the smile of beauty, Sal Hepatica for the smile of health. Bristol Myers invites you to tune in again next week for Duffy's Tavern and Mr. District Attorney.